So I fight for a father I never loved, against a brother that I did. I defend an empire that never wanted me, against an army that would have taken me in a heartbeat. Warriors of Chagoris, brothers of the great tribe, the Star Hunt calls you. Do you not hear it? The battle's red edge is your home, the respect of your kinsmen, your hurt. Plunge into the enemy's breast like a blade, cut out his heart, and you will know fulfillment. The Emperor has given us strength. In return, we give him victory. The overlooked barbarian, the warhawk, the great Kagan, the untrusted but yet respected, Primarch of the Fifth Legion, the White Scars, Jagatai Khan, a figure of mystery, whose legacy as the reclusive conqueror has echoed for over 10,000 years, overlooked by his brothers, by his Imperium, and those who fell into the trap of failing to look below the surface. The choices and decisions of this so-called barbarian Primarch shaped humanity forever. But who is the man behind the walk? Who is underneath the mystery of the Great Kagan? Who is the man, Jagatai, and what shaped him? His story begins at the end of the 30th millennium. A gestation capture was hurtling through the warp, claws and teeth scratched upon its reinforced surface as creatures of nightmare and madness tried to get to the prize within. Re-emerging back into real space, the battered capsule was interfered with. Divine hands took it within its clutches as it hurtled towards the grey, desolate world of Chemos. The capsule was redirected, its fate changed forever, as this mysterious entity swapped it with another, directing the burning treasure towards a new destination. The capsule began to enter a planet's atmosphere, hurtling down with all the grace and violence of a falling star, roaring and crashing into the earth. Amidst the smoke and fire, a child crawled out from the wreckage, Opening his eyes for the first time, he looked up to the azure skies. No fear or terror gripped him, only confusion. This child was special. He began to adapt, rationalize, and comprehend his surroundings at a speed and depth that was beyond an ordinary human. Alone, with no sense of who or what he was, the child began to wander his new temperate home. Deep within the Yasan sector of the galaxy, on a world dominated by lush greenery, soaring mountains and azure seas and great plains, this unique child wandered the planet of Mundus Planus, Chagoris, a world with a singular, vast continent. Chagoris was a world home to a human civilization that had suffered the devastating consequences of old night, the collapse of the galaxy-spanning civilization of mankind. For thousands of years, war storms had ravaged the sector, isolating Jagoris from the wealth and resources of its neighboring worlds. Knowledge, power, and wealth bled until humanity had regressed. The sword, bow, and rudimentary black powder weapons ruled this feudal world. It would be to the far west, deep inside the vast steppe lands known as the Empty Quarter, that the child began to roam. At the banks of the Kuan River, the young boy caught his first glimpses of humanity. He saw a tribalistic people, his superhuman mind registering their weapons, their horses, all the information he could gather but yet distinctly lacking an understanding of the people he was looking at. Ong Khan, 
The leader of his Talscar tribe stared back at the seemingly helpless boy and he knew immediately there was something different about him. His very presence inspired awe, but most distinctly was the fire in his eyes. Ong Khan declared that this child was a gift from the gods, and he took in this young boy, giving him shelter, food, a family, and a name, Jagatai. The Talskar shared everything with Jagatai. He was taught everything of their ways, their lifestyles, and the morality of tribal life. Honor, honor to the tribe, honor to the land, and honor to the storm seers, the Zadrin Aga, the shamans who guided and preserved the traditions of the tribe, as well as being an invaluable advisor in the matters of the gods and the powers bestowed upon them, and the lessons of control. Lest the Yaksha, the demons, punish your pride and arrogance. The young Jagatai began to grow quickly. Even his intellect and strength was progressing so fast, he would best even the adults in combat and match and even outwit the wisdom of the Storm Seers. Jagatai learned everything his people could give him, but most importantly was their spirit. On horseback, Roaming the vast plains, the azure skies above, the sun on his face, feeling the adrenaline flowing as the wind hit his face, hunting, fighting off rival tribes, drinking the fermented milks and wine of his people, it was freedom, uncaged, that sensation of staring at a sunset, feeling in tune with the world, what would you give for that feeling? Jagatai was special. His strength, his intellect, his ability to understand and adapt was frightening. Even being in his presence for the first time was overwhelming, but behind this prominent form was a young boy who pondered. Rival step tries began to fear him because of this seemingly superhuman warrior who began to preach and talk what was beyond the constant warfare that dominated life on the steppes. The young Talskar warrior sent from the gods was a figure of awe and a conjurer of jealousy. But Jagatai's fast-paced, freedom-filled existence wouldn't last, and it would soon change forever. His father, Ong Khan, was dead, killed by the Talskar's rivals, the hated Kureye tribe. A rage, so apocalyptic in its release, gripped Jagatai. He screamed for vengeance. The young man, barely a few years old, but at the same height of his elders, gathered his people. As the greatest Talskar warrior, he led them to war, attacking the Kureye tribe and raising it to the ground, killing every man, woman, and child in a cacophony of swift, brutal vengeance, taking the Kuryade's Khan's head and mounting it upon his tent. As the Talskar swore fealty to their new leader, Jagatai Khan, this brutality of tribal life was the other side to all that he loved about it. The vengeance was complete tribal honor restored, but as the anger began to fade, the quiet, pondering boy was not happy. It was a waste, this pointless inner tribal conflicts. The spirit of Chogorus was within him. He loved to fight. He loved the rush of the wind. They all did, the people of the steppe. They were brothers, all of them. Perhaps it was a philosophy created in his superhuman mind, or perhaps it was in the blood. Jagatai Khan and his Talskars rode out, clashing with the other warring tribes. A combination of the brilliant strategies and exceptional prowess of Jagatai broke their enemies. One by one, they were all defeated. The tribes of Heilun, the Kilhan, Haoljar, Sezjak, and the High Zur all at the feet of this new Khan, did not find death, but they were welcomed like brothers, absorbed into Jagatai's family. 
welcomed as Talscars, a fate unheard of in the millennia of brutal tribal warfare. The Malthuli, the irresistible force, bowed to their Khan, each splinter unit led by men who were promoted based on meritocracy, ending the old feudal ways of inheritance. Tribes that had warred, killed, and stolen from each other for centuries found themselves fighting side by side, riding in the saddle as one force, one army, one people. They bled together, drank together, and followed the vision of Jagatai Khan together, an unstoppable brotherhood of warriors. Imagine standing before the Khan, how earth-shattering his presence felt. How your admiration and respect flowed from the acknowledgement of his prowess and his greatness. The man who had bound your people together, each clan fingers in a curled fist that smashed your enemies apart. It would be this great growing horde that would draw the attention of more dangerous foes. To the east, outside the empty quarter lie great kingdoms and empires. Feudal civilizations with black powdered weapons and high walls. Greatest of all was the Palatine, an emperor to a corrupt empire whose packs of greedy, self absorbed nobles would often roam the edges of the steppe lands, hunting and attacking the tribal people for sport. Ten summers after his arrival on Chagoris, as his tribe moved to their winter settlements, a vast avalanche caught Jagatai off guard, and he and his personal guard were swallowed up by the rushing snow. Alone, Jagatai survived, his loyal brothers all dead, and just as how he had arrived in Chagoris, he was again alone. It was in his journey to return to his people that Jagatai was attacked by a Palantine aristocratic hunting band. The arrogant men underestimated the tribal savage before them. It would be their last mistake, as Jagatai tore them limb from limb, fighting with blinding speed and aggression. One lone survivor returned, bearing a note from Jagatai, declaring that the people of the steppes were no longer the Palantine's toys, alongside the severed head of a man who was the Palantine's very own son. The enraged Emperor of the East assembled an enormous force. Men clad in heavy steel with guns marched to Jagatai's home, but found not a pathetic gathering of tribes in simple girths, but a well-disciplined, motivated horde. The Mathuli strode out, and utilizing the speed of an entire mounted force, they tore the armored warriors apart showering arrows as if the very heavens rained death. The force was utterly annihilated. The men of the East had tried to destroy them, their home, their culture, their way of life, but Jagatai wouldn't let that happen. In the wake of this glorious victory, the superhuman young man became the Kagan, the Khan of Khans of the Empty Quarter, the rightful ruler of all of its people. Men such as Targetai Yasuge, Quinn Shah, Giyu Hun, and Hasek, friends and brothers who had been by his side, followed their Kagan out of the empty quarter, the dust gathering at their feet as they set out to conquer the world. Kingdoms and empires over decades began to fall. Cities would look out to find this disciplined horde outside their gates. They were offered one chance to surrender or be destroyed. The example of that refusal was a warning others dared not to repeat. Each king and emperor he slew, Jagatai became more and more disgusted with them, how fat, lazy and corrupted they had become. The obscene displays of wealth, the utter weakness of it all, great cities towering structures, temples, and very kingdoms fell, and after decades of war, Jagatai finished it, mounting the Palatine's Emperor's head over his tent. His conquest was complete, but peace never lasts. 
far upon the horizon, in Chagoras' azure skies, a golden eagled stormbird descended from the sky. Jagatai's life was about to change forever. When explanations are hard to produce, lie after lie comes shining through. Truth gets locked away for reasons only known to yourself. Truth may hurt, but the lie hurts more. One lie to cover another. What was the first lie? Can you remember? So much hurt and too many lies. What's the truth? Will I ever know? Can I ever separate the two? The Khan remains static, like one of those age-darkened statues that stalked the shadows of that place. He saw rows of them against the far wall, each cowled and bearing a staff, mirror images of the living fossil that addressed him now. I have conquest in my blood, the Primarch said. I have always hungered for it. Only now I know that you planted the desire there. You made me as an instrument of your own designs. We are all instruments. Except for him. Oh no, very much him. The Sigilite placed his thin hands together. Listen, I understand the problem. You were monarchs of your worlds and now we ask you to fight for this one. You were never given the tutelage we had planned, and so the wrench is sudden. If we could postpone the crusade for a hundred years in order to prepare you adequately, we would do so, but we cannot. For we race against the closing door of fate. All must be gathered in. But remember this, you are a son of terror. You were made here. I was made on Chagoris. The Sigilite smiled. I should put that keening self-pity behind you if you wish to earn the allegiance of your new army. The Khan turned on him, unclasping his arms as if he wished to draw his blade. It is all a lie, he said fervently. Every part of it will be burning their temples and executing their priests in return for a million worlds. All as ignorant as beasts. Is that what you wanted? It is necessary. We could tell them the truth. Do not be foolish. The Khan's lips curled in disgust. So much contempt for your own species. Yes, contempt, snapped the Sigilite. If you had seen what I have seen, watched what a human may become when left alone in the dark, you would share it. He collected himself. You were lucky, Jagatai. Your world was no Caliban. We tell you of old night and you barely believe us, but that is not how most places were. The lie is noble. It is there to protect, to guard, not to deceive, for they are not ready. The Khan turned away, stalking further into the shadows. There were other tombs there, smooth with age, the name from the surface is impossible to read. I have heard this before, the Primarch said. There were empires on my homeworld that offered freedom to their slave castes, but only when they were ready. That moment, strangely enough, never came. In the end, they had to take it for themselves, to die for it. Even then, there were some who said the day had come too soon. He looked back at the Sigilite. The truth will come out. You won't be able to hold the blindfold in place, and once it slips, The fury of those you deceived will be limitless. Malkador nodded. Which is why we rely on you, on your exceptional power, on your tactical genius. It is not enough to conquer the galaxy. You must conquer it swiftly. Bring all under the rule of the throne before the patterns of fate change and we lose this one chance. I tell you no falsehood when I say that this is everything. All depends on this. We have mere decades remaining. Just the blink of an eye set against eons to accomplish it. The Khan smiled cynically. And when all is finished, then we will revisit the lie. When all is finished. The Primarch laughed, but there was no mirth in it. He tapped an armored finger idly on the lip of one of the tombs. I wonder some days why you gave us minds at all. 
Machines would have given you less grief. Less grief, surely. Less joy, too. Malkador sighed and wrapped his cloak tighter around his whip-thin body. You have found it hard to understand your father. You wish him to be more intelligible. I understand that. But do not be seduced by the scale of his power. He has sacrificed more than any of us, and he does not use it for himself. A man may pursue a single goal and become the master of that endeavor, only to find himself weakened in all other pursuits. The Emperor battles daily with forces beyond understanding, yet you expect him to retain a mortal sympathy. The Sigilite shook his head. He walks the paths of eternity. Be thankful he is able to converse with you at all. The Khan thought on that, staring pensively at the tomb. And what is gained? If we lose, what are we? What victory is that? The only one possible, said Malkador. I cannot believe it. Then stay. Speak to him again. Listen to what he has to say. The Khan's eyes never left the tomb. His gaze, sharp as the raptor that had given him his moniker, seemed liable to bore into the granite. A tense silence fell across the chamber, broken only by the dull hum that always came up from the distant foundations. The one that made the earth tremble and the atmosphere feel thicker than soup. I suffocate in this place. He said at last. More words won't change that. He looked up. We already have our destination, the world he chose for us. There are enemies I will gladly slay for you. Perhaps when the hunt is underway and I have prey under my blades, I will see the truth of what you say. There is no truth out there that cannot be perceived from here, warned Malkador. Then I will have to come back, said the Khan, already restive already moving. Someday, when the moment is right, not before. A golden eagle stormbird descended from the sky, and as a procession of large, golden armored warriors made their way into Jagatai's camp, he saw that these strangers possessed technology far beyond anything on Chagoris. From his first moments of sentience, Jagatai knew that he was different, that he was more than the people around him. His intellect, his strength, and in recent years, his towering figure. Finally, the answer to that very question came as he looked upon his father, the Emperor of Mankind, flanked by an equally large figure, Horus Lupercal. To stand before the Emperor is akin to glaring into the heart of a fire, warm and blinding, but with an added sense of welling majesty and wonder. Such perfection, such soul-wrenching glory, it would move you to tears. Humanity distilled. Even to Jagatai, the superhuman Primarch senses could feel that power. His father had found him. He was a Primarch, one of twenty sons of the Emperor of Mankind, the head of a galaxy-spanning empire that sought to reunite the lost colonies of mankind across the stars. He was at the head of the Great Crusade, the reconquest of the galaxy, reuniting with his lost sons and he wanted Jagatai to join. Join the Great Crusade at the head of an army made from his own genetic material and to conquer the stars. It was almost overwhelming, but Jagatai did not follow in the footsteps that millions had done before him. He did not throw himself at the feet of this new overlord, just how he had done throughout his youth. That brilliant mind began to ponder, his father before him, arrayed with technology that surpassed anything that he had dreamt of. That very technology could transform his world. Also the chance of conquest in the stars, an almost dream offered to a Jagorian. But yet he was an emperor. Jagatai had seen many kings and emperors, or tyrants who eventually became corrupt and complacent. And perhaps worse of all, was there really a choice? 
What would happen if Jogoris was left in hands that only cared for its compliance? Jagatai knelt before the Emperor and swore his fealty, the pragmatic choice, the lesser evil. The work began immediately. A call was sent out across the stars for the 5th Legion to reunite its splinter forces. Their Primarch had been found. The Adeptus Astartes, superhuman warriors created with the meshing of genes he'd grown from Jagatai's own genetic material. Faster, stronger, larger, and more resilient than any mortal man. As a legion gathered in the skies above Chagoris, the transformation began below. Targetai Yasuge, Quin Sha, Giyu Hun, and Hasek, brothers to Jagatai who had been by his side since the beginning, volunteered to undergo the transformation into Astartes. Many of the friends and Chagorian soldiers loyal to Jagatai would not survive this process. The success rate for adults was low, and the pain was at the very threshold of human tolerance. But such was their devotion and loyalty to their Khan, that thousands endured it. As the 5th Legion, the Star Hunters gathered to Chagoris, and the recruitment of Chagorian Astartes began, Jagatai, Targetai Yasuge, Quin Sha, and Hasek headed to Terra, the capital of the growing Imperium of Man. The Imperial Tide of the Imperium must have been shocking to men who had at most seen stone walls around feudal cities. The smog, the towering structures, the immense overcrowding. This was what Jagatai had to protect his people from. Face to face with the Emperor and his right hand Malkador, Jagatai's discomfort grew into outrage. He was asked to be more than a conqueror. He was asked to be an arbiter of a philosophy that challenged the fundamentals of who he and his people were. The Imperial Truth. It was a lie to claim that the universe was an ordered, rational place, an atheistic society, that things beyond human understanding live within the warp was a lie. We'll be burning their temples and executing their priests in return for a million worlds, all as ignorant beasts. Is that what you wanted? Truth may hurt, but the lie hurts more. That very so-called lie was integral to who he and the people of Chagoris were. Their Zadrin Aga, the Stormseers, drew upon that very power of the warp, guided and molded their people by it. It was a power they accepted, put boundaries on, and warded themselves against. Jagatai never lied to his people, never like the emperors and kings on Chogoris had done. He had seen its costs as kingdoms fell. The truth will come out. You won't be able to hold the blindfold in place, and once it slips, the fury of those you have deceived will be limitless. It was complicated to serve his father, to bow to an emperor, to conquer the stars and reunite humanity, but burn their churches in the name of a lie. It was the way that they had made him, questioning, pondering, honest. Suffering from the confinement, Jagatai and his son set out for Chagoris. One day the lies would be revisited, but for now, conquest awaited. Not even a mighty warrior can break a frail arrow when it is multiplied and supported by its fellows. As long as you brothers support one another and render assistance to one another, your enemies can never gain the victory over you. But if you fall away from each other, your enemy can break you like frail arrows, one at a time. 
If you can see us, we are dangerous indeed. But that is as nothing to the peril you face if you cannot see us. And all you can hear is our laughter. Chogoris. He may have been created on terror, but Chogoris had made him. Like some of his brother Primarchs, Jagatai had bargained with the Emperor to leave his homeworld in his hands, because he knew that it would be crushed under the tide of uniformity for the Imperium. Blood did not matter, it was heart. The spirit of Chogoris that had to be preserved. Culture bound men together, just as how he had bound the numerous tribes of the Empty Quarter under the banner of his Mathuli. The Fifth Legion, the Star Hunters, sons born on terror, veterans of the ongoing Great Crusade were ordered down to the surface and stood side by side with their newly elevated brothers from Chagoris. Thousands of soldiers, each bound with Jagatai's blood within them. But blood was not enough for Jagatai. Over 50 thousand men assembled on the plains of Chogoris. Their Primarch stood before them. The enormous, powerful presence of Jagatai awakening something within them all. Each Astarte, Terran and Chogorn were presented with a ritual blade, dipped in a poison designed to suppress their healing abilities. Fifty thousand men marked the form of a jagged scar across their cheek. With the wound still fresh, they discarded their old names, for that man was dead. Each chose a new name to mark his ascension into the horde of Jagatai, the Kagan. Their old way of life was gone. They were now one army, one brotherhood, one legion. They swore oaths to their Kagan and to each other. As long as you brothers support one another and render assistance to one another, your enemies can never gain the victory over you. They were one. They were the Talskar, clad in white. And now they set out to the stars to conquer the galaxy. Jagatai's molding of his legion continued. He began to incorporate his ethos and tactics from what he had learned in his time on the steppe. Attack and then retreat, shock and awe. The fifth legion would be the first in and then the first out. They would attack with such blinding speed that all resistance would be washed away in a tide. World upon world would find this enormous looming force blacken their skies only to realize in their horror that they were already under assault as a wave of superhuman warriors clad in gleaming white armor with an enormous figure leading them would smash them apart. Whooping cries and cheers would be heard over the thunder of jet bikes and land speeders as the spirit and heart of Chogoris sung through its warriors. Even their weapons and armor was adapted to fit their way of war. The Legion's colossal naval ships were modified to Jagatai's own specifications. He had been but a mere tribal warrior before. The bow and warhorse were his tools, but his mind had soaked in the complexity of the Imperium's technologies to a level where he could adapt it. The Dao Sword, the Tolwa Dagger, the Guan Dao Glaive, all deadly pieces of iron forged in the plains were reforged into steel and ceramite power weapons. Even Jagatai's personal guard, his Keshig, adapted their Terminator armor for increased mobility. It was the way we made you, words of Malkador that never seemed to leave his thoughts. Conquest was in his blood, but it was in the heart of the Chagorians. Their love of battle was unparalleled, just as the sensation of adrenaline and freedom had gripped Jagatai, mounted upon the plains of Chogoris. It was tapped into by all of the Fifth Legion. Imagine the speed, the power, the sensation of slicing apart your enemies with your blades. An exhilaration that would leave you grinning ear to ear. But they were more than just the savage visage they displayed. Jagatai began to encourage his sons to be more, to delve into such things as calligraphy, hunting, 
and the telling of ancient tales. The society that separates its scholars from its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting by fools. The 5th Legion fully joined the Great Crusade, with Targetai Yasuge, Quin Sha, Giyu Hun, and Hasek by his side. He disagreed with his father on the fate of humanity about lying to them, so he distanced himself from it. He would follow his own path. The 5th Legion began to disperse. Like an uncurling hand, the fingers outstretched to spread their grip on the stars. Each unit led by a son Jagatai trusted completely. The 5th Legion spread from war zone to war zone, utilizing their lightning fast raid tactics to overwhelm the horrifying Xenos and non compliant colonies of mankind. They begun to conquer at such frightening speed, they even outpaced Imperial reinforcements. And coincidentally, the delegation sent directly from the Imperial Palace. The greater the distance from terror and its influence, the more free Jagatai felt. It did not matter if he received less glory, less praise from his father, his legion, his culture and his way of life mattered more. They became a rumor, a legion who were gone before you could understand or interact with them. They were the superhumans, clad in white, bearing scars on their cheeks. Speaking in their strange tongue, they were the White Scars. Sanguinius came up to his brother, a goblet in each hand and handed one to the Khan. To fraternity, he said, raising his. The wine was unctuous, heavily spiced, no doubt priceless. You must accept my apologies, the angel said, gesturing towards two immense thrones carved from mahogany and capped with ivory. My herald was mistaken from the outset. They tell me that Star Hunter is a name no longer to be uttered. No apology needed, the Khan said, seating himself awkwardly opposite his brother. Despite himself, he could not help staring at the way the whispering wing quill settled around the angel as he reclined, like a shimmering cloak of silver pinions. It means nothing to us. White Scar, said Sanguinius, amused though not maliciously. Those are the two words now making us talk from Terra to Ultramar. Would it flatter you to know that you are a source of some fascination, brother? That there was a race among us to see who could corner you first? Not especially. No, I guess not. We were Talska. That was the origin of it. The Khan said, for some reason, sitting there in the presence of this dazzling, ethereal presence, he felt there should be some explanation. A livery now as it was on Chogoris is white. They misheard the first, they observed the second. Their words, not ours. Sanguinius shrugged. We are all made into images for them. That is our purpose, you might say. He leaned forward, conspiratorially. And between you and me... He flashed his impossibly handsome smile. I'm not really an angel. The Khan laughed at last. And such things are impossible. Or so our father told me. Yes, I had the same conversation with him, somewhat awkwardly in my case. Sanguinius took a sip of wine. I've been hunting you for a while, Jagatai. My compliments, your legion has learned some ship mastery. I thought my crews were good, but I believe yours could school them. We're used to staying on the move. Clearly, and the destruction of 9212. Impressive. Once I heard you had located the homeworld I made for it, expecting you to be there for some weeks. You fought them before? On Melchior. The knowledge that they are wiped out gives me satisfaction. And they are, I take it, exterminated. All of them, the Khan said darkly. Then I relish the prospect of never hearing them mentioned again. Sanguinius cradled his goblet in the palm of his hand, swilling it absent-mindedly. All Xenos are foul. But my sons developed a particular hatred for those. Then why were you not sent to destroy them? Your pardon? 
You had the measure of them. The Khan took a swig of his own. We used intelligence your legion had gathered. I wonder why you were not sent to finish the task. The angel shrugged. We had other battles. I've not been doing this for as long as you, but I'm not slow with it. He placed his goblet beside him and leaned forwards in the throne. We were sent there to witness the depravities of devotion. Through this we were enjoined to understand the wisdom of the Imperial Truth. You do not see the need for it. I'm yet to be convinced. I'd heard the rumors. This is where you tell me that I need to understand the necessity. That we shield them for their own good and that the deceptions are noble. For all that, they remain an illusion. Sanguinius said nothing for a while. He looked at his brother thoughtfully, the last of his smile dying away. You have psychers in your legion? He said at last. Of course. A librarius. Of a kind. Then that is already a refutation. The angel said. The populace can believe our powers are bounded by science. Even our generals, if they want to. We know it isn't. The Khan looked at his brother warily, as if cautious to avoid some kind of trap. And what do you suppose that leaves us with? I will not debate with you of gods and monsters, the angel said. But the Psyker cannot be avoided. Already there are those among us who wish to see them banished, shut away or blunted, lest they unlock something fouler within us. Those voices are growing stronger, despite what you may believe. My wayward brother, the throne listens to its sons. One day, if we are careless, we will lose all these things, and then we will be the ones at fault, for we did nothing. The Khan looked skeptical. I care nothing for what another Primarch does. They won't stop at their own legions. Sanguinius remained reclined, almost languid, his pristine golden robes catching the candlelight. For a Puritan, there is no comfort in scouring one's own house. All houses must be made clean. You are on your own, Jagatai, heading further into the void. An empire onto yourself, so you don't hear the whispers. And I care nothing for whispers. Sanguinius snorted. You should. I've seen worlds destroyed by them. Stop me, good people. Don't you see my temper is running away with me? Help, master common sense. Are you afraid? Good mistress, prudence, come to my aid. Stop me, conscience. Stop me, I pray. My temper, my temper is running away. Dear brother kindness, snatch after the reins. Help or my temper will dash out my brains. Help, or I'll get a terrible fall. Help, shame, caution, love, wisdom and all. I've never desired fellowship with any of you. Do not take that as pride, more like necessity. I find obligation to others difficult. Fraternity, all alone on Jagoris. Jagatai had seen that he was different from his people. He was more than just a mortal man. With the coming of the Emperor, that idea of being unique had changed forever. Twenty Primarchs, brothers, crafted from the Emperor's own genetic material. Superhumans destined to be the generals of the Great Crusade, reuniting humanity under one banner. As the decades passed in his service to the Imperium, it was inevitable that his past would cross with one of them, a brother, an equal. Horus had been there on Jogoris. The sight of him must have been intriguing. Just to be in his presence, you could feel his charisma shine. Horus saw beneath the facade of the savage, seeing the cunning, quiet intelligence. More interactions came over the decades. Sanguinius, Primarch of the Blood Angels, was an encounter hard to forget. 
his warming face, his ethereal presence. Something made even Jagatai, the calm and closed off man, want to speak. His brother had accepted his need for isolation, but warned that events inside the Imperium couldn't be ignored forever. And then Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Sons. Both Magnus and Jagatai's life had been shaped by sorcery. Magnus the Gifted One himself, the scholar who wielded the power of the warp to incredible heights. And Jagatai's life on Chogoris was guided and nurtured by his Zadrin Aga, the Storm Seers, the cultural rock of his people and their traditions, philosophy and way of life. He had been guided by Shinaz, perhaps his closest friend in the universe his teacher and mentor who followed him to the stars, becoming Targotai Yasuge. Jagatai respected Magnus, as the two had so much in common. To his other brothers, he was a mystery, something he intended to keep that way. Fraternity was obligation, and he had always wanted to escape obligation. Walls made him feel suffocated, be they physical or mental. Even his taste was different, compared to the lavish and ornate displays that every legion seemed to display in their weaponry, their armour and their ships. Simple stretched hides, Chagorian pelts and humble tribal food were the choice of the warhawk. Unlike many of his brothers, Jagatai had truly bonded to his people. To each Primarch and Jagatai, they'd always felt in some way removed from humanity. They were born rulers. They were saviors. They experienced the loneliness that comes from leadership, magnified by their magnanimous stature and earth-shattering presence. But to Jagatai, he did his best to be an equal. He was the Kagan but he never put himself beyond the scrutiny of those who served him. The Kurul Tai, a council where all were free to voice their thoughts as equals. A tradition born in the steppe and retained on the galactic scale. Despite being a Primarch, Targatai Yasuge, Quin Sha, Giyu Hun, and Hasek were more like brothers than sons. He had them and their council so he had no void in his heart to fill. They understood where the rest of the Imperium misunderstood. Even their livery of Tal Scar was lost to ignorance and disinterest. The outsiders named them White Scars because of their lack of understanding. The fifth sailed further and further into the void of the stars, content within their own company. As more worlds came under the shadow of the White Scars, Jagatai finally began to see more of what Malkador and the Emperor had tried to make him understand on terror. Old Night, the collapse of humanity's spanning federation across the stars. A wound in the psyche of the civilization that remembered those frightful days. One of the justifications for the Great Crusade was to protect the future of humanity to unify it under one banner, to protect it from a slow decay. Devoured by ourselves and the horrifying Xenos that hid in the dark corners of space, Chagoras' society had collapsed millennia before, reverting to a feudal-like existence where the scars of old night were forgotten. It was only within the Great Crusade did Jagatai finally understand the horrors of what Malkador had warned of. Xenos. They were disgusting. During the emancipation of Droon, they encountered a range of horrifying creatures of barely definable form. That all these creatures had in common, bloated bodies that floated on invisible etheric tides, multiple eyes, thrashing tendrils, and the ability to unleash fearsome blasts of warp energy as they threw hordes of mind-controlled humans at them, treating humanity as if it were a thing to be controlled, like mindless slaves, a trait Jagatai had despised in the kings and emperors on Chagoris. 
Perhaps the Emperor was right. Humanity had to be protected from this desecration and horror. But though many Xenos made the White Scars curse their name in disgust, for others they held a different view. Orcs, the Greenskins, the hulking beasts whose love of war matched the Tagorians. Whooping cheers of High Tagoris met a screaming green tide on thousands of worlds throughout the decades of the Great Crusade. To have a worthy foe was everything to them, and Jagatai and the White Scar's blades were slick with alien blood. Smiles dominated their faces as no test was more worthy. Though this fervor of slaughter that Jagatai and the Legion was bathing in would change in a sobering moment. Side by side, the White Scars and the Lunar Wolves stood, cleansing another Orc Horde. The campaign had been brutal, and the encirclement of the Orc's capital had taken weeks of mind-numbingly brutal warfare. Jagatai and his White Scars utilized their speed to break apart and disorientate the enemy's line, whilst the slow, unstoppable tide of the Lunar Wolves crushed the weakened and confused Orcs. Encircled and flattened by a mountain's worth of bombardment, the Imperial forces prepared for the final assault. With Quin Sha, Guyu Hun, and Hasek, and Sir Janus of the Lunar Wolves by his side, Jagatai raced into battle, a Primarch at the forefront of an unstoppable, lightning fast wedge. A movement he had taken from the plains and improved with the strength of Legiones Astartes. Fighting their way into the Orc's capital, the clash began. To stand at its center, the cacophony of noise, heat, and blood would overwhelm you. Fighting with every ounce of strength and ferocity, the Orcs were being pushed back until Giyu Han Khan, one of Jagatai's oldest friends, a man who had followed him from the plains to the stars, overextended. Jagatai screamed over the battle for him to pull back. First in, first out. The Giyu Han held. His wounds were pouring, and in the melee rush, he was knocked back, falling into the emerging magma pouring throughout the holes of the previously bombarded surface. Jagatai halted rushing over to catch the last moment of his friend, sinking into his blazing death. Jagatai stood frozen, and then with a scream that could shatter eardrums, he ordered everyone to pull away. Something had awoken within him. He broke into a run, first heavily, measuring his strokes, and then accelerating, faster and harder, until he had moved into that state the Chagorian sages called Alach Gech. The quiet smile had gone. The quiet cunning had gone. All that was left was the cold rage. His speed kept increasing. He became a blur, too fast for the human eye. He was a hidden behind a curtain of severed flesh and thrown blood. A primordial force burning through the ranks of Xenos. The Orcs, a dull-witted, primitive race whose only reason for life was war, began to run. Their encoded love for battle, overwhelmed by the onslaught. Eventually the screams faded away, and all that remained was Jagatai, covered in alien gore. It must have been like witnessing a god fight, breathtaking, haunting life-altering. It was the way we made you. The words of Malkador echoed in his mind. Stop me, good people. Don't you see? My temper is running away with me. Had they placed that rage within him? He was a son of Chagoris. Chagoris had made him, but perhaps he was more a creation of terror, more a designed tool. Yu Hun was dead. Others had passed over the numerous decades of the Great Crusade. But a friend? One of the men who had been by Jagatai's side since the beginning? 
He confided in Yasugai. They knew that many of them would perish in this war. In fact, death on the battlefield was a fate they all desired. Yet the sting still hurt. Even to the superhuman warriors. Even to a Primarch. Following the joint compliant action, Jagatai and the Legion returned to Jagoras. Quan Zhu, the Legion's fortress, built high in the Kum Katra Mountains, was the only speck of Imperial influence and industrialization. Jagatai had ensured that the people of Jagoras were left to their way of life. It kept them strong, ideal for recruitment, and their traditions were not swallowed up under the tide of Imperial conformity. For their Kagan to return, it was a time for celebration and rest. A brief time where Jagatai could still roam the plains once more, with Yasugai and Hasek, taking in the sensation of freedom that he had enjoyed so much in his youth. It had all changed so much. One thing that all of them, even Jagatai, struggled with was the passage of time. They were all older. They had now lived multiple human lifetimes. Everything dies. Words from Yasugai, Jagatai knew to be true, but deep down he knew he would outlive them all. Something that saddened him greatly. Returning to Quan Zhu, the Legion rested, even taking time to participate in its Chagorian traditions. Jubal Khan, a rising star within the Legion caught the eye of the Kagan, showing his prowess in an incredible duel, fighting with the methods of blinding speed and engaging and then falling back. Even his Chagorian was perfect, yet this was a son of terror. It was a hopeful sight. Jagatai's plan had worked, his unifying of the Star Hunters and the Talscar. But not all born of terror fit so neatly. Others, born in that distant world, found themselves to be outcasts and sought a place of belonging. A place where rank and homeworld didn't matter. A place in the warrior lodges. Some of us had it easier than others, Mortarian muttered. Fulgrim looked archly at Sanguinius. An awkward silence fell. You should not regret that, said the Khan. The other three turned, as if surprised that he had a voice. The hardship. Mortarian glared at him sourly. His pallid flesh almost matched Ulanor's overcast, humid skies. I don't regret it, he said. I could only regret that only some of us gained our father's favor, though. I could regret that. Sanguinius took a sip of wine from his glass, serenely unconcerned. Brother, you should be pleased for Horus. Why? Motarian's expression was pinched. Because he was found first, had the longest to work with his legion. If it had been you on Chthonia, if it had been me, we might have been in his place now. Fulgrim sniffed. Speak for yourself. Being War Master is not the only accolade. Sanguinius laughed. No more talk of your Palantine Aquila, brother. You will make him more jealous. I'm not jealous. Not of Horus. Nor of you. Scowled Mortarian, missing the humor in Sanguinius' voice. You don't understand the problem. Fulgrim leaned forward, clasping his long hands together. Which is? While he was leading us. We fought to gain even a glance or gesture from him. That was acceptable, for none of us are his rival. Nothing in the galaxy is his rival. Now we will fight to gain a glance from Horus. But Horus is not the architect of this. He is just one of us. It will lead to trouble. Fulgrim shot a tolerant look at Sanguinius. He is jealous. The Khan shook his head. Fulgrim could be irritatingly stupid. No, he speaks the truth. 
It should never have happened. Sanguinius looked at the Khan thoughtfully. I thought you, of all of us, would feel joy for Horus. The Khan shrugged. He is the best of us. I begrudge him nothing, and I have taught him so. But it should never have happened. So should it have been you? Asked Fulgrim. Acerbiacly, Motarian snorted again, but Sanguinius said nothing. I wouldn't have taken it, said the Khan. Of course you would have, said Fulgrim. The Khan shook his head. I have no use for another title. My people give me enough. Sanguinius smiled. My brother, I think you are the most inscrutable of us all. I know what Rogel wants, and I know what Rebute wants, but... Even after so long, I have no idea what you want. He wants to be left alone, said Fulgrim. To shoot off into the stars and hunt down Xenos on those delightful jet bikes. They're devilishly fast. I heard from a contact on Mars, Yagatai, that you do strange things to your ships. The Khan shot him a heavy-lidded stare. I heard you do strange things to your warriors. Fulgrim's slender face briefly flared with anger, but Sanguinius laughed. I wonder which one of you would win in a duel. The angel mused. Name the place, brother, Fulgrim said to the Khan. I'd even travel to Chogorus, if you built a palace to keep the dust from my armor. The Khan felt the insult. It stabbed at him, deeply, but his expression never changed. They could never know, none of them, how much their close fraternity rankled him. You would lose, said the Khan. Fulgrim grinned, but there was something fragile in it. Oh? You would lose because you treat it like a game, like you treat everything, and I would not. You would lose because you know nothing of me, and I know everything of you because you shouted from the turrets of your battle cruises. My prowess remains unknown. You have some reputation as a swordsman, brother. But I make no boast when I tell you. I would leave you choking on it. Fulgrim's cheeks flushed. For a moment, he looked like he would go for his blade. As ever, Sanguinus' calm smile soothed the moment. Now I regret bringing this up. In the cause of peace, shall we put this stupidity behind us? We are not at war, and never likely to be, and that is truly a blessing. Who'd have thought it? Said Mortarian to the Khan, a shrewd glint in his rumory eyes. You do have your pride. As do you. Then what would be the wager on us, brother? Asked Mortarian. What would you pay if we fought? The Khan sighed. No. I grow tired of- Tell me. Mortarian insisted. Or do you only consider the odds with sword dancers? The Khan stared back at him. As he did so, he realized that, of all his seventeen brothers, Mortarian was the only one who, like him, had remained on the utter margins during the Great Crusade. Even Alpharius had played more of a role at its center. The Death Lord was as mysterious to him as the Warp. Intriguing. I don't know. He said, truthfully enough. It would be interesting to find out. Mortarian laughed then, but what could be seen of his expression was crooked. His whole face seemed arranged for dourness, as if levity risked cracking it. That it would. But we have nothing to fight over you and I, so breathe easy. No. Ah, Sanguinius. Seriously this time. Not even the Librarius. The crooked smile faded. That's different. The angel took another sip of his wine. How so? You've not heard the news then. Our father has taken the matter in hand. I know you take your creation seriously, but you must know it couldn't be suffered to go on. Fulgrim looked intrigued. What do you mean, taken in hand? There will be a reckoning. The Death Lord shot a wry glance at the Khan, as though reveling in some secret knowledge that would become public very soon. I'll be there when it happens. 
I hope you will be there too. Some fights are too important to be left to advocates. Nearly two centuries of warfare. Thousands of worlds conquered and millions of Xenos and non-compliant colonies have been slain. It was in the ashes of the Imperium's greatest victory over an enormous Greenskin War that the Imperium changed forever. Ulanor, cleansed of alien filth at the dawn of the 32nd millennium, held a muster of billions of superhuman and mortal warriors. Horus Lupercal, Primarch of the Lunar Wolves, was named Warmaster. The Emperor himself handed the responsibility of the Great Crusade to his most favoured son. It was a mistake. Jagatai had seen the fate of emperors who stood back, how depraved, corrupt and selfish they became. Why did his father leave the conquest? Why did he not tell them why? More lies he knew was justified under the guise of doing what they thought was best for humanity. The dynamic had changed forever. At a time when Jagatai had needed a brother, a friend, not a superior officer. The Librarius, the Chagorian Stormseers, the backbone of Chagoris, their guides from the plains all the way to the stars were under threat. A divide had been growing over the latter decades of the Great Crusade. Those such as Lehman Russ and Mortarian, who felt an utter disgust towards those who drew on the powers of the warp. Even Corvus Corax and Rogel Dawn were adverse. Many lie in the middle, but it was Jagatai, Sanguinius and Magnus who were their most arduent defenders. Jagatai had been reluctant to plant himself within the politics of the Imperium, but Sanguinius decades ago had convinced him to fight for his Stormseers lest the decision be made in his absence. Over the latter part of the Great Crusade, Jagatai and Yasuge had tried to show Horus the necessity of having psychers in their arsenal, displaying on numerous campaigns his Stormseer's effectiveness, encountering other Xenos psychers. But the chance had been lost. Horus was now Warmaster, the commander the one who could not be shown to pick sides or have favourites. Jagatai had lost an ally, but he could also feel he was losing a friend. There was a chasm between him and Horus, a distance bred from the hierarchy. They could both feel it. Fraternity was obligation. That old feeling kept creeping in as Jagatai left the muster of Ulanor, frustrated and disheartened, though he did not leave alone. Ilia Ravalion, a member of the Departmento Munistorum, was assigned to the Fifth Legion at the dawn of this new era. The elderly woman, born on terror, with a photographic memory, proved to be adept at all things logistical. She was a counterbalance to a legion that already had its eyes upon the next target, often overlooking what was left behind. Jagatai and Ilya over the coming years forged a bond. Over drinking wine and playing Go together, Jagatai, the free-spirited superhuman, were the orderly Terran-born mortal. Though the presence of the Primarch had made her feel nauseous and even lightheaded in the beginning, the elderly general was able to look Jagatai in the eye, to stand face to face and offer her wisdom and experience, something that became invaluable in the coming campaign. Chondax, the fortress world inhabited by the remnants of the vile greenskins that had fled Ulanor. The beginning of the grueling campaign aligned with the reckoning Jagatai's mysterious brother Mortarian had spoken of, the Council of Nicaea. Assembled from the highest bureaucrats, senior Astra Militarum, and a representative from all of the Adeptus Astartes legions, the Fabricator General of Mars, 
Malkador, and even the Emperor. The building debate in the shadows finally surfaced. The Librarius, Psychers, and their sanctioning in the Imperium had to be dealt with. Two sides had been drawn. Magnus, the Blood Angels, and Jagatai, the Librarius. Targetai, Yasuge, and all those on their side spoke vehemently for the justification of psychic powers. But everything came tumbling down with the revelation of Magnus' arrogance that he had delved into warp sorcery. He had gone too far. The pro psychers failed, Yusugai feeling immense guilt for failing his friend and Primarch. The accumulation of decades of work, the crafting of a new librarious rules created by Jagatai, Sanguinis, and Magnus had gone. Jagatai had often warned Magnus of his need to push limits, and now its cost was the Chagorian's way of life. But the message wouldn't reach the Kagan. Horrific warp storms began to form around Chondax. It made Ilya uncomfortable. But Jagatai, in truth, was all too pleased to be out of range, forgotten, misunderstood, left alone. With Quinn Shah, Hasik, and his white scars, and a green tide in front of them, the Fifth Legion headed to war. I fear decrepitude, because all emperors are liars, all empires are lies. But there is only one unforgivable lie. That is the lie that says this is the end. You are the conqueror. You have achieved it, and now all that remains is to build walls higher and shelter behind them. Now, the lie says, the worlds are safe. It is not enough to take from an enemy their life, rather take from them also their place of safety, their allies, their homes and their loved ones. Crush all those in their care, lay their chattels to waste and then drive them alone and naked into the darkness. Take everything they have and burn it, for the mere pleasure of seeing the ash crackle between your fingers and call it nothing more than a beginning. Chondax, the remnants of Ulrak Uruk's Greenskin Empire, would prove to be a bloody battle for the Fifth. With horrific warp storms surrounding the sector of space, this was a war solely down to the White Scars. Jagatai, Ilya, Hasik, and Quinn Shah. For seven years, the Fifth Legion fought in a back and forth grueling campaign. The difficulties of the terrain being mountainous and marshy, the crux of their usual fast-paced encirclement maneuvers. And yet more seemed to be at play. Some, such as Shiban Khan of the Brotherhood of the Moon felt that there was something wrong. Something wasn't sitting right. He had found legionaries with their wounds too clean for an orc's work. It was as if they were fighting something greater than the mindless war before them. Jagatai spent much of his time with his council, though he missed the guidance of his friend Yasugai. He found that his thoughts lay more towards the future. The Great Crusade was now expanding to the edges of the galaxy. After Chondax, what great holdouts were there? What if they had no more enemies left? After his conquest of Chagoris centuries ago, he had not settled down, placed himself on a throne, built walls, and told himself that he was safe because it was a lie, and he despised lies. Something that had created so much distance between him and his father, but he only really feared one thing in this universe, decrepitude. The Emperor had arrived not long after his conquest of Chagoris. What would he have done in a time of peace? It was the way we made you. The words of Malkador. They had made him a hunter. Conquest was in his blood. They had made him 
they had made him uncomfortable with peace, lest in a way he fall to corruption. To live without purpose as humans leads us all down a spiraling path. What would you do if that hollowness took over you? Would you lie to yourself and say that you are strong when there is no goal to achieve? But perhaps that fear would never come to pass in a manner that Jagatai would have never suspected. After years of brutal war, Jagatai and the White Scars finally achieved victory. But at the precipice of this campaign, a fleet belonging to the 20th, the Alpha Legion burst from the warp, assembling before the 5th Legion. Any communication was met with pure, dreaded silence. Two Astartes fleets stared at each other. Ashopathic communications began to flood in through the tumultuous warp storms. Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves had turned traitor. Magnus the Red and his thousand sons had been slain. The homeworld of Prospero destroyed. The Warmaster orders the 5th Legion to engage the traitor and bring him to justice. Madness. Jagatai's mind began racing. His friend Magnus, was he truly dead? Russ was a traitor. So much power concentrated in so few hands. Look at this madness. Attention spread across the thousands of White Scar warriors and legionary personnel. The possibility of fighting another legion, the horror that battle would entail was a sobering thought. More Ashopathic communications came through. Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fist orders the White Scars to return to Terra and defend it alongside the Space Wolves. The War Master has turned traitor. More came flooding in. Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves request the White Scars aid against the Alpha Legion. They have turned traitor. Someone was lying. Was this Alpha Legion blockade the deception? Did they want Jagatai to return to terror? Did Russ speak the truth? And they were being held above Chondax? Or were the 20th simply waiting to see which side the 5th chose? Jagatai hated the lies. Perhaps none of them were speaking the truth. They were the 5th, the White Scars, Ordu Jagatai, and they were slaves to no one. He would find the truth for himself. The stalemate ended. The forgotten and underestimated legion in a move synchronized to perfection that would leave even the mighty Gilliman and Dawn jealous launched the entire legionary fleet at once. The coordination, the skill was incredible. Finally, after years of serving by their side, Ilya, the Terran outsider finally saw why Jagatai and his sons had allowed themselves to be underestimated. And the sight brought her to genuine laughter. The chisel, an instant, tightly formed wedge burst through the Alpha Legion blockade. Their destination, the truth. Jagatai made his way to Prospero. After days, unnerved, trying to decipher the truth, the White Scars finally arrived, only to find a husk. Pollutants, smog, and a violent storm filled the ruined skies of this once beautiful world of Prospero. Not just the people and the cities, but the planet itself had been annihilated. Jagatai felt the cold rage. He felt sadness and confusion. He had to know more. He had to know the truth. Jagatai, with Quinn Shah and his Keshik by his side, descended down to the crumbling, burnt surface. He had hoped to find the truth. He had hoped to find his brother. Leaving the fleet to his friend, Hasek Noyan Khan, hands he would soon find were not to be trusted. No. The Khan stood up again. Whatever you are, you are not Magnus. You don't even sound like him. Magnus shrugged. Believe what you want. Perhaps I am not Magnus. I used to be. 
that is certain. But maybe what counts as myself is not what it was. Part of me dwells elsewhere, on a barren rock halfway across the cosmos. Part of me is here, lingering like a stench of a carrion. I can't quite leave, not yet. I think something has to happen first. Maybe you are it, or maybe you were never meant to be here. I favor the latter. You were always unpredictable. I came to find a friend, said the Khan distastefully. Whatever else had happened, I thought I could come to you for counsel. Magnus looked hurt. Do not be harsh, Kagan. Only a part of me resides here, slinking in the shadows. The better part is elsewhere, pondering loftier things. Soon, he, or I, or we, will come to a judgment. What will that be? I don't know. I really don't. Lorgar sends me pleas almost daily, reminding me what Russ did here. He thinks we are kindred spirits. Touching, really. Magnus paused and stared down at his flickering hands. Sometimes, though, I still think there might be some way back. I see it as a maze, one in which all I have to do is find the route through. Perhaps the Emperor will forgive. If he survives what I've unleashed, perhaps he will. Then Magnus's spectral eye flickered up at the Khan again. But you, Yagatai, what is your choice? The Khan shook his head. We are who we are. No one slaves. Magnus laughed. <laughs> That's not good enough. You have to choose. If what you say is true, then the dream is over. It will be each legion alone. It doesn't work like that. Horus corrupted. The Emperor is a tyrant. True enough. Then I choose neither. Magnus laughed again, though the sound was bitter. <laughs> this thing is like a great dark star, ringed by fire. It will draw you in, bit by bit, until you are orbiting it with the rest of us. Even you do not have ships fast enough to escape it, Yagatai. Even your white scars will not get out. The Khan felt sick from the stink of death and ashes. His blade glittered coldly in the near-perfect dark. We can outrun anything that lives. But they do not live. Not like we do. I do not lie, brother. Choose. We will meet again, either as allies or foes, so you may as well decide now." The Khan stared down at Magnus, his mind in turmoil. What have you become? He asked, no longer able to keep the horror from his voice. What I was always destined to be, said Magnus, looking at him sadly. But you still have a choice, brother. Make the right one. The Khan held his ground, tensing. Enough, brother. Magnus laughed. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> That's always been your weakness. I know it all now. I could tell you the Emperor's name, and it would surprise you. I could tell you that the fates decreed Fulgrim to be sent to Chogoris, and you to Kemos. And I could tell you which arcane force in the universe prevented it. He took a step, then another towards the Khan. Do you wish to know where you will die, Kagan? Do you wish to know on what world and in which dimension your soul will find its ending? These things are not known. All is known. The Khan looked at him warily. You told me I had a choice. My fate, all fate, is still to be written. Magnus grinned. His eye seemed to be weeping, though it was hard to tell if it was tears or blood. Stories may meander, but the endings never change. Believe me, I have witnessed the authors. He shuddered. They are terrible. He whispered, by now only inches away from the sword. I... I have what I came for, brother, said the Khan. 
You can only give me one piece of knowledge that I truly desire. Magnus inclined his head. And what is that? How to restore you. Magnus stared. For a moment, he looked truly bewildered, as if he had expected mockery and received sincerity, or perhaps the other way round. He looked down at his hands, then around at the devastation of his kingdom. Misery mingled with confusion. I am corrupted, he whispered, as if realizing it all over again. Restore me, and I shall become a lord again. I shall be the Crimson King, free to rule over a world of spells and vengeance. The galaxy may live to rue that. You are my friend, said the Khan quietly. Magnus looked at him, and for a moment, just a moment, the old dignity was there, etched upon a ravaged face and glimmering in the dark. Then... I judge you know what to do. The Khan nodded and pulled his sword round for the strike. Slivers of witch light skittered along the ruined wound steel. Until we meet under starlight, he promised. Sooner than you might think, said Magnus, making no effort to evade the blow. The Khan swung and the Dao glittered through the air. When it hit Magnus's outline, the ghostly shell shattered spilling into a thousand pieces like broken glass. A wild crack ran out, a steely snap, followed by a shriek like a child's cry. The dust around him billowed up in the cloud, swirling and writhing. The Khan was momentarily blinded and staggered back. Never do the easy thing. An apparition, a shard, a broken piece of a hole that was once his friend, was all that remained of Magnus. Just as Prospero had been burned to ashes, ravaged and broken, so had the Thousand Sons and their Primarch. Roaming through the wreckage of Prospero, with Quinn Shah and his Keshig, Jagatai found himself set upon by strange ethereal monsters. And in the confusion, he was separated, falling deep into the tunnel systems built below the crumbling city of Tizka, finding a ghost of what was or is Magnus. The sight broke him. He had come to find a friend, but only found the husk of the brother he had respected and even loved. The shard of Magnus told him that time had run out that he had to choose. He'd always run away, relying on his speed to outrun his problems. But this war would find him and his sons. He had to choose. Choose a side. With all the cards on the table, with the Shard's wisdom, the truth was out. The Emperor had lied. Yaksha, demons were real. And Jagatai had to make a choice. But what kind of choice was it? The words rang in his head. Horus is corrupted. The Emperor is a tyrant. Foul entities of the warp had corrupted the brother he loved, Horus. But he would be accepted by them. A life of unending conquest awaited him and his sons. But humanity would suffer. The Emperor is a tyrant. One who lies to his people, crushing thousands of worlds under the guise of compliance. The Imperium looked down upon him and his sons, but there was a future for humanity under the Imperium. So I fight for a father who I never loved, against a brother that I did. I defend an empire that never wanted me, against an army that would have taken me in a heartbeat. Jagatai made his choice, putting the Shard of Magnus to rest and escaping out of the depths, he reunited with Quinn Shah and his remaining Keshig, who had rescued one lone survivor from the ruins of Prospero, Revial Arvida, a psyche of immense power. But as they prepared to return to their vessel, 
The storm-riddled skies darkened. A teleportation circle erupted before them as Mortarion, Primarch of the Death Guard, emerged. Surrounded by his Death Shroud Guard, the sight of the pale, sickly thing whose rebreather rattled like death's music was a sight that would fill any mortal with reverence and dread. The brother who he had last seen above Ulanor, the one who, like him, had been assigned to the outskirts of the Great Crusade, forgotten, misunderstood. Mortarion began to speak, to offer his brother the chance to join Horus, destroy the Emperor who lies. Oh, and he hated the lies, didn't he? He offered a galaxy of warriors, a galaxy of hunters, where the strong are given their freedom. A galaxy in which there is no dead hand at the tiller, constraining them, lying to them. Besides, half of his legion had already been turned, so it was only a matter of time. But Jagatai stopped him. He had seen through him his mysterious brother. He had campaigned against the Psyker, only to now find himself in collusion with them, legions embracing the warp. He was not here because of brotherhood, he was here because he had no more allies. The Death Guard, the slow, indestructible anvil, with the white scars, the perfect, swift hammer, they would be unstoppable together. And when the Emperor and Horus were gone, there could be space for a new Emperor. Jagatai felt nothing but disgust for this selfish betrayal, and he would not be dragged down with them. They had chosen to collude with foul entities of the warp. They were fools. And besides, long ago, the oath had already been made. Matarian's sickle crackled into life, and the two sides clashed. The slow but yet resilient Mortarian versus the lightning fast Kagan. It was like a battle between gods. Jagatai's blinding speed and dancing strikes began to tally wounds. The Khan laughed, wielding his blade again freely felt good. Going up against a fellow Primarch was a kind of test he had missed for too long. But for the first time in his life, Jagatai felt tiredness. Mortarion stood bloodied, dozens of wounds covered him, but the few that he had landed on Jagatai were punishing, toxin-laden gashes. A stalemate had been reached. Mortarion, enraged and bitter, began to retreat. The Death Lord pledged that this wound between them was not over, and that one of them would die at the other's hands. With the help of the Thousand Sun Rivial Arvida, Jagatai, Quinn Shah, and the remaining Keshig teleported back onto their flagship, only to find utter chaos. The Warrior Lodges, that secretive organization that had festered for decades amongst the Legions, had risen up. Declaring themselves for Horus, for the War Master, for the universe of warriors and hunters. Thousands of the Terrans and Chagorians, either by resentment for their forced conversion into the Chagorian way of life, or simply convinced by the universe painted by Horus, have been turned in secret. Hasik Noyan Khan, a man who had been with Jagatai from the start, had tried to force the Legion's hand, force them into the future of warriors and hunters. Horror gripped Jagatai, seeing the carnage of the 5th Legion's civil strife. Brothers slaying brothers. Striding through the middle of the bloodbath, the fighting began to die down. As Jagatai roared his disgust at his friend's betrayal, he plunged his Dao sword deep into the panicking Hasik's torso, declaring this coup over. Humbled and shamed, the traitors were escorted to the brigs as Zagatai and the fifth prepared for war. Betrayed by one of his closest friends, a man who he had spent centuries with, was a bitter snag at the heart of Jagatai. 
though some relief came as he was finally reunited with Yasugai. Seven years the Kagan had been deprived of his chief Stormseer, his closest advisor, his friend. Locked within the disaster that had been the Council of Nikea and the subsequent warp storms around Chondax, the traitors were dealt with. Hasik and thousands of others were locked away. They all deserved death. But it was Yasugai who counseled that the previous Warrior Lodge members, the Terrans and Chagorans, be offered a route to redemption. They were charged with the crime of being fools as well as traitors, not truly knowing the extent to which the War Master Horrors had fallen. It was due in part to the bravery of such men as Shiban Khan, who had held long enough for Jagatai to end the civil conflict. The Sagyar Mazan, Death Squads, a road to redemption was offered, for in this coming war they would need every able-bodied warrior. The Horus Heresy had truly begun. Nine legions had betrayed the Emperor of Mankind, declaring their loyalty to the War Master Horus. Three Loyalist legions, the Salamanders, the Raven Guard and Iron Hands were almost entirely wiped. The remaining six Loyalists either scattered or divided as war and violent warp storms ravaged the galaxy. What began was the most brutal war in human history. Billions of innocents would die, legionaries slaughtering each other, worlds burning. Again the words burned in Jagatai's mind. Never had so few been given so much power. It was a mistake, an emperor's mistake. One caused when his father believed the lie. The lie that tells you you can put up walls and you will be safe. Jagatai, Yasugai, Quin Sha, Ilya, Shiban, Jubal, and Revial Arda of the Thousand Sons began to enact their wrath upon the traitor legions. The fingers of the Fifth Legion branched off, enacting their grip across light years of real space. With lightning fast hit and run tactics, isolated traitor fleets would be destroyed, supply lines harassed, equipment sabotaged. Each small piece adding up to a delay. Time for the Imperial forces at Terra to fortify. They all knew that the palace would be where this would end. Years of non-stop, brutal warfare consumed humanity. But its cost to Jagatai and the White Scars was more than just their brother's lives. The soul of the Legion was dying. The heresy was changing them. They were fighting men who they had once served with, men who they had bled with, watching them cut down their own brothers in brutal legionary upon legionary duels. Jagatai and the Fifth had come from a world where the beauty and adrenaline pumping, life affirming combat was something they lived for. Hunting Xenos across the stars, feeling the wind rush on their face, the freedom and joy of the plains taken to the stars. But there was no more joyous laughing, no more whooping cries, no more cheek to cheek smiles, just brutal human slaughter. Members such as Shiban Khan, encouraged by his Primarch's ethos of the noble pursuits, found he had nothing to celebrate, nothing noble to express. Killing was one thing, they had been bred to do that, but inflicting pain, hurting their enemies, this war had changed them. Jagatai had not brought his people to the stars for this. Their enemies had changed too, taken over by worship to the Yaksha. Their corruption manifested physically, a sobering reminder of a path Jagatai could have gone down if his love for horrors had eclipsed his sense. Four years of no rest, nearly one third of Jagatai's sons were dead. Then the worst news of all came, in a confrontation with Eidolon of the Emperor's children. Quinn Shah was dead, his body recovered in thanks to the efforts of Revial Arvida. 
a debt the Legion could never repay. With his friend's broken helm in his hands, as Quinshaw's body was cast into the void of space, returned to the universe, as was the Chagoran way, Jagatai felt the grief wash over him. Chagorians knew that to die in battle was a glorious end they all desired, but this was tainted in a way. Jagatai assembled the Kuraltai, a place for all to speak. All of them, Jagatai, Yasugai, Ilya, Shiban, Jubal, and Arvida, with Quinshar's death still in their hearts, debated on the Legion's next move. The walls were closing in. The traitors had them in a noose. They had adapted to the fifth's tactics, and now it was costing them. Half wanted to make a final stand, bearing the weight of melancholic soldiers hoping to die a good death. But Yasugai and Ilya urged them to find a way to terror. They could still fight. Jagatai made his decision. The oath had been made. The White Scars would stand on terror. The Fifth Legion assembled everything they had and headed towards their last gambit. The location of a powerful navigator who could guide them through the warp storms, terrorizing the galaxy. But the journey would not be smooth. Mortarian, the wound created on Prospero, had reopened. With the Death Guard Legion and a force of Emperor's children, the brothers prepared to face each other once again. Only hatred and disgust left between them. See the sorrow in someone's tearful eyes, or see the dread in someone's weary frown. Can you not see the fear when someone's telling lies? Can you not see that each poor soul has a heavy cross to bear? One which we hope will never come our way. Perhaps the onus is on us to show them that we care and lift their spirits and take away dismay. The command locate Yusugai died on his lips, with a synchronicity that could not have been random. The Stormseer's mind voice was suddenly there, though racked with agony. In the beginning, I was Shinaz, Yusugai said, managing to convey some kind of broken humor amid the pain. Remember that? You named me. Do not do it. The Khan murmured, his mind racing, guessing at last what had happened. The machinery, the under palace, the absence of his father from the war. With sudden, terrible clarity, the pieces fell into order. Is this my command? Do not do it. The deep ways are perilous, and Yaksha will thrive in it. You are the protector. The Khan was moving then, striding down from the command throne. The teleporters might have been usable, even now. Targutai, this will end you. Do not do it. Return to the ship. No, that I would have followed you to the end, my lord. I would have stood beside you on Terra. When I am gone, do not let them forget. Do not let them become. What is hateful? Come back. You are their protector. Then he was gone, wrenched out of existence. Jagatai staggered, slipping to one knee. The world seemed to sway, not from its axis. He looked up, and the entire bridge was tilting, falling. Ilya was screaming. The Prosperine Saucer was crying aloud. The warriors of the Sagyar Mazan were looking out into the void, ushering in the final battle. His legion was dying, thrust at last into the forge fire of war, out of space, out of time. I still need you. The Khan cast his head back, his imperious reserve broken open. He clenched his fist to their heavens and howled out his rage and his grief 
and for a sparse moment, there were no more sounds, no more thoughts, only the black thunder of a Primarch's mortal fury. Kargan! He called out, as if waking from a nightmare-plagued sleep. The Khan stood and turned towards him. This is it, Arvida said. The path of heaven. He has opened it. There will never be another chance. The Khan was sluggish, his mind elsewhere. The rest of the Briz crew recovered themselves, restoring systems that had been primed for imminent attack. Out across the Aether racked vacuum, the enemy was similarly recovering. My lord, we must take it. Arvida was conscious of the danger. The change still poured at him, prowling around the edges of his self, watching for any weakness. The portal was the warp in its rawest, deepest form. It would be murderous, but it had to be attempted. You saw no victory. I did not. The Primarch stared at the recovering scanner screens, at the enemy fleet that was bearing down on them again, barely halted by the tumult across the fabric of space. A choice remains. Ilya burst between them. The trails of angry tears were wet on her cheeks. There is no choice, she hissed, her eyes flashing with anger. He did this. Honor him. Take the path. Still, he hesitated. The battleships were turning back towards them. Last cannon had started up again, slicing across the warp-lit abyss. The Endurance had carved its way into range, immolating anything that dared to block its passage. It was on the edge of sight now, unmagnified. Colossal, its coming marked the spoilation and heralded by despair. Only one ship could hope to stand against it. If the Legion turned now, if the order were given, then the retreat would be a bloodbath. Something needed to hold the line. I have to face him, the Khan said quietly. You do not, raged Ilya, her grief making her wild. Lord, if you fight him. The chance will be gone, urged Arvida. There will be other days. Not for Targultai, roared the Khan, suddenly bursting into fury. Not for Shah. My warriors have died for me this day, and every day since my horse and brother ignited this treachery. I have watched them die year by year, their strength taken from them. No further. I will slay him if I do nothing else. Arvida waited for the tirade to subside. To withstand the rage of an emperor's son, even one cast into doubt by grief, was no trivial feat. Yet he never moved away. The way is clear. I can guide us if you let me. He paused, breathing hard, knowing the peril. The rift was already beginning to close, its edges falling away back into real space as Yasugai's soul was consumed. Our destiny is on Terra. Your destiny is on Terra. A tense silence fell across the bridge, broken only by the sounds of battle preparation from the decks below. Ilya waited, desperate, her face white. Torgun and the other Sagyar Mazan waited, still armed, making no move. Arvida waited, the Council of Stormseers waited, as did Jubal and the assembled Keshik. The Primarch looked out onto the onrush of the enemy, his hand strayed to the hilt of his tolwa, and still he said nothing. No one moved. The maelstrom churned, sucking matter into its ravening jaws. The Death Guard came into Lance range, and the first tracks of the macro cannon blast appeared on the augers. The Khan did not look at Arvida, he did not look at Ilya, nor at Namihai, nor Jubal. Eventually, he turned to Taban. Order all ships into the rift, full burn, he said, then his gaze strayed to the real view ports, to where Mortarion's flagship loomed ever larger, a silhouette of decay against the tempest of the war. The truth will come out. You won't be able to hold the blindfold in place, and once it slips, the fury of those you deceived will be limitless. Isugai, his oldest friend, 
his soldier on Jogoris, his storm seer, his compass for his people's way of life, surrounded on all sides as the fleet was being ripped apart. Yusugai sacrificed his life, emulating his own body to open a rift into the webway. That ancient pathway, crafted in a time before humanity was primordial soup. Finding the last of his strength, the man, Targetai Yusuge, bade farewell to his closest friends, Ilya, Arvida, and his Kagan, Jagatai. He entrusted Jagatai to protect the Legion, to save them from the hatred and melancholy that was eroding them, and to stand on terror to defend humanity. The webway opened as Yasugai's soul left this universe. The Legion began to barrel into the rift, but they were set upon. Motarian was gunning for his brother. Jagatai wanted to fight. The cold rage began bubbling. How many friends had he lost? How many sons have spilled their blood? How much had he sacrificed? How could he let that go unavenged? But Ilya's words reached him. He couldn't let the sacrifice of all of them, Yasugai, Quinn Shah, and all the others be in vain. The white scars powered towards the portal. The Sagyar Mazan, the Death Squads who had once betrayed their Kagan, earned their redemption, using their lives to buy time for the others to escape. The guilt of letting more of his sons die for him burned in Jagatai, but the Sagyar Mazan were smiling, rediscovering their love of battle as they threw themselves upon the Death Lord Mortarian. The White Scars raced through the webway, only to be set upon by their enemy's last attack. The Yakshar, demons of the Chaos God Slanesh tore through. Their disgusting, pale, emaciated, accentuated, twisted forms, the embodiment of depravity. Led by a singular, enormous beast, a greater demon, a keeper of secrets. The creatures of Chagorian myth and nightmare, the entities the Emperor had Malkador claimed were lies, stood before them. Yet these waking nightmares did not find scared little humans before them. They found a force who had been battered, bloodied, and honed by centuries of war, and a near decade of civil conflict. Jagatai and the White Scars had suffered enough and they unleashed themselves upon the Yakshar. No fear was in any of their hearts as they screamed Hi Chagoris and for the Kagan. Shiban, Jubal and the others barreled into the Slaneshi demons and Jagatai faced the Keeper of Secrets, the Greater Demon. The duel was a mind-numbing blur, the speed of both of them impossible to follow. Jagatai began to decimate the strange, humanoid, chitinous form, but taking equally painful, goring wounds. Breaking his sword upon the sentient nightmare, Jagatai switched to his bare hands, unleashing the cold raid that had terrified even orcs long ago. He screamed in the Yakshar's face, there is nowhere left to hide. We know you now. We shall hunt you in every plane of reality. We shall cleanse the void, and then we shall cleanse the warp. And then, with his bare hands, he tore the demon's heart from his chest, roaring for the Emperor. The White Scars had survived. Nearly half of them had fallen since the heresy had started. They had lost many friends and brothers, but finally the Legion limped to terror. The oath had been made, and now it had been honored, and his friends and sons had bought it with their blood. Even as an enraged Lehman Russ, who Jagatai had ignored his calls for aid at Chondax years ago, couldn't stop him from bringing his legion where they were destined to be. Reuniting with Sanguinius, 
Rogal Dawn, Lehman Russ, and Malkador, Jagatai and his men found a moment to gather themselves, to heal from the hell that they had been through. It was also a time to ponder. He had never been close with his father. Their interactions had always been awkward at best. He deep down knew that part of him hated him because he was an emperor, because of the lies he was told to uphold, lies he had to conquer the galaxy to enforce. It was now, with all the cards on the table, that he had begun to understand. Can you not see the fear when someone's telling lies? Can you not see that each poor soul has a heavy cross to bear? It was a war started and perpetuated by lies. The lies about the warp, about why the Emperor had left the crusade in Horus's hands. Perhaps even the nature of what he and the Primarchs truly were. But beneath it all, it disturbed him. Because he had begun to understand. Perhaps the onus is on us to show them that we care and lift their spirits and take away dismay. There was a burden involved. His father lied about the warp to deny it power. He lied about leaving the Great Crusade to work on the Webway Project, a path to sever humanity's reliance on the warp. He had lied to his sons as to not burden them. He carried it, and now Jagatai would have to carry a great burden too. The War Master, after nine years of brutal conflict, had arrived in the Soul System, and the Siege of Terror had begun. The gods demand entertainment, the demand trial and contest. We could not be allowed to defeat our own demons, for that would be boring. And boredom is the only thing Eternals fear. We are being lined up, one by one, to tear at each other's throats. I do not think they wish to see a victor. I think they wish us to fight forever, locked in madness until the universe's end. Nine years of war had led to this moment. The War Master's fleet entered the Soul System. The birthplace of humanity would be the stage for the fight for its very existence. The gambit of Lehman Russ, the assassination of Horus, had failed. Only Rogal Dawn, Jagatai, Sanguinius, the Emperor, and the billions of ordinary, superhuman and mortal people stood in the traitor's path to victory. Engaging in a layered defense, the loyalists made sure that every inch taken cost the traitors lives and resources. But in turn, this was brought with immense sacrifice. Jubal Noyan Khan, Lord of Summer Lightning, fell in the orbital fleet warfare slain by the accursed Abaddon, right hand of Horus. Over weeks, the traitor forces smashed through, darkening the skies of terror. The now corrupted and traitorous Primarch stood over the world that had created them, and they prepared to burn it, to take their so-called father's head. Jagatai, Son of Chagoris, the man who hated wars, the man who had destroyed them, from Chagoris to the stars, found himself defending them, defending the lie of safety. Millions of people trapped inside the palace had spent the last nine years fortifying their home. The Imperial Palace had become a maze of bastions, trench works, and reinforced banks. Dawn had ensured that it was damn near impregnable. But what good were walls when hell itself had come knocking? The War Master's forces began their assault upon the walls. Within Dawn's layered defense structure, he had forbid Jagatai from venturing outside. But Jagatai refused. 
How could they just sacrifice the millions of ordinary humans, the men and women who had just taken up a rifle in the defense of their home, to sacrifice them just for time? It was the right strategic move, but devoid of human emotion. Jagatai R. Sanguinius, if his prescience saw that his intervention would save lives. The angel replied, many. And then Jagatai told them that that was what he was made for. Jagatai had changed. He was a strategist to equal even Dawn. But the cost of this move was more than just those people's lives. It was their souls. We fought the great crusade to free humanity, not to sacrifice it. He was not like the young Khan who destroyed an entire village when his father's death called for vengeance. He was more, more than just a conqueror. Isugai had seen it. He was a protector. Jagatai prepared to ride out. His life and his son's lives were in dedication to humanity. They were meant to die in their place. Perhaps Horus was exploiting this but the cost of abandoning people that could be saved would be worse. Worse than death. Worse than if the traitors were victorious. It was the way we made you. The Emperor had made him a conqueror. Chagoras had made him a Kagan. But he had made himself more. A defender of humanity. The White Scars, the sons of Chagoras, assembled on their jet bikes. The mortal defenders, sitting afraid, crushed by the weight of their imminent death, as monsters approached, heard the rumbling behind them. They looked to the sky and saw them. The superhuman warriors, clad in gleaming white, rushing forward. Like a crashing wave, Jagatai and his sons tore into the Death Guard finding their enemy's form was reflecting the rotten hearts within. Bloated, rotten, sickly, the Death Guard had become transformed, tainted by the warp, the road of fools. It was in the swarm of bolter fire and cleaved limbs, exploding armor and sheer hate that Jagatai was knocked from his mount, finding himself surrounded. The Death Guard threw themselves at him, hoping their hulking, bloated forms would drown him. A warp-tainted blade found its way through his armor. He felt the immediate onrush of the disgusting warp power flood his veins. Even making a Primarch sick, he began to slow, unable to heal, drowning in a tide of diseased flesh. It was due to the sacrifice of one of his own sons, throwing himself off of his mount, buying space as he shriveled up with a disease that Jagatai found freedom, releasing the tainted blade and cleaving the diseased marines around him. It was only with the intervention of Sanguinius, his brother, that Jagatai was able to retreat. Many white scars were gone, dying horrific death, but thousands of ordinary people have been saved due to their sacrifice. The unpredictability of the Khan was something the traitors, even Primarchs, couldn't plan for. The weeks began to phase together. The skies of terror became dark. Perpetual night reigned as the atmosphere became clogged with spent munition shells and the smell of blood and death. Jagatai even managed to hold the Colossi Gate alongside Constantine Valdor and the Blood Angel's Captain Raldoron. But the near sleepless, soul crushing, constant battle was wearing them all down. Even to Shiban Khan, Jagatai looked emaciated, if that was even possible for a Primarch. They were losing. Millions dead, terror burning ground being lost. Their hope was fading. Something had to be done, and so Jagatai prepared for a final gambit. They made a ragged pair. The battle-ravaged warlord, his exhausted emissary, 
How do you feel? He asked. Old, she said. I feel very old. How do you feel? The wisp of a smile flickered over his proud face. No one else would have ever dared to ask him that question. None of the tens of thousands of warriors under his command. None of the hundreds of thousands of auxiliary troops who marched under his banner would ever have presumed. I feel settled, he said thoughtfully. The pieces are arranged. The calculations have been made. Very soon we shall reach the point where nothing else can be done save for the action itself. She found that she didn't really believe that. He had said something similar on the eve of other battles, and she had believed it then. But this was different. The stakes were higher. The likelihood of destruction was overwhelming. This was not a voluntary decision in any meaningful sense. She had studied the same report that he had, sat in the same council gatherings. This was desperation, a final spit in the eye of fate. And if any were to benefit from what they did, then it would not be them. But not quite, of course. He added wryly. There is always doubt, even more so now. He clouds everything, and even when you know the origin of the sickness, it is hard to remind yourself that it is artificial, some of it, and can be fought, and must be fought. It's worse in the Sanctum, Ilya said. I can imagine. But that's not all, is it? She took a swig of water. I mean, it's not why you came here. The Khan moved away from her headed to a shelf where she kept the few old things that had been preserved. The seals, marking her entry into the Departmento Minotaurum, the cheap plastil memento of the triumph she had taken from Ulanor, a priceless dagger that Quin Shah had given her, never drawn from its sheath. Never do the easy thing, he said, looking at the trinkets without really seeing them. We suffered for that, and now, in a way, this is the easiest thing of all. To stop holding back, cut loose, just like we've been promising we do ever since Prospero. He placed his hands gently on the shelf. Yesugai saw it. He dreamed of it, he told me. That I'd end my journey fighting a creature of the dark, on a world of embers. And I tried to dismiss it. But it kept coming back to me. That's the problem with the dreams of Stormseers. You wonder if you work to make them true. So, despite everything that makes this seem inevitable and right, it might just be me, deep down, tired of compromises, eager to get it settled. The easy thing. She watched him as he spoke. He stood erect, just as always. In his armor, he was still imposing but she had the sense that there was more hollowness under those plates than there had once been. The warriors of the Legion were all the same. They had been made to keep going, no matter how starved and how damaged they became. A baseline human would give up on a task after a while, but the Emperor's own would just keep fighting until the exceptional machinery of their bodies finally fell apart. Death meant nothing to them. Dishonor meant almost everything, and so it was possible that they could talk of an impossible trial, one which promised nothing but pain on the greatest conceivable scale as the easy thing. Why did he tell you of it? She asked. I don't know. Because it troubled him, I think. Or because he believed that he had to, to give you the means to make a choice. Maybe. Ilya drank a little more. She was starting to feel more like herself. You could forget what a privilege this was, to be spoken to with such frankness. Over the years, the Khan had done so only occasionally. He sounded now much as he had sounded just before the Catalyst Rift, musing on the past, fretful of the future. So to talk to him felt like a greater service than rounding up tanks. You know, I never had a family of my own, she told him. I never really knew if I wanted one or not. 
by the time I thought about it seriously, the opportunity had gone. I don't regret it. I did what I needed to do. And just when I thought I'd got to the end of all that, I came to Ulanor and found myself tangled up with you. So I got that family in the end, and you made me furious and anxious and exhausted. All of the things I thought I might have missed. She smiled sadly to herself. But the last lesson was the hardest one, because then you all began to die. I was the weakest, but somehow I'm still here. Now I begin to wonder if I might still be here when you're all gone. I'd mourn you if I lasted that long, like I mourned Targetai and Zar and Halji. She looked up at him. But I'd be proud, too. Throne, I'd be proud. Not because you're the bravest or the best, but because you do this. You ask the question. I taught you how to keep your ammo dumps from running out, but I didn't teach you that. You always did it. She edged upward in the chair, painfully, feeling her body betray her. And it is time now, my Khan. This is why we came back. He came over to her. In order to reach her level, he had to kneel. He extended his great hand, and she put hers out, and each one clasped the other. I will make you as safe as I can here, he said. If they come for the place while you're gone, I'll give them hell. The end was soon. They could all feel it. The very presence of the demon Primarch Mortarion and his Death Guard was stripping the hope from their very souls. Despair reigned, from the innocent civilians, to the exhausted conscripts, even to the Astartes and Primarchs. This artificial despair would destroy them before Horus had even set foot inside the palace. The fifth legion assembled, all that was left of them, only one mortal. Ilya had earned the honor to stand beside them. The Death Guard and Jagatai's foolish, corrupted brother Mortarion had to be defeated, lest this hanging warp despair take them all. They would retake the Lion's Gate spaceport, deny the landing platform to the traitors, and also provide a staging ground for Gilliman and the Lion's legions for when they arrived. The deception had been planted. Dozens of White Scars had allowed themselves to be captured, tortured, and slain in order to ensure the enemy was unprepared, misdirected. A sacrifice that none of them would ever forget. Jagatai, the man who had once fought with freedom in his heart, the man who hated lies, the man who conquered the stars for humanity, knew that he had to face Mortarion. The pox riddled, elevated demon Primarch, and that, in most likelihood, he would not survive. Thousands assembled, the White Scars, thousands of mortals, and the last tank regiment on terror, and they set out to battle. Utilizing an enormous mobile ship platform as cover, the Loyalists, like a procession, walked towards death, gunning for the Death Guard and the traitors. Fire and ash roaring around them as they trudged through the violated miles of Terran Earth. The mortal people were afraid. Of course they were. Reports came in of things claimed to be Xenos, but the utter gut-wrenching sickness that sung through their bodies when they caught glimpses left doubt. Before war calls, when men and women roar with pride in their heart, how quickly that bravery melts when fire, smoke, ash, and the literal dread of death is before you. You lie to yourself and say that you are brave. Miles upon miles, the Loyalist contingent trudged until finally they met them. 
the bloated, disgusting caricatures of Astartes, the Death Guard, with their sickly washed armor. All of them tightened their rebreather equipment, lest they take in the disgust around them. Jagatai and the Fifth roared into the Lion's Gate spaceport, fighting in gut-wrenching, bloody combat for every inch of land, until finally he saw him, the enormous, pus-riddled, rusted, moldy thing that was his brother. There was so much hate between them. The duel was brutal. Clashes that shattered bones rang out. Blood and sparks flew in display too fast, too apocalyptic to register with human eyes. Mortarion began to taunt his brother, decrying his weakness, telling him that he had shown him the truth, the truth of the gods of chaos, the truth that had now made him immortal, and he had run like he always had. The corrupted Death Lord was now leagues above Jagatai in strength, so much that even his Primarch body couldn't endure the onslaught. Jagatai became a bloody mess, wounds poured from all over his smashed form. His cold rage was not enough. At the edge of death, Jagatai stumbled. Mortarion again taunted him. He had expected him to dance, to show his pathetic sword-wielding abilities, but he hadn't. He had just taken it. He had taken the blows. With blood choking in his mouth, a cracked visage looked back and smiled. I absorbed the pain. The terminus est. You gave up. I did not. My endurance is superior. The Death Lord froze, the cocky cracked visage, the pus ridden, corrupted face of Mortarion contorted, turning into the epitome of rage as Jagatai laughed, the wheezing howl of a dead man. The words cut deeper than any blade ever could, lifting his broken form from the floor. Jagatai seized the opportunity, unleashing everything he had left finally dancing as he tore ribbons of flesh from his corrupted brother. Faster, faster, Jagatai moved, his heart fueled only by the spirit of Chagoris, the cold rage for all he and his sons had suffered, and for humanity. Finally, the moment came when Montarian plunged his scythe deep into the Khan's chest, bursting through his back in a shower of blood. Jagatai locked himself onto it, dragging his body down the length of the scythe with his bare hands, until he was finally face to face with his twisted brother, and with the last of his strength, he tore his brother's head from his shoulders, banishing the demon back into the wall. I sometimes imagined how I would feel if we ever came up against a foe we could not defeat, where nothing remained but to fall back again and again, weakening further with every encounter, watching the lifeblood slowly drain out of those around us as the noose tightened. I hoped and believed that I would do so as they did and keep fighting. The Kagan. The Warhawk of Chagoris lied broken on the world where he was created, under black skies, as humanity fought for its very existence. Ilya, general and confidant of the Primarch, came raging in on a land speeder. The closer she came, she heard the shouting over the explosions and bolt of fire. Damag, Damag. The word roared from the throats of the white scars and in an instant she knew what it meant as the horror washed over her. Demarg, Demarg, the sons of Chagoris cried, death. It was the war cry of a warrior's death, as Mortaria's rotten soul had been banished back to the warp. Both the Death Guard and the White Scars felt something overtake them, 
A soul-crushing hollowness washed over the white scars. They dropped their weapons. They felt sick. Their kagan, their father, was gone. Just as quickly as the grief had come, the rage followed. Demarg, they cried into the air as their souls sung for their fallen kagan. And like a tide of hate, they washed over the confused death guard. Ilya found her way through, finally laying eyes upon the sight that broke her. Was it even a corpse? This mountain of battered flesh that had once been the Warhawk of Chagoris. Jagatai, the defender of humanity, gave his life. The underestimated, the forgotten, the misunderstood had made the sacrifice. The oath had been made, and now it was fulfilled. Touching her hand to the only part of her friend that was not gore and blood, Ilya wept. But as the despair almost took her, she felt something. She asked those around her to check for a pulse, but there was nothing. But she knew in her heart that she had felt something. Malkador. She had to get him to Malkador. Perhaps there was a chance. Dragging the corpse of their lord up, they made a desperate gambit back to the palace as the remaining white scars held the spaceport. No more would they attack and retreat. This was where he had fallen, their father. This was sacred ground, and they would die in his defense. Reaching Malkador's side, Jagatai was taken, placed within a mysterious device. There his body lay, as the battle for the fate of humanity roared on above. Jagatai lived. He had given his life to the Imperium, for the father whom he had never loved, against a brother that he did. He had defended an empire that never wanted him against an army that would have taken him in a heartbeat. When he awoke, the universe had changed forever. The loyalists had won. Horus had been slain. The traitors scattered, but Sanguinius was dead. The emperor was crippled, interned upon the golden throne. The dream, the great vision had been murdered. Jagatai's treacherous brothers had seen to that. Magnus, Horus, and Sanguinius, the only brothers he had ever loved, were gone or corrupted. Yusugai, Giyu Han, Hasek, Quin Sha, Jubal, and as the decades passed, even Ilya, he had outlived them all. The man who had just wanted to embrace the freedom of conquest under the azure skies of Chagoris had sacrificed so much. The man who'd hated the lies had suffered the most because of them. He had found fraternity, obligation, but for those who had felt that obligation too were gone, only grief left in its wake. The man who had feared decrepitude and the lie of safety that wars provided had given his life to defend them. Never do the easy thing. You are their protector. Perhaps in all this suffering, he had finally found the one thing he had never set out to accomplish. Understanding his father, the Emperor. A man whom Malkador long ago had told him he had sacrificed more than anyone. Because that is what is required to walk the path as a defender of humanity. A new era had begun. The Imperium had survived, and with the Reformation under the direction of Rabute Gilliman, the legions were divided, broken into thousand-man chapters, so that no individual could ever wield such power again. Something Jagatai accepted in his head, but found tumultuous in his heart. To divide the people of Chagoris, he was a unifier. That was his reason for conquest but at the risk of another civil war, the surviving legions and primarchs agreed. For 70 years, Jagatai led the White Scars, following the heresy, 
pushing the traitors all the way to the Eye of Terror, that disgusting warp rift. It would be at the Battle of Corusil V, where Jagatai was unleashing himself upon a Jukari force that had assailed Tagoris during the heresy that he was lost, disappearing within a webway portal surrounded by his elite Keshik. For 10,000 years, the songs and battle cries of the sons of Chagoris have lauded their great Kagan, awaiting for the day the quiet barbarian, the conqueror, the oath keeper, the son of Chagoris, the warhawk of terror, the defender of humanity, returns. Warriors of Chagoris, brothers of the great tribe, the Star Hunt calls you. Do you not hear it? The battle's red edge is your home. The respect of your kinsmen, your hurt. Plunge into the enemy's breast like a blade, cut out his heart, and you will know fulfillment. The Emperor has given us strength. In return, we give him victory. will stand before my perfection. My superiority is eternal. Agony, ecstasy, more. Sensation will be mine. Perfection is a process. It is the fruit of the highest branch. That is why we are here, my sons. This world is the beginning of our climb. The fruit sits above us, just out of reach. We will climb until we have it in our grasp. But climb we must, lest our imperfections damn us to mere adequacy. A scarred. Haunted's visage reflects the twisted, sadistic heart within Lucius, the soul thief, Fulgrim's champion, the scion of Chemos and champion of Slanesh, a name spoken with equal parts dread and pleasure, a monster who even death cannot hold over, a man who embodied the darkness that lay in the heart of the Third Legion. A darkness counted by the other side of that coin. Saul Tarvitz, a tragic legend whose legacy is the last vestiges of nobility his legion gave to the galaxy. But who are Lucius and Saul? How did men who are as close as brothers embody the sensations of betrayal and tragedy the Horus heresy unleashed? A story that leaves one heinous, disgusting monster in his wake, an eternal nightmare for mankind. Their story begins at the end of the 30th millennium. Deep in the Aquitaine sector of the galaxy, two children were born to a world dominated by near perpetual twilight. Chemos, the world that Lucius and Saul were born to, 
was almost unrecognizable to eyes that had seen it decades before. It was a story told to these young boys, and to almost every child born on this grey world. Decades ago, like an angel descending from the very heavens, a mysterious child crashed into the surface of Kemos. Beautiful, purple eyes looked around, only to find a picture of misery. Kemos, for millennia had been a mining colony, populated during humanity's golden era over 5,000 years ago. But with utopia in humanity's grasp, it was ripped away. Old night, the age of strife had arrived, and with the collapse of the spanning federation of mankind, millions of worlds like Kemos were cut off, unable to travel, communicate, or trade because of war and ravaging warp storms. The once prosperous world of Kemos began to regress, each generation suffering as resources, knowledge, and power bled out. After millennia, the ruins of a great age was all that remained. The technology, the supplies, and the people were lesser. Great fortress factories housed the last bastions of humanity, and under their weak sun and grey skies, all of Kemos struggled on a daily basis to feed its people. Everyone had to work, day and night, in the damp, cold, pollutant-clogged mines, just to keep the vapour mines and food synthesizers running. It was a hard, brutal existence that forged the surviving people of Kemos. Hard places often breed hardened people, and on a world where missing a single, disgusting, grey, nutrient slop meal was life or death, it changed them. Greed, selfishness, and ruthlessness was necessary to survive. Dueling and scheming were rife within this heavy oligarchic society. Each person was out to protect what little they had, be it with cutting words or blade. The millions of people dotted around the fortress factories for generations knew nothing else. To reach even beyond the age of 30 was considered special in this uncaring place. Most died, having experienced only grueling, back-breaking, finger-blistering work. They never relaxed, never had pursuits or hobbies, most had never even heard music. But just as this slow decay would seem to doom them forever, they were saved. The child that had descended from the skies had been taken in. He had an aura about him, a supreme welling of majesty. He was humanity distilled. He was perfect. Hope bled from those luscious purple eyes. The boy grew into a man inside the fortress factory of Kallax. Over decades he transformed them. This superhuman began to fix and even improve the food synthesizers. For the first time in millennia, Kallax produced a surplus of food. And for the first time in living memory, the people had time, the most precious commodity. They had freedom and choice. Within a lifetime, one being ruled over Kemos, uniting the previous warring factions and fortress factories. Fulgrim was his name. We have all been the victim of nihilism, the dark cloud that smothers everything tainting the world into a dark and unforgiving place. But what would you feel for the person who dragged you out from it? The one who raised you into the light, wiping the mud and grime from your face? Kemos experienced a renaissance. The culture, arts, and pleasures denied to them for millennia flourished. And the superhuman Fulgrim, the enormous, silver-haired, Amethyst-eyed, godlike figure had done it for them. For the children that were Lucius and Saul, it was a legend, an odyssey of their people from the darkness into the light, a mythological story come to life. 
filling them with the innocent wonder only children experience. And just as their saviour was perfect to them, the ideal, that very sensation arrived at Fulgrim's doorstep. Arriving above the clouds of Chemos, the Great Crusade had arrived. The Empire from Terror descended, and with it, perfection. Fulgrim's father, the Emperor of Mankind. Perfection is not a state of being, it is a state of striving. The journey is all that has meaning, not the goal. The Imperium of Mankind, a growing empire with its seat upon terror, and the head that stands upon the shoulders of billions is one man, the Emperor of Mankind. He was perfect, his knowledge was infinite, his prowess was unmatched, and his power was unwavering. His vision for humanity was a mark of greatness. There he stood, in beautiful, ornate, golden armor, the peak of humanity. The Emperor of Mankind had come to Fulgrim, his son, his Primarch, bringing a grand destiny the Great Crusade, the reunification of mankind across the stars. He brought enlightenment, the imperial truth, and he had brought Fulgrim his sons, the Legiones Astartes, warriors grafted with his own genetic material, men elevated into superhumans. As the great savior left to terror, Chemos began to transform further, a bountiful growth fested by new Imperial resources and Fulgrim's personal direction, even so far away in the stars. The young Lucius and Saul grew up upon a grey but flourishing world, the scars of the past only remembered by the old, but the mindset was not forgotten. Where once duels and conflicts echoed in the smog-filled mines, they were now a center stage in grand amphitheaters. Pleasure, culture, and creations once denied to the people flooded the streets, bringing color to a world illuminated by perpetual twilight. The planet of Chemos had been united, not conquered, a feat only capable with a Primarch level skill and diplomacy. The consequence of this bloodless path left an aristocracy, families elevated from the rulership of fortress factories into the governors of cities, all in the service to their imperium. It is perhaps during this time of change when the boy that would become the man, Saul Tarvitz, was taken, only enjoying the beginning of the fruit bearing upon his homeworld, but elevated toward a different, grand destiny in the stars, a fate that would soon come knocking for the boy known as Lucius. Perhaps born into a life not of wealth or poverty, Lucius would find himself joining the upper ranks of Chemosian society, like all those who had the fortune of being born after the arrival of the great saviour Fulgrim, and the Primarch's reunion with the Emperor. One singular word left the demigod's lips, a word that would change Chemos forever. Perfection. Perfection is a process, it is the fruit of the highest branch, it sits above us, just out of reach. You must climb until you have it in your grasp, lest our imperfections damn you to mere adequacy. Ambition had been a bubbling fire for millennia. But in this new society it roared. Both Lucius and Saul were taught to climb, chase the fruit. But the young Lucius left his contemporaries in the dust. He climbed high. His talents, his skills, his athleticism was beyond his peers. The handsome young man was a beacon that drew greedy moths to his flame. Aristocratic sponsors came rolling in. He was a tool, 
a rising star whose coattails could be ridden. Your home, your family and your friends, the company you keep often reflects who you are. And to the young, impressionable Lucius, he was surrounded by greedy, ruthless, selfish people, descendants of a ruling caste that had oppressed millions for millennia. As he grew, he found himself drawn to one art form, a path to a fruit that could make him perfect, the sword. His talent was supernatural, and again he quickly began to master this new pursuit. But there was something cruel within this naive boy. Each victory, each step taken in the climb towards the fruit, he looked back in disgust, because those who he surpassed were beneath him. Scars and wounds were the lucky consequences for the power drunk Lucius. The worst was death. Some rumors even stated that he had murdered some of the dregs of society, claiming he had been attacked first. When he took part in the annual swordsmanship contest on Chemos, Lucius garnered the attention of a hulking stranger in the shadows. He dueled against a famed champion twice his age, slowly breaking him down, enjoying his superiority on display, humiliating his enemy as he was about to be attacked by the champion's supporters and disciples, the hulking figure intervened. Lucius' skills had made him worthy for elevation. All that the boy Saul and Lucius had been through, their memories and dreams, would be distilled in the process they were about to endure. On a cold steel table, Lucius and Saul were cut open, organs, created from the saviour Fulgrim's DNA was grafted onto them. They endured a pain that flooded through every nerve and fibre of their being. For years they were prodded and sliced, until after years what emerged was Lucius and Saul, Legiones Astartes. They were Emperor's children, the Third Legion. Pike sat up, alert now. You're certain? Fulgrim nodded. I've seen it before. Secret societies were rife on Chemos in my youth. Periods of unrest often see the formation of ad hoc brotherhoods, looking for some sense of control amidst the confusion, or to take advantage of it. And it's not Bucephalus. She had thought as much earlier, before Corinth had convinced Fulgrim otherwise. Bucephalos wasn't the type to overthrow a government, not with force of arms at any rate. No, Fulgrim said. He stared at the map, as if trying to isolate the situation from its component parts. Pike wondered at the expression on his face, simultaneously frustrated and excited. He was enjoying it, like a child who'd learned a new game. A shiver ran through her. A child's enthusiasm, slaved to a cogitator-like mind, ruthless, efficient, perfect in its clarity of purpose. Fulgrim attacked the problem from every angle, until a weak point revealed itself. Then his attentions focused with deadly precision, like a duelist exploiting a flaw in his opponent's guard. Representatives of the patricians have visited me over the past few days, looking for some advantage. Pike said. She poured herself a glass of wine, and then one for Fulgrim. Mostly trying to secure themselves an advantageous position in the new order. They appear to think that Pandion is living on borrowed time. He might well be, Fulgrim admitted. Some of them even threatened me. She smiled at the look on his face. Obliquely, of course. Nothing so forward as a sniper's bullet. They're used to getting their way in these matters. They have little understanding of the wider implications of our presence. Or they might simply be that arrogant. Or both, 
She nodded in agreement. They'll need to be dealt with. Harshly is my preference. He looked at her, eyebrow raised. She shrugged. They insulted me. I can have my people kill them if you'd prefer. Fulgrim laughed. It may come to that, though I'd like to leave some of them alive. Functioning aristocracy is necessary, at least at the outset. A careful dance, then. She said, I am a fine dancer, acclaimed for my grace and agility. He preened slightly, and she couldn't help but laugh. I never had the knack for it myself. Perhaps you can teach me. I would be delighted. Fulgrim glanced at the map again. I'll send Kasparos and Gryphon to inspect the Agra Circle, I think. The land downers there require a gentler touch than those in the mountains. I had another request. Pike said. Fulgrim glanced at her. Pike paused, considering her next words carefully. I ask that you consider being more careful in the future. Careful? No more running after snipers. No more baiting assassins. I will not hide, Lady Golconda. I am not asking you to. But twice now, you've acted on instinct, pursuing your attackers rather than waiting for support. You're aggressive and impulsive when provoked. That is invaluable intelligence for a certain sort of person. Fulgrim's expression didn't change, but Pike could feel the sudden tension radiating from him. She forced herself to remain calm. She had endured the anger of one of the Emperor's sons before, and she could do so again. And what sort of person is that? The words came out like a warning rumble of some great cat, somewhere between a purr of invitation and a growl of reproach. Have our enemies revealed themselves to you, primary iterator? He sat back fingers interlaced. Are their schemes suddenly laid bare before your keen insight? His tone was mild, but the words were cutting, almost petulant. She took a steadying breath, knowing that to say the wrong thing now was to lose him entirely. That is not what I meant, and you know it, Lord Fulgrim. She said, her voice even. This latest attempt may very well have been a feint. To better gauge your capabilities. Or it may have merely been the act of desperate men. The explosion wasn't necessarily meant for me. It would have covered their escape and eradicated any evidence they might have left behind. He sighed and leaned back. But... He hesitated. For a moment, his two handsome features cracked and Pike glimpsed what lay beneath. Then he was smiling again his mask artfully rearranged. But... He continued. You may very well be right, my lady. Forgive me. She nodded slowly. The Primarchs were not human, she reminded herself. They were both more and less than that. But like humans, they had their foibles. Fulgrim was arrogant, but it was an assumed arrogance. It was a mask he wore, a part he played. Soon enough, it might become the real thing. For now, it was simply another piece of armor, a way to protect himself from a galaxy all too quick to take advantage of his flaws. She knew his story. She knew all of their stories. A boyhood spent in hardship, forced to endure terrible privation, and dangers that would have broken the sanity of a normal man. A slow, determined climb to conquest. It left little time for friendship or for learning those lessons that made one a part of society. She smiled. My late husband, one of them, I forgot which, had a saying, forgiveness is unnecessary between friends. Fulgrim chuckled. And are we friends then? If you like. She took a chance and patted his knee. Fulgrim laid his hands over hers. Fulgrim, the Phoenician, the savior of Chemos, to stand before him, exhilaration, wonder and joy would flood your veins. His perfect features, 
his silver hair and ornate, beautiful armor. It was as if a demigod of mythology was before your very eyes. For Lucius and Saul Tarvitz, the sight of their Primarch, their gene father awakened something deep within them. Even from his youth to his earliest days within the Legion, Saul was described by his brothers as a humble man, and the sight of his Primarch must have taken that humility to the extreme. Who was he? Saul before this magnificent being. For Lucius, that cruel arrogance fostered by his upbringing must have been shattered. He had shown complete disregard for those who he saw as below him. But in front of him sort of being so far ahead of him, it must have been world altering. Upon Chemos, Lucius had been special, a cut above the rest. But with his fellow Astartes at his side, such as Saul, he was no longer unique. They were all skilled, all worthy of being sons of Fulgrim, even if men like Saul thought that they were not worthy. After months of grueling surgeries, relentless combat and educational training, Lucius and Saul were ready to join the Legion as fully-fledged members. In the time that Lucius and Saul joined, the Legion was in a state of renewal. Decades ago, with a scattering of the Primarchs, the twenty legions had headed to the stars, leaderless. It was at this time that tragedy struck. The third legion had earned glory and renown in the early days of the Great Crusade, but a terrible sickness arose, the viral blight. A flaw within the gene seed became rampant. Brave and noble warriors dropped like flies, and at the edge of dissolvement, with 200 Astartes left, hope arrived. Fulgrim. With the union of Primarch and Legion, new gene seed was harvested. Fulgrim spoke to his remaining sons with a speech that dripped with hope and charisma. A legendary battle cry, declaring, You are the Emperor's chosen, his heralds, his warriors, his children. This is only the beginning. Over the coming decades, recruits began to flood in. Men such as Lucius and Saul. A second generation devoid of the scars the Legion had endured, knowing only the absolute sheer will of their father that had brought the Third Legion to an equal place at the table. A Legion to match all the others, and then, perhaps, even eclipse them. The Imperial Aquila, the Emperor's personal heraldry, a badge of honour earned in the early days was for the third alone to bear. Lucius, Saul and all their brothers would have to live and fight every day to show their worthiness of this honour. As the Legion was rebuilt, it became a reflection of the man that led them, Fulgrim. Perfection is not a state of being, it is a state of striving. The journey is all that has meaning, not the goal. Lucius and Saul were climbing the mountain towards perfection, a journey that had two different perspectives. To Lucius he reflected the immaculate, talented, the ambition, the example, the very image others saw as Fulgrim's arrogance. But the other side was Saul, the humanity beneath the mask. He was stalwart, noble, duty-driven, the perfect soldier who perhaps did not have what it took to climb to the very top. As the two men joined the Great Crusade, fighting horrifying Xenos and non-compliant colonies, the two embodiments of Fulgrim united. For nearly a century, the Emperor's children fought alongside Fulgrim's brother, Horus, and his lunar wolves their number slowly swelling from elite attachments to Imperial Guard to near-independent Legion force sizes. It was in this consolidation that Lucius and Saul would begin to forge a bond that only soldiers know. For men so polar opposite, their differences harmonised. 
They were unstoppable together, each a positive influence on the other. Lucius' skill drove Saul to work harder, to strive more towards their Primarch's road to perfection, and the humility of Saul reigned in Lucius' worst tendencies. To Lucius, Saul was perhaps his only friend. His inherent selfishness pushed others away, even his fellow legionaries. His absolute focus on his journey, his grueling levels of training, an effort towards a greater, stronger, more perfect Lucius. Others were not important in that journey, except for his equal, Saul, the brother alongside him. But for Saul, friendship and brotherhood came easily. Discipline, not ambition, drove him, a trait that others flocked to. Even in the Preexior campaign, Nathaniel Garo of the Death Guard forged a bond with Saul, so deep he called an Astarte of another Legion brother. The two even had small eagles carved into their gauntlets by knife point, a sign of the battle debt they owed one another, and when the two clasped each other's wrists, their van braces would form the sign of the Imperial Aquila a bond that would have galaxy-shaping consequences. Enlightenment is not found outside of you. Real truth is inside of you, and always has been. To find it, you must cut away everything, lower and deeper, until you reach the bottom. Once there is nothing left, all that remains is the truth. That is what is happening to you, eternal. You are on the cusp of discovering the real truth. Repeat what you said about the trees, Eidolon prompted. The winged forms use them to secure prey for feeding, Lord. Tarvid said. I understand that. Eidolon snapped. I've lost men to the winged things, and I've seen the thorn trees. But you say there were other bodies. The corpses of blood angels, Lord. Tarvid nodded. We've not seen them. Anteus remarked. It might explain what happened to them. Eidolon replied. Anteus was one of Eidolon's chosen circle and enjoyed a far more cordial relationship with his lord than Tarvitz did. Have you proof? Antaeus asked Tarvitz. I destroyed the trees as you know, sir. Tarvitz said. So you don't have proof? My word is proof, said Tarvitz. And good enough for me. Antaeus nodded courteously. I meant no offense, brother. And I took none, sir. You used all your charges? Eidolon asked. Yes, lord. A waste. Tarvis began to reply, but stifled the words before he could say them. If it hadn't been for his use of the explosives, they wouldn't have reunited. If it hadn't been for his use of explosives, the ragged corpses of the fine emperor's children would have hung from the stone gibbets in ignominious disarray. I told him so, Lord, Lucius remarked. Told him what? That using all of our charges was a waste. What's that in your hand, Captain? Eidolon asked. Lucius held up the limb blade. You taint us, Anteus said. Shame on you, using an enemy's claw like a sword. Throw it away, Captain, Eidolon said. I'm surprised at you. Yes, Lord. Tarvitz? Yes, my Lord. The blood angels will require some proof of their fallen, some relic they can honor. You say shreds of armor hung from those trees. Go and retrieve some. Lucius can help you. My lord, should we not secure this? I gave you an order, Captain. Execute it, please. Or does the honor of our brethren legion mean nothing to you? I only thought to- Did I ask for your counsel? Are you a lord commander and privy to the higher links of command? No, lord. Then get to it, Captain. You too, Lucius. You men, assist them. The local shield storm had blown out. The sky over the wide clearing was surprisingly clear and pale, 
as if night was finally falling. Tarvids had no idea of murder's diurnal cycle. Since they had made planetfall, night and day periods must have surely passed. But in the stork forests, lit by the storm's flare, such changes had been imperceptible. Now it seemed cooler, stiller. The sky was a washed out beige, with filaments of darkness threaded through it. There was no wind, and the flicker of sheet lightning came from many kilometers away. Tarvitz thought he could even glimpse the stars up there, in the darker patches of the open sky. He led his party out of the ruin of the trees. Lucius was grumbling, as if it was all Tarvitz's fault. Shut up, Tarvitz told him on a closed channel. Consider this ample payback for your kiss-ass display to the Lord Commander. What are you talking about? Lucius asked. I told him it was a waste, Lord. Tarvis answered, mimicking Lucius's words with an unflattering voice. I did tell you. Yes, you did. But there's such a thing as solidarity. I thought we were friends. We are friends, Lucius said, hurt. And that was the act of a friend. We are the Emperor's children, Lucius said solemnly. We seek perfection. We don't hide our mistakes. You made a mistake. Acknowledging our failures is another step on the road to perfection. Isn't that what our Primarch teaches? Tarvitz frowned. Lucius was right. Primarch Fulgrim had taught that only by imperfection could they fail the Emperor and only by recognizing those failures could they eradicate them. Tarvitz wished someone would remind Eidolon of that key tenet of their legion's philosophy. I made a mistake. I used that blade thing. I relished it. It was Xenos. Lord Eidolon was right to reprimand me. I told you it was Xenos. Twice. Yes, you did. I owe you an apology for that. You are right, Sol. I'm sorry. Never mind. Lucius put his hand on Tarvis's plate arm and stopped him. No, it's not. I'm a fine one to talk. You are always so grounded, Sol. I know I mock you for that. I'm sorry. I hope we're still friends. Of course. Your steadfast manner is a true virtue. I become obsessive sometimes in the heat of things. It's an imperfection of my character. Perhaps you can help me overcome it. Perhaps I can learn from you. His voice had that childlike tone in it that had made Tarvitz like him in the first place. Besides, Lucius added, You saved my life. I haven't thanked you for that. No, you haven't. But there's no need, brother. Then let's get this done, eh? The other men had waited while Tarvitz and Lucius conducted their private vox to vox conversation, the pair hurried to rejoin them. Over a century of gruelling warfare, countless worlds, environments and habitats you couldn't even begin to describe, fighting horrifying, strange Xenos, all the way to primitive and advanced human societies. Lucius and Saul fought side by side, each putting their own life at risk in the defense of the other. With each campaign, their experience grew, till after decades, they both achieved the rank of captain. Accepting the responsibility, especially as a representative as a chosen of Fulgrim. As the decades passed, the Great Crusade began to envelop more and more of the galaxy. World upon world was brought into compliance, and the authority of terror reigned over trillions. As Fulgrim, Lucius and Saul pushed even further and further, the Legion began to evolve. Their armor, their weapons, their battle barges, and even their bodies became an embodiment of the extremely high standards their Primarch had set. Lucius, Saul and the Legion had climbed ever closer to the fruit of enlightenment. With victory upon victory, external weakness was purged, and so began the shredding of weakness within their hearts. Enlightenment is not found outside of you, 
Real truth is inside of you, and always has been. To find it, you must cut away everything, lower and deeper until you reach the bottom. Once there is nothing left, all that remains is the truth. That is what is happening to you, Eternal. A legion of thousands of warriors gunning towards the height of paragons, but the interpretation of that had begun to create a divide. In the latter part of the Great Crusade, Lucius and Saul found themselves upon the vile planet coined Murder. Responding to a distress call sent by the Blood Angels, a task force under the direction of Lord Commander Eidolon made Planetfall. A decision that was made in spite of all the warnings and lack of intelligence. But glory awaited, and the great Eidolon wouldn't let others claim it. The assault was a disaster. Lucis and Saul found themselves assailed by disgusting, arachnid Xenos with claws sharp enough to slice through ceramite armor. They hated these foul beasts. Their aesthetics were an affront to the Emperor's perfection. Their bestial attacks, their smell, the way they pinned fallen brother bodies to thorned trees like shrikes. The brothers fought back to back, Saul coordinating their surviving brothers. But Lucius was an island of his own, losing himself in the absolute focus of blood-roaring combat, taking down two for every one of his brothers. Lucius even picked up a severed alien claw to wield alongside his sword. He seemed comfortable holding an alien's blade. And besides, the disgust from his battle brothers didn't matter, as if the opinions of lessers would factor into his worldview. Just as they were about to be overrun, with Lucius ensnared and Saul shielding his friend, reinforcements arrived. An ally who the Legion had once been bound to, their brother Legion, the Lunar Wolves. Reuniting with Eidolon, Saul and Lucius were chewed out. Even though they had followed the reckless path set for them, the chastisement from Eidolon was an arrogant spiel, with all the markings of an out-of-control ego. To Saul, a man content to just serve, who retained his humility even under Fulgrim's philosophy. He despised this arrogance. We all know the frustration and hate we feel when enduring hypocrisy. But to Lucius, Eidolon was simply a reflection of a man further up the path towards perfection. His power and position made him right. And the path Fulgrim had set out for them also meant they had to acknowledge their mistakes, even the mistakes of friends. Lucius spoke out against Saul, an act that rightfully felt like a stab in the back, a small betrayal of the near centuries-long friendship. But to Lucius, how could admitting their mistakes be betrayal? His loyalty was to the path of perfection, something Saul had placed below his bonds to his brothers. But just as quickly as the conflict arose, Lucius apologized. Lucius was selfish, gifted, and obsessive, but he was not above admitting his faults too. Again, Saul had brought him back, their bond the balancing of each other's worst tendencies. Even to their Lunar Wolf reinforcements, they could see a stark change to some of the Legion they had fought side by side decades ago. Just as how the Iterator Pike had seen within Fulgrim, the mask of arrogance, that one day it may become the real thing. Fulgrim's sons reflected that too. Men like Eidolon, and in time, Lucius, had become the mask. Unlike Saul, who knew it for the masquerade it was. With their evacuation from murder, the honest, Humble Astarte, Saul's presence had been the counterbalance to Eidolon. The bonds between legions was reaffirmed, with men such as Tarek Torgadon and Garvil Loken finding common ground with this disciplined noble marine. The captains bonded in the fighting cages, Saul even bringing Lucius with him. 
despite his arrogance making him an isolated figure. Upon their departure, the overconfident Lucius challenged Loken to a duel, expecting to overwhelm him with his superior blade work, but he left with a bloodied nose from a dishonorable, unarmed strike, a grudge that would fester in the years to come. The path towards damnation is not determined in the end sum of life. The blackening of one's soul is measured by degrees, from heartbeat to heartbeat. Perdition is not born in the din and fires of war, but rather within the silence of a solitary mind. He had ruined his perfect face, Loken. His handsome face had been a mirror to the beauty of his Primarch, though he did despise the casual mockery from his brothers. In their duel that was supposed to be a test of who was the greatest swordsman, Logan had ended it with a fist directly into the bridge of his nose. It had refused to set properly, despite the attention of the legionary's apothecaries. It was a mark, a constant reminder of his failure to be superior. A fire burned within Lucius. He needed to be better, stronger, faster, the greatest warrior. And that oath was renewed every time he looked himself in the mirror. Following their conflict on the world of murder, Lucius and Saul would continue to build esteem within the now bustling legion. With nearly two centuries of war under its belt, the Emperor's children had become a source of much attention. Bureaucrats, artisans, nobles from Terra flooded to the beautiful works of art that was the Third Legion's fleet. Gorgeous marble statues, ornate golden carvings, sublime tapestries decked every surface. The evolution had been more than just external. Lucius, Saul and their brothers were as much artists on and off the battlefield. To be in the presence of the Third Legion was to see the height of humanity. The exceptionalism would overwhelm you, and you were never so aware of how ordinary and how unimpressive you were. Even amongst this exceptional brotherhood, Lucius and Saul had proven themselves, both with a combat record that was exceptional. In the recognition, the two friends were inducted into the Brotherhood of the Phoenix, an unofficial warrior lodge that has spread throughout many of the legions. Supposedly a place where rank meant nothing, and all could converse as equals. That the third's culture of distinct hierarchy had inevitably crept its way in, for some were more equal than others. Some were more perfect than others. The two Astartes stood before their Primarch, contentment beaming from them. Saul was grateful and felt that he was not worthy of such an honor, but in contrast Lucius knew that he deserved to be there. They had grown so much from Saul, the noble, humble man whose ability to bond and coordinate made him a beacon for others to rally around. A man who earned trust easily, a man you wanted to follow. Lucius had become a champion. A perfect example of the Chemosian duelist ideal, and his skill was growing. Even decades after the events on murder, Lucius challenged Loken again, but this time claiming victory easily. Lucius' skill had become so great that Loken knew now there was no one in the Sons of Horus Legion who could best him. The victory must have been exhilarating. He had improved. He was greater. The weakness had been expunged. After two centuries into the Great Crusade, the Emperor's children had built a reputation. The once mask of arrogance worn by Fulgrim was becoming all too real. Being treated as if being above humanity, many had begun to believe it. But this character defect would blur into something worse, 
as the Legion's fleet darkened the skies of the world Laeron. The path towards damnation is not determined in the end sum of life. The blackening of one's soul is measured by degrees, from heartbeat to heartbeat. Perdition is not born in the din and fires of war, but rather within the silence of a solitary mind. Descending down to the surface of Laeron, the Third Legion's host found this intensely strange planet, crawling with chitinous, multi-limbed Xenos among towering, shimmering coral-like structures. The layer slithered through, and the melee became a bloody trudge, with every inch of ground a mix of superhuman and alien blood. Examinations of the layer's form under the watch of the chief apothecary Fabius Bile revealed their secrets. The layer had been altered. Their genetics had been molded. Each different cast uniquely adapted to their unique environments. Armored scales, fins, membraned wings. They had taken the base and then improved. They had been made more perfect. The suggestion of experimentation had almost made Fulgum strike Fabius down, but the doubt, the underlying insecurity that lies underneath arrogance, came through. The solitary mind of Fulgrim had feared only one thing, failing his father. Fulgrim couldn't fail the path towards perfection, even if the thought of mixing with Xenos DNA disgusted him. Failure was worse. The Third Legion left Laeron bloodied, many of the wounded finding themselves under the scalpel of Fabius, and a Legion armed with a new precedent. Arriving back to the Legion from an operation under Lord Eidolon's command, Saul and Lucius met their Primarch, the perfect father that they in turn feared failing. Strapped to his hip, was a silver blade, a gorgeous piece whose allure sent shivers down your spine, a prize taken from the ashes of the defeated Lair. The two could sense that the Laeron had changed something. The path towards perfection was accelerating. Lucius even received a pair of scars across his cheek from the Remembrancer Serana, a push to remind him of Loken's insult to his perfection. Scars that became a promise, an oath to a victory he needed to achieve. Like meteors raining from the skies, the Emperor's children, Death Guard, World Eaters and Sons of Horus thundered down to the surface of Isfahan III. The rebelling world would be set ablaze as thousands of superhuman warriors obliterated all that stood in their way. Saul pushed his way through the rubble and corpses, finding Lucius at the front, a blur of ceramite that seemed to claim a life with every swing. A complex network of scars marked the once handsome face of Lucius, each one the memory of a worthy kill, a celebration of his perfection and power. Reaching to fight alongside Lucius and Lord Commander Eidolon, Saul was elated to capture the sight of a true brother, Nathaniel Garo of the Death Guard. With embers and smoke filling their lungs, the Astartes pressed forward until they stumbled upon a strange humanoid psychic creature whose sonic blast began to hound the Imperials. Garo was then struck suffering grievous injuries, and then Saul rushed over, dragging his brother to safety. They had to kill it. Rushing up to the spine-chilling monster, Saul and Eidolon managed to destroy it, but with a talent that shocked Saul to his core. An equally awful, guttural sonic beam emanated from Lord Eidolon, rendering the creature to a puddle of flesh. The battle had been won, but Saul questioned what he had witnessed. But Eidolon bade him to be silent, that what he had seen was not of his concern. Finding the wounded form of Garrow, 
The carved eagles met once more as the ceramite gauntlets clanked together. They were close. The both of them gave each other grief. One a legion full of stubborn, barbarous men. The other a bunch of pretty boys. The banter felt good. Despite Saul's thoughts lingering on what he had just witnessed. Following the engagement, the secret was out. And under the direction of Lord Eidolon, Saul was escorted into the bowels of the Legion ship. Translucent cylinders with eerie, humanoid forms floated within, meeting the gaze of the hated Legion's apothecary, Fabius Bile. The horrifying, world-shattering truth came to light. The spider had been altering, experimenting with gene seed. Their gene seed. Mutations taken from Xenos, such as the Leia, had been grafted onto Battle Brothers. The sight disgusted Saul. The Emperor was perfection. Fulgrim had been made in his image, just as they had tried to live in their fathers. To desecrate this with Xenos filth was abominable. A spit in the face of the Imperial truth. It felt wrong. Eidolon and Bile tried to convince him. With these alterations, they could be more. He could be closer to perfection. But Saul refused. His ambition did not outweigh his sense. He was the man others decried as destined to be a line officer, and nothing more. But that did not matter. Saul wanted to be perfect, not for himself, but for the Emperor for the Imperium and for Fulgrim, and humanity. The captain was turned away, his refusal seen as an insult, and he was ordered to never speak of what he had seen. A deep fog found its way over Saul, the struggle within of what he had just witnessed, but worst of all, knowing that his Primarch Fulgrim had approved of it. The man content to be an ordinary, loyal, honourable man made a choice. Saul relinquished his place and the spear tip of their next assault, pleading with the venerable dreadnought known as Ancient Rylanor to take his place. An almost unheard of statement by a son of Fulgrim, his friend Lucius even remarking the unfathomability of it, as Lucius Rylanor and contingents from the other legions made Planetfall once more. Saul finally discovered a truth he had never hoped to see. Virus bombs, prepped and ready to emulate all living things upon the surface. Lucius and his brother legionaries were going to die. They had been betrayed. Only one could have been the architect of this betrayal. The War Master, Horus. Grabbing a Thunderhawk, Saul guns down to the surface, the thought of panic racing through his mind. As fire trailed in his wake, a signal was sent to the closest vessel, the Eisenstein, helmed by Nathaniel Garo. They were ordered to destroy this renegade Thunderhawk. Perhaps if it had been anyone else in the universe, fate may have followed a different path. Saul made contact with his friend, relaying the horrifying truth. They had been betrayed. Thousands of brothers upon the surface of Istvan were moments away from annihilation. The War Master Horus and their legions have betrayed the Emperor. Saul begged his brother, his friend, to trust him over countless battlefields, fighting back to back, spilling blood for each other. Garrow knew that Saul never lied. Garrow destroyed the pursuing ships, clearing a path for his friend. Saul asked his brother what was terror like. He asked him if he remembered what they were fighting for. Hope. Hope for humanity. The Imperial Truth. The two swore that they would meet again and stand side by side on terror.
Chural city, the last bastion for the Istvanians, who had dared defy the might of Astartes. Lucius led the spear tip, flanked by his fellow Astartes and Rylanor, ancient of rites. With ash and rubble ground beneath his tread, the dual-wielding champion of the third rushed into the palace of the rebelling planetary governor, Vardus Prahl. An almost miasmic vibration was echoing all around him, trying to seep its way into his armor. Finally, a warrior decked in ornate golden armor rushed him, creating a wound, a crack. Music flooded into Lucius. He felt his blood sing. Lights and colors seemed more vivid. As he lay his eyes upon his foes, a pleasure he had known his whole life was elevated to eleven. His fingers felt electric as he'd launched himself at Vardras Prahl. To see Lucius fight was like a dance, a fluidity of deadly strikes, that could be called nothing short of art. As he drove his sword through the heart of his enemy, elation filled him. Lucius had done it, and like the end of a hero's journey, he had slain the monster. A story worthy to be immortalized within the halls of Fulgrim's champions, just like the legends of the Legion before him. Just moments after his great victory, Lucius heard a voice over the Vox, one he was utterly surprised to hear. He was glad to have his friend finally join the carnage, but Saul's response shocked him to his core. They had been betrayed. The legionaries on the surface had been sent here to die. The War Master, Fulgrim, had betrayed them and the Emperor. Disbelief washed over Lucius. How could this be? How could this be the truth? It must be lies. Fulgrim wouldn't send him to his death. What of all the victories he had earned for him? Look at how strong and elevated he had become for Fulgrim. He was one of the chosen. He had never failed. He was loyal. The great destiny of the third had left Lucius behind. And why? Because Saul had rejected it, and Lucius was his friend. His loyalty to Saul had just cost him his life. The Emperor's children, Death Guard, World Eaters, and the newly coined Lunar Wolves made a mad dash for the network of bunkers that lay below the city. Saul, Lucius, Rylanor, Garviel Loken, Tarek Torgadon, Erlen and thousands of Astartes loyal to the Emperor stood in dark halls, as fire and hate washed over an entire world above. Oceans boiled, forests melted, cities corroded, corpses and the unlucky survivors were torn apart, piece by piece, as virus bombs erase an entire culture from existence. The masks had been removed. A betrayal decades in the making was revealed. Foul entities of the warp had corrupted the War Master Horus. The Great Crusade was over, and with his legions, Horus would rescue the galaxy from the hands of an uncaring emperor. The galaxy would burn. A battle cry that would shape humanity for millennia. As the flames of a world on fire began to thin out, the Loyalists strode out to the eerie silence of a dead civilization. Inside all of them was confusion, and then the pulsing hatred for their betrayal. Their survival had been an oversight, a miscalculation, and the traitors would pay dearly for it. For months, the surviving Loyalists, commanded by Saul, Loken, and Tarek, prepared a defense so strong it would cost the traitors two lives for each loyalist. For a man who others mocked for his contentment at being a simple line officer, when the time called for him to be more, Saul rose to the challenge, his care for his brothers birthing this heightened ability to command. 
Saul and Lucius found themselves attacked by men who they had once fought together on countless worlds. Men they had once shared life with and pursued the path of perfection with. Though Lucius and Saul fought together for months in this exhausting guerrilla campaign, a crack had begun to open between them. The path towards damnation begins with the silence of a solitary mind. Saul hated the traitors, but he took no pleasure from their deaths. But Lucid had begun to find a perverse relishment. His previous battle brothers were a worthy test. More scars that left a flowing of power and righteousness from each kill. Over months, the feelings of friendship Lucius had felt for a near century had begun to turn to ash in his mouth. Here was Saul, the brother who he had always seen as his equal, barking orders to him. They were the same rank, but he had the audacity to act as his superior, and the others followed Saul. But yet he had greater skill. He should have been further along the path towards perfection. For the first time in his life, Lucius saw that Saul, his unambitious friend, who had natural talent, finally having ambition. Lucius had had to train ruthlessly, constantly test himself for decades, just to be Saul's equal. But what if Saul finally had ambition? That would mean he would surpass him. Like a poison, the anger grew and grew for weeks. Each sign of friendship, each display of protection became an insult. After another engagement against their previous commander, Eidolon, the jealousy, the hatred, the insecurity became too much. Lucius respected Eidolon because he acted just as a Camosian was expected to. A man the product of a selfish society who prioritized power and facade over loyalty. Lucius made his choice, and in the dead of night, he made Eidolon an offer. He offered Tarvitz. Tarvitz froze as he heard a voice say, It won't do any good, Saul. The presenter's palace is as good as lost. Even you should be able to see that. He looked up, and he saw Lucius standing in the center of the dome in front of him, his shimmering sword in one hand, and a shard of broken glass in the other. He raised the glass to his face, and sliced its razor edge along the cheek, drawing a line of blood from his skin that dripped onto the dome's floor. Lucius. Tarvitz, rising to his feet, entered the dome to meet the swordsman. I thought you were dead. Bright starlight filled the dome, and Tarvitz saw it was filled with the corpses of Emperor's children. Not traitors, but loyalists, and he could see that not one had fallen to a gunshot wound, but had been carved up by a powerful edged weapon. These warriors had been cut apart, and a horrible suspicion began to form in his mind. Dead, <laughs> laughed Lucius. Me? Do you remember what Loken said to me when I humbled him in the practice cages? Wary now, Tarvitz nodded. He said there was someone out there who could beat you. And do you remember what I told him? Yes replied Tarvitz, sliding his hands to the hilt of his broadsword. You said, not in this lifetime, didn't you? You have a good memory, said Lucius, dropping the bloody shard of glass to the floor. Who's that later scar for? asked Tarvitz. Lucius smiled, though there was no warmth to it. It's for you, Saul. You betrayed us! said Tarvitz, the hurt and disappointment almost too much to bear. You killed your own men and let Eidolon and his warriors into the palace, didn't you? I did, said Lucius, swinging his sword in loops around his body 
As he loosened his muscles in preparation for the fight, Tarvitz knew must come next. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Tarvitz circled the edge of the dome, his steps in time with those of the swordsman. He had no illusions as to the outcome of this fight. Lucius was the preeminent blade master of the Legion, perhaps all of the Legions. He knew he could not defeat Lucius, but this betrayal demanded retribution. Honor must be satisfied. Why, Lucius? asked Tarvitz. How can you ask me that, Sol? demanded Lucius, drawing the circle closer, and step by step, the distance between the two warriors shrank. I am only here to thank my misplaced acquaintance with you. I know what the Lord Commander and Fabius offered you. How could you turn such an opportunity down? It was an abomination, Lucius, said Tarvitz, knowing he had to keep Lucius talking for as long as he could. To tamper with the gene seed. How can you possibly believe that the Emperor would condone such a thing? The Emperor? <laughs> Are you so sure he would disapprove? Look at what he did to the Primarchs. Aren't we all the result of genetic manipulation? The experiments Fabius is conducting are the logical next link in that evolutionary chain. We are a superior race, and we must establish that superiority over any lesser beings that stand in our way. Even your fellow warriors, spat Tarvitz, gesturing to the corpses around the dome circumference with the blade of his sword. Lucius shrugged. Even them. I am going to rejoin my legion, and they tried to stop me. What choice did I have? Just like you are going to try and stop me. You'd kill me too? Asked Tarvitz. After all the years we've fought together. Don't try and appeal to my sense of fond reminiscences, Sol. Warned Lucius. I am better than you, and I am going to achieve great things in the service of my legion. Neither you or any foolish sense of misplaced loyalty are going to stop me. Lucius lifted the blade of his sword and dropped into a fighting crouch as Tarvitz approached him. The dome seemed suddenly silent as the two combatants circled one another, each searching for a weakness in the other's defense. Tarvitz drew his combat knife in his left hand and reversed the blade, knowing he would need as many blades between him and Lucius as humanly possible. Tarvitz knew that there were no more words to be spoken. This could only end in blood. Without warning, he leapt towards Lucius, thrusting with the smaller blade. But even as he attacked, he saw that Lucius had been expecting it. Lucius swayed aside and swept the hilt of his sword down, smashing the knife from his hand. The swordsman ducked as Tarvitz turned on his heel and slashed high with his sword. Tarvitz's blade cut only air, and Lucius hammered his elbow into his side. He danced away, expecting Lucius to land a blow, but the swordsman merely smiled and danced around him lightly on the balls of his feet. Lucius was playing with him. If that's the best you've got, Sol, then you'd best give up now, smirked Lucius. I promise, I'll make it quick. Going from the pursuit of perfection in all things to ultimate depravity isn't a journey anybody makes in one step. It's a series of small ones, each one justifiable in its own isolated way. But after you've taken a hundred of those small steps, you're a long way from who you were at the start. He betrayed him, his oldest friend in the galaxy, the man who had been by his side through dozens of war zones, 
The man who had stood by his side in the fire and mud of battle, he had fallen. Surrounded by the corpses of their fellow legionaries, the two brothers fought, both with hate, but one with sorrow, and the other rampant jealousy. Saul knew that he could not hope to win, but he wouldn't let this be the end. The duel degraded from a dance of swords to men punching each other in the mud, an unrefined display of primal rage. With the intervention of the loyalist Solathen, Lucius was forced to retreat. It would be the last time they ever saw each other. Lucius had betrayed the loyalists. His deal with Eidolon had assured his place back into the fold back towards the path of perfection at Fulgrim's side. And if it costs Saul's life, so be it. For it is only natural for ambitious men to leave behind others as they ascend. But it did burn him, not to have the scar across his cheek satisfied with a worthy kill. Recovering from another world-altering betrayal, Saul had no time to wallow. War was at his doorstep. Lucius's betrayal had left their defensive position flanked. Traitor forces began to swarm into every gap. As the brave warriors of the Emperor fell, they threw everything they had at the enemy. Each meter of ground lost would cost both sides dearly. For the man who had never let ambition take a hold of him, Saul, like a beacon of fire rallied the last of the Emperor's children and lunar wolves together. Each new, devastating piece of information that flooded in fell flat against an iron will that rallied in the face of hopelessness. As the thousands of superhuman warriors clashed, the last of the loyalists began to whittle away under the suffocating march of Eidolon's troops. Half covered in rubble, smoke and ash, Saul turned to the last 100 men alive. Brothers of different legions looked back at him. He knew all of their names. They were all men he was honored to die by, but most importantly, he had been honored to live besides. As a silent army of thousands stared from kilometers away, Saul and his men looked above through the cracked citadel roof witnessing the death from orbit approaching. Solothen asked Saul if they had hurt them, and with his last words in the universe, Saul replied, Yes, we hurt them here. They'll remember this. Flame and death swept over the last remaining warriors of the Emperor. An action that should have ended in moments took months for the traitors, a delay they would never recover from. Saul had fought for hope. The Imperial truth was that great hope for humanity, a view that had to be murdered by the newly cleansed Emperor's children. Great men are not born great. It is something forged, and when the time came, he rose to it. Saul climbed, becoming the man others needed him to be. It was perfection. Victorious. Lucius was welcomed back into his legion. The two brothers who had embodied each side of the coin that was the third legion and Fulgrim, now one side was facing down permanently, expunged. Finally, Lucius was back upon the path that Fulgrim followed, and the truth was revealed to him. The Emperor was not perfection. He was an obstacle. He had hidden the truth from them about the war, about the gods, the primordial truth of chaos. A new prerogative had begun to spread throughout the Legion. Lucius and the others could sense this unspoken permission to explore, to take the pursuit of perfection and to ramp it up, cast down the barriers of morality for it was only an obstacle. The Third Legion's pursuits became excessive. Their weapons and armor became more vibrant and shaped. Genetic splicing, a sight that once horrified Saul Tarvitz, was embraced. They relished in acts that were taboo 
because each new sensation, each new experience opened their eyes to how laughably naive their previous image of perfection was. Where once had been a level of self-belief, bordering on the level of arrogance, Lucius stepped over the line and it became the real thing. He was the greatest duelist in the Legion. His newfound depravity elevated him, taking a simple test of life and death to a torturous display of utter superiority. Just as how he left cuts and scars on his opponents in his youth, that sadistic streak rose again. With each pathetic enemy defeated, it felt incredible. We tell ourselves lies, such as when I have power, I will be just. I would wield it and shape the world into a better place. Oh, the pride of mankind, to think you would not be corrupted, that you would not let the adrenaline pumping, enchanting sensation change you. The galaxy was at war. The unthinkable had happened. The favoured son of the Emperor, Horace Lupercal, had turned traitor. Sides were being drawn up. And so Lucius and the Emperor's children began their preparations for the next stage. The galaxy was about to burn. As the Legion approached their next target, the Emperor's children gathered upon Fulgrim's flagship, the pride of the Emperor. All were mandated to listen to a masterpiece, a symphony crafted by the renowned Bekwa Kinska, one of the many remembrances who had clawed their way to be attached to the renowned and magnificent Third Legion during the Great Crusade. In the Grand Theatre of La Fenice, Lucius, Fulgrim, and their brethren all bore witness to the masterpiece known as Maravaglia. Music drafted from the inspiration taken upon their previously conquered world of Leron. As Lucius began to listen, he spotted strange new musical equipment that he had never seen before. Pieces that began to emanate a sound unlike anything he had ever heard before. The vibrations began to ripple through their bodies, a sense of pure ecstasy, beauty and disorientation shot through thousands of mortals and superhumans. Mania roared through Lucius's head as he joined into a mosh pit of slaughter and hedonism around him. The debased music blurred the lines between the warp and real space, and for the first time in his life, Lucius saw demons, creatures of spine-tingling beauty and horror, something only a foul mind could truly appreciate. Possessing the bodies of Bekwa Kinska and the other performers, pure chaotic taint washed over Lucius and the Legion, all laughing and crying as they fueled their new patron god, Slanesh, she who thirsts. Arriving upon the world of Istvan V, Lucius and the Third descended down to the surface, preparing for an ambush against the incoming loyalist forces. Utter delight burned inside Lucius as he almost drooled at the idea of slaying more Astartes. Chances to enjoy the torture, enjoy the superiority and pleasures of war, as the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard, accompanied by numerous Titan Legions and Imperial Guard, began their march against the Emperor's children, Sons of Horus, World Eaters, and Death Guard. One of the largest, bloodiest battles in human history began. A torrent of blades, Bolt shells, plasma fire, and armor crashed into a concophony of violence. So overwhelming, it would melt what little sanity you possessed. As the Emperor's children clashed head to head with the Iron Hands, a tirade of purple and black armor smashed against each other. Once the closest of all the legions, 
with Fulgrim and Ferris Manus sharing the greatest bond between all Primarchs. But now men Lucius had once fought with on numerous campaigns fell to his impeccable blade work. More scars honoured with corpses, each betrayal felt a little sweeter. The mix of recognition, sorrow and then delight at having crushed a being now beneath him. The power was exhilarating. As the three loyalist legions tried to retreat, the full horror of the betrayal was revealed as the Night Lords, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers and Alpha Legion turned upon their supposed allies. It became an apocalyptic slaughter, leading to Lucius bear witness to a moment of history as his Primarch Fulgrim beheaded Ferris Manus. A Primarch had died. The celebrations and trophies of the dead adorned the Third Legion ships. Pieces were turned into art and captives were taken for experimentation. Lucius' skill and laser ambition had allowed him into the inner circle. Now he stood by Fulgrim's side, a place he knew he deserved to be in. As a token of his office, Fulgrim gifted to him the Layer Blade, the exquisite silver sabre that had taken the head of a Primarch. As the months began to roll by, with the Imperium divided and burning, the Emperor's children conquered planet after planet, each battle resulting in Lucius and the Legion pushing further upon the boundaries of excess. But something had caught the eyes of Lucius. Being in such close proximity to his Primarch, the man who he had seen as a god in his childhood on Chemos, all the way to the Primarch achieving perfection, he noticed something was wrong. Fulgrim seemed lesser. Perhaps Lucius himself had become so powerful that he had caught up. But it was different. Fulgrim began to make tactical mistakes. His knowledge of Legion traditions and rites seemed faulty. Lucius even witnessed him perform psychic abilities and even in sparring. A two slayers that Fulgrim had overseen personally with all his senior officers. Lucius seemed to best him. A Primarch? Dark dreams and whispers haunted Lucius, leading him to the heart of the La Fenice Theatre. Peering into this corrupted place, he saw a perfect portrait of his Primarch, with eyes showing horror too real for human hands to capture. Lucius was shocked. Lucius convened with the Brotherhood of the Phoenix, the Inner Circle. All despised him for his arrogance, for it was even too much for them to bear. But Lucius was not stupid, for he understood minds similar to his. He challenged their egos and stroked their vanity, tempting them into boldly capturing their Primarch, for Fulgrim was not himself. In a bloody struggle, with many casualties, the Legion's senior officers restrained the fraud and began to torture him, only for realization to strike. Fulgrim let the ruse go and broke instantly from his restraints. The true Fulgrim stood before them and he revealed the truth. It had been a demon bound in the layer blade that had possessed him. A cretin that now resided within the painting, baiting Lucius to free it. The ruse by their Primarch had been a test and a revelation, a metamorphosis of Fulgrim fully embracing their corruption, that now their path of perfection belonged to Slanesh, a new path for Lucius to follow. The call of death is a call of love. Death can be sweet if we answer it in the affirmative. If we accept it as one of the great eternal forms of life and transformation. The moment where man becomes something greater than his rude beginnings. 
a flying, godlike, shimmering, diaphanous, beautiful creature. You have some skill, he said as they circled one another. The warrior didn't reply, and only then did Lucius note that he was no iron hand. Raven guard, he said, recognizing the grip, stance, and angle of blades favored by Korax's shadow warriors. That explains why you're still alive. The Raven Guard attacked in a darting series of blinding feints, high cuts, and dazzlingly fast thrusts that Lucius parried, dodged, and backed away from in an increasingly swift-paced duel. The warrior wasn't just skilled, he was talented too, gifted even. I haven't killed any blackbirds in a while. <laughs> Since... Istvan, at least, giggled Lucius. The warrior didn't react to Lucius's goading, which marked him as even more skilled than he'd thought. Realizing he would not easily get a rise out of the Raven Guard, Lucius put aside his need to humiliate his opponent as well as defeat him. Time and time again they came at each other, spinning like dancers, locked in a routine that could only end in the death of one of the performers. Lucius studied the warrior as they fought. His movements were like oil in the air, a slick progression of flowing poise. His blade work was flawless, technically perfect, but empowered by an innate understanding of the art form of the sword. With a start, Lucius realized that this warrior was almost the equal of him. A jolt of uncertainty flooded Lucius at the thought that the warrior had a chance of besting him. He laughed, giddy at having finally met a worthy foe, his every nerve surging at the idea of defeat. The Raven Guard sprang at him with his twin black swords extended before him. Lucius rolled aside and sprang to his feet in time to block a downward cut and scissored his body to avoid a disemboweling slash to the gut. His own sword lanced down to the Raven Guard's neck but a burst of thrust carried the warrior away again. Lucius unhooked the whip he had taken from dead Kalimos, letting the barbed length of it uncoil like a hungry snake. Just me and thee now, said Lucius, removing his helm and tossing it aside. He reached up and raised a well on his cheek, a scar that should have long since healed, but which had been kept raw and marked with caustic powders. You cut me before, and I will always treasure that wound. But that's all you're getting, Raven Guard. Sharokin. What? My name, said the warrior. It's Nikona Sharokin. Just so you know who it is that's killed you. Nikona Sharokin, said Lucius, rolling the name around in his mouth as though experiencing a new flavor. No, that's not the name of a man that can kill me. You don't get to decide, said Sharokin, one sword held high over his head, the other extended low. They circled one another warily, each aware of the other's skill, and knowing they were well matched. Neither paid heed to the battles raging around them, the life and death struggles being played out, in the ruins of a dying race's tomb. All that mattered was the purity of the duel. All other pretenders to this fight were dead, and all that remained to be decided was which of them would walk away. Lucius attacked first, lashing his whip at Sharokin's head. The barbed tip scored a line through the faceplate and left eye lens. Lucius followed up with a low cut to the thigh, redirected at the last instant for the groin. Sharokin read the move and blocked with the cross blades, spinning on his heel to hammer his elbow into Lucius' head. But Lucius wasn't there, rolling forwards beneath the blow to thrust his blade at the base of Sharokin's spine. More flame from the Raven Guard's junk pack carried him away from the paralyzing strike. He spun as he landed to face Lucius once more. You're fast, son of Korax, said Lucius. Too fast for you, traitor. Lucius smiled. 
you won't goad me into foolishness. Even before Lucius finished speaking, Sharakin gunned his jets again. Instead of dodging, Lucius leapt up to meet the Raven Guard with his whip, slashing and his sword stabbing. He saw the black outline of the Raven Guard coming at him and stabbed his sword into where Sharakin's throat would be. His blade struck only empty air, and the shock of that almost cost him his life. Somehow, impossibly, the Raven Guard wasn't there. A blade plunged into his side, and Lucius twisted away from the fiery, unexpected, and exquisite pain. Lucius spun, feeling suddenly helpless as the Raven Guard slipped around him with dizzying speed, his blade stabbing again and again. Then the Raven Guard was at Lucius' back, pushing him to his knees. Blades pressed down through his gorget into the hollows either side of his neck. It gives me no pleasure to do this, said Sharokin. You are nothing to me, simply a rabbit dog that needs to be put down. Lucius tried to speak, to say something to mark his death. Sharokin's blade stabbed down behind Lucius' collarbone, tearing through his heart and lungs severing arteries and wreaking catastrophic damage that not even a space marine's post-human physiology could undo, and all thoughts of worthy valediction died with him. The call of death is a call of love. Death can be sweet if we answer it in the affirmative. If we accept it as one of the great eternal forms of life and transformation, the moment where man becomes something greater than his rude beginnings, a flying, godlike, shimmering, diaphanous, beautiful creature. Years of climbing down the descent of madness had become Lucius's and the Emperor's children's climb towards their path of perfection. The traitor forces had gone from what was a deviation in character to the personification of the worst traits of humanity. Lucius, Fulgrim, and the Emperor's children had fully let the corruption flow over them. For Lucius, this only seemed to accentuate his worst tendencies. He acknowledged the gods. He knew of the great boons of Slanesh, but he did not bow and grovel. He wholeheartedly believed he did not need to earn anything, for he was the greatest swordsman, the greatest duelist. He took what he wanted. He followed where he wanted. He indulged in what he wanted. The corruption of Slanesh had become more psychological for him. The thrill of killing was nothing compared to the overwhelming influx of pleasure he felt, slowly picking apart his opponents. His mind had been changed. To acknowledge any mistakes was weakness, imperfect. To point out a flaw or to chastise Lucius, he felt an overwhelming sense of anger, a threat to his self-image. It was abhorrent and had to be crushed violently, a self-defense mechanism that lacked the strength to acknowledge shortcomings, to acknowledge insecurities. But to Lucius he had none, so they were all lies. Gone was the man who had apologized to his friend Saul. Gone was the man who had brothers and friendship, for he was above it all. As the Imperium burned for years, Hundreds of worlds crushed under the shadow of the depraved Third Legion, Fulgrim finally directed his forces together towards a new goal. A weapon that could turn the tide, as the traitors began to turn their attentions towards terror itself. Assembling before Perturabo, the Primarch of the Iron Warriors, and his Legion, they saw what the Third Legion had become. 500 warriors in the shimmering purple of the Emperor's children emerged from the smoke, and their appearance drew a gasp of shock from the assembled Iron Warriors. 
Lashes of vivid pigment were spattered over contrasting hues and clashing colours, offending the eyes with their garish disregard for the Legion's heraldry. Jagged spikes jutted from pauldrons, and their helmets were Byzantine winged affairs. The heart within was reflected. Lucius wore upon his battle plate displays of ravenous excess. Slaves dragged in chains in this parade of madness. Flayed skin artworks, fumes that began to tickle the heart and spine of any who dared partake. The sight was disgusting, only appreciated by those too devolved to have sense. With Lucius as his personal guard, Fulgrim came to offer his brother Perturabo the chance to claim this weapon, the Angel Exterminatus together. Their path took them directly into the Eye of Terror, the malignant storm that was a breach from real space into the warp. As the traitorous forces followed the gruelling path, they were ambushed. A cruiser ship, the Sisu Fem, a mashing together of loyalist survivors of Isvan V, launched themselves at the traitors. It felt exhilarating for Lucius once more to test himself upon Astartes, and the layer blade in his hand tasted Iron Hand's blood once more. In the midst of the melee, Lucius caught sight of a shadow in his periphery, a darting figure that finally made a killing strike. A cut was cleaved across Lucius's face. Only one. Garville Logan had ever left a mark upon him, and a fresh wound filled him with maddening delight and hate. This pathetic little raven had cut him, finally a challenge to test himself, to see how much more perfect he was becoming. The two would clash again upon the surface of the crone world the traitors were assaulting, each traitor force leaving ancient Eldari automaton corpses in the wake of their march. Again the shadow came for him, the surviving loyalists ambushed them. Just before the Eldar citadel, Nakonia Sharokin of the Raven Guards, black emotionless eyes looked into the bloodshot, mad ones of Lucius. Lucius began to taunt and goad him, enjoying himself. But quickly he found he had to use all of his concentration. He was being matched. His opponent's skill was equal. Impossible. For how could any be his equal? Blades clash in a whirl and dance. So far as that other Astartes would have been overwhelmed. The duel was incredible. No one had pushed Lucius this far before. As Lucius made his attempts to end this little play thing, twin black swords plunged into his dual hearts. Blood poured from him as Lucius heard words he had dreaded most in this universe. It gives me no pleasure to do this. You are nothing to me. Simply a rabid dog that needs to be put down. The last vestiges of life left Lucius, but this seemingly miserable end had not gone unnoticed. For the call of death is a call of love. Death can be sweet, a chance to become something greater, a godlike, shimmering, diaphanous, beautiful creature. Always, it was just ahead of him, taunting him, drawing him on. Right now it appeared as a slender, minretti of fluted ivory and mother of pearl, with a couple of that burned in silver fire. It stood amidst the thick forests of trees that ride with their own sick radiance. Living flames leapt from branch to branch, giggling with childish amusement, as the forest grew and fell back, denying him a way through. Scared of me, are you? The blue flame at the top of the tower flared brighter in response. Lucius drew his sword, its radiant silver. It had been a gift from his Primarch, 
too noble a weapon for hewing, but needs must. Lucius hacked at the glass trees, shattering glowing limbs to fragments with every swing. He pushed deeper into the glittering forest, shorn branches reforming behind him with the sounds of windows breaking in reverse. The capering flames screeched in annoyance, but Lucius ignored them. They darted in and sought to burn him. He unhooked the barbed wire that he had lifted from Kalamos and lashed them back. They squealed and fled each agonizing touch. Then the forest parted and Sanak's tower was before him. Closer now he saw the mercury bright flame, veining the structure like a living thing. A warrior in crimson armor stood in a dueling circle of flattened sand before the tower. Twin swords hung at his waist. One pommel cat with a dark jackal's head, the other a white hawk. Both were hooked kopesh blades with strange shimmering curves, which gave Lucius a thrill of anticipation. To face a new blade was always interesting. I hear you've been looking to fight me, Lucius. Sanact said. The warrior's face was obscured behind a helm with a silver crest and faceplate. Are you Sanact? I am Sanact of the Athenaeans, yes. I've come to fight you. Is it your wish to die? Lucius laughed. <laughs> I think I've tried that once already, so I'm not about to try that again. Sanact removed his helm, revealing a youthful face and close-cropped ash-blonde hair, innocently handsome in a way that Lucius couldn't wait to destroy. Your feelings say different. You want to know why you came back. That is why you sought me out, to find a swordsman as skilled as the raven, one who revels in the kill. Sanact said, They tell me you're good. I'm the best of my legion. That's not saying much. Lucius hissed. Lucius put the whip to his belt and entered the dueling circle. Sanact drew his swords, one crystalline edged and glittering with witch fire, the other a simple energy blade. Lucius rolled his shoulders and swung his blade to loosen his wrists. He had sparred with his own legion, but had stopped short of killing anyone since Yidris. No such restraint was needed here. He circled Sanact, studying his movements, assaying his reach and footwork. He was strength and speed, confidence that crossed into arrogance. So like himself, it was almost funny. I assure you, I will defeat- Lucius attacked, before the Thousand Suns warrior finished speaking. All of his strikes were repulsed with casual ease. They broke apart and circled again, studying one another using obvious cuts and feints to test the other's metal. You have natural ability, but I have studied every school of blade since the first swords were hacked from the Debrugia flint beds of old earth. Sanact said. They came together again in a clash of blades. Sanat was blindingly fast, his two weapons moving in perfect concert. Lucius could fight with two swords, but preferred the focus of a single blade. Sanak's blades cut high and low, forcing him to work twice as hard to keep them at bay. Your thoughts betray you, Sanak said. Lucius heard the first traces of amusement in Sanak's voice. You fight with passion, but I can feel every attack before you make it. Are you actually giving me tips on technique? Sneered Lucius. Sanak swayed aside from a throat-opening thrust. I am a scholar of martial knowledge. It is my duty to pass on what I have learned to others by example. Thanks, but I don't need your help, retorted Lucius. You are manifestly incorrect. Anger touched Lucius, but instead of controlling it, he let it consume him. An angry swordsman made mistakes. But now he needed that anger. He threw himself at his opponent, disregarding any notion of defense, just going for the kill. He wanted to take this arrogant cur apart, to gut him without mercy and without finesse, to give him an ugly death. Sanak turned the attacks aside with lightning-fast parries and reposts. 
but Lucius kept up with unrelenting pressure. He forced him back to the edge of the circle, relishing the confusion he saw in Sanact's eyes. No longer able to pick out Lucius' emotions from the morace of anger, Sanact was falling back onto techniques learned by rote and ancient teachers, and that just wasn't good enough. Lucius awoke upon the apothecarian table. He had died. He was sure of it. Twin blades had pierced his heart, and yet he lived. Nikonia Sharokin, the Raven Guard, had defeated him, and he took no pleasure from it. A thought that was utterly alien to Lucius's mind. If anyone had achieved the impossible and defeated him, how could they not roar with triumph? How could they not be overcome with satisfaction? The champion of the Third Legion had walked a path of perfection, a journey rife with ambition, betrayal, and sedition. A life of utter focus on blade work. It consumed him, creating this mad feed that exuded pleasure from slaying his foes, demonstrating his power and perfection. Dark eyes bore down on the boy from Chemos, taking utter delight in each vile act he did, fueling the Prince of Pleasure. Even the cursed apothecary Fabius Bile had no idea how Lucius had returned to life, a mystery he would begin to understand in the years to come. Following the events of the Angel Exterminatus, the Third Legion was directionless. Fulgrim's grand quest had succeeded, and he had become the Angel Exterminatus. Fueling a dark apotheosis with a life force stolen from his brother Perturabo, a multi-limbed, sensual, snake-like entity roared into existence as Fulgrim ascended into a demon primarch. Leaderless, elements of the Legion scattered, turning into warbands that simply ravaged the galaxy, loosely under the authority of the corrupted Warmaster Horus. Lucius's ego had been hit. He needed to reclaim his feelings of power again. He needed to prove to himself that he was close towards perfection. He needed to fight the deeply riddled insecurity of weakness. And so he sought out worthy challenges. Sanact of the Athenaeans, a surviving member of the Broken Thousand Sons, was a name whispered to Lucius, an Astarte said to be the greatest, something the vile Lucius couldn't resist. Alone, Lucius made his way to the crumbling ruins of the planet of the sorcerers, cutting his way through a glass forest until he finally met his opponent. Two arrogant men faced each other, both far cries from the men they were during the Great Crusade. Both more powerful, but yet both lesser too. The duel had begun, and the two matched each other with blinding speed. It was the pinnacle of martial contest, as each stroke was utterly perfect, pulling deep from that pit of malice that had always been a part of him. Lucius finally disarmed Sanact, but before he could claim his prize, the Thousand Sun was saved with the intervention of Azek Ariman, the first captain of the Thousand Sons. Lucius was furious and decided he would accompany Ariman on his quest to retrieve the Iron Oculus for the sole purpose of waiting for an opportunity to duel Sanact. Thousands of bodies fell to Lucius's blade upon the quest as the group finally made their way to the world of Nike. The Thousand Sons, Lucius, and their Imperial enemies both became trapped within a crystal labyrinth. Within this shimmering labyrinth, Lucius was confronted by the forms of Sanact, Garviel Loken, and Nikonia Sharokin, ghosts of his one true fear, losing. Drawing the layer blade, Lucius attacked, defeating them all. 
overcoming the insecurity of weakness. But at the moment of triumph, the moment where he would release the burdens to his perfection, he saw it. He saw a reflection of his previous uncorrupted self, Lucius, the son of Chemos, servant of the Emperor and friend of Saul Tarvitz. How far had he fallen? But any semblance of reflection or sorrow could not reach his heart. He screamed as he only perceived the reminder of his weaknesses. Lucius was swallowed by the crystal maze, lost within this mad prison, only escaping to enact a rage against the material universe. He lay in that fog until the psychic scream rippled through every fiber of his being. Fulgrim, just on instinct, he knew what this meant. Their lord was calling his children to his side. Lucius returned as the remnants of the Third Legion gathered in preparation for the end game. The Siege of Terror. The shambling, disgusting, sensual mess that was the Emperor's children darkened the skies of the throne world, genetically manipulated, with all manner of sensory machines grafted, with iconography and artwork knitted from living things you could barely call human. The traitorous forces burned the throne world, beginning the most grueling, horrifying siege in human history. On the world that Saul had hoped to stand side by side with Nathaniel Garrow on, felt the wrath of Lucius and the Emperor's children. Mere killing should never be enough. How much more intense is the feeling of inhaling the mist created when you vibrate a foe's body until he vaporizes? How much more completely have you explored all a person can offer you than when you breathe them? into yourself, leaving only the memory of them still a part of this world. Slanted, coal-rimmed eyes beheld the Eternal, bright with cunning and malicious intelligence. Dark sable hair threaded with crimson dye was scraped up in a tight scalp, locked over in a circlet of the same dark crystal she stood upon. Contoured plates of segmented armor sheathed her inhumanly tall, slender physique, inked with elaborate and revolting patterns that flowed and writhed upon the dark surfaces. They framed a fist-sized pendant of a skull pierced by three splinters of bone, set at the center of her chest and carved from wraith bone as white as untouched snow, a withered, Androgynous slave of a species Lucius could not identify, cowed in chains on the plinth at her side. It carried a long, slender device in its grimy claws, holding one end of it up in front of her lips. She spoke again, her words twisting through the device and rendered into gothic with a sibilant hiss. My contemporaries find it to touch theatrical. But what is life without art? Hello, little gold maker. Lucius bared his cage of needle teeth in a smile at the dark Eldar. The air was filled with a low shriek of anti-grav engines. Eldar and spite Carapus suit swept down around Lucius, tearing through the air on angular, bladed skyboards. The aliens whooped and jeered at Lucius as they spun in increasing, tighter circles around him, brandishing hooked glaives and serrated daggers. Pay them no mind, said the Eldar, raising an arm and throwing back the shoulder of her cloak of dark fur and flayed skin. With a gesture, the Helions came to a halt, glaring at Lucius with undisguised hunger. 
They are always eager to sample the newest additions to my menagerie. So let them, Lucius said. His head was swimming so thoroughly that at first he didn't realize that it was he who had spoken. The proximity to so many of the Eldar was an intoxicating thing. The strangled beat of their withering hearts, their cloying, black scent sinking through to his marrow. Let me taste their flesh, their blood. Slanesh will relish the flavor of their souls. Your god. The Eldar laughed like a serrated blade scraping over glass. Your idiot race does so amuse me. The things it bends the knee to in worship. I would not go so far as to call myself devoted, said Lucius, still bearing his predatory grin. But one needs no faith to see how the youngest god's love for you transcends all the others. The ones who ushered forth his birth. I have received gifts from him. And what sort of monster would I be if I did not unite your souls with him in thanks? The Comorite mistress considered his words for a moment. Ah, yes. Gifts. Tell me. The one of your race I barter with, trading flesh for secrets. The Manflayer. He has told me of you. The one your rabble calls Eternal. He tells me of your gifts. He says you live, despite tasting the embrace of oblivion time after time. She reached up, holding just shy of stroking a clawed fingertip across Lucius's cheek. Death refuses to hold you. You die, and yet you rise. And on, and on. I exchanged many secrets to acquire you. I wish to learn how. Cut me loose, said Lucius, leaning forward until the tendrils bit deep into his armor. Feed me that little wretch of yours, and I will tell you in privacy. The Eldar smirked, withdrawing her hand. She ran her fingers across the skull of her slave, carving gashes into its flesh with the crystal claws that tipped her gloves. It is a miserable thing, is it not? That is so, but it is not wholly useless to me. She gestured at the device the wretch held. Lucius ran his tongue over his fangs. When you speak like that, the way your face moves, I can't help myself but think of how I'll shudder when I eat your eyes. He tilted his head. If you want, I'll eat them one at a time. Would you like that? Would you like to watch me? If the words had any impact upon the Eldar, she gave no outward sign. She remained unfazed, her stare still half-lidded in arrogant contempt. Your race has always been infantile, in a clumsy, belligerent, and repellent way. I often forget how recently it was that you first crawled out from the primordial ooze of your first world. If you wish to show me rather than tell, it is of no consequence. She said as she rested a claw tip between Lucius' eyes. The answers I seek are within you somewhere. She sank her nail into Lucius's face, drawing a trickle of dark blood to spill over the claw and patter onto her boots. Lucius gasped with the transcendence of her touch as the tendrils fastened around his body began to loosen. The Eldar mistress grinned as she withdrew her hand, and Lucius dropped away into the dark. I am Thindrak, Archon of the Cabal of the Last Hatred, and I shall enjoy learning just how much of you I will have to cut out to find them. Mere killing should never be enough. 
How much more intense is the feeling of inhaling the mist created when you vibrate a foe's body until he vaporizes? How much more completely have you explored all of a person can offer you than when you breathe them into yourself, leaving only the memory of them still a part of this world? The traitors lost. The war master Horus had been slain. The emperor of mankind was crippled, interned upon the golden throne as a carrion lord. Lucius, Fulgrim, and the shambling horde that was the Emperor's children ravaged the Imperium as they fled to the massive warp rift, the Eye of Terror. The slightly mad, endorphined high, grievously scarred Lucius had nothing left to him but indulgence. The Scarlet Blade, a gladiatorial contest held by the Emperor's children, became a divine place for Lucius. Endless contest, endless slaughter, as all manner of opponents, willing and unwilling, were broken down in utter cruelty. The victories, the perfect skill, the admiration of the crowd, it felt incredible. A scale so far tipped towards arrogance, his insecurities were washed away. The sea of madness, the warp, twisted and turned around Lucius, servants of the delightful god Slanesh, fed upon the extreme emotions rippling from him. Oh, he was loved. The favoured sun had climbed, plucking the fruit of perfection, and he consumed the rotten, twisted prize. The climb of this incredible duelist drew jealous eyes. Lord Commander Sirius, hateful, arrogant, and jealous, decided he needed to destroy this upstart obstacle. Stepping into the ring at the final round of the Scarlet Blade, Sirius challenged the blood-dripping, scarred thing that was Lucius. Armed with only a simple sword and a tunic, Lucius giggled in delight and launched himself at this fully armoured opponent. It was not a fair contest, but a murder in disguise. Each wound Lucius took, his laughter grew. The corruption of Slanesh turned jolting pain into spasms of ecstasy. Sirius beat Lucius to death until the laughing stopped. Sirius felt immense pleasure and pride from slaying Lucius, but the victorious champion would suffer a fate worse than death. For weeks, the Lord Commander began to change. His hair fell out. Others could hear him scream in the night. Some nights it almost sounded like laughter, someone else's laughter. Dark lines appeared under his flesh, growing until they formed a maze of scar tissue. His armor began to shift. The look of flayed faces rippled across its surfaces. After weeks, like a snake shedding its skin, Lucius was reborn, the champion of Slanesh. His existence eternal. A face of roped scars, a tongue like a viper, elongated teeth, hoofed feet, each nerve sensitive to a level where pleasure and pain blurred. Lucius felt incredible. He was more powerful than ever. He was purged of any weakness, such as sympathy, kindness, friendship, and his humanity. More predator than man. His thoughts focus on his next pleasurable experience. Selfishness personified. To stand before Lucius, your spine would tingle. The hair on the back of your neck would stand up. As the monster before you would leave you begging for the mercy of death. The champion of Slanesh gathered forces loyal to him. The Cohort Nasike, warriors in dedication to the Prince of Pleasure. In search of worthy foes, 
countless number of champions of the Imperium, and Xenos fell to his blade. Lucius had now developed no regard for his own life, in fact, even taking extreme pleasure in it. As for the impossible happened, when the champion of Slanesh fell, his opponent, rife with pride, would begin to change. The roped scarred flesh of Lucius each time would emerge from underneath, shedding his opponent from humans, Eldar, and even growing like a tumour inside the living metal of Necrons. All faces that emerged in screaming horror across his armour. He carried all their souls with him. After a near endless cycle, a stretch of time impossible to measure within the eye of terror, Lucius was captured, sold as a gift to a dark elder Archon by one of his own, Fabius Bile. The venomous monster delighted in his captor's questioning. The smell of those favoured by she who thirsts made his skin throb. The corruption of the Dark Prince lives in every fibre of his being. Like a toy, Lucius was dropped into the pits of the vilest, most gruesome place in the material universe, the Dark City of Komara. Dark Eldar bodies piled up in a display of combat so fast, so utterly cruel and perfect, it made his patron god smile. Lucius enacted an uprising. With a layer blade in hand, he slaughtered his way free, uniting his cohorts Nasike with other corrupted Astartes prisoners, forging a new, devastating, disgusting force, the Faultless. A battle cry and a world view he would take to the material universe, for more slaughter was his to claim. Eternal, the universe will suffer this arrogant, cruel, hateful monster, for each champion who feels pride in his defeat becomes the monster, and the only way to end the cycle, the only way to defeat him devoid of pride, is someone who loves him, and the only man who ever loved him as a brother would, died in the fires of Istvan. Pity the monster who lives in this universe without love. But I am glad, Alexis. I am glad to have been. I am glad to have known you. It is something that friendship can exist at all in this universe of terror and betrayal. They shall be my finest warriors, these men who give of themselves to me. Like clay I shall mold them, and in the furnace of war forge them. They will be of iron will and steely muscle. In great armor shall I clad them, and with the mightiest guns will they be armed. They will be untouched by plague or disease. No sickness will blight them. They will have tactics, strategies, and machines, so that no foe can best them in battle. They are my bulwark against the terror. They are the defenders of humanity. They are my space marines, and they shall know no fear. Alexis, you must move. I see a face surrounded by rim-caked fur. The eyes are blue, the blue of glacial ice. Alias, it is Alias, my brother. He is still with me. 
Behind his face a blizzard fills the starlight sky with spiraling shards of white. You must move now. I feel him grip my arms and yank me to my feet. Bright pain flares through my body, jagged edged, slicing and grinding with every movement. I scream again. The pain is how you know you are still alive, shouts Elias over the wind, blink, trying to focus. The numbness recedes. I can feel my limbs again. There is no comfort in the returning sensations. These are splintered lands, the night-soaked side of Inuit, which has never seen the sun. The cold is as constant as the night. The warriors of the ice cast only venture here in metal-plated environmental suits. But those who wish to join the Legion must cross this desolate place, in rotting pelts and rags. It is a test, a journey throughout a midnight realm of agony. I have chosen that journey, but I will not see its end. There is blood on the ice, frozen hard, trailing away into the distance. Where is it? I ask, looking at Elias. He shakes his head, strips of rag hide his face. The snow-caked furs magnify his bulk, so that he looks more like a tundra ox than a man. I do not know. But it is close, he says, his voice muffled but still strong. I know that his hands are swollen and black with frozen blood, but the pain does not even reach his eyes. As I fade, he is unbowed. He is my brother, my twin in all ways except one. He is stronger than me. He always has been. I would not have made it this far without him, and now I have failed him. He should leave me here. He looks at me, as if he heard my thoughts. Do not even think it, Alexis. I am not leaving you. I open my mouth, but the reply dies in my throat. Over the snow-laden wind I hear it again, a low animal sound, like a breath released with a smile of anticipation. Elias has gotten utterly still. There's a growl from behind me, a crackling purr that floods my veins with warm fear. The beast has found us. It wants me. I know. I am weak and bleeding, and it has already tasted my blood. There is another growl, closer, longer. I can imagine it slinking across the ice behind me, its muscles moving with delicate slowness, its colorless eyes on my back. It is waiting to see what I will do, judging its attack for the moment when it is certain, and whilst it prepares, it wants its prey to know fear. The growl comes again, nearer, and I can hear the soft noises as the beast slides its furred body across the ice. I try to make myself calm, to ready my failing muscles for movement. Elias keeps his eyes steady on mine. He knows what I intend. It is what he would have done. I nod once, very slowly. I hear the beast's claws scratch over the ice. In my mind, I can almost see its muscles buncher under its ice-dusted pelt. The beast roars as it leaps towards my back, the sound rising over the blizzard. I dive to the side, my muscles on fire. I am too slow. The beast jaws close on my trailing left arm. It turns as it lands, dragging me across the ice. Teeth tear through my flesh. I can smell the rank meat stink on its mouth. The animal reek of its body. It flicks his head, my arms still between its teeth. I hear joints pop, and agony flashes across my eyes. I do not even feel it as I slam back to the ground. It releases my arm, and places a clawed paw on my chest. Ribs crack, and needle-sharp claws touch my skin. There is a yell, and suddenly the pressure on my chest is gone. I scramble to pull myself away and look up. Elias is standing with his back to a crevasse, his body poised, arms spread like a wrestler. Between us, the beast coils on its six legs. Pale fur covers its long body, from the snout of its shovel-shaped head to the end of its twitching tail. It pauses, assessing the new prey that has drawn its attention away from the easier kill. It tenses. I cannot see my brother's face, 
but I know that under the rag mask he is smiling. The beast pounces. Elias is still. The beast's jaws are wide, its glassy teeth like knife blades. My brother moves at the last instant, pivoting as his arms come up to the beast's neck. He turns, and the beast's momentum spins it through the air, towards the waiting crevasse. It is almost perfect. Almost. I start running, pain and injury falling away. The beast twists as it flies through the air, its forelimb raking flesh. The long hooked claws fasten on Elias's leg. The beast howls as both tumble together into the crevasse. I reach the edge in time to grab my brother as he falls. His weight pulls me off my feet. The beast claws come free and it vanishes into the crevasse, drops of blood following as its panicked snarls into the darkness below. Elias is hanging from my hand. I am on my front, my right hand gripping a ridge in the ice. My head and left arm extended over the crevasse's edge. My brother is spinning at the end of my grasp, his hand locked around mine. My arm is a lacerated ruin, the flesh punctured and chewed in the beast's jaws, and Elias's weight is pulling the wounds into broad and bloody smiles. The pain is like nothing I've ever felt. Blood is running over our hands, my hold is slipping. Pain and fear have become one inside me. I will not let this happen. I am strong enough. I must be strong enough. I try to pull him up, and my grunt of effort becomes a scream. I cannot lift him. My right hand holding the ice ridge slips. I jerk forward, sliding further over the edge. Alexis. My brother's voice is so low that it is almost lost on the wind. I look down at Elias, his eyes flick to our hands, the frostbitten flesh slick with blood that looks black in the starlight. I see what he already knows. My grip has already broken. It is his hand locked around mine that is holding him from the black void below. He was always stronger than me. I look back into his eyes. No. I shout, he opens his hand. The Emperor's finest warriors, like clay Alexis Pollux and Barabas Dantioch were molded, forged in over two centuries of war, two men who embody the brotherhood their gene fathers could have had. They were the bulwark against a betrayal that ravaged the Imperium, and they together defended the hope for humanity. But who were they? How did men born onto different worlds, taught by different masters, raised on different doctrines, stand side by side as friends in the end? Their story begins in the 30th millennium. The Great Crusade, the reunification of mankind has launched from terror, uniting the lost colonies of mankind across the stars. A campaign to bring humanity back into its golden era and drag us out of the ignorance and darkness left by the collapse in the age of strife. Deep within Segmentum Solar, a cold, frozen world stood, unmoving, tidily locked with its dying sun. The planet of Inwit, a sub-zero environment, a planet conquered by ice. Under this Vast ice crust, thick seas flowed in sluggish tides, and pale and sightless creatures swam in the waters, hunting by vibration and a preternatural taste for blood. To stand upon the frozen wastes and to look into the stars, glints of once great ancient space stations and orbital shipyards would catch your eyes, a reminder of the truth of this world. A civilization long past its golden era. Below this frozen tundra, life continued. Humanity. The descendants of this once great planet endure this bitter, unforgiving place. Living amongst frozen cities, sheltered under the ice, or as roaming tribes that trekked along vast underground ice corridors. The inhabitants of Inuit made the best of the life they had. 
the best this cold world could provide. Hard places often breed hardened people, and only those willing to endure thrive. The clan is sacred, family is sacred, for no one can survive the cold alone. It would be in this frozen, nomadic lifestyle that two boys would be born, Elias and Alexis of Clan Pollux. The boys grew quickly, responsibility and labour thrust upon them as being part of this enormous clan system, each of them ingrained with the skills needed for survival, practicality a weapon to keep them alive. The cold, the bitter wind, the numbing of extremities was daily life. For the populations of Inuit, from the sedentary all the way to the nomads, their way of life was possible through the use of technology. Elias and Alexis in the vast underground corridors followed their clan as technology and resources were traded abundantly. And where power and wealth is, war was not far behind. Conflict was part of the young boys' lives. Rarely blood stained the ice of Inuit, as clans waxed and waned through periods of civil strife. But yet all upon this world, however free or disorganized, were unified by one great collective. For Inuit was at the heart of an empire. Space-faring vessels, small fleets, even other planets were colonized by the people of Inuit. But still the old ways, the traditions of the ice remained. Inuit had forged them, creating a practical and hardened mindset that produced strong, enduring people. Men Elias and Alexis were destined to become. Before the boys born to the ice nomadic way of life, they were destined for something greater. The boys had heard the stories, the stories of the demigod-like figure, Rogel of House Dawn, a man of superhuman stature, incredible intellect, a man who had transformed their people, renewing their hope of once again achieving a golden age, a return to humanity ruling the stars. For Elias and Alexis, and the people of Inuit, the very reminder of past glory was constant. The land and sky was dotted with frozen relics of a better age. Elias and Alexis were told of how Rogel Dawn had been there that day, when an armada, the Great Crusade, the Empire from Terror had arrived, offering them enlightenment, the chance to join the Collective, an Imperium of Mankind. And just as how Dawn stood, a demigod-like figure with superhuman abilities, an almost incomprehensible, intelligent, powerful, and yet utterly human man was at the head. Rogel Dawn's father, the Emperor of Mankind. Elias and Alexis viewed them like titans in their mind, demigod-like figures who offered a place by their side amongst the stars. Warriors to reunite mankind. It wasn't just adventure, but to people born on Inuit, a duty, a sacrifice. The two boys began their journey, leaving their old life behind. Friends and family never to be seen again, but they had each other. Trekking through the harsh, cold wastes on the dark side of Inuit, bearing the first test, designed to weed out the unworthy and weak, the boys endured the bone-chilling, limb-numbing, bitter storm winds. He was leading from the front. Elias, he always was. The brothers were twins, but Alexis always felt that his brother was stronger. The same age, and yet he felt younger. Warmth shone bright from the brother that smiled in the face of danger. Almost lost within the freezing blizzard, the boys were set upon. One of the malformed, vile creatures that somehow survived and stalked the icy desert of Inwit had found them. Alexis was injured. It was his fault. The beast was here, and he knew it. 
He wanted to let his brother go on without him, to leave him, leave the weakness. But his brother refused, facing down the beast trying to kill his family. Tumbling off the crevasse's edge, Alexis reached out for his brother with his mangled hand. They were both falling, Alexis begging for strength he did not have. One look spoke a thousand words, and so the strong one, the brother Alexis looked up to, let go. Guilt washed over Alexis. Why? Why him? He should be dead. With grief casting its shadow over him, the boy from Inwit did not give in to despair. He had to honor the sacrifice, and so he picked himself up with his mangled body dragging himself to the gates. Alexis alone joined the ranks of the Chosen. He was to join the Emperor's finest warriors, and like clay he would be molded. He would be forged in war, armed with the greatest weapons. He would be immune to sickness and disease. He would become a defender of humanity, and he would no longer feel fear. Lord Emperor, make me an instrument of your adamance. Where darkness is legion, bless our walls with cold disdain. Where foolish foes are frail, have our ranks advance. Where there is mortal doubt, let resolution reign. Deep within the core of Segmentum Ultima, a temperate world dominated by vast mountain ranges, turned under the warmth of a merciful star, Olympia. Similar to the world of Inwit, this plant had managed to endure the horrors of the Age of Strife, but yet it still suffered its consequences. The environment we live in can change us, just as much as culture or creed. And so humanity on Olympia changed. As each generation passed, knowledge and power bled from Olympia, the terrain exacerbating societal problems as each city, isolated amongst mountains and gorges, began to diverge, cultures and languages becoming unique. Olympia was a place of marvel, and in the time of the early 30th millennium, a boy would be born in a time of immense change. Barabbas Dantioch son of Olympia grew upon a world almost unrecognizable even to his parents' generation. Where once had been a planet of warring city-states, the world had been unified within one generation by a figure of wonder and scorn. Olympia had been a place of few resources, scarcity breeding ambition, for as humans we would fight to be kings of the ashes. Scheming, intrigue, extreme hierarchical structures had blossomed in all areas of life. A world in a state of casual civil war, as great cities vied for control and influence, a gain to the wealthy and elite, an oppressive meat grinder for the ordinary people, simply resources in this great game. But the great cities were beautiful. Marble masterpieces, hewed into with labor and care. It was the image, the mask that was designed to preen and show off before the city's rivals. A mask that hid beneath a miserable people, just waiting for their turn to rise to the top. To stand before these great cities, it was incredible. Like our own ancient world come to life, each visual, a piece of art, a timeless masterpiece. But for the boy Barabbas Dantioch, this was a world that was utterly foreign to him. For one figure had changed the planet. The independent warring states had been unified under one banner, a demigod-like figure. A man so intelligent, powerful, and with a will of iron, so beyond and yet still utterly human. His name was Perturabo. The strange figure's story was known to all in the generation of Barabbas Dantioch, 
from the great mountains, said to be where the gods had resided, Perturabo descended, taken into the care of one of the many ruling tyrants. His exceptionalism was evident, and he grew into a man, and then something larger and greater than one. Olympia changed. Armies marched from the city-state of Locos. Each rival offered a chance to surrender or to have their walls, their monuments, their history and culture erased. Within a handful of years, Olympia was bound together, reunited just as it had been millennia before. Only a functioning aristocracy remained. Society had shifted, for now only one figure stood at the top and he stood alone. Barabas Stantioc grew in a time of plenty, almost gone with the petty squabbling, the pointless politics and sabotage. For now it was truly pointless. It had been ground out, replaced by a fairer but yet unquestioning regime. It was a time under the direction of something bigger, something more vast than any except one on Olympia could imagine. For the Great Crusade had arrived. The enormous, rapidly growing empire from terror had come to reunite humanity across the stars, to pull the species out of the darkness and decay from the age of strife. And at the head of this was a man, no, an exceptional creature that was humanity distilled and perfected, Perturabo's father, the emperor of mankind. The Imperium of Mankind, thousands upon thousands of worlds, united against the horrors of the galaxy, a place where superstition was expunged under the atheistic imperial truth. But this great crusade, this expansion needed warriors. It needed soldiers that were a cut above the rest. For Barabas Dantioc and thousands of other young boys, the opportunity to wage war in the stars, to be warriors for humanity, was a blend of excitement and fulfillment and ambition. To stand at Perturabo's side, the genius demigod, who could turn that down? Despite being born into a new age for Olympia, some habits die hard. Barabas Dantioch, like all those born on this world, understood a societal truth. The mind was a weapon, a tool that had seen dynasties rise and fall as a city-state's award for power and influence. Knowledge was to be used to advance one's place in the previous hierarchies. Even those of the lower caste could escape poverty and normality by simply being skilled. Dantioch and his fellows learned to absorb information. Knowledge was useful, tools in their arsenal. Education once reserved for an elite class was mandatory for those hoping for elevation. To have lived within this time must have been sobering. The younger generations never knowing the inequality and dread of their parents' life. Where once had been a society that had put faith in a pantheon of gods, it was replaced by a new order. Barabbas and his fellows grew upon the imperial truth. There were no gods. Logic, reason and rationality were the tenants. The values warriors needed to take to the stars. As Barabbas grew into a man, he made his choice and left behind everything he knew. Friends, family, the marble cities that had been transformed into bastions of defense by his lord Perturabo. He was to join the emperor's finest warriors and like clay he would be molded. He would be forged in war, armed with the greatest weapons, immune to sickness and disease. He would become a defender of humanity and he would no longer feel fear. The Legiones Astartes, superhuman warriors created from the melding of ordinary men with gene seed taken from the demigod-like Primarchs. Alexis and Barabbas were taken, laid down upon a cold steel table, both filled with excitement and dread. 
Then they were cut open. Chemicals and stimulants flooded their veins, as new organs were grafted onto their young frames. Every cell of their body screamed in pain, a feat of endurance that many others did not survive. For years, Alexis and Barabas, they were trained. Martial combat, battle doctrine, engineering, medical knowledge, all were fed into these burgeoning Astartes. Their bodies and minds were honed, but as the days grew closer to them becoming fully-fledged space marines, the influence of their gene father, their Primarchs began to take hold. Alexis Pollux of the Seventh Legion, the Imperial Fists, the Sons of Rogal Dawn, Discipline, Duty, and Unyielding Will, tenants of a brotherhood that waged war across the stars. From their earliest days on terror, at the dawn of the Great Crusade, the Imperial Fists were molded, excelling in fortifications and defense, fighting with Bolter and Brother by their side. The Seventh Legion embodied the very walls they defended. Tide Testudo ranks were a slow, unbreakable force that crushed their opponents. Even decades into the Great Crusade, unified with their gene father Dawn, Legion and Primarch fit together perfectly. Alexis was trained to embody these methods and ideas, practicality and endurance, virtues amongst the Emperor of Mankind's greatest empire builders. After years, Alexis's shame at his weakness, shame at having let his brother down, a burning will had emerged and manifested physically. Alexis Pollux of the 405th Company was enormous, standing a whole head taller than his fellow Astartes brothers, a daunting figure in sparring. But this alone did not make the man special, for it was Captain Yonad who saw that there was more to this hulking figure. Perhaps it was the loss that had allowed Alexis to understand a unique lesson so early. Perspective. Alexis was perhaps not the smartest or the bravest, but he knew how to see the bigger picture, to ponder, factor in outside variables, something that perhaps the loss of his twin had created. The grief, putting perspective on Elias, on him, on his duty to honour his brother's sacrifice, and what it meant to uphold that honour. Alexis began to specialise, as he joined his brothers at the front line of the Great Crusade. Horrifying Xenos and non-compliant colonies of mankind put Alexis through a hellscape of war. His skill became evident, as Captain Yonad guided his protege in void warfare. Long hours, high levels of concentration, large amounts of information, a strategic mind that kept perspective over an entire fleet, and yet a temperament that kept calm and strategic even under pressure. Alexis was made for this and continued to strive towards the tenants his Primarch Rogal Dawn exuded. For decades, Alexis and the Imperial Fist made thousands upon thousands of worlds compliant, erecting bastions and fortifications upon numerous worlds. For every son of Dawn, they knew how to fortify a position. Before this enormous marine, his life was mirrored by a man born to a different world, taught by different masters and under a different Primarch. Barabbas Dantioch, son of Olympia, joined the 4th Legion, the Iron Warriors. Intelligence, willpower, an efficient brutality were the tenants of this ruthless legion. From their origins on terror, the 4th Legion had seen some of the most gruelling and bitter conflicts the Great Crusade had to offer. And after decades, when Primarch and Legion were reunited, the glory and pride turned to ash in the Legion's mouth. They were a disappointment. Their record was not worthy of being called the greatest, marines unworthy of the Emperor's grace. No, they needed to be reforged, the weakness needed to be expunged from their character. 
and so Perturabo chose decimation. War is unequivocal, uncaring, unforgiving and blind. Blind also will be the selection of those who will pay the blood price for the greater failure of your record. One in every ten legionaries was beaten to death by his brothers, men who they had fought side by side with on numerous worlds across the galaxy, much to the scorn of other Primarchs and legions. It would be Barabbas and the first recruits from Olympia that would enter this hardened legion. The training was brutal. The example the Terran Marines had endured was clear. Failure was unacceptable. The need to prove themselves absolute. Barabbas, after years of surgery and training, finally became Barabbas Dantioch, Iron Warrior, Iron Within, Iron Without. With Perturabo at the Legion's head, the specialization of the Legion became evident to Barabbas. Siege warfare, great bastions held by vile Xenos and non-compliant human colonies required a patient but brutal force to crack their walls. Bombardments, sabotage, fortifications and coordinated strikes were akin to breathing for Barabbas and the 4th Legion. Each great fortress was a mystery, a game to be unraveled and exploited by the attacking force. And just like his gene father, intellect became the most prized quality for the upper echelon of the fourth. Philosophy, physics, engineering and military strategy were pillars that Barabbas poured his time into. Perhaps never the strongest or the bravest man on the field, but it did not matter for Barabbas excelled in one thing, intelligence. Any task or objective given to the son of Olympia would be achieved. He was reliable, a man of science, using his pragmatic orderly mind to solve the problem. As the decades began to pass for Barabbas Dantioch, he began to ascend through the ranks, ascending all the way to Warsmith and he was proud. He was a man who had earned trust. You can imagine the contentment flowing from someone who upheld their responsibilities, a person who had achieved a life of honor, fulfilling his purpose and doing it well. Alexis and Barabbas were warriors, loyal servants of the Emperor, men who had fought for over a century in the service of the Imperium. They had seen more than most humans would ever think to dream of in numerous lifetimes. And the Great Crusade had covered enormous regions of the galaxy. A golden age was on the horizon, but nothing lasts. Iron within, iron without. From iron cometh strength, from strength cometh will, from will cometh faith, from faith cometh honor, from honor cometh iron. This is the unbreakable litany. Iron within, iron without. Dantioch took off his helmet and raised his head. Perturabo paused at the sight of the warsmith's ravaged face. Dantioch's hair had thinned to a few greasy strands, scraped back over his liver-spotted, shining scalp. The skin atop his skull was taut, while that on his face hung in saggy pouches from the bones. Yellowed eyes peered from the complex folds of skin, the orbits of them purplish. His lips had thinned to pink traces atop a chin, riven with deep lines. His skull was visible under his face, as if the skin was a loose cloth cast over a grisly trophy. He was physically lessened by age, though his eyes shone with all the determination he had ever had. Look upon me and you might understand why, said Dantioch. The apothecaries believe I've aged somewhere in the region of 3,000 years. 
Apparently, we of the Lee Jonas Astartes are not functionally immortal after all. Perturabo found it hard to look at his warsmith. He found such decay of the flesh unseemly. Stone and iron decayed. Everything decayed. But the rapidity with which the human body ceased good function and began to collapse offended his sense of order. Humanity was, in many ways, despicable. Others have suffered the same fate and yet they fulfill the orders given them, said the Primarch. You were told to hold the straits. You did not. Dantioch got to his feet with a grunt of pain. I could not. Your orders were impossible to complete, though we tried to do so. And failing you fills me with the greatest of regrets. Were the Hrud not to have begun this migration, I would have succeeded easily. Dantioch swallowed before he spoke again. His saliva was sticky. They are predictable, my lord. One of my sergeants, Zolan, insisted that I should consider withdrawal. I refused to listen to him. You had ordered us to hold, so we held. We have lost the majority of my grand battalion as a result of it. The 51st fleet is shattered. You lost it because you were weak, said Perturabo in disgust, his voice as frigid as deep space. Because I refused to bend, said Dantioch. As much as it angered me to have Zolan speak to me in that manner, I find myself coming to you, our gene father, with similar tidings. Abandon this campaign, my lord. Perturabo's face crumbled with fury. He flushed, and his hands clenched the arms of his throne so hard the metal creaked. My lord, listen to me, said Dantioch hurriedly. I have examined all the histories we have concerning the Xenos since I returned to the 121st fleet. You have evidently had some success against them, but you have scared the Temper of Ferox into fleeing. They were beginning to move before your deployment of the temporal weapon, but its use has prompted a full-scale migration. What is our plan now? We cannot slay them all. Here is the greatest concentration of Hrud in known space. We risk the Legion. The migration endangers the Cadmus system and that will only be the start. The war must stop. This subsector must be declared Perdita and warning beacons set about it, so that it may be addressed with a larger force at a future date. Perhaps if we withdraw now, the migration will falter, and the damage will be contained. Perturabo glared fiercely at Dantioch, but the warsmith was undaunted. My lord, Dantioch went on, as an iron warrior, as your son, it shames me to the core of my being to suggest we should pursue this course of action. But should all the Hrud migrate out of this subsector, we shall be the instigators of a problem that will persist for hundreds of years, destabilizing a large portion of the Galactic North. We should withdraw, my lord, and reaffirm our orders. Perhaps there had been some kind of mistake. This last statement was too much for the Lord of Iron. The Emperor of Mankind makes no mistakes, shouted Perturabo. He powered to his feet, towering over the ruined warsmith. His plans are flawless. How can it be any other way? Dantioch did not like the bitterness of this statement. Then perhaps, my lord, it is your mistake in persisting with this campaign in the face of all available information. For a moment, Dantioch thought that Perturabo would strike him dead. There and then, the Primarch's giant frame tensed, his oversized war suit growling with the anticipation of action. Dantioch stared fearlessly into his lord's eyes. There is no shame in admitting defeat, he said softly. No man can win every battle, not even a Primarch, not even you. As you demonstrate so well, said Perturabo. He exhaled noisily his breath hot with unspent rage. He took a step back, tension bleeding off him. I release you from your orders, Warsmith, and give you fresh ones. Lesser Damantine has been marked for compliance, and thereafter will require a new regent. Go there, 
Take whatever dregs of your grand company remain to you. Take it and then hold it for me. There are no real threats there, only aggressive native zoo forms. I trust dealing with them remains within the scope of your abilities. I have but 240 warriors left to me, and only one remains from my command group on Golgis, my lord. Dantioch stiffened with the insult done to his men. He will gladly go where I go if you command it. I have my ships. Potarabo looked down at the warsmith grimly. I once considered you as fit for my trident. Now I see that I was wrong. You are a disgrace to this legion, Dantioch. I never wish to look upon your face again. Dantioch's expression bowed his head, crushed. Trembling with emotion, he spoke. As you command, my lord, so shall it be done. The Great Crusade had been raging for nearly two centuries. Alexis and Barabbas were very different from the naive men they had been in their youth. But the war had changed much. Eighteen legions and Primarchs roamed the galaxy all under the command of one. The brother elevated above the equals. The war master Horus. Command of the Imperium's forces as the great emperor of mankind returns to Terra for reasons a mystery to all. The Guargan system, garrisoned by warsmith Barabas Dantioch and the 51st Expeditionary Fleet, were engaged in a conflict that would forever scar the 4th Legion. On the world of Golgis, lit by the cold shine of its orbiting moon, would come alive with death, violence and power. The Hrud, a vile, Mysterious Xenos race had come back to reclaim their territory. Oily skin, segmented limbs, a face with disgusting dripping mandibles that would lead you to stare into large, void black eyes. Something was beyond wrong with this enemy, as to even be in their presence, time seems to shift and accelerate. To be in the presence of the Hrud, you would find your skin would wrinkle. Your bones would start to ache. You feel your strength draining from you as your hair would turn bleached white. A horrifying, rapid aging that would leave you nothing but dust and bones. Barabbas and his iron warrior brothers were the only ones remaining after weeks of combat. Even their very fortress, erected with all the genius and efficiency of an iron warrior's mind, began to crumble and rot. The fighting was brutal, Barabbas and his men finding themselves harassed by these vermin-like Xenos. Hundreds of Dantioch's brothers were dying, and worst of all, the survivors were not immune. Barabbas, elevated beyond a mortal man, Combined with the gene seed taken from his Primarch, his mental and father-like figure felt his body degenerate. He was getting older. The oldest Astartes in the galaxy were at most two centuries old. It was unknown if they were functionally immortal. A hypothesis tested in the mind-breaking combat Barabbas and his brothers were enduring. They were dying. The position was untenable. Even his friend Zolan told him they should retreat, beg for mercy at Perturabo's feet. To hold this position was flawed, mad even. But Barabbas refused because he could not retreat. Iron within, iron without. The battle cry of the iron warriors that had been roared upon thousands of worlds was more than just a rally. It was a mindset. From iron cometh strength. From strength cometh will. From will cometh faith. From faith cometh honor. And from honor cometh iron. This is the unbreakable litany. Never give up. Never give in. Be immutable as iron. Anything less was failure. And Barabbas knew the price for failure. 
the thought of decimation close in his mind. But he knew Zolan was right. His rational mind was screaming, conflicting with the culture and values of his legion. It was a losing battle. Each assault Barabbas repelled, he lost more men, and his body became weaker until near breaking point. He finally gave the order to retreat. Kneeling down before his demigod-like gene father, Barabbas took off his helmet, showing his emaciated, geriatric features in all their horror. His body had been aged to approximately 3,000 years, evidence of an Astartes mortality staring the Primarch in the face. Barabbas was overcome by a deep, soul-crushing shame. He had given his all, and it was not enough. He had failed his duty, his creed, and his Primarch. You lost it because you were weak. The words crushed him. But even in this state, where his body was thrumming with pain and aches, drowning from shame, his brilliant mind still toiled. He self-examined himself, the campaign as a whole. He met his enormous Primarch's cold steel eyes and told him there had been a mistake. The plan was flawed. Barabbas was surprised, his twin heart still pumped, to question his lord and in turn his emperor. Barabbas had been turned into something greater, but yet utterly human. And to be human is to make mistakes. Something Perturabo in his heart of hearts, feared more than anything else in this universe. Failure. Failure was worse than death. Barabbas was not afraid to admit his fault. Shamed of it, but unafraid. He had failed to be iron within. Iron without, in his duty, but not in his heart. He did something a lesser man would have run from, but his honesty and humility fell flat against the pride and, in truth, fears of Perturabo. Barabbas was condemned, released from his orders. His Primarch told him he never wished to look upon his face again. Barabbas was crushed. His duty failed, condemned by his legion, and his body racked with pain and aches. He couldn't look at himself. He couldn't reconcile the image of the old man that stared back. His aesthetics were the very antithesis of the iron within, iron without. He was weak, sent away in pseudo-exile, taking with him the little that remained of his company, Barabbas in his vulnerable state, made a choice. He chose to discard his helmet, and in the fires of a scalding forge he began to craft. A faceplate that was a work of beauty, a recreation of the Legion symbols brought into three dimensions. With the metal still glowing with heat, Barabbas placed it upon his skull, letting the malleable iron conform to his face his skin and bone burning with deserved flagellation. And then he plunged his head and iron mask alike into ice water, fixing the beaten metal into place forever. An iron mask, a shame he would endure to overcome his weaknesses. From now on, the image of himself would be iron within, iron without, a punishment and a redemption, and a way to hide from the truth that lay beneath. There is no enemy. The foe on the battlefield is merely the manifestation of that which we must overcome. He is doubt and fear, and despair. Every battle is fought within. Conquer the battlefield that lies inside you, and the enemy disappears like the illusion he is. The Great Crusade, 
Thousands upon thousands of worlds conquered. The majority of humanity across the stars bound together under one Imperium. A new golden age for mankind was within reach. Men like Alexis Pollux and Barabbas Dantioch could have put down their weapons and lived amongst the rest of mankind. But fate is never so kind. Accompanying his lord Rogel Dawn, the man who had once seemed so untouchable to the boy from Inwit, Alexis had risen the ranks. The captain was inducted into his Primarch's advisory council, sitting side by side with legends of the Legion, such as Sigismund and Fafnir Ran. It was then that news arrived that would shake the galaxy forever. Rogel Dawn, Sigismund, and Alexis encountered a damaged vessel belonging to the Death Guard Legion. Finding Captain Nathaniel Garo and a slew of other survivors on board, the words uttered next from Garo would almost cost him his life. The War Master Horus Lupercal has betrayed the Imperium. Four legions above the world of Isvan III were slaughtering their own brothers. Rogel Dawn, enraged at the very accusation that the Emperor's most beloved son Horus had betrayed them, almost struck Captain Garrow down. But the other survivors corroborated the horrifying tale. The information sent shockwaves throughout the Legion and the Imperium. Why? Why had Horus done this? Even to Alexis, the information seemed almost impossible to reconcile. They had fought side by side with the 16th many times throughout the Great Crusade. It was shocking. Immediately ordering a fleet to be prepared to be sent to Isfahan III, 30,000 Imperial Fists prepared this retribution fleet. Something all expected to be led by Dawn's most loyal son, First Captain Sigismund. But this was not the case, surprising everyone. The first captain chose to stay with their lord on the journey back to Terra. Captain Yonad, Alexis's mentor, was chosen as the replacement, and where he strode, so did his protege. The retribution fleet set forth, vengeance in their hearts for their fallen comrades. But as the fleet drew closer towards their target, the warp began to shift and convulse. The Sea of Madness, the mirror dimension that rippled with sentient thought, was the lifeblood of the Imperium. Interstellar travel was dependent on it. An enormous warp storm washed over the Retribution fleet. Ships were torn apart as they made desperate attempts to enter real space again. Alexis found his own ship torn asunder broken into pieces like a fresh carcass laid bare to the depths of cold, uncaring space. Alexis awoke. He was alive. The pain is how you know you are still alive. The words he held in his heart from his long dead brother Elias. Adrift in wreckage in space, stuck in his armor like a tomb, Alexis held on until finally fate was on his side and he was rescued by his brothers. Still recovering from his wounds, Alexis found himself in a position he felt in his heart he was not ready for. Responsibility. Captain Yonad was dead, and now thousands of Astartes, Militarum regiments, and servants of the Imperium were under his command. All of them, some veterans of the early days of the Great Crusade, space marines, the bulwark against the terror, and they all shall know no fear. Perhaps Alexis did not feel fear, but doubt. He was the weaker twin, the one who should have died. Captain Yonad should be here. Captain Sigismund should be here. There must be others more worthy. To have the responsibility thrust upon you can be daunting, a lonely experience. The price for mistakes is something very few can live with, but the foe on the battlefield is merely the manifestation of that which we must overcome. He is doubt, and fear 
and of spare. Every battle is fought within. Conquer the battlefield that lies inside of you, and the enemy disappears like the illusion he is. Alexis expressed his doubt to his brother Captain Tear, wary for signs of judgement, but blank, unmoving eyes stared back, declaring that he was Yonad's heir. Command was his, and he had no right to refuse. Doubt was the enemy, and Alexis had to face it. Fight it just as hard as any enemy on the battlefield. Regrouping the remnants of the Retribution fleet, Alexis was facing a dangerous situation. The warp storms had left them isolated. Communication and travel were an almost suicide attempt. Each scouting attempt was met by destruction and madness, kept in check by the warp. Others gave Alexis counsel. Some wanted to keep trying. The orders of dawn were absolute. They had to keep trying, or the possibility of receiving new orders. But Alexis held, arraying the fleet in a defensive formation, hesitant to relinquish their advantage. Attempting to break through the warp storm could be the very action their enemies wanted them to take. It was a clash of temperament. Perhaps men like Sigismund would have acted, but it was Alexis who shouldered the burden of command. Hours and days pass. A sense of ominous dread began to creep over the fleet, but Alexis held until the moment he had prepared for arrived. An enormous force was emerging from the ruin storm. The picked field revealed the truth. The fourth legion, hostile and approaching. The Iron Warriors and Perturabo had arrived. The Fourth Legion had betrayed the Emperor and sided with the War Master Horus. The Battle of Fal had begun. Hulking ships the size of cities rained fire and plasma over each other, and thousands were lost into the cold void of space. Alexis and the Imperial Fist clashed against Perturabo and the Iron Warriors. A battle that would have been a massacre if not for Alexis's caution. Inside hundreds of claustrophobic, ceramite corridors, imperial fists and iron warriors tore at each other, both fire and steel breaking each other apart, both suffering heavy casualties. For hours, Alexis has coordinated their attack, culminating into a strike for the throat by each force. But just as the tide shifted towards the imperial fists, a psychic communication burst through the warp. The priority level absolute. All Imperial Fists were to return to terror immediately. Alexis, caught within an impossible decision, obeyed his Primark. An order rang out for all Loyalists to evacuate across the small passage opened within the warp storm. An order that turned the battle into a massacre. Alexis and his personal guard commandeered an iron warrior vessel as his own flagship burned, the burning action costing him his own right hand, severed by the scum iron warriors. As the last imperial fist lay slaughtered under Perturabo's hammer, hate, sorrow and fury burned within Alexis Pollux. Deep within an enormous cave system, on the moon of Lesser Damantine, carved into the rock in the ceiling spire itself, stood Shadenhold, a fortress whose architect was a man whose name had been scoured from legionary records, Barabbas Dantioch. Even in this isolated outpost, rumours still reached Barabbas and his men, rumours that the War Master Horus had betrayed the Imperium and other legions had turned to. Something almost impossible to believe. The Emperor's favoured son, and to betray the Emperor? Why? Barabbas, despite his attempts, could not shake his thoughts about his own legion. The Iron Warriors and Barabbas had seen the worst, most brutal, mind-numbing conflicts the Great Crusade offered. A task they had endured thanklessly, whilst other legions, such as the Imperial Fists, were lauded. 
granted the Emperor's favour. Even with Barabas' own condemnation by his Primarch, the verbal lashing had revealed something fragile within his gene father. No man can win every battle, not even a Primarch, not even you. But Perturabo refused to admit his fault. His response is only showing the duality of admiration and hate for his father. He loved this untouchable, perfect being, but resented the exclusion and indifference. Barabas wondered how that resentment may have only continued to fester. After years of isolation, Warsmith Idris Kendrill came to the fortress, ordering that it be used as a resupply point for Horus's armies. The Fourth Legion had betrayed the Emperor. Confusion and sorrow rippled throughout Barabas and his men. This betrayal of their oaths to the Imperium seemed like madness. He could not reconcile that Perturabo, even though resentful of poor treatment by the Emperor, was capable of such an action. Barabas refused Warsmith Idris Kendrill, declaring that he would play no part in such actions against the Imperium. For Barabas and his brothers, their recruitment from Olympia had been a time of excitement, a great hope flowing over the common people of Olympia, joining this unified human Imperium. His heart beat with loyalty to the Emperor, to the Imperium, and his Primarch, the latter only wavering because of the mistakes his Primarchs had refused to take accountability for. Locked within this tomb of their own making, Barabas found a mysterious figure disguised as a hooded cleric, and after some questioning he lowered his hood to reveal his true identity. He was a brother space marine of the vaunted Ultramarines Legion, sent to Lesser Damantine in order to recruit Dantioch. His inside knowledge and understanding of siegecraft would be integral in the brimming war. The Ultramarine's name was Taro Nicodemus, and he was a tetrarch of Ultramar and an honor guard to Rabute Gilliman himself. Barabas' skill and subsequent dismissal by his Primarch had not escaped all Imperial records, not the keen eye of Rabute Gilliman, and so the Primarch made a gambit to secure this vital asset. The words flowed from Taro on how only Barabas could save Ultramar, only his knowledge and skill were good enough. Perhaps deep down, Barabas would never have admitted that the fault of the father was also the fault of his sons. Pride, something all knew to be a weakness of the fourth legion. The strongest, the smartest, was a title deep down all Iron Warriors believed that they had earned. A mix of pride, sorrow, and duty had Barabas in Taro's grip, but what he revealed next almost cost him his life. He spoke of the truth behind the traitor's betrayal. This war was not just a civil conflict, but a heresy. Foul entities of the Warp had corrupted the War Master Horus. Warpcraft, sacrifices, and other abhorrent tools were in the arsenal of the traitors. The thought of his legion rebelling was bad enough, but the accusation of witchcraft, heresy, darkness, and the Warp? Barabas almost drew his weapon upon Taro, his sorrow festering into rage, but Taro kept going until there could be no more denial. To be a man condemned in spite of your dedication towards your home and legion, Barabas must have felt like he was failing his own world, his home. He asked Taro, what would Primarch Rabute Gilliman ask of him? And so Taro told him they first needed time. Assembling his faithful brothers, those that had stood side by side with him for decades, each also stuck with the pain of their legion's actions. He looked them in the eyes and told them to prepare for war. For 366 days, the genius of Dantioch was pit against one of his legionary brothers, Idris Kendril. 
the battle of mind and body tested in the format of war, the fourth breathed. Siegecraft. Barabbas, Taro and their men cost the traitors time and resources. The siege was brutal, and Barabbas caught his first glimpses of this true enemy Taro had spoken of. As in a final gambit to end the battle, Idris Kendril brought in an enormous, emperor-class titan. The sight of it was disgusting. The warp had corrupted it with plague, rust and disease, a sight that induced sickness and dread. After a protracted siege, the end had come, so Barabbas and his brothers sabotaged his masterpiece, Chardonholmed, teleporting themselves onto a Sons of Horus warship. Still in the armor of the 4th Legion, the Loyalist contingent strode all the way to the bridge, slaughtering the 16th Legion traitors. The ship was theirs. The siege was over. Friends and brothers of Dantioch had died in this immaculate defense, and he would carry their memory with him forever. Just as Barabbas was about to set course for Terra, Terra once again pleaded with the warsmith. Terra was impossible to reach with the ravaging warp storms, and that Ultramar, Gilliman, had need of him and his fourth legion in sight. Barabbas agreed, directing their forces towards the realm of Ultramar in the Ultima Segmentum. The navigation was extremely dangerous, the tides of the warp were rough, and after months, Barabbas and his men finally reached Macrag, the heart of Gilliman's realm. Upon meeting the demigod-like figure, he was finally told of why he was so vital. He was taken to the planet of Sotha, and there Dantioc saw something incredible, something that would affect the tide of the entire Horus heresy. A strange Xenos device, unlike anything he had seen before, the Pharos Beacon. The shadow, which is in conflict with the acknowledged values, cannot be accepted as a negative part of one's own psyche, and is therefore projected. That is, it is transferred to the outside world and experienced as an outside object. It is combated, punished, and exterminated as the alien out there, instead of being dealt with as one's own inner problem. The lion, asked Warsmith Dantioch softly. The lion himself, is it true? A degree of trial and error had allowed them to permanently stabilize the vision of the primary location Alpha in the chapel of the memorial, adjacent to the newly founded library of Ptolemy in the fortress. The chapel, now an oddly lustrous place, thanks to the permanence of the Pharos link, was the site of all audiences with far away Sotha. The lion himself, sir. Titus Prato replied. His fleet translated in system just a few hours ago. So the lion emerges, murmured Dantioch. He comes to support Lord Gilliman, I trust. It would appear so, though he brings with him a fleet force of dark angels that might have split the planet in two. Prato said. It was a curious experience to be at once standing in a candle-lit chapel and looking into a gleaming abyssal cave of the tuning floor. So he is our salvation. He is our hope. Prato corrected. It appears he has 20,000 Dark Angels with him. That number could turn any tide. Prato paused. I sense unease in you, Titus. You greet me with today's momentous news of the Lion's arrival. But there is another reason for this conversation. You sense? Prato replied with a quizzical smile. Now, now, sir, I am no psyker, replied the warsmith. A heavy, high-backed seat had been set on the tuning floor, so that Dantioch did not have to stand throughout the audiences. Some of his tactical conversations with Gilliman lasted hours. The warsmith eased his position a little and succumbed to a rasping cough. 
The quantum tuning of the Faros device is empathic, and the more I use it, the more I am aware I can read demeanor. What do you hesitate from saying? Alexis Pollux of the Imperial Fist has requested an audience with you, sir. Dantioc stiffened slightly at the hulking Imperial Fist as he stepped into the communication field besides Prato and became visible. Pollux removed his helm. He gazed directly at Dantioc's masked face. Captain, said Dantioc. Warsmith, Pollux replied. I have been advised of your actions in the foul system, sir. I am used to the sons of loyal legions regarding me with suspicion, but I imagine you have more cause to distrust me than most. I reserve judgment, replied Pollux. This means of communication, as I was reminding the librarian, enhances empathic vibrations. You hate me. I can feel it. I am not quite done killing Iron Warriors, sir, Pollux replied. I am quite sure the Iron Warriors have not done killing Imperial Fists either, Dantioc said. But I stand apart from their actions. Do not judge me by- Sir, said Pollux. Primarch Gilliman has asked me to assist in the provision of security and fortification from a crag and its system. I have made it my business to personally inspect all potential flaws and weaknesses. You feel that I am a weakness? Asked Dantioc. Your legion has turned, and yet you are here, charged no less with the control of a device at once vital to Ultramar's survival, and yet technologically still a mystery. That is a dangerous combination. The navigational viability of the 500 worlds is entrusted to a man who might be an enemy. How better to undermine the fortress of Ultramar than to get inside and gain a position of trust and vast responsibility? I would know if this is your siege craft, purposed to bring Lord Gilliman's domain down. You are direct at least, said Dantio. But if you learn to read the tuning field's vibrations, you will see my true intent well enough. Besides, if I had been seeking to undermine Ultramar, Captain, it would have fallen already. You seek to distance yourself from your traitor kin, said Pollux. He pointed at Dantioc with his crimson, grafted hand. That mask is not helping. Dantioch's iron mask was fashioned to resemble the emblem of the Fourth Legion. The mask hides nothing, Pollux, said Dantioch. And it does not come off. Rather than reminding you of my association and origin, it should remind you how far some will go to remain loyal. This tells you something about metal, sir. This mask shows you that some men will wear a badge of shame forever so that no one forgets the bonds they have broken in order to remain true. Dantioch slowly rose to his feet. The Imperial Fists and the Iron Warriors Pollux, he said, sadly. Let us not debate. Let us simply agree that of all the Legiones Astartes, they are the greatest in Warcraft, the finest exponents of fortification, either of building defenses or of overwhelming them. Together, sir, with our talents and vast experience pooled, we can make McCrag impregnable. He coughed again, looked to his side and took up a data slate from the heavy arm of his seat. His gauntleted hand shook slightly at the effort. Now that the Faros is operational, I have been giving time to the consideration of defense in the McCrag system. Speculation, really. Some suggestions. A number of integrated schemes that might work well. He looked at Pollux. This might be the way to prove my loyalty to you, Captain. How? We talk, said Dantioc. Every day, if necessary. I share every plan and idea I have with you. Every secret of my Warcraft, including concepts the Iron Warriors have regarded as private law since their foundation. I will betray my traitor kin, Captain. I will tell you all of my secrets until you see through this mask and believe that only a truly loyal warrior could give up so much. Captain Alexis Pollux of the Imperial Fists and Warsmith Barabas Dantioch of the Iron Warriors. 
veterans of the Great Crusade, and men loyal to the Emperor. But immediately, Barabbas felt the hate flow from this enormous marine holding a bandaged arm. The Pharos beacon on the world of Sotha was an incredible piece of technology, a beacon that projected a signal, a lighthouse in the warp for the loyalists of the Imperium to rally around. As Terra and the Astronomicon had been locked off by warp storms, the Pharos beacon also worked as a communication device, projecting the user's image with a clarity and power beyond Imperial technology. Even emotions seeped through the link something Barabas could feel as an unbridled, cold hate radiated from Captain Alexis Pollux. The Iron Warriors and Imperial Fists had long been rivals throughout the Great Crusade, their specializations in warfare overlapping and fostering competition. But this was different. A silver skull. Alexis saw the very image that had been the source of so much pain and sorrow for him. The Iron Warriors had cost him thousands of his brothers at the Battle of Fal, good men who Alexis had served with for decades, men who he had looked up to, all gone. Even his right hand, severed by a fourth legionary, his new, grafted replacement twitched and stung, kindling for the warm fire of hatred in his heart personified in a crimson fist, a hand still scarlet red from amputation. But the shadow which is in the conflict with the acknowledged values cannot be accepted as a negative part of one's own psyche and is therefore projected. That is, it is transferred to the outside world and experienced as an outside object. It is combated, punished and exterminated as the alien out there, instead of being dealt with as one's own inner problem. Alexis hated Dantioch, because perhaps deep down the image of him was a reminder of his own regret and suffering, the lives lost in the evacuation on Fall. He knew Barabbas Dantioch had earned the trust of Primarch Rebute Gilliman, that should have been enough but his own internal struggle was easy to externalize as the man before him. And yet in turn, Barabbas was used to this treatment, bearing the armor and iconography of his legion that brought shame to him. He felt like in a way he deserved some condemnation, a glutton for punishment since that loss against the Hrud. Even as his body suffered a dull pain, being technically over 3,000 years old. Barabbas, Alexis, and many other Astartes, Astra Militarum, and a slew of other Imperial forces had gathered around Primarch Rebute Gilliman's realm of Ultramar and his 500 worlds. Many survivors of the infamous Drop Site Massacre, with the Salamanders and Raven Guard, unsure if their Primarchs lived, and the Iron Hand's not so lucky. The death of Ferris Manus confirmed, pledging their aid to McCrag and Ultramar as the only current vestige of the Imperium. Alexis and Barabas were both asked by Lord Gilliman for their expertise in fortifying McCrag, and as they did, every day they used the Pharaoh's beacon to strategize and talk. The enormous Imperial Fist and the geriatric Iron Warrior combining their brilliant minds, and unique legion strategies to make McCrag almost impregnable, each meeting, softening the lines between them as two men with utter sincerity tried to protect the Imperium and the values it stood for. The Pharos Beacon had also been conveying the emotion through the connection. Alexis and Barabas felt the emotions of the other a level of connection that words often fail to express. Barabas had begun to earn Alexis's trust, to be loyal, when all those you once called brother had forsaken their oaths. He respected him. The fate of terror was a question on the mind of all, a pressure that was slightly elevated as joyous news had come. With the arrival of the First Legion, 
the Dark Angels and their Primarch Lionel Johnson. A momentous occasion that had cheering crowds lined the streets in their millions. But just as a sense of hope had been renewed, dark news followed close behind. Aboard the Dark Angel's flagship, a dark secret had been harboured. A creature of nightmare, whose very presence conjured a deep dread within our fragile human minds. The Primarch Conrad Kurz, the Night Haunter. A figure of dread, whose very name inspired compliance during the Great Crusade. Alexis and Barabbas knew the stories. They may have even served alongside that degenerate Eighth Legion, the Night Lords. Torture, psychological warfare, tools in the arsenal of a twisted version of justice, a Primarch and Legion traitors to the Imperium, siding with the War Master Horus. Above the skies of Mokrag, the Night Haunter escaped, causing a mass of confusion that almost brought Gilliman and the Lion into conflict. The enormous, dark, gaunt, nightmare-inducing demigod emerged onto the streets of McCrag and began to immediately spread death and fear. The entire planet was on alert. Alexis and Barabbas decided to conclude their talk, their demeanour pleasant and friendly. But before the link was severed, something immediately sent Barabbas in to fight or flight. His twin hearts raced, and despite being an Astartes and knowing no fear, he recognised this feeling as the closest thing to it. The lights vanished within Alexis's chamber. His body kicked into combat, adrenals flooding his system. As first Master Augustine of the Ultramarines fell into the chamber, his body wounded and gorged to such a degree, Alexis was shocked he was standing. Alexis and two ultramarine guards fired, aiming for the shadows. Barabbas shouting through the Pharos connection to flee. The creature of shadow made quick work of the ultramarines, but Alexis did not give up, shouting defiantly, declaring he would bathe in his blood before the night was done. Left, right, orders screamed from the projection of Barabbas. He could sense the malice of the Night Haunter through the Pharos. They worked together, even drawing blood from this monster. They trusted each other completely, as Alexis's life was on the line. Gripping his sword, even with his wounded new crimson fist, Alexis parried and slashed at the shadows as claws and kicks rented his armor. The strong, Alexis Pollux lasted longer than most but he was beaten, Conrad preparing for the final blow. Barabbas' screams were drowned out. Desperate to save his friend, he reached his hand out, grabbing Alexis's crimson fist and he pulled him through. Shock ran through all of them as Conrad cursed and slashed through air and Alexis and Barabbas stood facing each other on Sotha. Impossible. Alexis had just travelled light years across the galaxy in an instant. The two stood together in the flesh, their first true meeting. Conrad cursed them, begging them to tell him how they achieved this, and Barabbas replied, the faith and will of good men. When they stand together against infamy, the galaxy fights for them. Their connection, their bond, had brought Alexis through the Pharos device, and it saved his life. The image of Semsemesh 4 wavered, as if it were viewed from behind a waterfall. For a moment the planet became solid, taking on the breathtaking clarity that only the Pharos could provide. You overthink, my friend. This is not a machine of cold logic, but a spirited thing. Dantioch thought for a moment. Do you ride on your world? No. 
The more primitive tribes use sleds, pulled by beasts. Pollux grunted. I have neither ridden nor been drawn by animals, so forgive me if my analogy is inappropriate. Imagine the Faros as a spirited riding animal, a steed that wants to run and run. It is in your power to direct it, but you must reach out to it. Work with it. Do not dominate it. Empathize with it. Follow its guide and it will provide you with what you truly need. But do not let it dominate you either. Allow the relationship to progress away from balance to either side and the focus will dissipate. Pollux grunted. Pollux ground his teeth in effort. Sweat ran down his face. He lifted his hands in the imitation of the psychers he had seen in battle. He felt ridiculous. Dantioch smiled. Yes, brother. You are doing it. Feel. Do not think. Do not try to force it to do what you want. Tell it what you need. The distant world blurred, the colors smearing into refracted rainbow auras around the outline of its disc. You are nearly there, said Dantioch. Pollux made a choking noise. His face bunched and turned red. For the love of terror, Alexis, breathe. Pollux cried out. The image wavered and seemed to blow away like mist on the wind. I cannot do it. He threw his hands up in frustration. It's no use. I understand what you are trying to tell me, Barabbas, and I've been diligent in my notes. But all this... He tossed his head angrily at the strange, alien dimensions of the chamber. I am a soldier and an engineer of stone. No more. I do not have your affinity for machines. This is a machine of stone. Dantioch limped over to his friend, his power armor whirring awkwardly at Dantioch's halting movements. Do not be disillusioned, Alexis. Perhaps. Yes, let us reframe your reference. Think of the Faros in terms of a strategic asset. See it in terms of a means to victory. Dantioch indicated the huge sheet of steel where he had painstakingly engraved a star chart set with a number of icons. All these points. Your observatory of the Emperor's Watch has helped me to identify. The Faros leans towards them. Perhaps once there were many similar devices, and this is the last. Think of the military application if we were to have two, or ten, or twenty, or a thousand such beacons lighting up the sky. Warp storms would cease to trouble us. We might one day even abandon moving through the warp by ship entirely if we so desired. Pollux went to a table and poured water from a bronze ewer into a great cup. A fine sentiment, but I wish it were a weapon, Barabbas. He drained the cup, refilled it, and drained it again. Then he went to the metal walkway leading out of the chamber and sat down heavily upon its edge. He looked into his hands, one pale, the other crimson, and frowned at them as if they displeased him. There is always talk of the miraculousness of this technology. If it exists, why does the Mechanicum not have it? They barely understand it. They look for spirits in its workings and are suspicious of its origins. Magos Kalantin is torn between harnessing the Faros and exercising it. They are an odd breed, said Pollux. Their chatter of gods and ghosts in machines goes against the teachings of the Emperor. In a manner of thinking it does. But their understanding is not so black and white as that. And in this time when the creatures of darkest myth spill from holes in reality to devour the innocent, who are we to say they are wrong? It bewilders me, and using the Pharos exhausts me. I am glad to help you, but I cannot help but feel my talents would be best used elsewhere. Do not be angry, Alexis. We must press on. There are many applications for the technology. Pure weapons, energy beams that could atomize targets layer by layer, field generators that might push an object out of phase with reality around it, and the possibilities for advanced machine interfacing are profound, all by tuning the quantum state of matter empathically. You could make these things, said Pollux, his interest peaked in spite of himself. Both would breach the thickest war. You and I think alike. But alas, it is superstition only, said Dantioch apologetically. We would work more quickly if you showed me what to look for on the monitoring equipment. 
We have a treasure here, Alexis, said Dantioch. One that we must learn to use to the full in service of Lord Gilliman. I cannot be the only one who can operate it. If I were to be slain, then our position would worsen. Then ask the mechanical, said Pollux. I trust you, Alexis. So does Lord Gilliman. The Mechanicum do not have the appropriate mindset to utilize the device. There is too much of the machine in them. They have tried, and they have failed. Pollux sighed. I will try harder. Might I make an observation? Always. You try too hard. Let it guide you. Pollux was by nature as serious a man as his Primarch, guarded and taciturn, but his face took on the look of consternation. I find it difficult to let go. All my training and my culture, they speak against emotion. It is a weakness for a warrior. It is the same for you and me both. You are of stone, I of iron. Both are unbendable. But in this time of darkness, old certainties are gone. We must trust instinct. Cold logic will only take us so far. And as much as such a sentiment goes against our natural inclinations, we must not reject it. I believe you to have more feeling than I, which is why ultimately I believe you shall be able to control the Faros far better than I can, even now. Pollux extended his hand. Dantioch took it. The warsmith gasped a little with discomfort as he helped his friends to his feet. You sound more like a damn poet every day. Now you go too far. Dantioch wheezed through his mask as he stopped himself from laughing. The pain was too great. You have your zeal. We should use that. Think on the utility for our efforts against the traitors. Sotha, a peaceful world. A place that only knew fertile fields and large mountain ranges. A place of tranquility only disturbed by the enormous black stone structure that lay half buried in a mountain's side. The Pharos device. The tide of the war had changed, and stability had been achieved. From a crag, Imperium Secundus had been formed. The new Emperor Regent, one of the Emperor's sons, the Lord Sanguinius of the Blood Angels, stood at the head of a triumvirate with Lord Gilliman and the Lion. It had been years since the Battle of Fall and the Siege of Shardenhold. Both Alexis and Barabbas had lost so much, changed so much, as this war had changed much of humanity. Inside the Pharos device, under the tutelage of Barabbas, Alexis was being taught to use the Pharos beacon, something the two had worked on together for many months. The beacon was unlike anything the Imperium had ever seen, constructed in a time perhaps long before humanity was primordial ooze. The use of the device was a full body and mind movement, something Alexis and many others struggled with. Both the Stardis had grown up on worlds of rigid ideology. The beacon asked of them a mental state that felt alien. Barabbas comforted his frustrated friend, reassuring him, confident that he would grasp it and perhaps be even greater than himself. Barabbas believed in Alexis. Over their many nights of discussion over tactics, philosophy and simple banter, Barabbas had become somewhat of a mentor for Alexis, being only slightly his senior. He saw deep beneath Alexis' struggle with feelings of unworthiness, of his responsibilities and a trust placed upon him, something he carried with him since Inwit. And in return, Alexis admired Barabbas, seeing the genuine loyalty and the burdens he carried, his shame of himself, shame for his legion and the constant pain he endured from his aged body. He knew Barabbas would never accept his help when he struggled or fell but he offered it anyway. The work of Barabbas and Alexis, lighting McCrag as a beacon in the warp, had become the most vital operation within Imperium Secundus, and perhaps for the survival of humanity. Billions upon billions of lives rested upon the Pharos beacon, 
a flame that had begun to draw others to its warmth. The Eighth Legion, remnants of the Thramas Crusade against the Dark Angels, had been cast adrift, drawn towards this strange planet, seemingly casting a light in the warp towards the realm of Ultramar. Kirkesh and his bands of legionaries entered the Sotha system, utilizing terror and ambush to annihilate the guarding Ultramarines fleet. The war had come onto their doorstep, and Alexis and Barabas immediately sent word to Lord Gilliman. A fleet was created immediately, but it would take time to arrive, and each hour board would be essential. Alexis and Barabas once again combined their might, two brothers from legions that specialized in siegecraft. They created a layered defense set with traps, choke points, barricades, and overlapping zones of fire. Many of their brothers besides them were from shattered legions, Iron Hands, Raven Guard, Salamanders, Imperial Fists, Iron Warriors, and the Garrison of Ultramarines. Astartes that despised the traitors and heretics with fervor. Kirkesh, and with his 8th Legion warband, descended down to the surface of Sotha, cutting a swath through the Imperium's forces. Striding to the front line, Alexis, with his newly acquired powered fist, was ready to deal with the invaders head on, as Barabas operated the Pharos beacon for as long as he could. Discipline, duty, Unyielding will, all the traits that the Primarch Rogal Dawn had sought most from his sons, and the men who stood beside Alexis could see the very embodiment of that ideal. Even with his fragile body, intelligence, willpower, and efficient brutality exuded from Barabbas, his mind focused completely with his heart, beating with an unbreakable loyalty to the Imperium. Iron within, iron without. The Night Lord's forces slammed against Alexis and the Shattered Legion's defenders. For every brother they lost, five Eighth Legion Marines fell. Bodies began to pile up in tight corridors of this alien place. Brave warriors that had survived some of the most brutal conflicts in the heresy so far fell. The defense held for hours, but each blockade became slowly overwhelmed. Even Alexis was lost to his men in a tide of midnight clad armor, staying behind to buy time. With Barabas aiding Gilliman's incoming fleet, Kirkesh ended it by teleporting alongside the 8th elite terminators directly into the control room. The light of Pharos fading from a crag. The Loyalists had lost, and unfortunately for them, the 8th Legion took prisoners. Barabbas, in chains, refused to talk, even as various brother Astartes were tortured in front of him, to a Legion that had perfected suffering in the 200 years of the Great Crusade. The sight must have been unimaginably horrific. Barabbas held his tongue, but even his hardened, Iron Warrior Heart felt disgusted. Kirkesh was escalating, hours of screams, and good men dead. But eventually Kirkesh moved on to a sight that made Barabbas' twin hearts sink. Alexis Pollux, held in a crucifixion-style bind. Kirkesh threatened to torture this imperial fist, and finally Barabbas began to crack. Barabbas knew Alexis would give his life to the Imperium, but the bond was too strong. Alexis was his true brother, his student, and his friend. He would give anything for him to live. Slowly, Barabas began to give up the secrets of the incredible Pharos Beacon. Each time he hesitated, Kirkesh reminded him of what he would do to his friend. Gilliman's fleet was close, causing the Night Lords to rush even as they were in awe of the capabilities of the Pharos Beacon. This weapon in their hands had the potential to end the war, transport the corrupted War Master's fleet directly onto Terra. With time short, Kirkesh forced Dantioch to focus the beacon onto the 8th Legion's flagship, light years away. 
almost ripping Alexis's tongue out as the warsmith hesitated. But the Son of Dawn was spared as the image arose up. Kakesh was about to step onto the flagship when Barry was pleaded to join him, declaring that the beacon needed an anchor. Kokesh, confident in his whipped prisoner, allowed this. Barabas and all the Night Lords stepped onto the platform. Utilizing his enormous will, Barabas powered the device to maximum. The whole mountain was shaking. Alexis looked over to his friend and realized what he was doing. Barabas Dantioch of Olympia, a man of intelligence and science, for the first time in his life, said a quiet prayer. The Pharos beacon began to overload, and Kirkesh was too late to realize it. Violent energy ripped through the chamber, eviscerating the Night Lords and surging through Barabas' crippled body. The mountain shook, and the device began to tear and break. Barabas, his body breaking apart. Floating in the air, he looked over to Alexis one last time, and he bowed his head. Alexis, looking at the silver faceplate of his friend as the Pharos beacon overloaded. But this is the waking world in which we live. There is no need to cry, no need to dream. Think on it and look in your heart. The light of the mind alone cannot dispel the whole world's darkness. In such times we can turn to the Lord, but it is good to have friends. Pollock struggled to his hands and knees. The pain spikes were so much junk, like everything else in the room. All the illumination in the chamber was dead. The sun was over the horizon, and the light of early morning shone, highlighting curls of smoke. Shakily, he got up. He plucked the wrecked spikes from his interface ports and shattered his bonds with his emperor-given strength. He limped through the wreckage strewn tuning floor, towards the still form of the warsmith, his friend. Brother Dantioch, he said. Barabbas! He cradled the warsmith in his arms, and hope bloomed in him. Dantioch lived for the moment. The Iron Warrior's mask lay on the floor, and so Pollux looked upon the face he had never seen. Dantioch was older than he expected. Lines of pain were etched into his scarred face that nothing could erase. His eyes opened. They moved sightlessly blinded by the intense flare of the pharos. Alexis, he whispered. I am here, Barabbas. The warsmith clutched at the arms encircling him. I never thought to call one such as you friend. He smiled. You are my friend, Barabbas, and my teacher. I am dying. You will live, Pollux said fiercely. Dantioch shook his head. Pollux wished he had water to give him. Anything. His croaking voice became insistent. Listen to me. I saw such things in the light. This war is only the beginning. He swallowed, and his throat clicked painfully. The beginning of the end. Dantioch gasped and settled back, his strength finally leaving him. But I am glad, Alexis. I am glad to have been. I am glad to have known you. It is something that friendship can exist at all in this universe of terror and betrayal. Quiet now, you must save your strength. Dantioch's scarred mouth cracked into a smile. I have no strength left. I have done my duty and I am no longer ashamed. His back arched in pain and he gasped. All hail the Emperor of Mankind, still beloved by all. May his dream be saved even if we cannot. A long, rattling breath escaped him, and his face stilled. Dantioch's body went limp in Pollux's arms. Barabbas! Barabbas, brother! He bent his head and wept for his enemy, his friend. Tenderly he crossed Dantioch's arms upon his chest, 
as bereft of a champion of the legions who had fallen in service to the Imperium. The warriors of Ultramar would find Pollux there, hours later, his head still bowed in mourning. But first, to other matters, how is our friend Captain Pollux? They looked over at the Imperial Fist, sitting immobile by his friend. In the center of the chamber, someone had draped a blanket around his shoulders, but otherwise he remained as he had been, motionless with grief. Refusing food, water, or help. He has not moved since we came here, but sits in vigil. Well, that will not do. Pollux! Gilliman called. Raising his voice, Pollux looked up. I command you to rise, Captain Alexis Pollux of the Imperial Fists. Ordered Gilliman. He stood, the blanket slipping from his shoulders. My lord Gilliman. It is time for you to let us take care of the Warsmith. We shall commemorate his deeds this evening, as night falls, in a manner befitting a true hero of the Imperium. The Imperial Fist nodded dumbly. Suzerain guards came to him, carrying a buyer. They made to raise Dantioch up, but Pollux stopped them. No, said Pollux softly, but dangerously. None shall touch him. I will carry him, for he was my brother. Up stone steps lined in Victus Caesareans. They filed through the broken gates to the redoubt, thence to the wide platform surmounting the top. At the far end, away from the gun emplacements and nested arrays of astronomical instruments, was a pyre of dried quicktree wood. Atop it, his armor battered, but his face serene, lay the body of warsmith Barabbas Dantioch. Gilliman stopped by the pyre, his great stature allowing him to look down upon the dead warrior. You have not replaced his mask, he said. It was a symbol of shame to him, said Pollux. He wore it as a constant reminder of his legion's betrayal. He no longer has anything to be ashamed of. That he does not. Gilliman held out his hand. Captain Casimir placed a golden torch into his grip. A hot flame burning true in the horn at the end. Gilliman presented it to Pollux. The honor should be yours. My lord, if it pleases you, it would be a far greater honor done to Barabbas if it were you, the mightiest of the Emperor's sons, who sends him on his way. Very well, said Gilliman, nodding in deference. With a crackle of parting wood, he thrust the torch deep into the quick tree pyre. He stepped back as the fire caught. Tongues of flame curled around the body of Dantioch, blackening his armor, licking at his scarred flesh amidst pillars of scented smoke that carried heavenwards. Company! bellowed the foremost of Gilliman's guard. So passes Dantioch, hero of the Imperium. They roared and discharged their bolt guns. The weapons boomed as they launched their projectiles, the propellant igniting and sending them fizzing into the air, banging again as they breached the sound barrier. So passes Dantioch, hero of the Imperium. So, so passes, passes Dantioch, Dantioch hero, hero of the Imperium. Of the, Imperium. the skies darkened. The pyre of Barabbas Dantioch bathed his comrades in heat and light. The last rays of sun struck the pharos, red beams glowing in the cave mouths of flank and peak. No return light shone in reply, and nor did it ever again. The song of the mountain was done, and night fell on Imperium Secundus for true. The pain is how you know you are still alive. Alexis awoke, finding rubble and ruin around him. The Pharos beacon was broken. The light cast over Imperium Secundus snuffed out. He limped through the wreckage and rubble, finding the broken, still form of his friend, Barabbas Dantioch. He rushed over, cradling his friend, as Dantioch gave his last words in the universe. Seeing his friend, and Mentor's true face for the first time as the silver faceplate lay broken besides them. The energies of the Pharos beacon had ravaged Barabbas's already broken body. 
and he had seen things within its destructive light. A future of darkness, an unending war, a future that would make you weep for the destruction, corruption, and decay humanity was to endure. Barabas began to speak his last. As Alexis begged him to rest, he would live. He must live. Tears welled up. Something that had not happened for centuries. Not since the death of Elias. Not since he was a mortal man. But I am glad, Alexis. I am glad to have been. I am glad to have known you. It is something that friendship can exist at all in this universe of terror and betrayal. And so, Barabbas Dantioch, son of Olympia, scion of the fourth legion and loyal servant of the emperor, passed. The tears falling from Alexis's face, watering the ground of a planet scarred by fire and blood. He bowed his head in mourning, kneeling there in silence for hours cradling the man who he had once hated, the man who he'd loved like a brother. There they found him, the reinforcements from Ultramar and Lord Gilliman, the sympathetic Primarch encouraging him to stand up and let them help him and the Warsmith. Finally Alexis stood, begging that none shall touch him, I will carry him, for he was my brother, spoken in a tone of soft warning, as if he was guarding something precious. Upon a pyre, ignited by a son of the Emperor, Barabbas's body lie, his faceplate discarded, for he had not one damn thing to be ashamed of. The silver skull had been a prison of his own making, a constant reminder of his failures, and the burden that lay upon him. But now he had overcome those failures. He had given his life for the Imperium, for the Emperor, and for his friend Alexis. His actions throughout the Horus Heresy were vital for the survival of humanity. Very rarely had the fate of so many rested upon the shoulders of so few. And so passes Dantioch. Hero of the Imperium. Grief haunted Alexis's heart. He had overcome great hate in his bond with Barabbas, enough to truly call him a friend, mentor and brother. He long ago had lost a brother, his twin, and that same pain bloomed. The light of the mind alone cannot dispel the whole world's darkness, but it is good to have friends but it is good to have friends. The memory of Barabbas would be with him forever, a fire in his soul to dispel the dark. When we lose the people we love, when the pain and grief fades, we take their memory and bind it to us. We wear it like armor and our will, our soul becomes iron, iron within, iron without. Once again, Alexis had survived where a brother had died, but this was different. He was different. Conquer the battlefield that lies inside of you, and the enemy disappears like the illusion he is. Alexis experienced an apotheosis. Gone was the doubt, gone was the survivor's guilt, and the feelings of unworthiness. Alexis Pollux, disciple of Captain Yonad, was gone. What stood in its place was Alexis Pollux, disciple of Barabbas Dantioch, a man of surety and unwavering will. The Battle of Sotha was a great blow to the forces loyal to the Imperium, but yet they endured. As the Horus Heresy continued, the choice was made as the survival of terror was confirmed. Imperium Secundus was dissolved as the Ultramarines Dark Angels and a Blood Angel set course for the Throne World, attempting to make a break through the warp storms that divided the galaxy. It would be years until Alexis was reunited with his Primarch and his Legion, a reunion that was a somber moment for all. The war was over, Horus lay slain, the Primarch Sanguinius was dead, 
and the Emperor was crippled, interned upon the Golden Throne forever. Billions of people were dead, thousands upon thousands of Astartes gone, and the galaxy changed forever as the scars of chaos were everywhere. Alexis found even his legion and Primarch were changed. Something cold and hateful had settled within their hearts. Something he knew all too well. The Imperium changed further. With Lord Gilliman's proposal of the Codex Astartes, no man would ever wield the power like a Primarch had before. Each legion would be broken into thousand-man chapters, led by veterans of the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy. Lord Dawn chose personally the greatest champions of the Imperial Fists to be the heralds and leaders of these new chapters. Legends such as Sigismund, Fafnir Ran, and Alexis Pollux. And so Alexis became the first chapter master of the Crimson Fists. A man who embodied the lessons of Dawn and the will of iron. From the remnants of the Ultramarines on Sotha would be another chapter named the Scythes of the Emperor, inheritors of the Wardens of Pharos, a chapter charged to guard the secrets of the Pharos Beacon, passing down a sacred silver skull mask, Barabbas Dantioch, becoming a figure of myth, a tale of a traitor redeemed. Even other Ultramarine successors would bear the symbology of this age of myth. The Silver Skulls chapter, carrying the iconography of a man redeemed into the 41st millennium. Every man has two deaths, when he is buried in the ground and the last time someone says his name. And that day came for Alexis Pollux, towards the end of the 32nd millennium. For over 800 years, Alexis served as chapter master of the Crimson Fists, a figure of legend, a man who had lived during the age of Primarchs. Names such as Elias, Dawn, Gilliman, and Barabbas Dantioch, memories of a different time, in an unnamed system facing a horrifying Xenos called the Scythians, Alexis was struck by a virulent poison enduring this slow decay for days. But still he gave out orders, all the way to the end. And at the very moment of victory, Alexis Pollux, son of Inuit, joined his friend Barabbas, fading from this world. Pollux and Dantioch, two heroes of the Imperium, men who embody the bond their Primos could have had. A friendship that preserved the humanity of Alexis from the horrors of the heresy, something inherited by a chapter forged in his image, inheriting his values, the defenders of humanity, the Crimson Fists. We are future memories, when our flesh is dust and our dreams faded. We will be ghosts living in a land of legends, made real only by the memories of others. What we take with us into that realm of the dead, what we are remembered for, that will be the truth of our lives. I will not stop you from trying to follow us, he told her. But. You will not be able to keep up, not for long. While you can, however, no Greenskin will take you, nor any of your children. He turned his eyes forward again, adding, This is the best I can do for you. To Jill Neen, it was enough. The timber of her sobs changed from sorrow and fear to gratitude. Cantor heard her urge her children to stand, and follow as she fell into step behind them. He continued towards the fire, not slowing his pace, but not increasing it either. All the same, as he and his crimson fists left the farming settlement, with their gaggle of refugees in tow, Cantor couldn't escape a feeling of deep foreboding. 
he had crossed a line. The woman would soon realize he had given her false hope. She and her children would tire quickly, and the Astartes would begin to pull ahead until they disappeared from view altogether. Cortez was sure the woman would collapse soon. The children she carried were small, but even a small weight took its toll on a long, hard march. It was a pity. He found that he respected her a great deal. Her arms and shoulders must have been burning with lactic acid, not to mention her legs and the muscles of her lower back, but she kept putting one step out in front of the other. Then, just as he was about to turn around, he saw her left leg crumble under her and she went down, turning to protect her little ones from the impact, with the ground even as she fell. It looked like her foot had snagged in a clump of grass. Her other children shuffled to her side and crouched there, urging her to stand. Fenestra had seen it too. It is over then. About time. We can move at speed. Cortez opened a link to the chapter master. Pedro, it's me. The woman has fallen. I don't think she'll be getting up. I just wanted to let you know. There was a moment before Cantor replied. She fought hard to hang on. Impressive that she lasted as long as she did, is it not? It is, said Cortez after a beat. But it ends here. Her burden is too great to continue. Again he paused. I... I should not have saved her, Pedro. I merely postponed the inevitable and prolonged her torment. Perhaps I should... Grant her the final mercy said Cantor, finishing Cortez's sentence for him. Yes. There was a long pause this time, that Cortez started to think the chapter master had cleared the link. Then, finally, Cantor said, Hold position and wait for me. But tell the rest of your men to keep moving towards the tree line. I want our squads in cover before the suns are visible. Even though Cantor's armor was scratched, chipped, Dented and burned black in places, he still looked like a figure of legend, still everything a chapter master should be. His golden halo shone in the growing light. When he was three meters from Cortez, he stopped and looked east. The suns will be up very soon, Elysio. We should have been in the cover of the forest by now. We run great risks of being spotted from the air. Cortez nodded. He knew the habits of the orcs, knew they seldom flew at night. Their eyesight was poor compared to their sense of smell, and darkness brought a kind of malaise down on them, without which they might have butchered each other in the dark. So violent were their tendencies. They only ever launched night attacks by the light of flaming torches, or searchlights which was doubly fortuitous because such lights made convenient markers for imperial artillery fire. As soon as the suns were up, the skies would fill with noisy, ugly flying machines. Cantor was right. They had to get to the cover of the forest within the next ten minutes. Come, said the chapter master, and he strode in the direction of the children where they hovered over their mother's unmoving form. The children heard the two massive space marines approaching, and, with fear apparent on their faces, took a few nervous steps back, conflicted between feelings of concern for their mother and concern for their own lives. Cortez saw them eyeing his weapons, especially his power fist. He wondered what they were thinking. Did they really believe he would crush them in it? In a universe as cruel as this, Perhaps they did. Come to think of it, what exactly were Pedro's intentions? Did he plan to put the entire brood out of its misery? Cantor crouched at the woman's side and removed his helmet. Cortez tried to read his face, but it betrayed no emotion. Julian, said the chapter master. Can you hear me? The woman's eyes were closed, but her lips parted, weakly. Quietly, she said. They were so heavy. So heavy. Cantor nodded. Yes, but you did well to bring them this far. Reaching out, he lifted the two smallest children away from her 
and gestured the older children to take them. They did so, and Cantor turned back to the woman. The Emperor's mercy, thought Cortez. You should not have to do this, Pedro. It is my fault. It is my soul that should bear the stain. Before he could communicate this, Cantor spoke. It is time, he said, and he reached down to the woman with his gauntleted hands. Time that someone carried you now. As Cortez watched, the chapter master lifted the woman and stood to his full height, cradling her exhausted form in his arms. She looked so small and fragile against his sculpted ceramide chest, little more than a rag doll. Then the chapter master turned to Cortez and said over the link, Once we are among the trees, they will have a better chance. They are charges of the chapter now, and we cannot abandon them. Carrying the woman as if she weighed nothing at all, Cantor began striding for the distant tree line. Over the link, he added, Help the children, Elysio. Help them get to cover quickly. The sun will be up within moments. to fashion a future, to enjoy it, be part of it, and now there is only war, only in death does duty end. We are extensions of a single will. We are adjuncts, we are orbitals. We are the periphery of the immortal, not its heart. There are no bystanders in the war of life and death, no place the battle cannot reach. So fight it without remorse or relenting, for death will surely do the same. You are the bringer of the new age. You are the warden of the old. You are the destroyer. You are the preserver. In the grim dark future, there is only war. A dark tide of war, and Xenos horrors plague every corner of the galaxy the light of humanity touches. The Imperium of Mankind. Over a million worlds. Trillions of people cradled in the hands of a rotting empire. A dying dream of an age of myth filled with zealotry, corruption and death, an empire whose foundation was built by a triumvirate, a master, a sorcerer and a warrior, Constantin Vaudor, shield of the emperor, the chief custodian, the captain general of the Legiones Custodes, a man whose true character remained a mystery, even to those close to the heart of the Imperium of Man. Who lies behind the personification of the perfect soldier? How does one become the embodiment of the Emperor of Mankind's will? His story begins in the 30th millennium. Terror, the birthplace of humanity, home to a billion stories and an untold number of lives lived. To gaze upon it, only the imagery of sorrow would be reflected back. A monument to our sins, and failures as a barren wasteland is all that remains. The scars of old night, of the age of strife, where humanity's spanning federation collapsed due to war and violent warp tides. Thousands upon thousands of worlds under the dominion of mankind imploded into shadows of their former selves. Terror, a rotten place, divided into warring realms, who battled over scraps and utilized technology of a golden era lost to mythology. A child would be born into this bleak world. Perhaps he had parents that loved him. That truth would remain a memory lost 
and what was to come. For a man, nay, a being had travelled vast distances, armies had crossed continents just for this singular child. He would be claimed, a figure of primordial power, utterly human, and yet so above it, the emperor of mankind. Was it his great potential? Was it simply fate, or was it the elimination of a future rival? The truth would never be verbalized. In the hands of this ancient being, a psycho without equal, this child was put through a process that others would only speculate the truth of. The child was reforged on the molecular level. Every atom and fiber of his being tailored in a genetic manipulation that blurred the boundaries of science and art. He began to grow faster, taller, smarter and stronger, leagues above a mortal man. Psycho-conditioning followed him at every stage, like a compass every thought, every decision, every achievement pointed north towards one being, the Emperor of Mankind. Humanity needed to be ruled, if it was to be protected from the horrors of the galaxy and from itself. It was a vision with a singular being at its heart, the arbiter of that future, of the species, and it would be this boy who would be charged with protecting him, and in turn that vision. Any memories or identity of who the boy was and where he had come from were purged in this gradual apotheosis. The being that emerged was a tailored thing, a man, Constantin Valdor. Whether he was the first attempt, or simply the first success, he would never know, for the truth of the events were only revealed to him if necessary. You are the bringer of the new age, you are the warden of the old, you are the destroyer, you are the preserver. If humanity was to be where the rising ape met the falling angel, Constantin Valder was meant to be something greater. His enhanced, enormous frame was flooded with information, battle doctrine, philosophy, knowledge, encompassing all theatres in and outside of war. Valder's mind was as much a weapon as any blade or the muscles in his enhanced form. For as one of the Emperor's perfect soldiers, he would have to protect his king in numerous theatres of war. His memory was perfect. Finding himself at the moment of his awakening, he would remember everything from that moment on with utterly perfect clarity. His growth was not something maintained at a distance, and his forging to his education saw the personal touch of the Emperor of Mankind. They spoke, they confided, and counseled each other. The Emperor was master and mentor. With his strength and power, he would be the bringer of a new age, a road fraught with war and conflict that required a warrior of unparalleled skill, the Warden of the Old, the Emperor of Mankind, a being millennia old who had seen humanity suffer its mistakes and sought to bring its previous collective wisdom into this age of ignorance and darkness. You are the destroyer, you are the preserver. Valdor was meant to protect the singular being, guiding the dream of the species. He was to be the destroyer of that dream's enemies. Its preserver in the millennia to come. Strength, power, knowledge, guidance, all coalescing into one man. As Constantine grew into adulthood, he was a result of the handcrafting of the Emperor. He was utterly unique. He was different. For Constantine, his perception of the mortal man must have made him feel like an outsider. He was human, and yet in the ways in which we define our humanity, he did not fit so neatly into that category. Emotional pain, anger, hatred, love, all were kept in check by a mind handcrafted for duty and servitude. To him, base humanity must have felt chaotic. We are all often slaves to our own emotions, kicking and screaming against an apathetic world. 
For Constantine, he found it difficult to connect, to understand the irrationality of mankind, only validating the Emperor's statements that the species must be ruled to save us from ourselves. Emerging fully formed, and a being leagues above a mortal man, Constantine Valdor stood alongside his Emperor, and Malkador the Sigilite, the Emperor's most trusted advisor within the Himalayan mountains, a triumvirate that began the preparations for the expansion of this new Imperium of Mankind. Decades passed, and the Imperium expanded. Others followed the same path as Constantine, elevated through the mysterious process that changed them into superhumans. A handful turned into dozens, and then hundreds, a force of bodyguards so elite that they would never be bested in battle. Defenders of the old world, and the preservers of the new, they were the Emperor's custodians. Inside the Emperor's fortress, the gates were thrown open. The secret work of thousands of geneticists, engineers, administrators and soldiers was unleashed. The time to unite terror had begun. Constantine and the Emperor's armies rode out and so the Unification Wars had begun. Rise, Minister. The voice was too low, too resonant to be human, nor did it convey anything in the way of human emotion. If statues could speak, they would speak with this assassin's voice. You know that if I am here, you are already dead. Nothing will change that now. She sat up slowly, though she refused to slacken her grip on the gun. Listen, she said to the golden shape in the darkness. Negotiation is equally futile. The killer assured her. But, as he's begging. That set off a spark within her. She felt her features harden as her temper ignited her courage. I wasn't going to beg, she said, her voice cold. My apologies then. The figure made no move. What of my guards? You know what I am, Kojizu. You can choose to die alone or you can resist the inevitable and I will leave this palace only after killing everyone who resides within it. My son, the thought welled up, bleeding hot and savage. My son. She said the words aloud before she could help herself. He is of an age to serve the emperor. Kojizu's hand trembled as it gripped the gun. No, she said, and how she loathed herself for the shake in her voice. He's only four. Please, no, not the legions. He's too young for the legions. There are other fates, minister. Her eyes were adjusting even as her blood ran cold. In the half-light of the hours before dawn, she could make out the ornate, overlapping edges of his burnished armor. The suit of golden plate emanated a low thrum, the source of the mechanical purr. In his hands was a long spear, lowered to aim at her. Affixed above the weapon's arm-length blade was the bulky chassis of a bolt gun, clad in reinforced wire work. None of this surprised her. What surprised her was that the killer stood, unhelmed, showing a face that had once been human. I've never seen one of you like this. I wasn't even sure you had faces. Now you know otherwise. Kojizu watched the assassin tilt at his head slightly, hearing the whisper of his priceless mechanics in the collar of his golden armor. Though his towering form was scaled up, whatever genetic meddling his master had performed to enhance the brute's intellect and physicality, no gene weaving could hide his roots. He had been human once, an Albion heritage. Perhaps, going by his features beneath the weathered flesh and battle scars. May I at least know the name of my killer? He hesitated, and she dared to believe she'd caught him with an unexpected question. Yet his dark eyes never wavered. My name is Constantine Valdor. Constantine? She repeated slowly. Her schooling in Old Earth's mythology had been extensive, and she often hearkened back to old tales and legends in her speeches, all the better to inspire the teeming masses of godless, hopeless dregs who served her. Now the minister found herself smiling, 
no matter that her son was to be stolen away to a fate of genetic torment, no matter that her death was a mere breath away, she smiled a mad woman's smile, all teeth and wide eyes. I am to be killed by a man with an ancient king's name. So it seems. If you have any last words, I will ensure they reach the Emperor's ears. Kojizu's lip curled. Emperor, how I loathe that title. He is the ruler of this world and master of our species. No title is more appropriate. She bared her teeth in an expression too ugly and defiant to be a smile. Have you ever considered just what kind of creature you serve? Yes. The dark eyes stared on. Have you? Master of mankind. She shook her head, feeling the welcome flare of righteousness. He isn't even human. Minister Zhu. The golden warrior made a warning of her name. One she didn't heed. Does he even breathe? Tell me that, custodian. Have you ever heard him breathe? He is a relic, left over from the Dark Age, a weapon left out of its box, now running rampant. Valdor blinked once, the first time she'd seen him blink so far. The rare human movement was unnerving. To her it felt false, like it had no right taking place upon his statuesque features. Terra is a thirsty world. She knew, then, with those words, she knew which of her many crimes she was to die for, the one she had least expected. A laugh, queasy and unwanted, tore itself from her throat. Oh, you vile slave, she said, unable to keep the sick grin from her face. Other worlds suffer a similar thirst. The golden killer's eyes had glassed over with an inhuman serenity, made all the more uncomfortable by the living intelligence shining behind it. Yet none of them hold the war-scarred, irradiated honor of being mankind's cradle. This world is the beating heart of the Great Crusade, Minister. Do you know how many men, women, and children now make their slow way back here to humanity's first home? Do you know how many pilgrims wish only to see the ancestral earth with their own eyes? How many refugees flee their flawed and failing worlds now the veil of old night has been lifted? Already it is said that unsettled land on the throne world is the most valuable commodity in our nascent imperium. But this is not so, is it? One resource is far more precious. She clutched the auto pistol tighter as he spoke, breathing slowly and calmly, even knowing she was to die, even knowing she had no hope of drawing the weapon. The body was reluctant to surrender its survival instinct. Instinct demanded she fight to live. What I did, I did for my people. And now you will die for what you did for them. He said without malice. For that alone? For that alone. Your other treacheries are meaningless in my master's eyes. Your cleansing pogroms, your trade in forbidden flesh, the army of gene work detritus you have sequestered in the bunkers beneath the Germanic steppes. The prospect of your rebellion was never a threat to the Pax Imperialis. Your crimes of apostasy are nothing. You're dying for the sin of your harvester machines drinking the last ocean. For stealing water. She felt like laughing again, and the sensation wasn't a pleasant one. The laughter was creeping up through her blood, seeking a release. All of this because I stole water. It pleases me that you understand the situation, Minister Zhu. He inclined his head once more, with a curious courtesy and another subtle purr of machine muscles. Goodbye. Wait, what of my son? What is his fate? He will be armed with silver, armored in gold, and burdened by the weight of ultimate expectation. Zhu swallowed, feeling her skin crawl anew. Will he live? The golden statue nodded, 
if he is strong. In that moment, her tremble subsided. The fear bled away, leaving only naked defiance somewhere between relief and hope. She closed her eyes. Then he will live. She said there was a bang, throaty and concussive, and she was falling, drowning, choking in thunder. Constantine marched across the wastelands of terror, seeing conflict upon every fractured continent. He and his fellow custodians in the beginning were clad in the best equipment the burgeoning empire could find. It began in steel and leathers. Some were lucky enough to equip ancient powered armor, scavenged from their enemy. Constantine, standing side by side with the emperor, and the chosen few were often outnumbered, outgunned by horrific armies of mutants, corrupted zealots of dark faiths, or regimented militias and mercenary groups. But it was irrelevant. No war was unwinnable, for he was leading them. Constantine's belief was absolute. They were unstoppable, with dust and ash under his feet. Constantine slew a countless number of enemies, each of them utterly overwhelmed by the strength and speed barely perceptible to their fragile mortal minds. It was like a black hole of fate, all possible futures leading to one event horizon, death. Each victory saw the Imperium's territory and numbers expand, each piece of equipment, each infrastructure and administration was built in tandem, a rapid rate of expansion that bloomed over terror. Constantine saw the transformation in front of him, as after each conflict, his armor became ceramite, his rifles became proto-bolters, until finally the guardians of the emperor donned brilliant gold. Auramite powered armor. Constantine and the custodians invoked the imagery the genetic crafting represented. They were symbols as well as warriors. Evidence of this Imperium's impending golden age. Constantine and many other custodians, such as Sagittarius, Jesaric, Amon, and Aquilon, led growing armies of mortal men, but they were not alone in the category of gene-altered soldiers. The Thunder Warriors, superhuman men, created with the meshing of specialized vat-grown organs and stimulants poured into adolescence. Stronger, faster and larger than their mortal counterparts. But where Constantine and his custody brothers were a hand-crafted, cell-coded piece of art, these warriors were crude, mass-produced stock. A brutal tidal force that worked as a stampeding mob of bolter and sword. Constantine saw them fight. He led them upon the field, and in those moments the contrast became apparent. In the infamous conflict with the priest king, Mollard Sen, and his fanatics, under the weight of a bone-chilling freeze, he would never forget Constantine, the emperor and thirty custodians, alongside thousands of thunder warriors and mortal men, crashed against this outnumbering force. Face to face with the leader of the thunder warriors, Ushatan donned the Primarch, unleashed a slaughter and rage that sent shockwaves of alarm through Constantine. The frenzy, the crackle of joy, as blood streaked from the Primarch and his thunder warriors. They exuded a vigor and rapture Constantine had never experienced in his disciplined mind. It was alien, unbridled and chaotic. Orders fell upon deaf ears, unable to tear the butchers away from their meat. The unification war upon terror was bloody. Decades upon decades of conflict and diplomacy that brought the Imperium to the furthest corners. It was a conquest under the personal hand of the Triumvirate. Many had fallen at the hands of Constantine, not least many of the ruling tyrants and despots such as Minister Koja Zoom. 
with a voice and tone that drew dread from the darkest corners of the human psyche. Constantine had come to put down this obstacle. To Koja Zoo, Constantine was barely human. How could any be that large, that imposing? It was frightening, even to her, a warlord who had seen and done nightmarish things. Even him blinking seemed alien, as if he had done the motion to put her at ease, to assure her he was human. Her actions so far had been inconsequential. All her crimes, her sins were nothing, for all her schemes were powerless against the growing Imperium, except for one that affected the heart of the throne world. She had evaporated the last ocean. She had stolen water. She mocked him for the absurdity, but for a mind so focused upon the dreams of his king, there was nothing absurd in dealing with all threats, no matter how little. Perhaps he no longer had the capacity for absurdity. There are no bystanders in the war of life and death, no place the battle cannot reach, so fight it without remorse or relenting. Kojazu asked what would become of her son. Constantine told her that he would serve the Imperium. The resource would not be wasted. She asked if he would survive, only if he is strong. As the fear and panic left Kojazu, Constantine dealt the blow, feeling absolutely nothing. Constantine took the late warlord's son, and he was offered up and transformed into something greater, just as he was, a warrior who would become the custodian, Ra Endymion. The lingering thoughts remained. Have you ever considered just what kind of creature you serve? The master of mankind? Is he human? Have you ever seen him breathe? He is a relic left over from the Dark Age, a weapon left out of its box, now running rampant. Yes, he knew. Constantine knew in a way that the Emperor was not human. He was the first custodian. He was privy to more of the Emperor's knowledge, plans, and true feelings, and the parts of his master that were kept secret were for a reason. It was not his place, nor in his capacity to question. With the unification of terror complete, after decades of war, all opponents, either destroyed or integrated, work began on the next stage. Constantine was as much administrator as soldier, as plans and foundations were drafted and created for structures designed to encompass a civilization much larger and more powerful than all of Terra's current might combined. The Imperium was stretched to the stars, the dream of mankind, the destination where hope and caution merged. But to Constantine, the Emperor and Malkador, that war required a new breed of soldier, men who could be diplomats as well as warriors, a force rigorous and disciplined enough to survive the dangers of void space, a war that had no place for the brutality mentality, and genetically unstable Thunder Warriors. Constantine had seen numerous times this savagery up close, a brutal force that was just good enough to unite terror, but not the galaxy. Upon the slopes of Mount Arat, thousands of Thunder Warriors met their end. A glorious last battle would be the truth the history books would remember. A massacre that drew the attention of one of the High Lords of Terror, Grand Provost Marshal, Uwoma Kandawire. Something had happened off the books, in the dark. The connotations were frightening. What was Constantine, the Emperor, capable of? And what force was strong enough to eliminate the hulking warriors of Thunder? I don't much like them either, Valdor admitted, punching his gauntlet through the helm face of an Imperial Guardsman, before rounding in an already stricken Thunder Warrior. But they are here, nonetheless. You should, I think, have seen them coming. Ha! 
Ushatan snorted, driving his blade through a second angel and flinging its twitching body aside. We always knew something was up. He never made us stupid. Or maybe he did. Stupid to have gone along with it for so long. He was staggering into range now, battering his way towards Valdor with his habitual blunt force doggedness. For all that, the Primarch had taken damage. These angels weren't like the powered armored prey he'd cut down so contemptuously before. Each one had landed a blow before the end. Cumulatively, they would have got him eventually, like wolves dragging down a bear. Not that Valdor would have allowed it to happen that way. You had no choice, Valdor said, now fighting his way into the Primarch's presence, spinning him perilously on his heel to dispatch the last of his bodyguards. All around the two principles, the fighting raged unchecked, though the remorseless march of the grey-clad angels was now breaking the back of the enemy counter-advance. None of us did. You almost sound like you regret that, Ushatan said, lumbering right at him, his blade held in that distinctive, rigid, two-handed style. Don't tell me you're having second thoughts. Their weapons crashed together for the first time, sword edge grazing against spear tip, and the kinetic release flattened a dozen fighters in all directions. Then they were driving savagely into one another, slashing, parrying, hacking, testing. I regret nothing, Valdor said, pushing the Thunder Warrior back with a single, spine-jarring thrust. Only because you can't remember how. Ushatan laughed, pushing back hard, for all his decrepitude, all his battle damage, he was still a furnace of energy, raging against the fading light. Still, I always wondered what it would be like to fight you. Valdor smashed a pauldron away, ripping the metal from its shackles and exposing blood-laced flesh. He followed up with a jab that would have taken the Primarch's head off had he not jerked it back at the last moment. Many people have wondered, Valdor remarked, battering him back another few paces. So they tell me. Ushatan was spitting blood by then, his shoulders dropping. His blade work never let up though, and kept on pressing, kept on blocking. They're all dead now, I guess. He spat, trying to shoot another grim smile. It comes for us all in the end. Hammering back, putting all his strength into a sudden push that checked the Apollonian spear for a moment and held it locked in a snarling mesh of electric overflow. Their faces came close for the first time, a blank mask of pure gold and a brutish pig iron helm grill. I always knew you'd outlive us, because I saw what you did to all the others. These angels will fight for you now. But one day they'll realize the truth about you. They'll see you coming for them. Too late to stop it. We're all dispensable. Every one of us that he made for these wars. All but you. Valdor threw off the deadlock, hat back at him, piling strength onto strength. He could feel abundance flowing through his sinews, filling him with a familiar cold martial perfection. Already he could perceive the end to this encounter, its possible outcomes narrowing swiftly now, pitilessly shrinking down to the singularity of another conquest. I am nothing, he countered, finding that he uttered the words with more vehemence than he'd intended. An instrument to be cast aside when its function is performed. And what function is that? Do you even know? Or are you just playing along with this, hoping it becomes obvious later on? Valdor saw the gap then, the weary slip of lactic acid heavy arms, and pounced, spinning the spear and lancing it dead straight. Ushatan tried to parry and almost got there, but the strike was just too atom perfect and the blazing spear point crashed through the Primarch's breastplate, shoving him backwards. Ushatan roared, grabbing the hilt of Valdor's weapon and trying to wrench himself free of it, 
but by now the disrupted charge was spilling across him, tearing up what remained of his battle plate and searing into the skin below. Faldor cast him down, using the spear's leverage to slam him to the snow-piled ground. The impact was shuddering, sending a shockwave dancing across the terrain and snapping Uchitan's spine. Grey-clad angels coolly advanced around them both, past the kill site, driving the last of the Primarch's ragtag army back towards the ridge, leaving burning vehicle shells and freezing corpses in their wake. Valdor extinguished his spear's disruptor and knelt beside his victim. As he did so, he withdrew a long knife from his belt. When Ushitan saw that, he coughed out a final dry laugh. <laughs> the mercy stroke, eh? He rasped, his face transfixed with agony. Up close, the black veins of fermenting poisons were visible on his exposed skin. Alas, indignity. You always were a miserable bastard. Valdor placed the tip of the knife over Ushatan's heart. Fresh snow was falling around them, turned brown and flaky by burnt Prometheum. I meant what I said, Lord Primarch. I take no pleasure in this. You are one of our finest commanders. And these new toys of yours, who will lead them now? Will they have their own commanders? No. Those ones are lost. <laughs> All the better for you, then. The High Lord was right. You can't bear rivals. It was not my doing. Sure, it wasn't. Ushitan spasmed, hacking up oily blood. You know, when we were at Molensen, and I said I pitied you, I meant it. I'm not trying to goad you. I really do pity you. Valdor remained motionless. For a moment, his hand was on the grip of the knife. I lived, Captain General. It was short, and it was painful, but by the Nine Hells, I lived. I'd rather have it that way than yours. No joy, no hate, no fear. Unbreakable without growth. Immortal without passion. As Valdor raided himself to apply downward pressure, he had a sudden vision of a far-off future state spun out of reality and into the cold halls of an undiscovered time, where the galaxy itself was darkened by strife and whole worlds were cast into flame, where wonders and madness had been unlocked and now screamed their way through the arch of reality where the foundations of physics creaked beneath the ravaging, scuttle of nightmarish unreason, and he was still there, still unchanged, still cold and pure, and steadfast, and unable to feel anything but the ubiquitous press of unending responsibility. What is left for you, Constantine? Ushitan breathed blood bubbling up beneath his burned lips. What more can he take from you that he hasn't already? Valdor drew in a long breath and then plunged the knife in, ending the Primarch's agony. For a moment he did nothing else. His head bowed, the storm exhausting itself around him and coating the land with a film of pale, drifting grey. Then, Slowly, he withdrew the blade. Nothing. He said very softly. Nothing at all. All our strength, our will, has the power to shape worlds. Yet, it is kept in check restrained by our beliefs, our doubt. Everyone is made up by the events of their past, and it forms walls around one's spirit, or breaks such walls down. The mind makes some powerless and gives strength to others. 
Because we are not ready to give up our ties or codes, we surrender ourselves. We become slaves to teachings and belief. That is why belief will always rule you. To truly believe in an ideal, you must be willing to betray it, to not to follow it so dogmatically. That is the lesson of strength. Alone, Valdor stood, staring down the remnants of the Thunder Warriors, led by Ushatan and Grand Provost Marshal Wuma Kandawire. In alliance with the geneticist Amar Astarte, they stood against what the Imperium was becoming, fighting for accountability, democracy. They knew that plans had been made, generals to replace the old, ones accountable only to the Emperor, and they had to stop it. Constantine told Kandawire and Ushitan that there were no new generals, but there were new armies. Behind Constantine, silhouetted in the driving muck of the ice storm, where the snow and hail screamed and the frozen earth cracked, 10,000 helm lenses suddenly ignited, then began to advance. The Adeptus Astartes, genetically altered super soldiers, created with the meshing of specialized organs and pumped with stimulants. Faster, stronger, and more disciplined than a mortal man, and yet far more genetically stable than the Thunder Warriors. Armed with the Imperium's finest armors and weapons, this new breed of super soldier was unleashed upon Ushatan and his remaining brothers. The Thunder Warriors were like lions, primal strength, tearing and breaking the wash of Astartes flowing through their ranks, but one by one they were torn down. These new men hunted like wolves, bringing down the larger and stronger beasts in front of them as a group. Constantine with every slash and stab with his spear reaped death. His precision and skill were utterly perfect. Perceiving in mid-melee minute drops in speed, due to lactic acid build up. He was moving fast enough that the Thunder Warriors couldn't even register his movements or parries. The gap between Constantine and Ushatan closed. Spear met two-handed sword in a melee so brutal, so mind-numbingly fast that to bear witness to it, vibrations would cascade through your weak, mortal form. Ushatan taunted Constantine, trying to punch through both his physical and emotional walls, but it was fruitless. I am nothing. Constantine's life, his thoughts, his feelings were utterly unimportant. The two superhumans clashed and struck, fighting at the pinnacle of human martial prowess, but it was not enough for the Primarch of the Thunder Warriors. Constantine rammed his spear through his enemy, driving him to the ground, as the last of the Thunder Warriors were cut down around them. With the snow falling and Ushatan's black blood spilling, he railed against Constantine one last time, telling him, I pitied you. I meant it. I'm not trying to goad you. I really do pity you. I lived, Captain General. It was short, and it was painful, but by the Nine Hells, I lived. I'd rather have it that way than yours. No joy, no hate, no fear. Unbreakable without growth, immortal without passion. What more can he take from you that he hasn't already? The mind makes some powerless, and gives strength to others. Because we are not ready to give up our ties or codes, we surrender ourselves. We become slaves to teachings and belief. That is why belief will always rule you. To truly believe in an ideal, you must be willing to betray it. Constantine, a man with no ego, no passion, it had been purged in the elevation the Emperor had done to him. He was the epitome of control an emotional state of neutral. Had he ever felt the roar of rage, excitement, or joy in his blood, like Ushatan? Had he ever cried, 
felt love or true happiness. How much of his humanity had the Emperor taken? And yet with the one thing he was left with, duty, did he really believe in it? Could he make that choice? Could he, like a Woma Candlewire, choose to believe in the Imperium? Could he, like her, be willing to betray it? Was he a creature of power or strength? Did he ever make any fundamental choices in his own life? Did the Emperor alter him because he feared a rival? One who had the strength to make choices? In the ashes of victory, Constantine reflected on the slain Primarch of the Thunder Warriors, a man he confessed he did like, but the duty remained, and his death was necessary for the future of the Imperium. A warmer Kandawire was left alone, the dreams of a diplomatic Imperium fading with the opposition that could do nothing. The genetic laboratories in Duality had been sabotaged by Amar Astarte, disgusted with how far the Emperor had gone and was seemingly willing to go. A fruitless scheme, counteracted by the Imperium's own copies of the research and materials. The operation for the production of this army was to be taken from the hundreds to the thousands, to then the hundreds of thousands. Constantine did not like these Astartes, too much imperfection in them, they were too human. He had been there decades ago, during their creation, when he had borne witness to one of the Imperium's greatest failures. Deep in the Imperium's innermost sanctums, under layers of protection, thought to be so ironclad, lay the new generals. Forged for war in the stars, the Primarch Project. Twenty specimens, created from the Emperor's own genetic material, were the foundation of an army that would conquer the galaxy. But they were lost. A tear into the warp opened, within their gestation chamber, ripping the capsules from their ceramite foundations. Constantine and Amar Astarte had rushed within, recovering as much research and material as they could. With the Emperor of Mankind, utilizing his enormous psychic might to hold the collapsing roof. As Constantine and Amar rushed, the loss of these new Primarchs, these generals, was insurmountable. The truth behind their loss was only known to the Emperor, Malkador, and Constantine. A secret kept even from Constantine's custodian brothers. Chaos. Within the war, the immaterial. The reflective realm of rippling psychic emotions, some foul and evil stirred. Four dark entities, eldritch horrors that called themselves gods. Embodiments of humanity's worst tendencies, their very existence was only a supportive claim to the idea that humanity must be united together, lest the influence of these foul gods corrupt and warp us. With the trial by fire of the Adeptus Astartes, created from the surviving material of the Primarch Project, Constantine declared that the Imperium was truly born. The palace was now secure. All it needs now is a throne, a symbol, and a weapon, a resource that would guide the Imperium through the warp, a golden throne. With a preparation underway, Constantine heard the news from Malkador that planted a seed of caution. The Emperor of Mankind had felt his Primarch's presence out there in the galaxy. Immediately Constantine's mind went to threat evaluation. What if these Primarchs had been tainted? Could they ever trust these superhumans raised without the guidance and conditioning of the Imperium? Perhaps they should be destroyed. But most troubling of all, the Emperor had called them his sons. It was like commuting with a star, all-powerful, brilliant, so far above the existence of all others. Constantine knew exactly what the Emperor was, what he had seen, and what he had done, and what he intended to do. But it caught him off guard, when this timeless, 
godlike creature expressed humanity. Sons. They were meant to be weapons. Malkador told Constantine it was not often, but there were periods where the Emperor seemed more connected to his humanity. Something Constantine accepted, but did not understand. But his regimented mind did not have the space to question. Constantine's caution, his distrust would only heighten in the events to come. In an interaction white from all Imperial records, Constantine noticed some suspicious activity taking place within the Imperial Palace. He and the custodians were the pinnacle of discipline, exhibiting a caution and concentration so absolute that any threat to the Emperor was met by guardian spear and death. In the Imperium's royal courtyard, the Emperor descended down in a thunderhawk to the surface, but an imperfection, an error was caught as Garudo had failed to respond. The deeply coded language voxed into silence. Atop an angled roof, overlooking the landing pad, a figure lay in watch. A threat, donned in the custodian's own golden auramite armor. Constantine launched himself at this imposter, like a golden thunderstorm, his personal Apollonian spear lashing with tongues of lightning. Despite his size, despite the bulk of his armor, he moved as smoothly as a dancer along the narrow ridge. He was the Emperor's greatest champion, Terra's mightiest warrior, and peerless in combat. A duel broke out. The two enormous figures matched each other blow for blow, something too fast for the mortal eye to see. A contest that was broken apart just as quickly as it had started as Malkador the Sigilite told them both to stand down. Constantine asked this intruder who he was. The large superhuman responded, I am Alpharius, one of the Primarchs, donning the armor and personal weapon of his fellow custodian, Garudo. Only Garudo's death would have allowed this Alpharius access to his equipment. Each custodian was a genetic masterpiece, a work of science and art, each one of them the Emperor's finest, who accumulated names as they achieved and accomplished in the Emperor's name. Constantine himself had achieved nearly 2,000 names, each etched onto the inside of his own custodian armor. The loss of Garu Do, a loyal servant of the Emperor, was a magnanimous loss, and yet here he stood, Constantine's first interaction with a Primarch, in the armor of a murdered brother. Interrogating this Alpharius, he revealed his purpose for his actions, to expose a weakness in the security of the Imperial Palace, a protection that needed to be impregnable, and any amount of sacrifice in the name of the Emperor's protection was worth spilling, though that did not mean he liked it. Constantine understood that Garado's death may have been necessary. He accepted it, but he was not devoid of all emotion, and still felt kindred for his custodian brothers. Alpharius went further, saying that Constantine could not think like an enemy of the Emperor. His mind was forged with unbreakable loyalty. He could never choose to betray the Emperor, even in thought. A weakness their enemies could exploit. It would be that weakness, it would be this attitude to war, treating it like a dark game, that led Constantine to develop a way to fortify the palace from threats of that nature, creating the Blood Games. A contest poising the Emperor's own custodies against each other in a contest to reach the inner sanctums of the palace. The lesson had been important, as well as for the fact that this Primarch, Alpharius, had the potential to think like an enemy. Something that only stoked the cautions of Constantine. After centuries of work, origins armoured in steel and leather to brilliant Oromite gold, Constantine stood at the side of the Emperor. Terror had been unified, twenty legions of the Adeptus Astartes created, and an alliance with the Mechanicum of Mars, 
The vision was coming to fruition. The Emperor of Mankind declared the birth of the Great Crusade. Enormous armadas launched from terror, venturing into the cold void of space to conquer the galaxy. At the Emperor's side, Constantine began to battle upon countless worlds, facing horrifying Xenos and non-compliant colonies of mankind. Like ink in water, the boundaries of the Imperium spread, a die cast over millions, and then billions, and then billions upon billions. And then, after a decade of war, upon the world of Chthonia, a crime-ridden underhive, they found him. Horus Lupercal, number 16, a Primarch. A reunion that became a rally cry to the Imperium, as the first openly acknowledged Primarch had been found. With the Primarch reunited with his legion, his sons, Constantine finally began to understand why. Why the Emperor had forged such terrifying beings. Worlds collapsed under the onslaught of a genius Primarch-like mind. The effect they had on others, to be in their very presence made people weep. As the decades rolled past, more and more of them were found treated like long-lost sons. There were some he respected, one such as Rogel Dawn, who in their first duel together, Constantine emerged victorious. Centuries of skill paired against the innate strength and speed of a Primarch, but never again did Dawn lose. These creatures learned fast. As the Imperium spread further and further across the galaxy, the Imperium of Mankind grew, transforming terror into a bustling administration hub, something that over time drew more of the attention of Constantine, as the Primarchs and their legions spread out, conquering, leaving the cleanup and the real compliance to others. Decades upon decades of war, Constantine and the Custodians fought alongside their Emperor in achieving compliance across the galaxy, the dream. The grand vision at the Imperium's heart was within grasp. The Emperor decided that the Great Crusade was stable, and the next great work upon terror would begin. On the world of Ulanor, cleansed the filthy Xenos, the Orcs, a grand triumph was prepared. Billions of Astra Militarum regiments, numerous Astartes legions, and their Primarchs stood in parade. Constantine stood at the side of the Emperor, as billions wept at the majesty of such a perfect being. Constantine saw his king, that his attention was required upon terror, and that there would be a new head of the Great Crusade. The War Master, Horus Lupercal, the 16th, the first found and favoured son. A new era had begun with Constantine following his emperor back to the throne world, the place of his birth and his transformation. Inside the innermost sanctums of the Imperial Palace, deep below the incredible technological masterpiece that was the Golden Throne, the work escalated, crafted in a time lost to history by a species long forgotten, a shimmering, disorientating, vertigo-inducing tear into another realm was open. The webway, the mirror dimension highway, the grand plan, the future of the species lie ahead, but fate is never so kind. Faldor was among them, his long cloak whipping in the ash-blown wind. More than 60 custodians of the Legio, plus hundreds of support troops and regular auxiliary units were gathering for the push north. The Captain General looked almost untouched by combat. His armor was close to pristine, giving off a reflective aura under Prospero's blackening skies. His Apollonian spear seethed with energy, wrapping the golden shaft in a corona of false sunlight. He moved in the way he always did before battle, proud, 
confident, measured. Simonus bowed as he drew close. Grim labor, Vestarios, Valdor said. Indeed, Lord. Now that I see this place. He had been intending to say that he wished to see it utterly destroyed. He had seen sorcery of a scale and depravity he had never witnessed before, but he never got the chance. The land raider jutted in close, gunmetal grey, adorned with blood-red decorations of writhing serpents. It was the first of more than twenty such troop carriers, driven insanely far through the rubble and kicking it up like a ship throws a bow wave. For a moment, Simonis never even saw Lehman Russ. He had certain expectations of Primarchs, that they marched on foot at the head of their armies, issuing orders in clear voices like his own master. He did not expect them to ride into war. Hanging off the back of a personal transport one-handed and swinging a damn sword around like a berserk. Constantine! Russ cried out, throwing himself from the still racing land raider and crunching heavily to the ground. His blade, the one Imperial scholars called Bale Knight, but one which the walls themselves called Mjolnar, gleamed with malignant silver-white spitefulness. The Wolf King marched up to the Captain General, pelts swinging about him. Other warriors jumped down from the skidding land raiders, Varingiar terminators bearing axes and frost blades, the liberally bloodied armor hung with fur scraps and bone totems. Valdor waited for him, flanked by his own honor guard. The custodians were taller than their counterparts, and no doubt more accomplished in some of the finer arts of combat. But there was something in the Varingiar's latent menace, bleeding from them with every swaggered move that chilled the blood. What took you so damn long? Russ demanded, hawking up a gobbit of spittle and loosing it on the ground. He went helmetless, the only one of them there who did. A statement of arrogant confidence that struck Simonus as borderline crazed. We've been killing witches without your sisters to blunt their fangs. Valdor stiffened a little. It was your wish to engage first, Lord, he said. True, Russ laughed. There was a strange light in those bestial eyes. Simonus thought he looked half mad. True, but you took your time when the order came. Order. No living man gave the Captain General an order, save the one who had created him. Our landings are completed, Valdor said calmly. We advance on all fronts, and the Knight Commander's sisterhoods are deploying throughout the city. Russ growled low in his throat, a sound that made Simonis' spine tingle. This will throttle them now. This will crush them. Hell's eyes, I have learned to hate these bastards, but still he eludes me. Is he even on this world? Asked Valdor doubtfully. We have detected nothing. Russ dropped to Valdor then. He was a little shorter, much broader, his armor stained and smeared where Valdor's was pristine. Oh yes, he hissed, smiling in a disconcertingly feral manner. I can smell him now. I can smell him hunkering down in his own filth, fearful of me. Valdor remained unmoved. Even now I would see him taken to Terra if it could be done, I would wish to know why. Russ laughed, a coarse bark that sent more spittles flying into Valdor's faceplate. You're still clinging to that? Ha! He turned away, swinging his great blade casually. I've known since I first saw this world that we would face one another. I did not come here for prisoners, Constantine. If my father had truly wished for such, he would not have sent me. You were not sent alone, Lord Russ. Russ glanced back at Valdor, a sly smile on his fanged face. Oh, that's it, is it? He laughed again. You have the power of magisterium and wish to cling to it. Russ paced back to him again. He was always moving, restless, like a tempest bound up inside the sham form of a man. Don't try to invoke the Lex with me. You claim to speak to my father, but you're not his blood, are you? Not like we are. 
That's what really gets you, isn't it? You're his instruments. He'd toss you aside in an instant if he cared to. We, though, we, we're family. Ross gave out a great belly laugh then, amused by the idea. You'll never understand that. Faldo didn't reply for an instant, seemingly genuinely nonplussed. There are so many errors there, he said eventually. I don't even know where to start. But a reply never came. Fresh mortar blast boomed at the end of the avenue. The land raiders gunned their smoggy engines, and the grav tanks swung round to target new markers. In the far distance, where one of the many great pyramids slumped in burning ruin, and the clouds deepened towards inky vortex, the enemy was moving. They stir! Russ roared joyously, running back to the land raider and leaping onto its chassis. The walls were crying out battle chants, slamming their blades against their armor and slavering for action once more. Try to keep up, Constantine! You'll have to get your armor dirty sooner or later! And then the column powered up and thundered down the shattered avenue, followed by looping packs of grey hunters and whole contingents of bound auxilia. Simonus watched them go. The Aculon guard remained static around them, their helm faces magnificently blank. Is he in his right mind, Lord? He ventured, looking up at Valdor inquiringly. Valdor didn't respond immediately. He watched the wolves race into battle, whooping and hollering. It was impossible to gauge what he thought behind that ornate mask of Oromite and Cerulean. Primarchs. He said, finally, a single, withering expletive that sounded as close to a curse as the Captain General of the Ten Thousand would ever get. He has unleashed something he does not understand, Valdor said, staring at the distant Russ and speaking slowly and deliberately. Just as Magnus did before him, what is it with them all? Where did they get this monstrous pride? More flagstones cracked, and Simonus heard the sighing creak of breaking stone. There was no sign of the Primarch, of the Thousand Sons now, only the endless bellows of his assassin. He lurched over to Valdor across the tilting flags, daring to reach out to pull him back from the edge. But at last, the Captain General turned away as the debris of a world's demise blew about them in a furious edesis, he finally reached up to remove his helm. It came loose with a hiss, and Valdor inhaled the first unfiltered air of doomed Prospero. The Captain General was furious. Never before had Simonus witnessed such raw anger on that normally implacable face. They are the architects of this, Valdor said, speaking to the storm. All of them. He turned to look at his thrall. It could have been prevented. Yet when the hour came, we merely watched them being born. Two centuries of war. The Great Crusade had expanded far, and now the Imperium encompassed billions upon billions of humans. But a rift had begun to form. A festering wound that had finally spilled into a question. A decision that needed the approval of only the Emperor. The use of psychic powers within the Legiones Astartes. Two sides had been drawn up. The pro psychers Magnus the Red, Sanguinius, and Jekatai Khan. Versus the anti psychers Lehman Russ and Mortarian and in part, Corvus Corax and Rogal Dawn, others refusing to take a side. The grand debate for the future of those who manipulated the powers of the warp was overseen by the most powerful user of that art, the Emperor of Mankind, and at his side stood Constantine Valdor, no judge, but a loyal guardian. Constantine himself did not feel strongly for either side. He had seen the misuse and danger of this power during the Unification Wars against the vile 
self-declared priest king Mollard Sen, the connection to the war, that realm of madness left him cautious of the influence of the great enemy, the gods of chaos, that had ripped the Primarchs from the palace centuries ago, and yet his lord, his king, was a psyker. Constantine had seen his emperor wield his abilities for the good of the Imperium. He knew the value of astropaths and navigators whose existence and powers were vital to the survival of the Imperium. Keeping an empire's logistics alive with their very connection to the war. The Council of Nicaea had begun, each side presenting their case with passion, but all turned into disaster with the revelation of the Primarch Magnus's hubris. He had delved too far. He and his legion were unstable, burned like a hand too close to the flame as they were walking the path of those who had brought about the horrors of old night, the age of collapse from mankind, whose scars were felt upon every world in the galaxy, a time of rampant, uncontrolled psychic nightmare. Constantine saw the matter put to a close, as the Emperor declared the banning of psychic powers within the Astartes legions, a decision whose consequences would ripple across the galaxy. With Constantine and the Emperor returning back to Terra, the great work continued. The webway portal beneath Terra had been opened, its winding roots conquered and claimed under the banner of the Imperium. It was an alien place, its shifting, misty walls, its acrid smell, and the echoes of ghosts haunting the shadows and periphery of eyesight. Constantine alongside the Custodes and members of the Adeptus Mechanicus quickly garrisoned a long ruined Eldari city, its inhabitants long dead to an age almost lost to time. But this seeming path of victory turns to ash in the Imperium's mouth, as after years of building these foundations, it all came tumbling down. At the side of his Emperor, Constantine saw this figure of raw, hot psychic flame burst through the webway, all the way to the steps of the Golden Throne itself. The psychic wards the Emperor himself had placed, shattered. The figure with one baleful eye exhibited a startling panic as Constantine and his brothers began to fire upon it, their shells passing through the apparition. The palace began to shake, and equipment exploded, taking an untold number of lives. The figure in psychic fire looked to the Emperor, and in those eyes that had seen countless suns and civilizations die, he answered him, Magnus. The panicked, miserable Primarch answered, Father. Behind the projection of Magnus, a tide of laughing, unholy, Vile sounds rushed like a tide. Constantine, the Custodes and the Emperor charged the demons. Magnus's breaking of the psychic wards of the Emperor had doomed terror. The webway was under assault, and the Immaterium tried to flood in, only stabilized by the Emperor's might. Magnus had broken the Edict of Nikea, but most importantly he had broken the dream for the species. The Emperor, for all of Constantine's life, had remained controlled, his displays of humanity waxing and waning over periods we would call lifetimes, but his fury was obvious. The censure of Magnus was ordered immediately, and a contingent of custodies and sisters of silence led by Constantine were sent to aid the Space Wolves Legion, the Thousand Suns' rivals in the seizure of Magnus, to stand trial upon terror. Arriving within the Prosperine system, Constantine was united with the Primarch Lehman Russ. The enormous figure drew up close, boisterous and lively, just like how he had been when the two had met near two centuries ago. If Constantine was the warrior carved in marble, unmoving and stoic, Lehman Russ was the animated, living thing that drew all eyes upon him. Lehman and Constantine, both weapons forged by the Emperor's personal hand, 
Yet where one exemplified order, the other was freedom. Constantine, despite his cautions, liked the Wolf King, even if at times their natures mixed like oil and water. You claim to speak for my father, but you are not his blood, are you? Not like we are. That's what really gets you, isn't it? You're his instruments. He toss you aside in an instant if he cared to. We though, we, we're family. Constantine was an instrument, something he had told Ushatan long ago. He was to be cast aside when he was no longer needed. But the idea that Lehman and all of his brothers believed themselves to be family, with a man so far above mortal connections, puzzled him. Was this part of the Emperor's manipulation? A way to keep his tools loyal? Or a display of his rare humanity slipping through? Constantine was bonded to Lehman Russ in a way he was not with the other Primarchs. The Apollonian Spear. One of a pair alongside the Dionysian Spear, gifted to Russ, both forged by the Emperor's hand in the Age of Strife. The Apollonian Spear was gifted to Constantine at his ascension to the role of Chief Custodian. Each foe struck down by the blade, their very soul, their core being would flash through Constantine's mind in an instant. Each conflict where thousands upon thousands died at his hand, he left feeling like he knew every one of them. Koja Zhu, Ushatan, Corrupted Terran zealots, Xenos all laid bare before him. It was a gift from his lord, an augury into other lives that kept the threads of his own humanity together. He was a man, despite his transformation, his humanity was too precious to lose to indifference. As the forces of the Imperium were set to loose themselves upon the Thousand Suns, new orders had come in from the War Master. The judgement had been changed to annihilation. The planet burned, and the wolves of Fenris roared as the custodies marched. Billions of lives were lost, and each thousand sun, such as Phocis Takar, Constantine cut down. He saw their treachery, their gene flaws. He saw them become monsters in his own mind, mutated beyond recognition. Thirty Astarte stood against him, each gifted with prescience, but still they fell single-handedly to the unbelievable strength of Constantine. The hubris of Magnus had brought him here, and at the moment of victory, the Wolf King victorious in his duel with the Crimson King, they vanished. The Thousand Suns were gone, and in the ashes of a world on fire, amongst the failures and hubris of another Primarch, Constantine came the closest in his entire life to anger. They are the architects of this, their monstrous pride. It could have been prevented, yet when the hour came, we merely watched them being born. Man ought either to be indulged or utterly destroyed, for if you merely offend them, they take vengeance. But if you injure them greatly, they are unable to retaliate, so that the injury done to a man ought to be such that vengeance cannot be feared. The Battle of Prospero had ended in disaster. Their objective failed. Returning back to Terra, Constantine heard the news that would change the fate of the Imperium forever. The War Master Horus has declared open rebellion. Alongside the Emperor's Children, Death Guard and World Eater Legions, open rebellion was now alive and like a malicious disease that would wash across the various worlds of the Imperium. Constantine confided in his fellow custodian. He had been there when Horus Lupercal had been discovered by the Emperor. 
He had watched him, seen him learn and grow into command of his legion. He had seen him be crowned War Master at the triumph of Ulanor. He knew the hidden pride that lay beneath the humble mask. He pondered on the idea of a building resentment fostered outside of the Emperor's influence. But it did not add up. It was not enough to fuel a rebellion. Perhaps something had driven him to it. The Imperium was in shock. Lines were being drawn up and sides chosen. The realization of Horus's betrayal had called into question the burning of Prospero. Billions had died, and a legion had been destroyed on the false orders of the War Master Horus. Constantine had seen their corruption, their genetic faults rupture through the Thousand Suns as they delved too deeply into their psychic powers. But the fact that their destruction was architected by a traitor pained Constantine. With the return of the Primarch Rogal Dawn to terror, preparations for defense and retribution was enacted. With much of the Emperor's attention drawn to the webway, under assault, underneath the Imperial Palace, the war in the material was left to Dawn and Constantine. Seven legions were sent to bring these traitors to heel, to rip them out of their hole on the world of Istvan V. Constantine had always been cautious of the Legiones Astartes. He found those feelings more and more reinforced when the further disastrous news reached the throne world. The Night Lords, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion had turned upon their allies. Three loyalist legions had been decimated, their Primarchs missing. The Battle of Isfahan V, one of the bloodiest, most mind-numbing, cacophonous battles sent the Imperium into disarray. Constantine and Dawn began to lock down Terror and the Soul System, preparing for the battle now that would inevitably come to their doorstep. Constantine knew the capabilities of Horus, his first meeting with a Primarch, Alpharius of the Alpha Legion had taught him a lesson. He needed to put himself within a traitor's mind, to understand them, to understand how to fight like them. Terror, already under the watchful gaze of the custodians, blurred the line into a surveillance state. The probability of spies for the War Master lurked in the shadows. Many people and worlds had been forcibly complied into the Imperium sphere, and there were plenty who had no love for the Emperor. The galaxy began to burn, as the traitorous forces began to spread out like dark fingers, shadowing worlds under their vile grasp. The Imperium was falling apart, as various warp storms began to cut off whole sectors, making communication impossible. It was becoming clear that there was something more to this rebellion. Just as Constantine had suspected, there was a dark benefactor to the War Master's actions. Whispers of vile rituals, human sacrifice, creatures of nightmare that did not seem like Xenos. The great enemy, the gods of chaos. The secret known only to the triumvirate of the Emperor, Malkador the Sigilite and Constantine Valdor. But now the secret was out, and the fury of many such as Dawn was ferocious to be kept in the dark against such dangers. They had prosecuted a war, the Great Crusade in the name of the Imperial Truth, bringing humanity across the stars out of the darkness, away from the ignorance of mysticism and the enslavement to belief. And yet there were creatures in the warp, entities that called themselves gods. Creatures that answered the prayers of the desperate and cruel. The truth had become evident to the Emperor, Malkador and Constantine, that this was a war for the species, for its very soul. A war against enemies that would use every foul trick in the book. Constantine began to take the steps necessary to fight that war. Within a dark corner on terror, Constantine, draped in robes and hiding his identity, made his way into one of the Imperium's most inner sanctums. There he met with perhaps the most dangerous men and women within the Imperium. 
the Officio Assassinorum, chemically and genetically altered killers, crafted and armed with technology beyond the reach of most within the Imperium, an order who had operated directly under the Emperor, a necessary tool for some enemies could not be reasoned with. Appearing before the Assassinorum Council, it was Constantine who became the architect of a plan to deal with their enemy, a united task force from all sub-schools of the Order, working in tandem on one target, Horus Lupercal. Men ought either to be indulged or utterly destroyed, for if you merely offend them, they take vengeance, but if you injure them greatly, that they are unable to retaliate, so that the injury done to a man ought to be such that vengeance cannot be feared. Horus needed to die, Emperor's son or not, he was a threat to his master. What some would consider cowardly, others might call expedient. Constantine's movements had not gone unnoticed by the Praetorian of Terror, Primarch Rogel Dawn. He confronted him, clearly disturbed by the secrecy and the implication of this hidden order's use. Constantine deflected and lied. He was used to the lies. He had hidden truths from Candlewire, just like now he was lying to Dawn. Lies did not offend him, because he trusted that if he was not told, then he did not need to know. An utter acceptance that bristled against Dawn who was preparing a mighty defense against forces he was told was a lie. The protection of the Emperor was Constantine's goal, and he would employ any method. He would utterly destroy his master's enemies, so that the consequences done ought to be such that vengeance could not be feared. Dawn pushed back against Constantine, that your first remit is to safeguard the life of the Emperor of Mankind, above all else, mine and that of my brothers is to safeguard the Imperium. Constantine responded that the two are the same. To Constantine the Imperium was the Emperor, the singular vision at its heart. He could not imagine an existence without him. Did he fight for the man or the dream? Was he even capable of defending humanity from the Emperor? Which would he let die first, the species or the master? The tension between these two demigod-like figures never went away, as Dawn left with a distasteful feeling. Any feelings of shame, any wavering of morality that would run through our minds never entered the rigid, egoless temple of Constantine, as he left terror in preparation for the assassination of the traitor. Horus Lupercal. Would you? Dawn's fury was palpable, crackling in the air around him. I'm sure my father is capable of defending himself. And tell me, Captain General, what kind of victory exists in a war like the one you would have us fight? He jested at the room around them. A war fought from hidden places, under cover of falsehood. Innocent lives wasted in the name of dubious tactics. Underhanded, clandestine conflicts fueled by secrets and lies. For a moment, Valdor half expected the Imperial Fist to rip up the table between them, just so he could strike at the custodian. But then, like a tidal wave drawing back into the ocean, Dawn's anger seemed to subside. Valdor knew better. Though the Primarch was the master of his own fury, turning it inward, turning it to stony, unbreakable purpose. This war, Dawn went on, sparing Malkador a glance, is a fight not just for the material, for the worlds and for the hearts of men. We are in a battle for ideals. At stake are the very best of the Imperium's ultimate principles, Values of pride, nobility, honor, and fealty. How can a veiled killer understand the meaning of such words? Valdor felt Malkador's eyes on him, and the tension in him seemed to dissipate. 
At once, he felt a cold sensation of conviction rise in his thoughts, and he matched the Imperial Fist's gaze, answering his challenge. No one in this room has known war as intimately as you have, my lord. And so surely it is you who must understand better than any one of us that this war cannot be a clean and gallant one. We fight a battle like no other in human history. We fight for the future. Can you imagine what might have come to pass if Kel and the rest of the execution force had not been present on Dagonet? If this creature's spear had been reunited with the rebel forces? He would have attempted to complete his mission. Come to Terra, to enter the sphere of the Emperor's power, and engage his murder gift said Sire Calexis. He would never have got that far, insisted Sir Venus. He would have been found and killed, surely. The Sigilite or the Emperor himself would have sensed such an abomination and crushed it. Are you certain? Valdor pressed. Horus has many allies, some of them closer than we wish to admit. If this spear could have reached Terra, made his attack, even a failure to make the kill, a wounding even. He trailed off, suddenly appalled by the grim possibility he was describing. Such a psychic attack would have caused incredible destruction. Dawn said nothing for a moment. It seemed as if the Primarch was sharing the same terrible nightmare that danced in the custodian's thoughts of his lead lord, mortally wounded by a lethal enemy clinging to fading life, whilst the Imperial Palace was a raging inferno all around him. Valdor found his voice once more. Your brother will beat us, Lord Dorn. He will win this war unless we match him blow for blow. We cannot, we must not be afraid to make the difficult choices, the hardest decisions. Horus Lupercal will not hesitate to- I am not Horus, Dorn snarled the words striking the custodian like a physical blow. And I will. Enough. The single utterance was a lightning bolt captured in a crystal, shattering everything around it, silencing them all with an unstoppable, immeasurable force of will. Rogaldorn turned to the sound of that voice, as every man, woman and Astartes in the chamber sank to their knees, each of them instinctively knowing who had uttered it. The Sigilite was the last to do so, shooting a final, unreadable look at the prime mark of the Imperial Fists, before he too took to a show of obedience. The question escaped Dawn's lips. Father? The darkness, the great curtains of shadow that had filled the furthest corners of the chamber, now became lighter, the walls and floor growing more distinct by the moment, as the unnatural gloom faded. He blinked, strange how he had looked directly into that place and seen it, but without really seeing it at all. It had been in plain sight for everyone in the room, even he, and yet none of them had registered the strangeness of it. Now from the black came light. A figure stood there, effortlessly dominating the space. His patrician features marred by a mix of turbulent emotions that gave even the mightiest imperial fist a second pause. The Emperor of Mankind wore no armor, no finery or dress uniform, only a simple surplace of grey cloth, threaded with subtle lines of purple and gold silk, and yet he was still magnificent to behold. Perhaps he had been listening to them all along, Yet it seemed to be a defiance of the laws of nature, that a being so majestic, so lit with power, could stand in a room among men, Astartes and the greatest mortal psyche would ever live, and be as a ghost. But then he was the Emperor, and to all questions, that was sufficient answer. His father came towards him, and Rogaldorn bowed deeply, at length, joining the others that had bended the knee before the master of mankind. The Emperor did not speak. Instead, he strode across the shrouds to the tall windows 
with a sailcloth draped hung like frozen cataracts of shadow. With a flick of his great hand, Dawn's father took a fist of the cloth and snatched it away. The hanging tore free and tumbled to the floor. He walked the perimeter of the room, ripping away every last cover until the chamber was flooded with the bright, honey-yellow luminosity of the Himalayan dawn. Dawn dared to glance up and saw the golden radiance striking his father. It gathered its brightness to him, as if it were an embrace. For an instant, the sunlight was like a sheath of glowing armor about him. Then the Primarch blinked, and the moment passed. No more shadows, said the Emperor. His words were gentle, summoning, and all the faces in the room turned to look upon him. He placed a hand on Dawn's shoulder as he passed him by, and then repeated the gesture with Valdor. No more veils. He beckoned them all to stand, and as one they obeyed, and yet in his presence, each of them felt as if they were still at his feet. His aura towered over them, filling the emotions of the room. Dawn received a nod, as did Valdor. My noble son, my loyal guardian, I hear both your words, and I know that there is right in each of you. We cannot lose sight of what we are, and what we aspire to be. But we cannot forget that we face the greatest enemy and the darkest challenge. In the depths of his father's eyes, Dawn saw something no one else could have perceived. So transient and fleeting, it barely registered. He saw sorrow, deep and unending, and his heart ate with an empathy only a son could know. The Emperor reached out a hand, and gestured towards the dawn as it rose to fill the room around them. It is time to bring you into the light. The Officio Assassinorum has been my quiet blade for too long, an open secret none dared to speak of, but no longer. Such a weapon cannot exist forever in the shadows, answerable to no one. It must be seen to be governed. There must be no doubt of the integrity behind every deed, every blow landed, every choice made, or else we count for naught. His gaze turned to Dawn, and he nodded slowly to his son. Because of this, I am certain, in the war to come, every weapon in the arsenal of the Imperium will be called to bear. They think of that as the exercise of power. I do not blame them. They are creatures of power, built to dominate, but they are wrong. The term is older than that. It is the interpretation of the truth discovered through communion with the Source. We are interpreters of it, not masters. We are slaves to it. That is our first lesson. All others are secondary. All other attempts had failed, intervened, and halted by the vile first chaplain of the word bearers, Erebus. His dark patrons had whispered things into his ear, leading each imperial assassin to find themselves slain, even by their own tools. Assembling a team of the most deadly creatures that defied the confines of the word human, Constantine led them to their target destination on Dagonet, the mission taking some of them to the darkest and most rotten places upon this world, Constantine even finding his ship shot down by a bunch of junk hunters, unarmored, staring down at the end of a barrel. However, he noticed something off in the distance, and with a voice that rumbled from the core of an enormous being, he declared, my name is Constantin Valdor, Captain General of the Legio Custodes, and I hold the power of the Emperor's displeasure in my hand. Death 
Death was handed out at the fingertips of Constantine's hand. The miscreants exploding into mist and meet at the hands of horrifying assassins. The plan continued. The target was in sight. Stepping down from the land speeder, they struck, eliminating him, only to find themselves duped. A body double. The plan had failed in regards to except one detail. Spear. A nightmarish creature. A horrific melding of a psychic blank and the corruption of chaos. One drop of the Emperor's blood was the ingredient needed for an assassination, plotted by the vile first chaplain, Erebus. Horus lived, but the anomalous threat was expunged in the attempted regicide. Upon terror, Constantine met with the ruling Assassinorum Council. The disapproval of Rogel Dawn was apparent. This way of war was dishonorable, a sin on the Imperium that they were fighting for. But Constantine felt justified. The tactics were dishonorable, but what value did the idea of honor have on a man who had the feelings of ego purged from him? The gambit had failed, but the value of the death of this spear was immeasurable. It had protected the Emperor. The very idea of their master's death was a sobering moment for all at the table. Your brother will beat us, Lord Dawn. He will win this war unless we match him blow for blow. We cannot. We must not be afraid to make the difficult choices, the hardest decisions. Horace Lupercal will not hesitate. A mindset so at odds with the noble Dawn, it enraged him. The clashing of Constantine, the enslaved weapon, versus the Primarch, who had made a choice to serve the Emperor. But before the argument could escalate, a booming voice silenced them all. The Emperor, the brilliant, perfect being, spoke. My noble son, my loyal guardian, I hear both your words, and I know that there is right in each of you. We cannot lose sight of what we are, and what we aspire to be but we cannot forget what we face. The greatest enemy and the darkest challenge. The two polar opposites were merged. The cold, calculating of Constantine, combined with the honor of Dawn, as the Emperor brought the Assassinorum into the light. A new, accountable force. A sentiment Constantine immediately accepted, even if he did not understand. The years began to drag on, as the Imperium burned under the assault of Horus and the traitorous Primarchs and their legions, each of them slowly devouring and succumbing to the corruption of their dark patrons. More and more Primarchs managed to limp back to terror, each scarred by losses against the traitors. Lehman Russ, Sanguinius, and most surprisingly, Jagatai Khan a legion's loyalty who even Constantine and Dawn had held in doubt. Terror itself was almost unrecognizable, transformed into a bastion that would give pause to any force in the galaxy. Constantine saw the Great Towers, where he and the First Custodians had sat with the Emperor, basking in his personal tutelage, places where they had once discussed philosophy and tactics. The birthplace of the Magisterium, the Order of the Adeptus Custodes, the place where the dream had started and now were destined to be awash with smoke, fire and blood. All roads led to terror, both loyalists and traitors knew this, and after over seven years of civil strife, the War Master was preparing for this final strike. All able-bodied defenders were drawn up ready to fight on the walls of this great bastion, except one, Lehman Russ, Primarch of the Space Wolves. He had prepared his own gambit, a surprise strike designed to cut the head of the traitor's cause before they entered the soul system. Constantine, Malkador and the other Primarchs knew that there was no swaying him. Constantine met with Russ before his departure, noting the hypocrisy of Russ with rune priests within his ranks. 
to Constantine, the ruling of the Emperor was absolute, and this break in the Edict of Nicaea was unlawful, despite Russ's protest that they needed to fight fire with fire. They think that as an exercise of power. I do not blame them. They are creatures of power, built to dominate, but they are wrong. The term is older than that. It is the interpretation of the truth, discovered through communion with the source. We are interpreters of it, not masters. We are slaves to it. That is our first lesson. All others are secondary. To Constantine, any method was allowed within the confines of the Emperor's will, the Source. He could not make a choice to betray that will. He was a slave to it. He could not enforce any opinion on it, as the psycho conditioning of his mind snapped his king's will into his own moral confines. The Primarchs, the creatures of power, struggled against those very confines their own truths, struggling to mix with Constantine's absolute. The Emperor, the Magisterium. He warned Rust that Horus would not fall for his barbarian persona. Constantine knew the brilliant mind that lay beneath. He disliked the Primarchs. They were the cause of all of this, but a part of him liked the Wolf King. Constantine presented Rust with the reason he had come to him. The Dionysian Spear the other half of Constantine's own Apollonian spear, a weapon that had remained firmly locked with Constantine's grasp for centuries, whereas his counterpart had done everything he could to be rid of his. As Constantine departed, Rush told him that he had to do this. It was his nature, something Constantine understood well. For reasons a mystery to him, the Emperor had made them this way. With the departure of the wolves, the fortification of terror continued. Constantine took his role upon the War Council, as his brothers continued their battle inside the breach webway, underneath the palace. The power of chaos had been growing, the assault and tide of demons putting more pressure on the Emperor's enormous psychic might. The Ten Thousand, the mightiest warriors of the Emperor, were being pushed back. Their numbers whittled down as they faced the horrors of sentient nightmare. Each custodian who fell was a loss of unbearable proportions, each a handcrafted human by the Emperor, many with hundreds or thousands of earned names. A loss on the mind of Constantine as a shadow of Horus began to loom overhead. You refused our offer of assistance, said Dawn. We refused nothing, said Valdor. You know where the order came from, and you never resisted it. Of course not. Valdor drew in a weary breath. Resisting orders has not given spectacular results thus far, has it? Neither has following them, said Dawn grimly. The tension between the two figures was evident, despite the informal setting. The Primarch Rogal Dawn was unarmored, as he preferred to be unless called to war. As ever, his aspect was Spartan, clad in robes of a warrior monk. His white hair had grown long, adding to the effect. The many stone tables of his private chambers were stuffed with the paraphernalia of imperial bureaucracy, order capsules, tactical reports, innumerable requests for audience or support. Even though the doors were closed and locked, Simonis guessed that dozens of attendants still hovered on the far side, waiting for their moment to run the gauntlet of the Lord Commander's unpredictable mood. For now, though, it was only the three of them, locked away in the windowless heart of Dawn's cell-like sanctum, raking over old regrets before the storm hit. There are days when I think nothing any of us do is free of the curse. Curse? I did not have you as a suspicious soul. I wasn't. We're all having to learn new things. Dawn sat back in his heavy throne, for a moment, letting the aura of control slip. He looked like some archaic warlord then, holed up in his crumbling citadel, as the tides of ruin lapped closer, 
Simonis tried not to meet his gaze. The situation remains the same, Valdor said, steering the discussion back to its purpose. The Emperor holds the breach under the palace. The Mechanicum works on a way to release him from his duty. But you and I both know they will not succeed in the time we have left to us. But it's not the same, though, is it? You should have withdrawn earlier. Tell me, Constantine, what did you gain clinging on down there for so long? You'd all rather have died following a command than countermand it. I do not see that- It was a fool's errand. I tried to warn you. Unless we committed to everything we had, there was no hope of holding those portals. But no, only the pure could be risked. And look how that turned out. The order was given. Dawn smiled, cynically and without warmth. You see, there's your old problem. You never see any fault in him. You never push back. You never stop, think, say to yourself, is that sensible? He pressed his great, calloused hands together. And now you have this conundrum, the greatest of your existence. You were created to be the embodiment of his will, but we can no longer discover what that is. You are his voice, but he is silent. Can you think for yourself now, Captain General? That is what is required. Simone has hardly dared to look at Valdor. No one, not even Russ, who was as much bluster as substance, had ever dared to speak with such casual condescension to his master. And yet, when he finally lifted his eyes to that noble countenance, there was no anger there, only a kind of thoughtfulness. We were faithful, Valdor said quietly. I watched while your brotherhood was created. I studied you. I saw the dangers in you from the start and witnessed the way you fought and acted and quarreled. And still, I said nothing. If there had been a time to question an order, perhaps it was then. But the moment passed, and your great success came soon afterward. I will be honest now, for you have been honest with me. I did not believe you would ever be that deadly. I saw how swiftly you conquered worlds and said to myself, perhaps this is why you were made in the way you were. That was your great victory. You became untouchable. Dawn listened warily. Simonis did also. But now, we see the errors implicit in your forging. I should have spoken earlier. By the time war came to this place, the moment had passed, and we were all trapped by our fates. You say that the defense of the tunnels was doomed? Perhaps so. I have fought in other wars more than you will ever know that were also doomed. And they always played some part in his pattern. I still cleave to that. The only element that could not be accounted for. And there he looked directly at Dawn. Was you. Dawn lost his chilly smile. And, as always, the fault lies elsewhere. From the first time I met you, Constantine, you were never quite able to keep the disdain from tainting your words. Oh, you've been polite. I've never met a more courteous soul. But that doesn't really cut much with me. The Primarch stirred himself, sitting forwards in the throne and jabbing a finger at the Captain General. See, for all you look down on us, at least we were doing. We were building the Empire while you were musing over the finer points of the law that binds you. We were making decisions over which planets would burn and which would be saved. I'd rather have blood on my hands than book ink. For a moment, Simonus thought Valdor might snap then, release the anger that he was surely capable of. Over heartbeats, the two of them held one another's gaze, as if engaged in some hidden test of will. And yet, the task remains before us, Valdor said at last. I came to confer, not to dispute. We know Lupercal will be here soon. 
You are the Lord Commander. I have invested in me the power of Magisterium. We must speak with one voice from now on, lest further division hamper what preparation remains. Dawn looked at the floor then, pressing his fingers together in an image of contemplation. Simona saw the curve of those mighty shoulders and had a mental image of the weight of the entire Imperium bearing down on them. I speak as my soul dictates, Dawn said slowly. If it appears blunt to you, then it is not intended as such. I do not have time for much else, only truth now. He lifted up his eyes, which were ringed from a lack of sleep. And this is the truth. Your power was exhausted in that war. You have fewer than a thousand warriors under arms, and half of them are beneath the apothecary's knife. My father is silent and cannot guide you. Magisterium is an empty word. I have no doubt you'll fight when the time comes and reap as great a tally as you always have, but your place is by the throne now, not on the walls. Simonus listened, unable to keep the shame from welling up within him as the Primarch reeled off his judgment. The power of those words came not from their delivery, which was issued more in sorrow than disdain, but the fact they were being uttered at all. You have given great service, Captain General, said Dawn, working to keep the worst of the hardness from his voice. But this war has moved beyond you. It will be settled by the legions. If you wish to remain a part of it, you will have to find some way to fit around that. This is why we strip the comfort of religion from humanity. These are the livers of vulnerability that faith cracks open in the human heart. Even a belief in a lie leads us to do good. Eventually, it leads to the truth. That we are a species alone in the dark, threatened by the laughing games of sentient malignancies that mortals would call gods. Rare is the battle where the Emperor's custodians outnumber our foes. We are ever beset, surrounded upon all sides by heresy and foulness, just as is terror itself. Yet like the throne world, we stand resolute, indefatigable, indomitable. Let the enemy come. Let them darken the horizon with their numbers. Still, we will prevail. Warriors in gold, armed with the finest weapons the Imperium had to offer, cleaved apart sentient nightmares in the ruins of a Xenos civilization. Alongside their allies, the Sisters of Silence, psychic blanks whose very presence melted away the Immaterium's influence and contingents from the Mechanicum of Mars. The fighting was brutal. Tides of disgusting, horrifying demons ripped asunder against the men who had fought like lions. Spears were slammed into the floor as servitors rammed in ammunition in the blink of an eye. The glorious 10,000 gave everything they could in the defense of the webway, but it was not enough against a tide that would never end, against a force that was infinite. Upon the surface of Terror, Constantine acted as their representation on Terror's War Council, a task that he knew was important, but each time reports came back of the Fallen, more and more of the friends he knew, perhaps even some who he had trained, it took a toll. The Emperor was silent locked in concentration upon the Golden Throne. For the first time in Constantine's life, he had no orders. He had to act upon his own interpretation of his master's will. Secrets had played a part in this whole rebellion, yet there was one still only known to the Emperor, Malkador and Constantine. A dream slowly revealed to another, Ra Endymion, the son of Kojazu one of the last tyrants of terror, 
that Constantine had slain, taking the boy for elevation into his brotherhood. The folly of Magnus had broken the wards around the webway, grounds the custodians fought so desperately for because of what it represented. Humanity was changing. Over time, it would evolve. Its psychic powers would one day rival the nearly extinct Eldari. It was a metamorphosis that could not be unguided. This is why we strip the comfort of religion from humanity. These are the livers of vulnerability that faith cracks open in the human heart. Even if a belief in a lie leads us to do good, eventually it leads to the truth that we are a species alone in the dark, threatened by the laughing games of sentient malignancies that mortals would call gods. Even one group, left unattended, left to the predations of the comfort of religion, could be corrupted, taken advantage of by laughing, malignant gods. The utter hubris of a man trying to control trillions, to chase humanity down until all was within his grasp. A plan to bring the species into the webway, out of the reach of the corruption that would taint our evolution. It was the singular vision at the heart, the dream that the Emperor had told Constantine of long ago. The dream that Magnus' mistake had doomed. It would be very easy to utterly despise the creature or creatures that had doomed your entire species. The Primarchs. After years of fighting, the 10,000 now barely numbered a functional 1,000 custodians. The webway foothold was lost, and with a last desperate act, the Emperor had a thousand human psychers sacrificed to the Golden Throne. Like a blazing star, their king thundered into the webway. The sight, the brilliant aura, renewed the near-muscle-locked custodians. With a roar, and tide of brilliant spears, they thundered down to follow their king against hell itself. Radiant power that was humanity itself purged miles of the webway corridors, allowing a respite for the survivors to seal the webway gate below terror. The loss and the strategic decisions angered Rogel Dawn. He was right. The custodians had bled themselves for a battle they could not win. You never resisted it. The orders were outdated, yet they couldn't maneuver around the orders of their source. Their king, the mind truly does make some powerless and give strength to others. You'd all rather have died following a command than countermand it. Constantine and Dawn, the custodies and the primarchs, both forged by the emperor, but the ability to truly think freely was a gift or a curse denied to Constantine, a choice that showed its weakness when the very being his existence orbited was silent. Dawn could sense it within him, never quite able to mask the disdain he had for the Primarchs, how he saw their free will as an error in their forging. But now it did not matter. Even with Dawn pointing out all the flaws, the failures, and the position they were now in, Words that would drive any man to indignation, Constantine felt nothing, and yet the task remains before us. They needed to present a united front, the protection of the Imperium, of the Emperor was all that mattered. I am nothing. The words he spoke to Ushatan centuries ago always remained true, an instrument to be cast aside when its function is performed, an instrument a weapon did not get upset, but nor did a weapon doubt. When all others were panicked, resigned to the fact that they would have to face Horus without guidance, unsure that victory was possible, Constantine was unwavering. He believed, with absolute certainty, that the Emperor would speak, that if this was the fate given to them, they would face it. Constantine, Malkador, Dawn, Jagatai Khan and Sanguinius, with all preparations made, found the darkness, 
corruption finally creep into the soul system. Legions, once birthed upon terror, who had fought besides Constantine at the end of the unification of terror, had come home, bringing death and chaos. The layered defense of the soul system was tested, each stage designed to bleed the traitorous forces as they grew closer to the throne world. Thousands had died, as ships the size of cities clashed in the deafening, hollow, uncaring coldness in the void of space. Horus, and now the fully corrupted forces of the traitors were in the sky. From the elevated such as Constantine, to the ordinary people, who just lived on terror, they saw the drop pods falling like tears of nightmare. Ordnance fell upon the sacred ground of humanity's birthplace. The smoke and fire began to clog the atmosphere, and so the siege of terror had begun. They were approaching through the smog and fire. They could see them. The traitors, their armor, their weapons, and their features had been contorted. Blood, pus, extra limbs, surgically grafted technology. Their very souls had been poisoned by the influence of laughing, vile entities, the gods of chaos, undisciplined. Bloodthirsty butchers, warriors that reminded Constantine of the Thunder Warriors, unworthy soldiers that needed to be put down. The traitors in their hundreds of thousands launched themselves against the Lion's Gate spaceport, an ongoing conflict that pitted the brilliant minds of Rogul Dawn and the traitor Primarch Perturabo of the Iron Warriors. The loyalists had fought bravely but they were eventually overwhelmed. The forces of darkness entrenched themselves, and then pressed further towards the heart of the Imperium's capital. Constantine deployed many of his custodians, such as Amon Taromachian, to scour the grounds of the palace. Strange creatures had been appearing, demons, breaking the boundary between the material and immaterial. Constantine himself began to hunt them down, using his Apollonian spear to slice and pierce the walking abominations. The unfathomable existence of dark, sentient thought, the demons, so-called life, flashed through Constantine's mind due to the power of his emperor-gifted weapon. The corruption of chaos clashed against his mind, finding no purchase. Each demon slain was a test of his character, searching through his soul for even the smallest flaw, something no mortal man could ever endure. The days turned into weeks, and then months. Ash and smoke clogged the atmosphere. No matter how long terror existed, it would never be the same. Scarred by the forces of hell itself, Millions were dead, and the fate of those still living was a thought that would send shivers of panic down your spine. Constantine met with Rogel Dawn once more. The two had simply become weapons, no time for rest. Both their minds and bodies strained by the demands the Imperium had on them. It was then that Dawn uttered a thought he meant to keep private. We were born for more. It was an unguarded moment, but before Dawn could brush it aside, Valdor held his gaze. In those eyes, Dawn saw a sad hint of sympathy, a moment so utterly human it had no place on a custodian's face. Born to fashion a future, and enjoy it, said Dawn. Enjoy it, yes, be part of it, not just its midwives. When we were made, the future was full, and now there is only war. All those centuries ago, at the side of the Emperor, Constantine had heard his martyr talk of the vision, the salvation of the species. You are the bringer of the new age. You are the warden of the old. You are the destroyer. You are the preserver. Constantine and the custodians were meant to be humanity's guides, and then, when the dream was achieved, 
he was meant to enjoy it. Perhaps it was why the Emperor had given him the Apollonian Spear. Why he had made sure Constantine never lost his humanity. Because it would be needed in the peace to come. Constantine got tired. He made mistakes. He was human. However elevated and transformed. The being that lie beneath was a man. We will prevail, Vogel, he said. One day, you'll break your sword and hang up your shield, and you will sit and laugh, and from the window see golden towers standing without fear, or ages, or batteries, freed from all possibility of threat because of what we do now. Constantine believed it, utterly and truly. I have to. The alternative is unacceptable. The siege of terror continued. Jekatai Khan, Constantine and Ralderon of the Blood Angels assembled a force preparing to sally out in the defense of the Colossi Gate. Three figures that seemed like heroes of long lost myths to the mortal defenders barely holding on. Militant General Burr met the three figures. The commander of the front looked on in shock as the enormous Primarch Jekatai Khan told him he had deference as a leader of the zone. Staring into the horrors that was the traitorous forces, he told the three, It is my honor, lords. With respect, I'd rather strip bare and charge those bastards alone than give any of the three of you an order. The Khan roared with laughter as Ralderon and Constantine smiled. It felt good be reminded of what they were fighting for. A brief light of humanity in the darkness of an unending war. The task force leapt forward, cleaving demons in numbers worthy of songs of praise, as they felt the vengeance of humanity beat in their chest. As the siege continued, months of ceaseless war, as Constantine and the defenders fought to near exhaustion protecting the weakening emperor upon the golden throne, who in turn battled with the Immaterium, with the dwindled forces of the Custodes dragged to every corner of the conflict. Duties they had attended to during the times of peace began to be neglected. Deep below the palace, inside the infamous Blackstone prison, where all kinds of foul artifacts and prisoners were kept, one slipped out, Basilio Fo, the mad scientist who long ago had sought to create a virus designed specifically to kill Legiones Astartes. Running through the wreckage and ruins of the palace, the mad scientist found himself the prey of a monster dreaded throughout the galaxy, a Night Lord's legionary. Wounded, and at the edge of death he was saved as the Emperor's greatest weapon slew the traitor. Constantine debated with himself, sparing Basilio foam, as the weapon he was creating may be of use. Men ought to be either indulged or utterly destroyed. The injury done to a man ought to be such that vengeance cannot be feared. His Emperor was silent and so he would keep any weapon he thought may protect that being he orbited. Even if he respected and even liked some, he wouldn't hesitate to eliminate all the Astartes and even the Primarchs. The Siege of Terror had reaped a toll that would reverberate throughout the Imperium. The sacrifice of many, from the ordinary to the super soldier had bought time. The traitor's alliance was falling apart, and in a last gambit, the corrupted war master Horus lowered the shield upon his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, baiting the loyalists into a strike they had to take. With Malkador, a figure Constantine had known for centuries, sacrificing himself upon the Golden Throne, the loyalists prepared for their strike. The Emperor, Constantine, Sanguinius and Dawn, alongside the greatest warriors they had left, boarded the vengeful spirit. They prepared to end this heresy.
because your own strength is unequal to the task, do not assume that it is beyond the powers of man. But if anything is within the powers and province of man, believe that it is within your own compass also. A new age had been birthed, one that will last 10,000 years before its eventual expiry. A staggering, limping age that will see the last vigor of the crusade dampened down and stamped out. An age of forgetting and smothering. War will never cease from that point, not truly, but on terror itself, a shocked silence descends. For a strange and short interval, like a caught breath after trauma, the world holds itself static. The surviving titans are like haze-wreathed statues on the grey horizon. Fighting men and women stand, their arms slack by their sides, their dull eyes staring at the falling ash. It is into this world that the Wolf King returns at last, too late to influence the outcome yet too early to escape it. It is his surviving grey hunters who stalk through the echoing corridors and banish the last of the ghosts from the still hot stone. Even the Primarchs are humbled by what has taken place. They no longer strut, not like they did on Ulanor seven years before. They are diminished, the ones who survive. Valdor finds him in a place that was designed as an observatory but will become, over a thousand painful years, of all things, a chapel. Your brother is looking for you, he says. He means the lion, who has come back, also too late, and who now rages through the corridors, lost in a storm of grief and madness. Russ looks up, his mane is matted, his fangs look blunt. When he smiles, it is gruesome. A retching of flesh once ruddy, and apt to genuine mirth. Still carrying that damned thing. He observes. Valdor does not know if he can ever let go of it. His fingers have been clamped around the grip for so long that they are hard to prise open. The illuminations still echo in his mind. Thousands of them. He has killed thousands. I am Battle Brother Sky of the World Eaters. My imperfection is my doubt. I am Shadow of the Open Hand Cult. My imperfection is my fear. I am the demon Bilebringer. My imperfection is my name alone. Where is yours? Valdor asks. His voice cracks with fatigue, even for him. This has been like a lingering death. He cannot forget what he saw on the vengeful spirit, nor what was lost on those never-born infused decks. Russ snorts. Huh. I told you I never used it. I gave it to you myself, here, before you left. And it did what you told me it would. Russ looks straight at Valdor. Only my blade illuminates those it strikes, not the hand that carries it. Did that achieve anything? I don't know. I never will now. Valdor lowers himself, crouching on cramped stiff muscles. Nothing he did was without purpose. A seed may flower many centuries from its planting. I have seen it myself. Russ looked sour. You never stop. Even now. Even here. You're still spouting those platitudes? Do not be so hasty to write off his wisdom. He's dead, Constantine! Russ roared, finally rousing himself and shaking the dust from his pelt. All the plans are dead too. We've pissed like dogs all over them and now the galaxy stinks from our spore. Look around you. Try to see this world as those with a soul see it. Try just for a moment to be angry. Valdor does try. He indulges the Lord of Fenris and tries. All he hears, though, are the voices of the slain. You cannot get rid of it, he says quietly, knowing the danger of such words. Understand this. When you took it up on Seraphina, it claimed you as much as you claimed it. It will keep 
coming back. It will follow you through time, for it was made for you and no other. Some things survive. This is one of them. Russ's shoulders slung. He sighs deeply, and flecks of bloody acid stain his robes. You always did accept your fate, but I never could. I thought that was why he made me the way he did. Now I just think we're all tainted, and I don't know anything anymore. For some reason that triggers something in Valdor, as if from the catacombs far below, he hears the echo of a voice that will never speak out loud again. Flux and stasis. You will not change. Neither will I. That cannot be random. Russ is no longer listening. The greatest sin on Fenris. To fail your jaw. And then, Valdor does something so out of character that even he is surprised by it. But then, this is a time of extremity. The moment when one epoch passes to another, and all but the most mechanist soul cannot fail to be stirred by that. He places his hand on Russ's shoulder and exerts a faint pressure of reassurance. This is not over yet, Wolf King. Valdor says, in as empathetic a manner as he has ever managed. There are sagas yet. Valdor looks up. The candles glutter in the chamber, shaken by a cold breeze that has no place in Terra's humid atmosphere. He looks out of his window and first sees mountains, blue-black against Fenrisian night. Then they are city spires again, still half in ruins, testament to the throne world's fertile powers of reconstruction. There is so much more he would have liked to have done here, for the galaxy is bleeding and everything is in ruins. Rebuilding must be done right. The surviving tenants of the old crusade cannot be allowed to die, and even his custodians are forgetting so much. But he cannot tell the Wolf King to do one thing, and allow himself to do another. Valdor has always been bound by the laws, even those he made for himself. He rises, reaching for his armor. By the time he leaves, there'll be nothing left of him in the chamber, no sign. No message, no cryptic clue. He slips out unnoticed, for the path has been prepared for a long time. And unlike Russ, he takes no companions with him. That, too, is as it should be. He has never been a gregarious soul. He looks back only once, just as his lander powers up from the platform. The heart of the old palace is still there, horribly damaged, but structurally intact. And within it, buried deep, is the one who made those things in the beginning. For a moment he cannot take his eyes off of that sarcophagus, trying to guess whether he knew how this would transpire from the start, or whether, as seems likely, this is a desperate chance set against unthinkable calamity. Once, Valdor half dreaded the appearance of his master's voice within his mind knowing that it would be there only to give orders or make demands. But now that it is silent, he misses it. There are many species of solitude, but this, for one such as he, bound inexorably to the one who had made him, is among the worst. Only in death, he whispers before leaving. The Emperor was crippled, interned upon the golden throne as a carrion lord, the price for the destruction of Horus. A sorrow so deep and so soul-haunting washed over the victorious defenders of the Imperium. From the mortals to the Primarchs, such as Lehman Russ, all except one, Constantine. He believed that this must have been foreseen. It was impossible that his king did not factor this into his plans. From his birth on terror, Constantine had been taken, transformed into something so far above the limits of a mortal man, but it came at a cost. No joy, no hate, no fear, 
unbreakable without growth, immortal without passion, a mind of power that didn't have the strength of choice. He never chose to serve the Emperor. There was nothing more for the Emperor to take from him. It was a cost taken for the dream of the species, a dream that needed custodians to protect it. The Emperor had taken much, but there was something he could give him. The Apollonian Spear, a tool that kept him tied to his humanity as he waged war from terror all the way to the stars. A great crusade, a war to bring all of humanity together to save the species. And after two centuries, when that dream was within their fingertips, it was ripped away by those whose forging was flawed. The Primarchs. Constantine chose to employ any method, any deed that would achieve the protection of his king. It did not matter if it was honourable. Constantine was born to defend the Emperor. He would let the Imperium and even humanity die for him. All Constantine did, all he endured, all who he had killed and carried with him in his mind was for the Emperor. But now the Emperor was silent. For so long Constantine in his heart of hearts dreaded that voice, the orders that would command him to do the impossible. But now it was gone. The hollowness, the free thinking was horrifying. He had changed. In his last meeting with Lehman Russ, he showed a display of humanity no other custodian was capable of. He had utter faith that this must be part of his master's plan. Nothing he did was without purpose. A seed may flower many centuries from his planting. I have seen it myself. Because your own strength is unequal to the task, do not assume that it is beyond the powers of man. But if anything is within the powers and providence of man, believe that it is within your own compass also. Constantine believed. He had made the choice, perhaps the first choice in his life. He had the strength where all others were melancholic, only in death would be the last words uttered by the first custodian of the Emperor as he left terror. Time for the Imperium passed. This age faded into myth. Constantine, the Primarchs, all figures of mythology to an empire that has rotted for over 10,000 years. A vision of a far-off future state spun out of reality and into the cold halls of an undiscovered time, where the galaxy itself was darkened by strife, and whole worlds were cast into flame, a zealous, authoritarian nightmare. As the Imperium has rotted, a name, a title, has been spoken in hushed whispers, linked to schemes that had danced in the shadows of the rotten Imperium, a name who was the enemy of the Inquisition the forces of Chaos and Xenos alike. Inside a pocket dimension, with an army of psychic blanks, winged space marines and super soldiers, armoured in gold, a figure seeks a name, the true name of the Emperor of Mankind, a power that could have hold over the most powerful soul in the galaxy, control in the hands of the King, in yellow. Konstantin Valdor, the first custodian, hero of the Unification Wars, the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy, the Emperor's most loyal servant. Because what if the dream that Konstantin's existence orbited did not die? What if it had just changed? What if to save his Emperor and the species it required something incredible? A death, an apotheosis, what if humanity required a god, a god emperor, all at the hands of a king in yellow. A dream was created long ago, and a warrior was forged to protect it. He was its protector, he was its 
custodian. We were born for more, born to fashion a future and enjoy it, because only in death does duty end. should burn and rave at close of the day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise man at their end, no dark is right. Because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave, by crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. I am the steel in the blade. I am the blood in the heart. I am the heat of the flame. I am the blood of Sanguinius. Calisterius, chief librarian of the bloodied host, consul etheric to commander Dante. The embodiment of the infamous Black Angel. The tales are true. However furious the fight, the usual hunger does not haunt him. His heart's no longer pound with those terrible lusts. He has escaped the doom of the chapter. He became unfettered, free to finally prove their nobility. He has the power to avert the grim fate that hangs over all of them. This slow, gnawing decline. This gradual death. But who is Mephiston? Who was Calisterius? And how did he become the Lord of Death? His story begins in the 41st millennium. At the edge of the Ultima Segmentum lie a cruel, uncaring world. Rust orange, and littered with the scars and ruins of a grander age. It would be on the planet of Baal Primus that a child would be born. One who took his first breaths of the radiated, dusty hellscape. Life within the spheres of the Baalite system was brutal. Doomed to exist on worlds that had once been paradises. Lives of luxury and peace millennia before. But yet, in our hubris, in our petty infighting and fear, the cautionary tale humanity repeats. Baal and his two moons were ravaged by civil war, cultures and cities glassed by weapons so destructive they did not belong in mortal hands. From the skies rang down the shards of the great orbital structures that had once been a monument to humanity's great potential. Radiation and rust flowed over the survivors of the Age of Darkness, until as each generation was born, more and more of the wealth and knowledge bled out. What remains is a people, even to the 41st millennium, who dwell within simple brick and mortar villages, others as roaming tribes that brave the wastes and deserts of this now thirsty world. 
The young child was born to one of the many Baalite tribes that had found refuge within the caves and mountains of Baal Primus. Overlooking the wastes, street with lines of garish salt, Kali was his name, who found that on top of the radiation and monstrous creatures that stalked the rust deserts, he was the son to a cruel father. Dressed in simple rags, that one of the very few possessions he would ever own. Alongside a primitive knife and a necklace of human hair with a piece of colored glass threaded on, Kali, like all the others, would do his best just to survive. He had nothing. His people had nothing except their stories, their myths, the binding glue that united them as family. Young Kali and every child under the haunting red light of Baal's dying son knew the tale. The great angel, Sanguinius, the son of a god, born with angel's wings who guarded the people of Baal. Sanguinius was the ideal. Even to young Kali, the stories of this mythological being was a story told and retold for centuries, filled with all the grace of human error. Young Kali's life was in danger, be it the radiation, the monsters in the dark, or his cruel father. Until he was saved, a strange figure took him away from a family he would never see again. The hunched, malnourished man of Baal had saved Kali because he was special born with something many would consider a gift, and more, a curse. Kali's mind was linked to the Immaterium, the Warp, and this intrinsic, otherworldly perception. He was a psyker. Nightmares haunted him. He saw horrors he could not even verbalize. He heard the thoughts of others. His mind was linked to the ocean of sentient thought in a way most would never grasp. It was a power that he could tap into, a power that had the potential to warp his mind, turn his body into a mess of mutating flesh. It was a power he was taught to harness and control by the mysterious old figure that had taken him in. For a time where they dwelled in the mountains that were the remains of these orbital facilities millennia before, fallen from grace as humanity itself, Kali grew until the time came that the mysterious figure knew was inevitable. They descended from the sky, birds of metal, the most incredible thing the boy had ever seen. Stepping out onto the dust stood these enormous figures clad in armor so beautiful they approached him even some with a brilliant cobalt blue armor they were the figures of myth they were the sons of sanguinius the blood angels it was like a hero of mythology had appeared before kali the sight made his mind spin and his little heart race they were perfect Others upon this world had sensed the boy's connection to the warp, a disposition that only allowed for two choices. Execution, sentenced to the dreaded black ships that would make their way to the distant throne world of terror to be fuel for the god emperor of mankind, or elevation into a son of Sanguinius himself. Kali was taken to Baal Secundus, the moon, home to where the angel Sanguinius had fallen from the sky, alongside dozens or even hundreds of other young aspirants from the system of Baal. The trials had begun. A place at the side of the angels of blood was earned. Through an enormous desert, Kali and the other aspirants trekked. Many would never return, either starving to death, attacked by spine chilling, fire scorpions, or swallowed by the deceptive thirst water oasises. With their stomachs in pain from thirst, their fingernails and hair caked in dirt, the survivors arrived at the place of challenge. 
gladiatorial trials began. Young aspirants fought until only the strongest remained. Death, now not something they avoided, but dealt in their very hands. In vigil, Kali and the survivors were forced to stay awake for 72 hours without rest. For those who failed, an unspeakable fate awaited. With the weakness in their bodies cold, Kali and the survivors proving their strength, their will to survive. As the tribals of Baal, they were used to a harsh life. But what came next would test their soul. A chalice said to contain a portion of the angel's very own blood. Kali partook of the divinity, his own blood mixing with that of a legend. The earth-shattering importance not lost upon him. And then, for a boy who had only known vast deserts, open air and freedom, he was placed inside a cold, claustrophobic sarcophagus. All that Kali had endured, everything that he was, everything that he had done, would be the actions of a mortal. Entering into a sleep, so utterly deep, it was as if he was dead. Kali lay there for an entire year, and if he emerged, he would be something new, something greater, a son of Sanguinius, a blood angel. Do not go gentle, enter that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day, rage. Rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end know dark is right. Because their words had fought no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright. Their frail deeds but have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Screams and chants could be heard from the aspirants in their sarcophagi. What was causing through their minds were visions, glimpses of the life of a demigod, the nobility and the darkness, blossoming for months. Many would not survive, driven mad or ripped apart from the inside as the blood of a demigod failed to mix with their nature raging against the dying of their own light. But Kali did not go gently into that good night, as he tussled and fought, his soul tested, even under special observation, as an aspirant who was psychically gifted. He survived. Upon his reawakening, he found no comfort. He and all the others were laid down upon a cold steel table. Incense and chants filled the room, a sacred gene seed created from the DNA of Sanguinius himself was brought forward. Kali was cut open, new organs were surgically attached to his growing frame, chemical stimulants flooded his veins, it would be a pain that tests the very limits of human endurance. Perhaps he was afraid, or excited, or both. What emerged from the process was something, someone knew. Kali was dead. What now stood, elevated beyond a mortal man, was Callisterius, of the Blood Angels chapter. He was stronger, faster. His ability to tap into the realm of madness, the warp, had been increased exponentially. Assembled in front of men, who had once been figures of myth, who were now his brothers. Callisterius again had his world changed. The Imperium of Man. Humanity was larger than the tribal existence he had known. Over a million worlds were home to billions upon billions. Worlds and peoples so vastly different and yet similar. Garden worlds, manufacturing planets, all the way to great hive cities. The information must have been overwhelming. And then came a truth that captured his soul. Sanguinius. The true Sanguinius. 
The angel who fell from the sky. The one who saved them from the mutant hordes of the wastes. The son of the emperor of mankind. Beauty. Nobility. Honor. The man with angel wings that soared above the skies of these harsh worlds. Sanguinius had led their people to the stars. They had purged the mutant and Xenos filth that infested the galaxy. A man who gave his life for the Imperium, murdered at the hands of that vile traitor Horus. But most importantly, Sanguinius was hope. A rage against the dying of the light. The light of humanity. The primordial fire of the species the galaxy would always try to snuff out. Sanguinius was the best of them. His blood coursed through Calisterius' veins, and it was his duty to live up to the example and teachings of the great angel. It was a reverence to an ideal that weaved its way into every fibre of the great fortress monasteries and fortifications of the chapter, all the way from the architecture, the statues, the ancient tapestries that spoke of heroes of the bloodline. Calisterius had not known music as a child. The closes at the tribes of Baal Primus came to orchestration were war drums and pyre dirges. It was only when he had passed the trials of the Blood Angels and he had become a son of Sanguinius that young Calisterius had learnt of instruments. To have never even heard music is a fate that we could never imagine. To be a son of Sanguinius was to become a force of nature upon the field of battle. Unyielding fury that would crush the enemies of the Imperium. The training was as brutal as the deserts. Martial combat, firearms, and for Calisterius, the expansion of his psychic abilities. He was a weapon as a blood angel, but a force of nature as a being connected so intimately to the warp. Like a whetstone to a sword, knowledge was a sharpening for those of the Librarius. They were as much scholars as soldiers. Whispers from the warp often haunted Calisterius. Offers of power and grandeur, lies and manipulation he had to fight every day. Something he took under the guidance of epistolary Gaius Racilus, a stern figure whose stares of disappointment shook even the bravest recruits. For Calisterius and those of the Librarius, it was almost a chapter within a chapter. The Librarium was an order of secrets that even the deeply respected and revered ancient chapter master, hero of the Imperium, Dante, needed permission to enter their most inner sanctums. The librarian's road was difficult. Their power was a necessary tool that had to be kept in check. Their brother legionaries at any time had to be ready to slaughter them in case they lost control and their mind melted with the truths not fit for a mortal. Yet to Calisterius, he found friendship even amongst his non-psychic battle brothers. Gaius Racilus, his mentor, whose friendship something Calistarius earned as the decades began to pass. The apothecary Albinus and his battle brother Quirinus were those who he had considered his closest, his confidants in this never-ending war. Calistarius was liked by his brothers, his zeal, his easy nature and charisma were a welcome sight amongst the war and the stars. Calisterius over the decades left Baal, as the duty of the Angels of Death was out there, in the Imperium. Disgusting Xenos, rebelling human colonies, and worst of all, demons fell under the might of Calisterius. Years and years of unending war that tested his abilities, refining them to the experience of a veteran. He had earned a reputation, one that was respected enough to see him requested to aid the glorious elite first company on the infamous Space Hulk, the Sin of Damnation. Stalking through the damp, 
claustrophobic conditions of the enormous wreck, Callisterius was brought to the reason he was here for. An ancient blood angel brother, wounded, barely alive, and in a sleep he would never wake from. Callisterius was given the task of delving into his battle brother's mind. Vespario was his name. His survival and story locked underneath a broken mind, clouded by rage and hate. Something that began to bleed into Callisterius, but he did not let up. Some truth was locked within. A truth that had Callisterius put his reputation on the line. For as his brothers were itching to retreat, deeper and deeper into Vespario he delved until he found the truth. Gene Stealers. Vespario had locked himself away, surviving long enough to pass on a truth to his brother centuries later. Callistarius, with Vespario's wisdom, led his brothers to an abomination. A gene stealer navigator hybrid, a threat to all of the Imperium. The Lexicanium and First Company annihilated the Xenos filth, a victory at the hands of the bravery of Callistarius. But he was tired. Never before had he used so much of his power. A deep fatigue settled within him. But most frightening of all, Vespario's mind had been warped by a curse known to those of the blood. Calistarius had linked his mind too deeply with one affected by the black rage. Baal Secundus, the fortress monastery of the Blood Angels. Black armor emerged from black stone, shadow from shadow. The skull-faced helmet nodded to Callisterius. Brother Librarian. Callisterius bowed low. Reclusiac? He was the first outside the tower to address Quirinus with that title. Quirinus didn't answer at first. He stood motionless and Callisterius felt that his old friend's eyes were on an interior vista. Finally, the reclusiarch said, The honor is great, and a great weight. A pause. I wonder, can any of us truly be worthy of what we receive? We are all unworthy of the grace of our Primarch and his great father. We are all flawed. It is our duty to accept that, to strive for the impossible, and to accept the roles that fate and our chapter assigned to us in the Eternal Crusade. Quirinus laughed. It was a good sound, the laughter of a warrior, at one with the truth of his life. Well spoken, brother. How very ecclesiastical of you. There are times when I think you should be walking this path with me, and not that of a librarian. No. Calisterius shook his head. I am where I must be. Do not mistake my statement of fact for philosophy. Our titles are not honors. They are descriptions of who we are. Reclusiarch is not an address. It is your identity. Before Armageddon, before Hades' Hive, the Death Company, and the crushing fall of the Ecclesiorium, they were storming an enclave of the word bearers. The traitors had established a foothold in Arlesium. Their heresy was a gale blowing over the primary land mass, and reaching out to infect the rest of the system and beyond. The Blood Angels came to purge them, root and branch. The Chaos Space Marines had sized the fortress city of a castor. Calisteria stood beside Quirinus in the doorway to the Thunderhawk's cockpit. They stared ahead at the approaching outer defenses. Anti-aircraft fire sought the mount. The gunship pilots flew through the barrage with deft confidence. A worthy battle lies before us, the reclusiarch said. The librarian nodded. The line was something of a ritual between them, an echo of their first engagement as scouts. Many worlds and decades ago, Calisarius's response should have been, may we always be so blessed. Instead, he said, Horus will rue this day. Speaking words ten thousand years out of place, 
His tone was furious, but hollow, as if his voice was not truly his. Cronus gave him a sharp look. Brother Calistarius, he blinked. May we always be so blessed. He said he would not remember until later his other words. He would not remember until later how his mind had slipped in time. Now he noticed Quirinus's gaze. Is something wrong? I hope not. The sky was black with smoke. Smoke from burning vehicles, ruined buildings, high explosives, flesh. It had been necessary to raise a castle. The word bearers had done more than occupy the fortress. They had made its population their own. There had been nothing to save, and everything to destroy. The blood angels had visited the judgement of the Emperor upon the heretic and the traitor. Perhaps elsewhere, on Elysium, there would be those who had not turned their faces away from the Emperor's light. But not here. Ecasta and all within its walls had been put to the sword. The fortress itself had been shattered. Not a single wall still stood. On its plateau was now a field of rubble, from where Calisteria sat upon a pile of rock Crete. The landscape of heaped and shattered grey stretched for kilometres in every direction. Here and there, an arm emerged from the wreckage. Some hands were limp. Others were splayed in perpetual pleading. Beneath the remains of the fortress were thousands of lost souls. You seem pensive, Quirinus said. The reclusiarch strode towards him over the wreckage, like the triumph of faith itself. The mutations were severe. You mean there were many psychers? Calisterius nodded. You have fought many such contingents before. But once so large. You were tested. Quirinus observed. I was. He was exhausted. He had been forced to discover the limits of his power by slamming up against them repeatedly. Quirinus removed his helmet. The smell of burning heretic is strong, he said, apparently changing the subject. Better that than the stench of living heretic. Quirinus laughed. Well said, brother. He looked off at the smoke-blurred horizon. Now tell me what is troubling you. Calisteria smiled. Do you never tire of being my confessor? If I did, I could not admit to it. Cronus turned back to the librarian. Out with it. The heresy took Rudia so quickly. And it spread so quickly, too. This world was a loyal one only a few years ago. I do not understand how a people can fall from faith with such ease. That is the essence of temptation. Ease is what lies at the core of heresy. Chaos seems to demand nothing and give much. If one is weak, such a combination is impossible to resist. Faith, brother librarian, true faith, is difficult. It demands everything. His voice suddenly took on a sharp, probing edge. Has the warp been speaking to you? No more than usual. Whispers, promises of infinite power, visions of becoming the ultimate defender of the Imperium. And then its ruler. Precisely. Have no fear, Reclusia. There was still a novelty to using that title. I know these lies for what they are. They have no appeal for me. Perhaps not now. But if there is no temptation, then you have yet to be truly tested. The day may come when such power will seem necessary and justified. Quirinus paused. During the battle, the thirst and the rage, you were able to keep them in check? Yes. The turn of the conversation made Calisterius uneasy. He thought again of that moment on the Thunderhawk during the approach to a castor, when two different time periods had overlapped in his consciousness. I am not slipping away. He reassured his old friend. See that you don't, Quirinus replied, with more command than confidence. The struggle against the Black Rage is difficult, and will always grow more difficult. Remember your faith, and remember its nature. The struggle is eternal. Beware of ease, and know that its presence is always a lie.
The black rage, the floor, the crack, underneath the noble, beautiful visage that was the sons of Sanguinius. The gene seed had changed Calisterius, where once was the homely features of a barlight tribal. He had been elevated. He was beautiful, changed into the likeness of Sanguinius himself. But there was a darkness in the blood, a wound that had been birthed over 10,000 years ago, something that all the scions of Sanguinius suffered. It began with the visions. Flashes of memory appeared within the sufferer's mind. They saw Sanguinius through their Primarch's eyes aboard the vengeful spirit. Images of the corrupted traitor, the infamous war master Horus, engaged in a duel against the brother that he had once loved the most. Then came the rage, the soul haunting, hot fury that had come from a heart that had once loved, that had been betrayed so deeply it would burn the world. A battle brother taken by the black rage was a raving berserker his throat tearing screams that bellowed out damnation to Horus was all that was left. An honourable death in combat was all that remained for these once noble men, lost to the madness. And yet this was not the only burden they carried. The red thirst, blood, that sweet crimson awakened terrible lust within them. Their canines elongated at the prospect of the warm meal. They were gifts and curses, a path that each and every son of Sanguinius resisted. It was a burden the chapters kept secret, for what would the Imperium think of their noble defenders if they saw the darkness that lay in their hearts, in their very gene code? There were ways to fight it. Calisterius had been shown them. The pursuit of music, art, and craftsmanship was encouraged to all battle brothers. Some Astartes trained, some studied philosophy, but Calisterius and all the sons of Sanguinius created beauty. It was a calming of the soul, a light of hope against the darkness of the rage. Do not go gentle into that good night. Calisterius had to resist it, lest his very being be erased by hate. Upon the sin of damnation, Calisterius had delved into Brother Vispario's mind. It was a broken thing, stung by the effects of the black rage, and its taint was not something Calisterius could wash away. Reclusia Quirinus, Calisterius's friend and battle brother, had noticed the change. He had been there the day Quirinus was blessed, elevated to a chaplain, a reclusia something that had brought joy to both of them as they supported each other in the burdens they carried. War and death was a life that they both knew, as for decades they fought across the Imperium, turning from aspirants to battle brothers and then veterans, living the length of multiple lifetimes in the service of the Emperor and the Blood Angels. And then he heard it. Horus will rue this day. Calisteria did not know where the words came from. Quirinus's concern grew as he began to see conflict after conflict, the once outgoing, charismatic Calisterius begin to retreat within his own thoughts. The cloud of rage was casting its shadow. Even Albinus and Gaius Raceless could see it. And then, Reclusia Quirinus, the zealous friend, whose banter kept him tied to his humanity, was lost, his ship disappearing from the light of the Imperium. Dead or lost, they did not know. An ember inside Calistaris's soul grew into a flame, the visions of the Horus heresy taking over more of his perception. They are my space marines, and they shall know no fear. The litany of the Emperor that was tested as Calistarius was losing himself. Some of us fear injury, all fear death, but most terrifying of all is to lose our memories, our sense of who we are. The wise men at their end know dark is right,
because their words had forked note lightning. They do not go gentle into that good night. He had fought it for centuries, rising through the ranks all the way to epistolary, wielding his mighty ancient four-sword Vitaris. But even with the strength of angels, Calisterius fell, all their gifts a curse delayed. A raving, mad thing was all that was left. Gone was the cobalt blue of the librarians, replaced by the black of rage and the infamous markings of the Death Company. Crosses marked in crimson decorated his armor to emulate the wounds their gene father had taken from Horus. It was the only adornment he had left. Led by specialized Death Company chaplains, Calisterius and his fallen brothers were corralled onto battlefields across the Imperium, sent into the most brutal war zones. The Death Company were loosed upon the enemies of the Imperium, their chaplains doing their best with the ancient litany chants to keep them focused on their enemies instead of each other. Whatever was left of the once beloved Calisterius was swallowed. He was somewhere deep within his mind, but drowned by the black rage. Be it anger, pain, or a depressive state, many of us know the deep, deep fog that can smother the mind, a hell that feels impossible to crawl out from. Calisterius, on the world of Armageddon, found himself thrown against an orc tide. The Greenskins were a savage species, whose only directive was violence and war. Calisterius wrecked a bloody toll upon them, his plasma pistol overheated, his sword wet with alien blood, and his psychic attacks mixed with the vitriol of the black rage fuel. The battles had been endless, until finally Calisterius and the surviving death company joined the final assault upon the Ecclesiorium in the enormous Hades Hive city. It was akin to death itself, the vision of a warrior clad in midnight black, with a face once beautiful, contorted with hate, the heat of rage and fire around him, wreathing orcs with every swing, every part of his armor was dented and cut, his wounds poured blood but still he fought, on and on, until the Ecclesiorium building collapsed. Calisterius and the orcs were crushed underneath a mountain of rubble, but still he lived, immobile, in the dark, alone with his rage. The days passed, as what little spark of Calisterius remained battled the black rage. He began to transform. The once cloud of the black rage began to change within. A metamorphosis had begun. For several days and nights, this scion of Sanguinius fought against the curse, handful by handful. Inch by inch he began to climb, and like a man emerging from the allegorical cave, looking into the light his eyes adjusted. Something, someone new emerged from the rubble. The black rage had been conquered, but Calisterius had not survived. The creature, this man was Mephiston. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men near death who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. An angel rose, surrounded by fire and rubble. He was dead, but reborn, ancient but new. 
Immediately he was set upon by the greenskins, but they were cut down in an instant. It was dispassionate. The rage was gone. It was outside of him, a fuel rather than a sickness. This new being wanted to return to his brothers, but the curiosity to test this new form won out. He flung himself at the Xenos. Columns of brilliant lightning and ferocious fire ripped through their horde, drowning out their bellows. Psychic wings sprouted from his back, began to soar above Hades' hive, until a voice entered his mind. No, stop. Mephiston tapped into the pool of rage and drove down towards the source, a figure who dared to enter his mind. He struck out, knocking down his enemy, only to hear a voice call out, Calisterius. It was Racilus, his friend, his mentor, shielding himself, lying against a winged shrine with a halo of thorns. Before this ancient librarian stood a figure in ruined, black armor, covered in viscera. His once handsome features had been replaced by a pale, ghoulish visage. His aura, his power, was enormous, like standing next to an inferno. This thing made Raceless's skin crawl. It was Calisterius, but the man answered him back that Calisterius is dead. It was clear to Racis's eyes and his psychic probing that there was truth to those words. He asked him then, Who are you? A name was burned across his soul. An identity, a path that brought him back. It was a guiding light. It was Mephiston. Racilus looked deeper within this Mephiston. The last he had seen of him was Calisterius lost to the black rage, but this Mephiston was calm and sane. He had come back from the black rage, the first to do so in Blood Angel's history. Racilus told him that Calisterius was not dead. He could see him within. He saw this new power, and he saw the curse of the chapter gone. Whatever this power is, it must be tethered, tied to something human, you must remember yourself. Placing his hand upon his once mental shoulder, Mephiston promised he would. The Lord of Death, Mephiston, had been born inside the rubble of Hades' hive. He was someone new. He had Calisterius' memories, but they did not feel like his own. Like he was an outsider who had watched every moment of Calisterius' life. Returning to the chapter's homeworld of Baal, Mephiston was met with superstition. No one, not a single soul had ever come back from the Black Rage. Examined by Astaroth the Grim, the High Chaplain of the Blood Angels, the man tasked with eliminating those who had fallen too deep to the Black Rage, he let Mephiston live. Mephiston was not lost to the Black Rage, he had conquered it. For a moment that should have been a sign of hope, it was met with caution. This Mephiston was changed. He looked ghoulish. His presence was unnerving. Even his accent had changed to an older form of Imperial Gothic. Even his friends Raceless and the sanguinary priest Albinus saw that this Mephiston was different. He was cold, calculating, intelligent. All humours and warmth had died within him, so unlike the charismatic Calisterius they once knew. But the power was undeniable. He had raged, raged against the dying of the light, and Calisterius had not gone gentle into that good night. He had become Mephiston. Wherever the Lord of Death strode, the enemies of the Imperium cowered, his psychic powers were elevated to such a level. He was worth a dozen of his librarian battle brothers. On black, psychic wing, with veins of blood, Mephiston flew over the battlefields of numerous worlds, eliminating entire forces, challenging the vilest of foes alone, unassisted. He had become the strongest psyker within the Adeptus Astartes 
And so when the time came, after decades, he was unchallenged when he assumed the role of Chief Librarian of the Blood Angels chapter. Mephiston was powerful, but he did not understand it. Even as he searched for the truth of his transformation, as a member of the Librarius, he was as much a scholar as a warrior, but he found no answers, only trouble. Where power lies, others crave it, and none so much as the forces of chaos. A mere few decades into the birth of Mephiston, the demon Prince Bacar trapped him inside the crystal caves of Solon V. The vile creature of the warp weaved its venomous promises. Power, elevation, immortality, demonhood. Claiming that Mephiston was already firmly on the path. Perhaps he was not saved from the black rage, but corrupted by it. He was not Calisterius, but Mephiston's twin heart still beat for Sanguinius and the Emperor. He lunged at the demon prince and throttled the life out of it. With the strength of an angel, he banished it back to the warp. Mephiston was loyal. He was a new man, a new soul. Even if he did not understand his power, or why he had earned it, it was still for the Imperium. But as the decades passed, more and more of the chapter only knew Mephiston. Calisterius was a distant memory, known only to a handful. A sentiment dragged up as a near half a century after the Battle of Hades Hive, the Lord of Death came into contact with the harrowing faith. Lost, after the second battle of Armageddon, the damaged Blood Angel vessel was boarded, slaying the cursed sons of Lorgar. Mephiston and the Blood Angels pushed further and further into the vessel until they saw him. A figure donned in black with that uncomfortable bone-white skull helm. A chaplain, a reclusiarch, a man the chapter thought lost, Quirinus. The tension was immediate. What stood before Quirinus was Calisterius, but yet he was not. Calisterius is dead, Mephiston told him. But what drew the most ire was a revelation of Mephiston's conquering of the Black Rage. It soured what should have been this joyous reunion of friends. The zealous priest inside Quirinus overpowered any sense of friendship. The thought of one losing the Black Rage was abominable. It felt heretical. He even voiced it. But no rise came from Mephiston. Quirinus was Calisteris' friend, not his. And the unnerving, cold intelligence radiating from him made that clear to the reclusiarch. United again, the Blood Angels host followed the trail that Quirinus had been set on decades ago, crushing and bloodying the scattered word bearers resistance they met. Constantly those judgmental eyes were upon Mephiston, though now he had begun to question if this was the same superstition all his brothers had in the beginning. Or was it a madness, accumulated from being adrift in the warp for so long? Perhaps Quirinus had not fully survived as himself. Finding themselves upon a strange world, the Angel's host finally approached a temple, surrounded by statues of long-dead Astartes, frozen in battle. As they flung open the gates, Quirinus and the others wept. An artifact, a painting of their magnanimous Lord Sanguinius. To gaze upon it, you would be breathless, tears staining your cheeks as you witnessed true beauty. All except Mephiston. His heart were moved, but something felt off. Quirinus, with venom and rage, decried Mephiston in front of all of them, magnifying the distrust they always felt around him. The loneliness, the isolation, the betrayal of a friend did nothing, for he was Mephiston, and Calisterius was dead. Mephiston had been right, as the Blood Angels found themselves ambushed. Their actions in the temple fed a demonic ritual, one that birthed the monster, Doombreed. The demon prince of corn tore his way onto the battlefield, 
an abominable creature battling Mephiston in a duel that scarred everything it touched. With rubble and lava around them, Mephiston rejected the demon's temptations and slew the vile creature and the false artifact of Sanguinius. But it came at a cost, Quirinus. His once friend fell to the black rage. With his last hateful words, he told the Lord of Death, I will not return. I will lose too much. I will not be a monster. He wouldn't fight it. He rejected the path Mephiston took. He wouldn't become something devoid of the righteous rage of Sanguinius. He wouldn't become a monster. Antros and Racilus sat in silence, watching the slumped figure of their chief librarian. The only sound came from the blood rain, splashing crimson stars across the dazzling floor. Antros was about to speak when a torrent of images flooded his mind. He saw Hades hive again, but this time he was pinned beneath a huge weight, unable to move despite an incredible fury pounding through his veins. It was agony, but Antros sensed that now he was seeing the truth. It is always the same, always different, said Mephiston in his head. Antros looked over at the chief librarian, but still he was in Sente. Always Armageddon, but each time I try to discover the meaning of my power, changing the details searching for the truth of my birth, the truth of my nature. I do not understand, said Antros. Yes, you do, Lexiconium. We have nobility in our blood. Such nobility. The blood of the angel, divinity, filling our hearts, swelling our veins. Our father was the Emperor's purest son, and we carry his bloodline still. I know you feel it, Lexicanium. The faith and the fury, the honor and the hunger burning within you, as it does in all of the angel's sons. The dome's walls parted to reveal a wall of blood-filled eyes, dozens of them, all staring at him. Apart from me, of course, I have escaped the curse. The tales are true. However furious the fight, the usual hunger does not haunt me. My heart no longer pounds with those terrible lusts. I have escaped the doom of our chapter. I am unfettered, free to finally prove our nobility. I have the power to avert the grim fate that hangs over us. This slow, gnawing decline. This gradual death. The eyes closed and the walls became a featureless white once more, as the grotesque images vanished. The scenes of destruction filled Antros's mind again, showing him the ruins of Hades' hive. Yet, I return here, faithful as the tide, endlessly rewriting the moment of my death birth. You see, I have escaped one curse, only to discover another far crueler torment. What you saw on Thermia is an echo of that first slaughter on Hades' hive. But instead of fading, the echo grows louder with every repeat. Every time I give vent to my power, it becomes wilder, more dangerous, more unstoppable. At first, I can use it as a weapon. But the weapon becomes the wielder. And when I am myself again, 
I recall nothing of the excess that has driven me to. All I know is the carnage I have wrought. There was a clatter of ceramite as Mephiston sat up in his chair. His face was freckled with blood spots, and his hair was plastered across his clammy skin. But I have to control it, Lexiconio. If I can find an anchor for the power that is growing in me, I will be the living embodiment of what a blood angel can be. I will be proof that we can finally escape this curse. Do you understand? If I can master this gift, I can save us. There is no power in the warp equal to the strength that has been given to me. It is like none of the disciplines we strive to master through learning. It is not practiced. It is not studied. It is wild. Glorious. It is the blood of Sanguinius unbound. It is the power of a... His words faltered, and then he looked at the blood-spattered floor. I am so close to fulfilling the destiny that the angel was robbed of. But if I cannot harness this, if I cannot control this power, if it keeps growing in fury and I find no leash. He shook his head and his voice was full of pain. Then, then it would be better that I died as Calistarius under those rocks rather than save us. I will be the final death knell for the sons of the angel. Mephiston fell silent, and after a while, Raceless spoke up. He saw the surprise in Antros's face, and as usual, sardonic tone was absent. For decades, I have watched over the chief librarian in this hidden chamber, witnessing his agony as he pushes himself again and again to the edge of destruction, attempting to divine the key to this gift. He rose from his chair and crossed the room, covering the floor with a new explosion of bloody sigils. But we have failed every time. As Raceless reached the wall of the sphere, a brass plinth, as high as his waist, materialized from the dazzling whiteness. On top of the elegant, beautiful, filigreed plinth was a book, a thick, leather-bound ledger, locked shut with a metal clasp. Its cover bore no title, but it was embossed with a winged blood drop, picked out in gold leaf. Next to the book was a quill and an ink stand. I record everything, every word and deed that drives the chief librarian to the brink, and at the moment I feel him straining at the bonds of sanity. He nodded to the bloody syringe lying on the floor. I bring him back. Then you do have control said Antros, looking at the empty syringe. Mephiston shook his head. Each time, it is harder to hear Gaius call. He leaned forward in his chair, his eye shifting colour to match the sapphire gleam in Racer's eyes. If I give vent to all the power I have within me, there is nothing that could bring me back. So I chain myself like a dog, always holding myself back. He began pacing around the chamber. <sighs> but this power comes from the angel. To deny it is impossible and wrong. I must find a way to unleash his full might. I have held it at bay so long that it is starting to devour me from within. He stopped and faced Antros, his eyes burning, his mask of serenity forgotten. Why would the angel show me such a great destiny, but deny me the means to embrace it? What is this trial he has set me? Ultimate power 
was in my grasp. He clawed at the air, causing it to ripple and boil. And I cannot use it. He stopped pacing and stared into the middle distance, his eyes full of hope. But now I see a chance. I have heard the same summons that haunts Zin. Someone is calling me to Divinus Prime. Something is waiting for me there. Something that will give me the answer. Something Zin thinks I am blind to. But until now, I could not give it a name. I do not know what lives within me. I do not know how this hunger might grow. This I know. I hold darkness in my hands. It is mine, and this is my vow. It is and shall always be the darkness of holy extermination. For the glory of the blood angels. For the emperor. For Sanguinius. The Lord of Death. A psyker of unrivaled power within the Adeptus Astartes. Yet after nearly a century of war, he was no closer to understanding his power. It was something feared, a path that had cost him the Black Rage, something viewed as the righteous fury of Sanguinius, their gene father, their great angel. His once friend Quirinus let himself fall to the rage, unwilling to fight it, unwilling to become what Mephiston was. But to Mephiston, even if he did not understand his power, he knew in his heart that it was righteous. It was born of Sanguinius. It had to be. The duties of the chief librarian continued. Counselor on the etheric to chapter master Dante, and the greatest weapon within the Blood Angels chapter. The decades had passed to a time in the late 41st millennium. Mephiston was a figure respected, feared, and for some, revered. New blood had replenished the ranks of the chapter, ones who only knew the stories of the Lord of Death, Lexicanium Lucius Antros, a young, ambitious librarian, saw divinity where others saw a monster, an outlook put to the test upon the world of Thermia. The planet was falling. The foul Xenos, the Sepokrali, had ravaged the civilization until the surrender and evacuation had been ordered. Antros and the Blood Angels assisted the Imperial efforts to rescue the civilian population from this parasitic-like race that devoured and multiplied from their victims into a rolling, unstoppable tide. The Sepokrali were rushing Antros, preparing to wipe him out and his exhausted mortal defenders until, like a blazing comet, Mephiston rocketed into them with a visage like a corpse, cold, emotionless, and shadowed. The Lord of Death began the slaughter. With just a wave of his hands, dozens of Xenos were burst apart. To witness Mephiston fight was like beholding the fury of a god, the unnerving, spine-tingling feeling when you are reminded of how fragile you really are. Mephiston felt nothing besides a zen state which contrasted so much from his passionate brothers. Antros followed deeper into the Xenos' territory, seeking to find a temple that had been plaguing many of his psychic visions. Accompanied by one brave Imperial soldier, the Lexicanium found himself ambushed by a horde of Sepokrali. Again, the Lord of Death crashed in, reaping a toll that honoured his namesake, but their numbers kept on increasing. Finally, Antros saw emotion ripple across Mephiston's face, turning from a furrowed brow into a snarl. Mephiston began to draw from the energy within him. He saw the black rage, like an outsider watching from afar. He directed it, unleashing it at his enemies, but never feeling its venomous touch. But the power kept 
escalating. Oily black flames started to drip from Mephiston. Flames and raw psychic power bloomed from him in a tornado of death. In an instant, the Sepulchrali were ash. Andros turns to his chief librarian, seeing a feral face staring back, glowing crimson eyes with razor-sharp canines, looking hungrily at the Imperials. Mephiston, in this stupor caused the death of the mortal soldier, only brought back to sanity by the cries of Andros. Death's pallor returned to his face. Mephiston, in a look of alarm or shame, asked Andros to tell no one of what he saw and strode off. Returning to Baal and the homeworlds, Andros was brought before the chief librarian and his own mentor Gaius Racilus into the innermost sanctums of the chapter, in halls decked with artifacts, sculptures and pieces of art, priceless and ancient. Mephiston, against the advice of his friend Racilus, brought Lucius Andros into the fold. The tales are true. However furious the fight, the usual hunger does not haunt me. My heart no longer pounds with those terrible lusts. I have escaped the doom of our chapter. I am unfettered, free to finally prove our nobility. I have the power to avert the grim fate that hangs over us. Mephiston's power was hope. This I know. I hold darkness in my hands. It is mine, and this is my vow. It is, and always shall be, the darkness of holy extermination. But this hope, this power, was growing. It is the blood of Sanguinius, unbound, but he was losing himself to it. He had to control it, because if he could, then a path of salvation was open to his brothers. He was not Calisterius, but Mephiston was a man, and he cared for his brothers, his chapter. Black flames weaved its way across his arms and chest, the power leaking out of him, putting him in great pain. Each time he utilized his gift, he found it harder and harder to control. Only Raceless, with their bond, could bring him back. But it was getting harder. Something that deeply worried his ancient librarian friend. But hope had come. Something had linked Antros and his chief librarian. A link that had led to a path of hope. The Blade Perific. An artifact that could help Mephiston control his growing power. It was an opportunity they had to take. Divinus Prime, a world firm in the grip of the zealous Imperial Ecclesiarchy, had been lost, shrouded by the warp. Mephiston, Racilus, Andros, and a squad of blood angels, alongside the Ecclesiarchal Priest Zin, travelled to Divinus Prime. Using the connection to a Divinite Priest, the Lord of Death had ripped through the warp an action that had put Baal in danger, as demons of Nurgle had attempted and failed to follow him through. Vitaris, Mephiston's fourth sword blazed with vermilion fire, as the group were ripped into the warp, cast upon its tides until they landed upon Divinus Prime itself, a feat only Mephiston was capable of. The group emerged onto the planet, feeling nauseous, and with spikes of pain all over their bodies. But what was more shocking was the world itself. Enormous spires and fields of bone jutted from almost every surface, all shapes and sizes, from all manner of creatures. The bones were piled up and stacked. Some even looked like trees from their interlocking vines. The group had looked to the sky and saw a menagerie of strange colours. They were isolated. Their connection to the warp felt dulled. But yet Mephiston still suffered. The black flames under his arm were still burning. The group pressed on, finding a world at war. Miles upon miles of crucified priests, and a religious civil war was ravaging the holy world of Divinus Prime aflame with the zeal of a new, strange cult. Approaching the city of Mormotha, 
one of the last bastions against the forces of this new brewing cult. Mephiston needed answers and directions towards the Blade Perific. Even with this uneasy feeling Raceless and Antros were experiencing, Mephiston was nearly unfettered, his psychic mind touching another who he had known long ago. Father Orsif, the crippled ancient veteran's remaining eye lit up, and with a grin going from ear to ear, he greeted the Lord of Death. To the surprise of Antros, Mephiston smiled too, telling his old companion that he had heard a malicious rumour that he had retired. With great effort, Father Orsif managed a salute and told him that he kept his chainsword oiled and ready. Mephiston grabbed the shoulder of his old mortal friend. Warmth emanated from him as he told him that he had earned his rest, but he had come for his mind. Mormotha and Divinus Prime had answers, and they would be his. Fire and warp madness rippled all around Mephiston, as the Blood Angels found themselves within a trap. The clues given to them by Father Orsif had led them to the enormous cathedral inside Mormotha. Using an underground network of tunnels, Mephiston, Raceless, and Andros made their way towards the cathedral, until Mephiston fell down along the claustrophobic damp path. His power, like on Thermia, began to overwhelm him. The black flames ran rampant, pain thrummed through him as he fought back the psychic torrent within. Calisterius commanded Racilus, the concern evident on all of their faces. Again, the power was escalating. Time was running short for Mephiston as he strained to bring himself back to center. The cathedral was host to ravenous, zealous crowds as the return of a prophet was taking place. Cheers roared all throughout as they held up charms in the shape similar to the desired blade perific. It was in a moment that this joyous occasion turned to a stomach churning, migraine filled sickness as the speaker began to transform contorting, exploding into a vile demon. Mephiston roared down to strike at the creature, as the crowd of once innocent, faithful servants of the Emperor exploded in a torrent of mist, themselves mutated into warp-spawned creatures. Raceless, Antros, and the other blood angels were almost overwhelmed, having to resort to their bare hands as their weapons were clogged with meat. Mephiston himself was struggling, matching the demon blow for blow, but seemingly holding back, restrained by the worry of his power going out of control. The Blood Angels were moments away from the sheer number of bodies pushing over them, free to run amok inside the city, until Mephiston unveiled his plan. He signaled his tech marine to release the gates placed high upon the walls, black viscous oil poured in. If Mephiston couldn't use his power, then he would use his mind. The talks with his old friend, Father Orsif, had been fruitful, yet learned more than just the tunnels. Turning the city's own architecture against their enemies, the black sludge was ignited. Fire and warp madness rippled all around Mephiston, as their enemies burned. The demon's ritual, the abominable cult's plan, failed. The city had been saved by the skin of its teeth and the genius of Mephiston. Though it was born, perhaps, of his own fear of himself, fear of losing control. Though it was a victory, the group had no time to rest on their laurels. Finally putting the missing pieces together for the location of the Blade Perific, to the mountains, Mephiston and his companions rushed as the forces of the abominable cult raced in parallel. Soaring through the air on an old storm bird, they enjoyed the calm before the storm, as it seemed that war had reached the temple where the blade perific was held. As the blood angels arrived, they descended down onto the battlements 
finding the guardians of the temple to be imperial sisters of battle, already knee deep in mutants and demons. Mephiston, Racilus, and Antros aided their allies in cleaning up the field until Mephiston's glowing sword Vitaris was slick with traitor blood. The battle began to die down until a strange figure stepped forward. His visage was that of a beautiful warrior, one whose very presence made mortals weep, Zorambus, one whose truth was not hidden to Mephiston. The armies of the cult had failed, smashed against the Imperium's might, and found wanting. This Zorambus began to taunt them, unleashing his vitriol and rage, his failure to his master at the hands of this vile lord of death. He began to sow confusion in their ranks, all to buy time. The strange menagerie of colours that had haunted their journey began to convulse and distort. The ritual succeeded and the sky began to fall. Mephiston sprung his psychic black wings and dashed towards this sorcerer, easily overwhelming him. But the corrupted thing, Zorambus, released his manipulative form, dashing straight for Mephiston's mentor and friend, Gaius Racilus. The corrupted figure poured himself into the veteran librarian, taking control and attacking Mephiston. The oily black flames ignited. Mephiston felt the power overwhelm him. He unleashed it all upon this possessed Racilus, his closest friend in the universe. How dare this monster touch him? His eyes began to glow. Blood poured down his cheek like tears, and cracks of dark flame weaved over his body. Vitaros ignited in a scalding flame. The gift had consumed him. The mountain shook. Vortexes of flame spilled out, illuminating the night in the energy of the warp and the hate born from a demigod. Antros rushed to the spire, hoping desperately to find the blade Perific, only to find that he was not alone. Others, mortals in the service of the foul gods, had beaten him to it. The Lord of Death and the possessed Racilus crashed near them, with Mephiston finally able to free his friend and destroying the corrupted sorcerer. His face looked like cracked glass, with veins of black all over. Fire and sorcery were spilling forth from Mephiston, uncontrolled, until the wounded Racilus plunged a vial of blood into his friend. Control returns to Mephiston, his surrounding in ruins and his allies wounded. He staggered up towards the blade Perific. Then he caught sight of them, the chaos-aligned mortals. But to the shock of Antros, his lord did not intervene. He let them escape. Divinus Prime was at peace. Chaos was beaten, but anger flushed through Antros. He dared to think. Perhaps his cold, outcast of a lord had betrayed the Imperium. If I can find an anchor for the power that is growing in me, I will be the living embodiment of what a blood angel can be. I will be proof that we can finally escape the curse. This power, it is the blood of Sanguinius unbound. Fate had brought them to Divinus Prime, but these events had been architected. A great game, a race for the blade Perific, but that very architect had slipped up. Mephiston had caught the scent. He let the blade Perific go, attaching a psychic link to it, one they could follow. But with the blade gone, so did the chance to help control his power. But perhaps he was not meant to control it. Perhaps he was meant to bear it until it consumed him. It was the blood of Sanguinius, unbound. What right did he have to shackle it? The duty was accepted, the burden would be his. If the power he held was growing, then so would his control and discipline in wielding it. There was no other choice. The future of his chapter and his brothers 
and his Imperium depended upon it. The return to Baal in the wake of this Pyrrhic victory was a somber one. Much blood stained Mephiston's hands, but a sense of hope, a stealing of his nerve was revitalized, seeing in himself the strength to endure this gift. A handful of years passed upon Baal for Mephiston, a time of study inside the chemic meditation spheres of Baal. The veteran librarian let his mind drift upon the tides of the war, until visions of doom poured into his mind. Images of burning planets and the enemies of the Imperium rising, and enemies approaching. He awoke in need of answers. Travelling miles upon miles of tunnels inside Baal's most ancient prison, he arrived at a cell locked under mechanisms and ward so powerful none could ever break it. The Octo Calivari, the six-limbed, multi-ribbed, gaunt Xenos lay inside, an immortal, a psyche corrupted by chaos. Its presence made even Mephiston's skin crawl. Here it lie, imprisoned for millennia for the crimes of enslavement and genocide. Mephiston had come for answers, and so he took them. Delving into its mind, he sought out the visions and prophecies hidden within. The connection peered into the realm of chaos. Amidst fire and blood, he saw him. The demon prince, the bloodthirster of corn, Kabanda. Combined with the news from chapter master Dante, two threats were preparing to lay siege to Baal the Tyranid High Fleet Leviathan, and the forces of Khorne. It was the doom of the chapter. It would be a threat that would require all scions of Sanguinius. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster, because if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. At the center of it all stood Mephiston. He took no blood, but drank in the potency of the sharing nonetheless. He seems to swell in size, becoming dark in countenance, shadows gathering around his back like flexing wings. Brothers, he said, and his voice was in their ears and in their mind, thick with stolen life. Lend me your arts. The ruby light flared, becoming not brighter but more intense, taking on the consistency beyond that which light should possess. Mephiston's form wavered and grew. He was speaking words no servant of the Emperor should ever utter. A wound appeared before him, a slice in reality that dripped blood and tore like rend flesh. It split wide, and its edge bled fire and vitae. Through it Raceless saw terrible things, two armies of demons, one black, one red, battled upon a plain of bone. A gate of scarlet light in the shape of an angel opened from the demon's world into his own. There were stars on his side, and the curve of a red world, with two moons encircling by warring fleets. Baal. He was looking at Baal. A titanic monstrosity was only yards from the gate, ape-faced and wide-horned. Blood-red skin stained with every swing of its axe, as it fought its way through the last beings barring its way. Hideous foes, almost as mighty as the creature, fell before its blade. From the demon emanated a terrible, all-encompassing fury that resounded from Mephiston's soul like the striking of a bell calling him to an eternity of war. Mephiston had opened a way into the realm of the Blood God. Heresy of the First Order, worse by far, it spoke of a dark power in the Chief Librarian, 
that exceeded that of all those who had come before him. Mephiston drew hard on the other librarians. Racialist winced at the pain. The vital brotherhood between the psychers strained like a bulging net. Instinctively, Raceless knew the bond joining them was all that prevented them from falling head first into the no places of the warp. The view changed, sweeping down over the battlefield. Mephiston sprouted wings, blood red and huge, traces of fine veins visible through the stretched skin. His body was black as night and eyes aglow. The view through the rip in space and time halted in the maw of the gates as the demon slew its last opponent. Kabanda roared at the sky, and his followers screamed out their praises of him, and fell in a frenzy on the last of the black-skinned demons, putting them to the sword and finally breaking them. Triumphantly, the angel's bane stepped towards the gate, ready to fall upon Baal. The Lord of Fury stopped. His triumph turns to puzzlement. He reached a hand to the gate to find his way barred. Snorting mists of blood from his nostrils, he peered downwards and there spied Mephiston. He grunted a laugh, his angry face twisting with mirth. Heavy dreadlocks bound in brass rattled upon his breastplate. Yellow eyes shone with fiery delight. What is this? Little angel, stop the gate. I have won the right to pass this way by blood and might. Be gone. We shall see each other soon enough. I shall call for you, and you will join me. Back, spoke Mephiston. The space between he and the demon shimmered with heat. You cannot pass. The sons of the great angel do not permit it. Kabanda snorted again. You have no business here, Calisterius, he said mockingly. Then how am I here? shouted Mephiston back. We abjure you. Depart from this gate by the will of the great angel. By way of answer, the demon threw back his head and howled with rage, so the ground shook and the sky rumbled with an answering thunder. Your broken wind lord has no power over me. I am coming for your head, little Calisterius, he said, pointing his coiled whip at Mephiston. Baal shall fall. The angels will see their true nature, and corn shall rejoice. Your legion has gathered after all this time. Such a fine harvest of warriors for the blood god. He looked through the rift and spied the others in the cave. All of you will fall to your knees and gladly follow me before the eighth day of my manifestation is out. Kabanda's yellow eye passed over Racilus. His soul shivered. The demon's gaze provoked the rage in him. His mouth thirsted for blood, his soul for battle, and in his mind eye, unwelcome flashes of war, fraught millennia before, rose up to trouble him. His comrades were not so aged as he. Racilus was steeped in the war. Centuries of experience gave him a wisdom and resilience the others could not claim. The web binding the coven shuddered under Kabanda's regard. Several of the company screamed with rage, but none fell. All stood firm. I kind of resisted your temptation since the dawn of the Imperium. You will not best us. Be gone from here. This is not your time. I will pass. Turn back. Kabanda laughed in a savage, brutal mirth. Then let the harvest be of blood rather than warriors. You may die rather than serve easily enough. Blood is its own reward. Corn cares not whence it flows, only that it flows. The beast swung his axe at Mephiston. Psychic energy blasted out where blade met man. Skulls, 
dislodged by the shockwave from the ground of Korn's realm, flew in every direction and rang hollow musical notes as they rained down upon the sand and bone of the false earth. Within the cavern, the impact shivered out from Mephiston, bonds until now invisible, flared brightly, joining the breast of each librarian to his fellows with crackling arcs of power. Immaterial energies and the force of the blow together dissipated into the crystals, making the rock formation sing. The mountain shook. The air shimmered with volcanic heat, and flaming cinders burst from the psychic web. But Mephiston did not fall. Kabanda roared in outrage, and cast his beady eye over the assembled librarians. He who renounces his loyalty to the dead emperor shall be rewarded with immortal life, so swear I, most beloved of Korn, said Kabanda. No one replied, but Racilis felt, through the heat and rage, faint wavering. Do you see, little Calisterius? They are tempted. The last word became a grunt, and he hewed with his axe again at Mephiston. Warp made iron clash with the dark radiance of Mephiston's soul. Power blasted into the material universe through the rift. A librarian of the Golden Suns died his eyes bursting as flame consumed him from within. Racilus was driven to his knees, and he cried out in agony. Again that flicker of uncertainty, he looked out across the crystal cave, seeking out the weakness in the web. Twice you have struck. Twice I remain unbowed. Now it is... My turn. Mephiston drew Vitaris. The silver steel of the blade blazed with heat. Baal, the home of Sanguinius and the Blood Angels chapter. For over 10,000 years, the tribes and clans of this world and its moons had given up their sons in the service of the Imperium. It was home to treasures and structures built by hands inspired by the great angel. Its rust-filled wastes, surviving its radiation, had made the people strong. It had made them survivors, but what was approaching was most likely the end of it all. In the cold, uncaring void of space, a sentience so enormous and hungry was heading for Mephiston's home. High Fleet Leviathan, a tendril of the swarm that was the Great Devourer, the Tyranids. It was seemingly ignoring other systems, biomass that could have been easy pickings. Instead, it was heading straight for Baal, as if a sentience that large had a personal grudge. Chapter Master Dante, the millennia-old legend, had sent out the call for all descendants and chapters of the Blood Angels to defend the birthplace of their gene sire. And they answered, In the grim dark future, there is only war. But underneath all that zealotry, stagnation and regression, there was hope. The scions of Sanguinius arrived in their thousands, men taught by different masters, raised on different worlds, taught in different creeds, Armoured in different heraldry, set foot on the rusty sands of their gene sire's home. For the Lord of Death, librarians of numerous chapters gathered under his banner, though many of the other Adeptus Astartes met Mephiston with suspicion and exclusion. He was a legend, centuries old, but his reputation was notorious and revered. With all the various chapters of the blood, they all had very different ideas, different views about the man who had come back from the Black Rage. Had he escaped the curse, or had he been abandoned by the righteous fury given to them by Sanguinius? Assembling before the legend, Chapter Master Dante, a near entire legion's worth of descendants of Sanguinius assembled. They dined together, drank together, emptied the coffers of their deepest vaults. 
They all shared in this moment of unity, even having their breath taken away by the priceless relics of Sanguinius himself. Even to Mephiston, and those seemingly most distant from their origin chapter, the sight caught their breath. To see the creations and last pieces of the human, the demigod, the great angel himself, you could imagine the reverence, the hope, the loyalty such things inspired. It was a melancholic celebration of all that they were. The high fleet was coming, and a legion of angels were preparing to face it. No matter who the victor, Bar would be changed forever. Great battlements were erected across the various moons. Its people were enlisted, any resistance quashed. There was no space for kindness when the Great Devourer was coming. To Mephiston, his place would not be on the battlements beside his brothers. Kabanda, the bloodthirster of Khorne, the demon who had even fought Sanguinius himself during the Horus Heresy, was coming. With so many of the Blood Angels and their successors in one place, the opportunity was too good to pass up. To face the incoming Tyranid High Fleet and the forces of Khorne would be the end of the line of Sanguinius. Mephiston asked his Lord Dante if he was allowed to do everything necessary to save them. Dante agreed. Gathering many of the other librarians from other chapters, including Racilus and Antros, the task force rushed out towards the wastes of Baal. The skies above them were darkened, a headache so needle-sharp splitting their heads as the shadow in the warp produced by the hive minds dampened their powers. Disgusting, flying chisness monstrosities harassed them on their way, concern washing over their ranks until the Lord of Death lowered the rampart. Psychic wings sprouted from his back and Vitaris ignited. Mephiston dove out, gliding through the air as an aspect of death, swatting down the foul Xenos that dared to get in their way. Safely passing through the swarms, the dozens of librarians approached the sacred grounds upon Baal. They delved deep into a cave system. Mephiston, Racilus, and Antros feeling themselves return to strength as psychic power seemed to flow all around them rejuvenating them. Hexagonal crystals, the color of a deep crimson blood jutted out from the walls, illuminating the space until the group entered a large open cavern with more of the bloodstone glittering on the ceiling. The librarians gathered to Mephiston, chief librarian of the Blood Angels. The Tyranids were coming for the material, but Kabanda was coming for their souls. What they would do here was just as important. Today, they would stop Kabanda from setting foot upon Baal. The librarians began to share their blood with each other, from flesh terrors, blood swords, golden suns, and blood angels. The librarians were bonded in a way deeper than any had been before. They were one. Brothers, lend me your art. Mephiston commanded, as they tore a wound in real space, creating a window into the warp itself. Amongst fire, skulls and rivers of blood, there he was, Kabanda, bloodthirster of corn, staring back at the sons of Sanguinius. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. Because if you gaze long enough into an abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. To behold the enormous demon, your blood would begin to boil, your head would pound, and you would feel a creeping, hot rage flood your veins. You would be reminded of how very fragile and small you truly are. Staring directly into the abyss, Mephiston unleashed his power wings of black flame and veins of blood behind him. The demon began to taunt them, offering a place at Korn's side. There was a darkness in their blood, waiting to be unleashed. They only needed to embrace what they truly were. 
the abyss was gazing back into them, but the librarians helmed. Finally, Maficent ignited Vitaris, and once again, angel and demon formed, a mirror of his gene sire 10,000 years before. The strikes were bone-shattering, as two creatures of darkness battled in hell, even unleashing his enormous power. Maficent was not immune to the influence of Korn's realm. The feelings of hatred and anger trying to seep into his righteous power. The jewel was holding Kabanda, but the efforts of the librarians began to falter. Antros, the youngest out of all of them, began to feel the influence of chaos upon him, spreading the weakness through the psychic link. Pain plunged through Racilus and the others. The rip into hell began to waver, as Mephiston was beginning to be overwhelmed. Kabanda was too strong. Mephiston was pushed back, and the link was broken. Wounded, and many dead, the cave had been shook by the battle, sealing them inside. They had done what they could, and now they hoped the delay had been enough. After digging their way through, Mephiston, Racilus, Antros, and the surviving librarians emerged onto the war scar surface of Baal. Tyranid corpses were everywhere. They looked to the stars and saw equally hope and despair. An enormous scar was blazed across the horizon. The Cicatrix Maledictum, a warp rift that cut the Imperium in two. But yet, amongst the stars, there was hope. An enormous Imperial fleet had roared into Baal's space. The Indomitus Crusade had arrived. Baal and its moons had been ravaged. Thousands of the chapters of Sanguinius were dead, strewn across the ancient holy sites and battlements. But then he arrived, a son of the Emperor, a Primarch, Rebute Gilliman of the Ultramarines. A figure of legend, brother of Sanguinius, once again a Primarch walked amongst the Imperium. By his side stood new, faster and stronger space marines, the Primaris, the next evolution of the Emperor's work. Thousands of marines created from the line of Sanguinius marched forth, pledging their allegiance to Dante. To be in the presence of Lord Gilliman would be a treasure Mephiston would never forget. It hit like a physical wave, making even him want to kneel. The Blood Angels had been saved. Mephiston's efforts to delay Kabanda had pushed the demon's manifestation from the chapter fortress on Baal Secundus to Baal Primus. A mountain of tyrannid skulls in the shape of Kabanda's rune burned into the soul of all who looked upon it, a mockery to the Imperium on the surface of Baal Primus. Many of Mephiston's brothers would carry more than just physical wounds, burdened by the loss of so many men and so much history. But the least changed of them was Mephiston. Calisterius had stared into the abyss on Armageddon long ago. He had come back, something, someone else, the Lord of Death. Even if his memories were not his own, they were Calisterius's. It would have been Calisterius's deep sorrow, his hate, not Mephiston's, at what had been done to his brothers and the homeworld. With Baal saved, the chapter reborn, and their ranks replenished, Commander Dante was named Warden of Imperium Nihilus. The half of the Imperium cut off from the light of the Emperor's Astronomicon. The responsibilities of the Chapter Master had just increased exponentially. Along with that came the added weight to the shoulders of Mephiston, Dante's advisor and chief librarian. But with the disappearance of the demons and the retreat of the Tyranids, Mephiston found himself weakened. Something was wrong. 
the Blood Oath. The ancient battle bars drifted through Imperium Nihilus. Rasilus entered Mephiston's personal chambers, finding a sight that was stomach churning. A flayed man knelt in the center of the room, his skin splayed out into a maze, a star chart, whilst his mind rode the tides of the war. It was Mephiston, searching, scouring for the source of a psychic blindness he was suffering. Baal had been saved, but with the emergence of the massive warp tear across the galaxy, Mephiston's powers, his foresight, was dulled. He had begun to see ghosts, the numerous dead who had died in his service since becoming Mephiston. They gnawed at him, haunting his every step. Something was targeting him. Perhaps it was the architect of the events on Divinus Prime. He did not know. But what became clear in his divinations, the shadowy hand behind the scenes, the demon, had played a part in the creation of this Cicatrix Maledictum. Mephiston spent months searching for the source, doing battle across numerous worlds, finding no success, only walking away with a pendant he felt drawn to on some backwater planet, its significance lost to him. The path had finally led him to the world of Morsus, but immediately upon arrival, the Blood Oath was attacked. The Necrons, the ancient Xenos of metallic skeletons who marched with the grace of automatons. Green Plasma met the new heavy bolt guns of the Primaris-born Marines under Mephiston's command, but they kept coming until the Lord of Death entered the field. But rather than violence, he met them with their own principles. Mephiston invoked the Zanach tablets, the right to parley with the ruling Pharaon. The Necrons despised other Xenos as much as the Blood Angels, but they held their traditions in far higher esteem, something the well-read Mephiston knew he could exploit. The battle was halted, buying time for Mephiston and Racilus to descend down to the surface of Morsus. As his chief librarian and mentor fought to cure the psychic blindness, another was on a trial of his own. A quest for knowledge, to save his lord from his escalating powers, Lucius Antros. The sons of Helios Astartes chapter found a new brother amongst their ranks. As Antros sought to understand their unique strength in controlling and mitigating the psychic madness one should be experiencing living so close to the Cicatrix Maledictum. It was a redemption for his failures in the ritual on Baal against Kabanda, but most importantly, it was salvation for Mephiston, his friend and tutor, the one walking the path that could save the chapter. The Sleepless Mile, a mantra, a mental corridor, a deep meditation with the sons of Helios's secret. We dream, dreaming, dream. The trance centered the individual, so much that in battle, when Lucius Antros lost himself to the Black Rage, the sons of Helios brought him back, chanting, We dream, dreaming, dreamed. Antros awoke. He was sane. The Black Rage had not been conquered, but pushed down. He also felt stronger than he ever had before, like he was a match to even the renowned veteran Racilus. It was a gift he was eager to bring back to his lord. Antros departed, aiming to meet his lord upon the Necron tomb world that was hiding secrets. Mephiston and Racilus found themselves upon a near lifeless world. Whatever beauty Morsus had once held, it had been uprooted by the ancient horror that had awoken from the sands beneath. Only the scars of the Revenant Crusade remained, a failed recapture of the system. The Lord of Death, Raceless, and their squad began to explore the catacombs deep beneath the lifeless surface of Morsus. There they found them, the last remnants of the Imperium. A sad and worn down people and a guard regiment. Many the children 
or grandchildren of those who had once lived upon the surface, before the tomb had erupted from the sands long ago. The guard were in awe of the space marines, the Emperor's angels, yet they could not help but be afraid of the gaunt, unnerving figure of Mephiston. But even as he conversed with the brave Imperial holdouts, he saw them again. The shadows, the ghosts, a storm of dead soldiers only he could see. Often as a leader, the role is more than just orders. It is a performance, a confidence you must exude and spread to those around you. But Mephiston was struggling to maintain that facade as the dead screamed in his head. The hallucinations had begun to cause him pain. His mind was not his, something that gravely concerned his friend Racilus, constantly telepathically reassuring his chief librarian. The forces of the Imperium delved further into the depths, closer to the tombs of the Xenos, Mephiston hypothesizing the source of his blindness to be the Necron Lord of this world. There they found them, the Necrons, battling against a group of pariahs to the surviving human Imperials. The Blister Men, enormous Ogrins who had inhabited the irradiated mineshaft since the fall of Morsus to the Xenos. Their skin had become dark and blistered, the scars of what remained in a place with radiation lethal to an ordinary human. The Imperials cursed and shunned them, but Mephiston did not. He summoned his psychic black wings and soared down toward the Necrons. Vibrant blood-red armor clashed against cold, green plasma, illuminated Necrodermis. The Blister Ogrins looked upon Mephiston with wonder, rallying against the Xenos and smashing them with rusty old mining equipment. The Necron machines lay broken at their feet as the Ogrins stared in awe at Mephiston one even daring to caress his face, as though touching a prophet. Star Warrior, they called him, treating him with reverence and leading him towards their own territory. Mephiston, Racilus, and the Imperial strode into an enormous opening. It was a cathedral, a place of beautiful carvings and polished stone, something unnoticed by the haunted Mephiston as his determination to free himself from the ghosts was all-consuming. Before a great statue of a star warrior, carved in red, the leader of the Blistermen welcomed their prophesied saviour. But before the moment could be celebrated, the shadows again grew in Mephiston's mind. Pain seared through him. The ghosts had returned. We need you, said the voice. Racilus had materialized in a chair opposite Mephiston's. He looked around at the blazing, spherical chamber. You must come back to us, Mephiston. Even here you are not safe. Your power is still tearing you apart on Morsus. You are just averting your gaze. The only hope is to keep going, to reach the demon. What do they want of me? With every day that passes, the dead scream louder in my face. Mephiston gripped the locket as he spoke. How can I find the demon when my mind is crowded with riches? What is that? Asked Racilus. Mephiston shook his head. Just a locket. I took it from one of the corpses on Hydra's interior. All these damned souls that hound me seem drawn to it. It enrages them. Then throw it away. Perhaps the ghosts will give you some peace then. Mephiston shook his head. The ghosts aren't real, Racilus. This isn't some kind of visitation. They are just the shadows of my mind. They can't be drawn to anything, and the locket seems significant. I, I don't know why. It reminds me of something in my past. Racilus took the locket and looked at the blurry pict, badly reproduced and roughly fixed into the locket. The dead soldier who owned it had layered tape over the image, 
in an attempt to preserve it from the mud and smoke of the trenches. But the figures were still almost faded from recognition because he had run his fingers over their faces so many times. It was a woman and two young children smiling awkwardly, the guardsman's family seeing him off to warm. Do you know who they are? After all the death I have left in my wake, why, why should this one image, perhaps they resemble my own family? I do not even recall what they look like. Do you? Do these people remind you of anyone? Raceless shook his head, and a faint smile played around his lips. It's not the people. He held it up. It's the background. Do you see? Behind them. Behind the family, there was a small shrine. Mephiston's pulse raced. He had been so obsessed with trying to recognize the people, he had never noticed the shrine in the background, even though he had studied the locket countless times. He did recognize it. His subconscious had noticed something that his conscious mind had missed. It was a simple affair, just a winged skull crowned with a halo of spikes, but it triggered a powerful sensation in him. Hope. Why? He asked. Why does it look so familiar? Why does it mean so much? Where is this? Who knows? I doubt we've ever visited the place. It's the design you recognize. It is just like the shrine where I first saw you. As you are now, I mean. When you first told me your name was Mephiston. Surely you remember. The shrine in the Bactrus Wastes where we swore our oath. Oath? Racilus's face remained impassive, but he could not hide the pain in his eyes. Think. Cast your mind back. After you died and were reborn on Hades' hive, when you became the Lord of Death, you swore never to forget yourself. You swore that, whatever happened, whatever power you gained, part of you would always remain Calisterius, and I swore to remind you when your memory failed. Mephiston's thoughts traced back over all the wars he had prosecuted in pursuit of the demon, the terrible sacrifices he had demanded, the countless deaths he had caused. It had seemed as though nothing else mattered, but now, in the calm of the chemic spheres, he realized his destiny was more complicated than that. What use was killing monsters if he became one himself? He had forgotten his oath. Raceless knew him better than he knew himself. Mephiston held up his hands before his face, the red ceramite glittering in shifting light, and it looked as though his hands were wet with blood. He slumped back against the chair, shaking his head. My memory has failed. I cannot be the man I was. He is gone, swallowed by the warp. Help me, Rasalus. Be my memory. What would Calistarius have done if he were here now? Raceless smiled. Much as you are doing, he would be utterly focused on his goal, unwavering in his pursuit of his foe, but he would at least give these people a chance to hope. Reach their bomb, Calisterius. Trigger it. Why not? It will give us the chance we need to reach the Necron Lord and let you find out how he has blocked your vision, but it will also give the people of Morsus chance to show the Necrons they have a real enemy on this planet. There's no future for these people but you could at least give them a chance to achieve something before they die. Hunt your demon without pause, yes, but inspire hope too, rather than despair. He handed back the locket. After all, who better to finish the Revenant Crusade than a Revenant? Mephiston nodded. As he allowed the memory of the Chemic Spheres to fall away, he stared at the picture in the locket determined to remember the man he once was, determined to breathe life into his corpse. Do not leave me, Rasalus, he whispered back, as Morsa swam back into view. 
Mephiston gripped the hilt of Vitaris, staring into the depths of his mind. For the first time in his life, he looked his accusers in the eye. The shadows that haunted him looked back in silence, the rage fading from their eyes. He was back on Morsus, standing before the cogitator, in the heart of the Ogren's cathedron. Raceless was at his side, and all the living souls in the nave were watching him. His tremors had vanished, and he could stand upright once more. Mephiston nodded, understanding the question in the ghost eyes, making them a silent promise. One by one, they nodded back, before slowly dissipating, snatched away by a breeze that sprang up from nowhere. For the first time in centuries, Mephiston's mind was silent. Thanks to the loyalty of Rasilus, he would keep his oath. Calm washed over him. He saw what he must do. He looked from face to face. It was a disparate bunch. From the charred, monstrous Ogryn, the survivors of the Sabine Guard. So skeletal they were swamped by their great coats, and his own battle brothers standing proudly at his side, looking back at him from behind the tinted visors of their helmets. If the Emperor demands a crusade, Mephiston said quietly, he shall have one. No more retreats. We will burn these mines clean. Lorenz paled as she registered Mephiston's words, and passion flashed in her eyes. For the Emperor, said Raceless, gripping his four sword and clanging the hilt against his chest armor. There was a moment of shocked silence, and then a chorus of voices, human and abhuman. For the Emperor, they cried, raising their weapons above their heads. For the Emperor. The Lord of Death ran, retreating into his mind palace. The dead were hounding him. Thousands of people had died around and in the service of Mephiston. It was war, and in this grim dark future, death was everywhere. He should be here. He shouldn't be hounded by the dead whilst on the trail of this demon, this architect of the events on Divinus Prime, and so much more. A locket he had picked up on Hydra's Ulterior. Why had he done that? How it burned him that he could not discern why it felt so important. It was the background, a winged shrine with a halo of thorns. The same imagery of the ones in Hades Hive. The place where Calisterius had died and Mephiston had been born. Mephiston felt lost, swallowed by centuries of war a drowning focus on the threats to the chapter and the Imperium. He had forgotten his oath, his memory had failed, but Racilus was by his side. Whatever this power is, it must be tethered, tied to something human. Words Racilus had said long ago, something Mephiston had faulted in. The people of Morsus were likely destined to die, but why not fight by their side? Why not give them hope? Hunt your demon without pause, yes, but inspire hope too, rather than despair. That was what this power was for. That was what Sanguinius meant to him, what he could mean to the ordinary people of the Imperium. I am the steel in the blade, I am the blood in the heart, I am the heat of the flame, I am the blood of Sanguinius. Racilus would mean more to Mephiston than he could ever verbalize. His link to Calisterius and his greatest supporter, even when the world and his chapter shunned him, Racilus was by his side. Mephiston returned from his mind palace, declaring the rebirth of the Revenant Crusade. The Blister Ogrens, the Imperials, and the Blood Angels rallied. The ghosts faded from Mephiston's mind satisfied that his oath was renewed, his power tied to something human once again, hope. The statue of red in the cathedral 
was of a warrior with a burning sword. Even if in their ignorance, the Ogrins had believed it to be Mephiston, it had still given them hope. It inspired them to keep fighting and to lay Promethean explosive inside the mines underneath the Necron tombs. Mephiston and Raceless battled their way deeper into the cave systems, acting as the prophesied saviour and saboteur as the brave Imperials bought them time with their lives. Necrons fell in their dozens to the Lord of Death and the Blood Angels as Scarabs, Warriors and Cryptex met Vitaris. But there were losses, more added to the ghosts of dead, that needed vindication. Mephison alone was stable enough to continue, making his way into the largest of the tomb complexes, finding the source of his psychic blindness, which lay within. He could feel it, the Orchestrian, an ancient Necron device thrumming with power. It was the source Mephiston found, a relic of the Great War in Heaven that had awoken with the Tomb World and the Cicatrix Maledictum. A spindly Necron hovered over the device, noticing the slightly wounded human intrude upon this place. It prepared to strike until Mephiston began to speak. He feigned knowledge of the device and its history, piquing an interest in his Xenos counterpart. Clearly he wasn't the only one not meant to be here. He began to decipher the device's scripture, was attempting to appease and delay the threat beside him, the time ticking away. The Necron had clearly been stumped by the device. It was because it required a key it did not possess. Mephiston smiled, pouring his psychic powers into the ancient device. The Necrons on Morses began to convulse and explode. A source of bolstering power turned upon them as a Revenant completed the Revenant Crusade. Mephiston's psychic sight returned, his powers returned to their full strength. Mephiston opened his arms, embracing the shadows and dead, welcoming them as their Lord of Death, accepting what he was, their vindication, their hope. Upon returning to the Blood Oath in space, Mephiston and Raceless were reunited with Lexicarnium Lucius Antros. Yet at the moment Antros was about to tell them of the sleepless mile, he hesitated. Doubt had seeped into his heart. Doubt born on Divinus Prime and reinforced when he caught sight of Mephiston, conversing with a vile Xenos Necron. Racilus tried to pry into his mind, but his power was greater. Blocking his mentor was child's play. Antros kept his knowledge to himself sequesting himself alone and chanting the mantra that was his. We dream, dreaming, dreamed. The Lord of Death returns to Baal at the request of Dante, joining his lord as the Warden of Imperium Nihilus was preparing an enormous fleet to push back the tendrils of High Fleet Leviathan. Mephiston entered a trance, unleashing his psychic spirit into the war acting as a defensive measure against demons and creatures of that vile space. Travel outside of the Astronomicon of Terror was perilous, but the angels had a gift, the Sanguinor, a golden angel, a figure of legend that appeared in the chapter's most dire moments. In front of the fleet, the Sanguinor roared, acting as a guiding light, but it did not last in the war. Mephiston saw it, a dark angel, a mirror to the Sanguinor. It attacked its golden counterpart, their clashes ringing outwardly. Then it looked directly at him, the dark, hateful apparition. Dread washed over Mephiston, pushing him back into his corporeal body. The feelings of dread didn't quite leave him, as he saw one of their ships fall behind now pray to the creatures of the war. Giving the news to his lord, Dante plunged the fleet back into real space. They would not leave such a vital asset behind. Mephiston, Dante, Racilus, and their accompanying Primaris armored up, boarding the eerie, silent ship. Mephiston asked his lord if he should stay behind. 
concerned for his injuries that had not healed since the devastation of Baal. But they pressed on. Dante would not show weakness. Blood and taint were speckled across the dark steel halls of the ship, the crew seemingly suffering a fate too horrific for words. Further they pushed until they saw it, a pillar of convulsing flesh, an effigy forged of the missing crew. The warp began to blur over real space, demons began to chant and cry until through a tear it walked through, a towering, sensuous beast gracefully clawing its way in. Its very presence would cause lesser beings to writhe in madness and pleasure. Kyris the Perverse, a greater demon of Slanesh. Honeyed words trailed forth, offering temptation, freedom from the Black Rage. If only they became the champions of Slanesh. Mephison and Dante rejected the demon's false promises, igniting a battle between the blood angels and demons. Mephison flew at Kyris, matching the titanic power it exuded, much to the shock of Dante. Just how powerful had he become? Mephiston's power was so great that it kept growing and growing, fueled by the war pouring through the tear. Black flames and arcs of blood roared around this aspect of death. Even above him a shadow formed of a dark angel, matching his strikes. Dante and Mephiston in unison struck out, banishing the demon back to hell. But the surroundings were still shaking, Dante and Racerless pleading for Mephiston to stop. Help me, Mephiston cried out losing control on a scale never before. Kill me, Mephiston screamed. His power was consuming him until Dante knocked him out cold. The Lord of Death was taken away, placed within a sarcophagus, just as when he had joined the chapter. Even under the greatest wards on Baal, his power leaked out. He could hold back the power no longer. Razorless, with deep sorrow, in his heart, he knew what had to be done next, but hope arrived from the forges of Mars, a salvation that held his life in the balance. Amanda Dante, he said. He sat back and tugged a black silk cloth over the bowl, hiding it. Dante descended the last few steps into Mephiston's living quarters. The other lit platforms orbited the man like a model of a planetary system. Chief Librarian. Dante took a chair at the opposite end of the table. You have returned from the chemic spheres. My brother librarians deemed me safe to be let free. I concurred. Tell me how you fare. Dante examined him carefully. Mephiston's appearance had changed again and was now much as it had been before. His skin was still ghostly pale, his eyes piercing, his face too sharp and intent to express the beauty inherent to its features. He was a little bigger, a little taller, but the same grave cold emanated from him, the same deep sense of unease, the same immense power. As you see, I am calm. The sense of power outstripping my control is gone. He held up his arm. The robe he was wearing fell back from milk-white skin. The black carapace appeared like a series of massive bruises beneath. There is not a mark upon me. There is not, said Dante. Does this trouble you? Asked Mephiston. Should it, brother? Mephiston looked down at his book and trace the ancient words with his fingers. You have never truly trusted me since I ceased to be Calistarius and became what I am. It is not a lack of trust. You are a noble warrior and my brother, said Dante. Then you fear me. I fear nothing, said Dante. Mephiston looked up and smiled. His teeth were perfect, white as snow. You fear what I might become, what it might mean for the chapter. I do too, but 
I am in control of myself. The incident aboard the Dominance will not be repeated. Are you sure? I am sure, said Mephiston. He spread his hand, palm up, and looked at it. I am made anew. Physical strength is commendable, but what of your soul, brother? Is that too fortified? If not, then your enhanced physiology only makes you a greater threat. There is more to this body than the added strength Cole's servant gave me. Mephiston frowned thoughtfully, choosing his words with care. I do not think my self-control comes from the change. From where, then? I saw him. Or something that could be regarded as him. Who? Our father, said Mephiston simply. I sense something in you. You too have changed since Leviathan fell upon us. You saw our father too, Sanguinius, said Dante. I did have a vision. Dante stared into Mephiston's eyes. I was on the verge of death. I think I would have died if he had not sent me back. I saw something similar. A choice was given to me. Then you are more fortunate. No such offer was made to me. Dante spoke neutrally, but he could not hide his rancor from Mephiston. You are ready to rest, said Mephiston. I have seen more war than any being should have to. There is little in my life but despair. What we saw, both of us, it could not be Sanguinius. He is dead. He has been dead for 9,000 years, said Mephiston. What then? Is it more likely your sense of duty brought us back? Possibly. Duty is my undoing. Dante paused. Could it have been him? Could he persist somehow in the war? Mephiston shrugged. Sanguinius is recorded as being one of the Emperor's most psychic sons. Would that have been enough? As far as it is understood to us, a powerful soul might persist in the warp for a time, but they are never whole, never what they were in life. Eldari lore is rich with horrible tales about what occurs to the dead. Mephiston stood. If we take a radical step, and assume that what we saw could possibly be our lord and father, then we must ask ourselves why he has not shown himself to us before. You do not think it was him? I could not be certain. Then you do not believe. The warp is a strange place beyond the understanding of mortals. He closed his book and took it to the bookcase. When we begin to think, we understand it. That is the first step on the path of damnation. It is illusion. Everything the warp gives us is a lie of one kind or another. It cannot be trusted in any way. Mephiston gave one of his rare smiles. Even trusting that it cannot be trusted. Cannot be trusted said Dante. I was going to say, is folly, said Mephiston. But you are correct. Mine is not the most poetic of phrases. It is possible to try too hard for beauty in everything, said Mephiston. He slid the book back into position with a soft thumb. What will you do with me, my lord? I do not want to be left behind when we attack Keru. It is time for a little honesty among friends. You may yet be a risk to the chapter. I do not feel I am, brother. Even so, I will not deploy you on Keru. Not yet. Although you appear completely in control of yourself, we must test you in battle. If your abilities still outmatch your discipline, and you manifest the same devastating effect on the warriors of our chapter, 
I would rather it were somewhere far from Baal itself. Keru can wait a few weeks more. Shortly before we decided to test Cole's procedure on you, a ship arrived in the system with a sole survivor upon it. The son of the deceased governor of Ranenti. I have never heard of it. They have not requested the aid of our chapter for over 4,000 years. Peaceful until now. It is not far. One of the hundreds of systems to the north of the Scar. The world has been overwhelmed by a gene sealer uprising. If we do not cut off their psychic call, the tyrannids will fall upon Renenti and devour it. And if the high fleet in this subsector turns towards Renenti, they will bypass the trap we have laid for them. We will go there together. I wish to see you fight with my own eyes. If there is an effect on the warriors of our blood, my lord, you will be in danger. I have lived too long as it is, Mephiston. I have never shied from duty. If you do lose control, if you show signs of turning into a threat, then I will end you myself. I understand. Dante stood. We will depart tomorrow for Skyfall. There will be a small contingent, you, me, and a handful of men. For the rest, we shall rely on the Imperial fleet. See that you are ready. Dante looked to the armorer on the platform. New armor. A gift from Incariel of the Blade. My old battle blade no longer fits. Until tomorrow, then. As you command. The bravest sight in the world is to see a great man struggling against adversity. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. If you really want to escape the things that harass you, what you're needing is not to be in a different place, but to be a different person. Mephiston's mind drifted in the war. He found himself upon a world that looked so much like home. He saw the simple rags he was dressed in, the stained glass he used to carry around his neck. He was Kali once again, a child of Baal Primus, the boy who had never heard music, staring into the irradiated rust wastes of his once home. It was an illusion, a warp manifested facade. A hunched, malnourished figure began to mock him. It was the old man who had saved him from his violent father, the man who had nurtured his raw psychic powers. The ratty old man began to taunt him for his lack of manners, insolent as ever. The Lord of Death, Kali, Calisterius, Mephiston. He had worn many names. How many would he die with? In the material universe, Mephiston's body lay upon an operating table undergoing the crossing of the Rubicon Primaris. His skin and bones were being lengthened. New organs were being placed inside his body, as Dante, Raceless, and dozens of other librarians and sanguinary guard watched over in vigil. They were attempting to save him, to help him contain his power in an upgraded, stronger form. Kali, Calisterius, Mephiston, the being's souls were in the warp, residing in a pocket of calm that his once mentor soul called home. The old man led him into a cave, Mephiston finding it full of polished, reflective surfaces within, each reflecting back every stage of Mephiston's life. He came face to face with one, seeing the beautiful, warm, sculpted features of Calisterius contrasted with his own gaunt, waxy corpse-like visage. Who was Mephiston, a revenant of Kali and Calisterius? How much had been lost in order for the Lord of Death to rise? Mephiston moved further, approaching a precipice. Once again he saw the two angels of the warp fighting like titans of myth. One gold one black. 
A figure before him began to coalesce, a space marine silhouette, entirely filled with crimson blood. Mephiscent asked why he was here. What did this figure want with him? Words spilled forth of a truth that slowly became more and more real for Mephiston. The bloody marine spoke of the warring angels, each the amalgamation of the chapter's deeds, a psychic wound that seeped into Baal from the warp, an imprint put upon the past, present, and future of all who resided there. The golden angel was the purity of the chapter, the black angel was the flaw, a war kept in balance by each act of beauty and fall to the black rage. The angel of darkness was winning. It was a flaw in their souls, brought about by a grim dark future. The bloody marine offered Mephiston a choice, just as Sanguinius had been offered a choice millennia ago. Become the avatar of the black angel. Mirror the Sanguinor of the Golden Angel, embody all the flaws, hatred, and darkness within his brother's souls. This was why he was born on Armageddon, the truth he had been seeking for centuries. Mephiston was a part of this Dark Angel, but he now, right now, was given a choice. He asked, what if he refused? What if this centuries-old veteran had earned some rest? What if he had given enough? If he refused, he would die, as his body was dying right now. If he accepted, he would become more of a pariah. He would be damned to become the Dark Angel. His brothers would hate him even more and not know why, but he would buy the chapter time. Time they did not have. Was it even a choice at all? He refused. He had given enough. The figure of blood began to transform. Golden luscious hair flowed down. Gorgeous white wings sprouted from his back. Sanguinius. Mephiston fell to his knees as he saw his lord, his gene father, his god. It was his choice self-doom, but salvation for his brothers, or freedom, for the death of the sons of Sanguinius. In the Arx Angelicum on Baal, the surgery was complete, but Mephiston was dead. They couldn't resuscitate him. His friend Albinus kept trying, but a bloody corpse, stitched and cut, remained still. Panicking, they tried to restart his heart with enormous pulsating current that sent Albinus flying. Mephiston awakened. He was a shadow and flame. Lifting into the air, a tornado of fire and psychic energy began to tear the room into pieces. Mephiston's body began to lift. Mephiston's body was alive. As his soul roared into his body, a black angel manifested behind him screaming hatred and pain into the witnessing blood angels. Then it stopped. The energy began to flood into Mephiston, absorbed into a now serene and calm figure. The bravest sight in the world is to see a great man struggling against adversity. A gem cannot be polished without friction, nor a man perfected without trials. If you really want to escape the things that harass you, what you're needing is not to be in a different place, but to be a different person. Chapter Master Dante alone met with Mephiston inside his chambers. The Lord of Death, seeming serene, in control, stronger and better in his new Primaris frame. Mephiston was different, just as how he had evolved from Calisterius, this new being had evolved from Mephiston, an avatar of the Dark Angel. He chose not to go gentle into that good night. He would rage, rage against the dying of the light. Mephiston knew that even Dante feared him. He couldn't help it. They both spoke of what they had seen when death had nearly claimed them both. 
their genes sire, Sanguinius, though Dante was jealous for the fact Mephiston had been given a choice to return. Ronetti would be the testing ground for the reborn chief librarian, burning to the ground the gene sealer uprising with an ease and dispassion that felt like a god walking amongst men. With the approval of Dante, they returned to Baal, enacting a ceremony for the fallen who had been taken by Mephiston's violent psychic rebirth. He felt their eyes upon him as he read the funerary rites, in part judging and accepting. His power came from Sanguinius, but it was the power of their flaws. Following the ceremony, Dante, Albinus, Mephiston, Racilus, and Antros convened the Prospero system. Decades of work that had begun since Divinus Prime, which led Mephiston, Racilus, and Antros to this answer, a relic. Sabasis, the comment caught Mephiston by surprise. His powers and gift in psychic foresight were far beyond his brother librarians. It should not have been possible for Antros to read the inscription upon this relic. Even his psychic probing was rebuffed. Antros was powerful beyond his expectations. Sabasis was where the answers they sought were, and perhaps more information of this demon that had been playing in the background and shadows. The one Mephiston had chased since Divinus Prime and Morsus. Dante agreed to let them go, commenting how Mephiston was never alone with a friend like Racilus, something that made the veteran librarian beam with silent pride. Once again in the deepest vaults, upon the still rebuilding bar, Mephiston, Racilus and Antros met with the most dangerous prisoner the chapter had. The Octo Calivarii, that manipulative, immortal, chitinous Xenos. Mephiston began to interrogate it once again, preening information about Sabasis and the Prospero system. They needed to cross the Great Rift into the region of influence of the Thousand Suns Legion, the Sons of Magnus the Red. Mephiston, Raceless, and Antros prepared to leave. But before they departed, Mephiston gifted Antros an ancient staff of the chapter as a reward for his accomplishments and abilities. The three left Baal as the Octo Calivarii was laughing, knowing what was coming for them, thinking of the demon with a bird's mask. Mephiston watched Federak begin to stir. The colonel was strapped to a table in a small, shuttered room. There were just a few fingers of light spilling around the shutters to reveal that it was still daylight outside. By the throne, said Federak as he woke, straining against his bonds, trying to rise. What is this? Who would dare do this to me? His rage faltered as he noticed Mephiston standing a few feet away. He slumped back against the table the whites of his eyes gleaming from the sickly yellow pallor of his face. Mephiston crossed the room towards him, his armor purring with electromagnetics. He leant over the table and unfastened the restraints. Federak winced as blood rushed back into his arms and legs. He patted the limbs as he sat up and then managed to climb slowly down from the table, his legs numb and clumsy. This is an outrage. You have no right to treat me in such a way. Asturia, replied Mephiston. Federak shook his head. What? The painting you found in the mess hall. It is a rare treasure. Painted by an artist called Asturia. It is uniquely beautiful and unusually accurate. You were right to be impressed. Federak looked even more baffled. How do you know about that? Asturia knew the Emperor of Mankind, continued Mephiston, ignoring Federak's question. He personally observed several key engagements at the very dawn of the Imperium. The intensity of vision you notice is extraordinary insight, stems from the fact that he knew his subject. The determination you saw in that image, that 
Refusal to accept defeat is no simple trick of the artist. It affected you so profoundly because it is the truth. Truth is always beautiful, and beauty is always powerful. Federak massaged his temples and stared at the floor. Am I still dreaming? How can you know what I thought, what I saw? I am a librarian. Things that are hidden from others are made clear to me. Mephiston shrugged. To be fair, even a psyker of moderate abilities could see what's in your mind. Revelation shines out of you like a beacon. It's part of the reason I spared your life. Spared my life? Federak limped away from the table, looking around for his weapons. What are you talking about? You saw a demon. Mephiston spoke in calm, neutral tones, but the words resonated, catching Federak's breath in his throat. Demon? He sneered. What do you mean? You talking about fairy tales? Demons exist. The name is perhaps misleading. It conjures up unhelpful connotations. But there are entities in the warp that hunger for your soul, Colonel Federak. Beings of etheric force that desire a foothold in reality. They wish to escape from their protean hells and enter our galaxy. And here, in the Prospero system, they have almost succeeded. Mephiston did not need seer sight to know what Federak was thinking. The terror was clear in his eyes. Federak stared at him. Why? Why are you telling me all this? Because there is a demon on this world, and I need your help in finding it. Federak was unable to speak for a moment, shaking his head and mouthing silent words. Then he looked at the table. Why did you strap me down? You were not yourself. Mephiston wrenched the shutters open, flooding the room with light and heat. You attacked your comrade. I might have killed him if Raceless had not intervened. Sergeant Malik? Federak sounded horrified. He shielded his eyes from the glare as sunlight flashed across Mephiston's battle plate. Is he hurt? Federak was a good man. Mephiston had sensed that even before he dragged his thoughts. He was gruff and brittle and he had spent many years battling a faithlessness that ate into him like a cancer. But he cared for his men, and he would die for them if he had to. Mephiston had spent the last few hours striving for his sanity because he held vital information about ZKL. But he also felt a grudging affinity for a man who had battled so much doubt and madness so as not to fail his men. Federak was looking at the floor and muttering quickly to himself, growing increasingly agitated, massaging his face as though trying to remove a mask. Like a bird's skull. A mask like a bird's skull. His words rose in pitch and desperation until he seemed on the verge of crying out. Zerfa. Mephiston said the word quietly and Federak immediately relaxed, ceasing his muttering and taking a deep breath. Zephra was an old barlight word. Mephiston had dragged it from his own hazy recollected childhood. It had no innate significance to Federak, but Mephiston had planted verbal triggers in the colonel's subconscious, ways to redirect his thoughts from memories of the demon. There was no telling how long the wars would hold. Federak's memories of Zadkael would loop tirelessly until they found a chink in the armor Mephiston had made, and then Federak's sanity would fold, leaving him incapable of rational thought. He might last months, years even, but eventually the pain would be too great. You are lucky. Not many mortals come so close to a creature of the warp and survive as long as you have. Federak glanced at him. He was fully awake now, and his eyes were sharp. I won't survive though, will I? I can feel the wound in my thoughts. You have some time remaining to you. Which of us can say more than that? 
Federak sat heavily on a chair and cradled his head. After a while, he seemed to recover his composure and looked up at Mephiston. Thank you for whatever you did. Tell me how I can return the favor. This sector is no longer under Imperial control. You are a lone outpost. You will soon fall. Federak nodded. Which is why no one heard our calls for help. I heard your call, Colonel. That cannot be an accident. You called. I came. And I met the one man on this planet who can lead me to my prey. If you had not seen Asuria's painting, you would not have survived to meet me. And if you had not survived to meet me, I might have lost my way. Then the Emperor brought us together. He's watching over us. Mephiston shrugged. Or is it the skill of Asuria we should be thanking? The power of human endeavor and creativity. Is that what the Emperor means? Is he our better instincts? Is he the spark of genius that gives us hope and drives us on when we are about to accept defeat? Federak shook his head. I saw something more than a painting. Who knows what you really saw? Conversation for another time. I have come here seeking the being that drove you to pull that gun on yourself. I have to find it. I have to stop it. Or that madness you feel twisting in your thoughts will soon infect the entire galaxy. It feels like watching a fire from a distance. I see the light, the silhouettes that dance around it, basking in it. I yearn for the heat, for the warmth I once held so dear. I can almost feel its embers in my chest. I thought it would always be a part of me, but now, now I squint as the flames seem more distant, further and further from my reach. This is the price for the burden I bear, the price of power. Sebasis, a lost imperial world, clouded under the influence of the warp within the Prospero system. Mephiston, Racilus, and Antros search for a way to traverse the Cicatrix Maledictum, a journey that brought them to the husk of a long dead Eldari craft world. They found themselves set upon by illusions. Even their thunder hawk was struck. Mephiston, now in control of his power, unleashed it. He froze time within the pocket of the ship, debating whether to heal the shattered skull of their pilot. The Primaris frame was truly extraordinary, allowing him to unlock the true potential of his power, the power of Sanguinius. Mephiston chased down this puppet master finding that a foul Eldari was the source. It was at his mercy, but he began to bargain with it, threatening to bring the eyes of the Imperium upon this hallowed ground, unless it granted him access to their hidden paths. The webway, a bypass for the Cicatrix Maledictum. The alien agreed. The Blood Oath roared into the Prospero system, finding the nearly lost Imperial Jungle World of Sabasis. Mephiston, Racilus, Andros, and the Blood Angels descended down from the sky, finding the last Imperial outpost under siege, preparing for their last stand against the forces of a Chaos Cult. The terrified, exhausted people of Sabasis were awaiting their deaths, only to find the Angels of Death knocking at their door. Their prayers to the Emperor had been answered, as warriors 
In beautiful vermilion red armor strode in. Colonel Federak, the Imperial Guard commander, began to greet the warriors until his mind snapped. He awoke, strapped down upon a table, saved from attacking his friend by the enormous, bulky figure in the corner of the room. Mephiston stared back at the mortal, his aesthetics no doubt inspiring equal parts dread and hope. Before his return to the city and its last stand, Colonel Federak had seen something, something horrific that had happened upon one of the nine finger-shaped mountains of Sabasis. He had seen a demon with a bird skull mask, a sight that would crack the sanity of any mortal, and eventually his. Federak had been a man on the edge of giving up, even before, his sanity only saved by the painting that hung in his quarters. An Astria original, a glorious rendition of the Emperor of Mankind during the dawn of the Great Crusade, millennia ago. The determination, the hope, captured in the Emperor's eyes had acted like a bandage upon his psyche. Something Mephiston reinforced saving his life. Even when he had been Callisterius, Mephiston, as a blood angel was no stranger to art, his chapter was steeped in it. Many times, in all his lives, there had been a paintbrush or a chisel replacing a sword in his hand. He understood Astria's work, for he knew that look in the Emperor's eyes, because truth was always beautiful. Federak had seen the demon, the one whom Mephiston had been chasing now for centuries, and Federak would lead them to it. To the mountains of Sabasis, Mephiston and Raceless traversed, leaving Antros behind, much to the Lexicanium's frustration. With Federak at the Blood Angel's side, they retreaded the Colonel's steps, finding the remnants of the demonic rituals the colonel had witnessed before. The group found their way into a temple. They began approaching what appeared to be a ritual site. The uneasiness they were all feeling was broken, as they were ambushed by the demon Mephiston had been chasing for centuries. Zadkael, a greater demon of Zinch. From their flanks strode forth Baroque, cobalt blue, and gold-powered armor. The near automatons that were the traitorous thousand sons of Magnus the Red. The battle ignited, with Racilus and the Primaris Blood Angels engaging the thousand sons, and Mephiston rushing towards the ritual site at the center. It was glowing hot, searing with heat. The mountains began to shake all nine of the finger-shaped peaks. They were not mountains, they were towers of Zinch, bled into from the warp. The Lord of Death, with fire and plasma all around him, encased his body around the ritual site. He tapped into the full power as the avatar of the Black Angel. Now in his Primaris frame, he split himself. He bound his body to the ritual beacon, using his corpse to insulate and delay it. He sent his consciousness into his friend Raceless to aid his brother and his soul, chasing after the demon into the war. He awoke to a landscape without physical or temporal boundaries, a vast, formless limbo with colors and shapes impossible to describe. A figure stood up. It was a mass of charred muscle, coated in a crust of dark, dried blood, with raptor-like claws, glowing red eyes and wings. This was the true form of the being Mephiston, his soul. He was a creature that seemed to fit into the smattering of bizarre, twisted abominations that roamed this bizarre place. He was confused disorientated. His memory was fractured. He was someone. He was 
chasing something. He followed the creatures around him, joining a seeming exodus of twisted monstrosities, all towards the city of light. In their thousands they travelled, abominations, all hoping to join the Crimson King, Magnus the Red, in his utopia for Psychers, the hulking, nightmarish creature that was Mephiston, along the mind-breaking, impossible paths of the warp, stood before the City of Light, ancient, broken, Prospero. He broke his way in, slaughtering vile demonic creatures in his path, a crumbling ruin where the echoes of ghosts from the Horus heresy met him. Slowly his memory was returning, as did his surety of his task, and his target. But his prey was not the one being hunted. Lured into a tower, Mephison walked straight into the demon's ambush. He was stabbed by a ritual knife and locked in place. Zadkael cackled in triumph. Over a century of manipulation and scheming had come to pass. Divinus Prime, Morsis, the Cicatrix Maledictum, and now he had him, the perfect conduit, to enact a ritual to bring the City of Light back into real space. On Sabasis, Antros defied Mephiston's orders, travelling to the summit of one of the Nine Finger Mountains. The young Lexicanium, student of Mephiston, still caught by the righteousness of youth, thought he was saving them. But when he arrived, his body began to change. It started to twist and contort the sleepless mile. The path that had brought him back from the black rage was not born of the sons of Helios, but of Zadkael, a ritual of Zinch. Andros cried out in pain. He had been tricked. He had betrayed everything, his chapter, his friends, he had betrayed Mephiston. As his sanity was moments away from being swallowed by the creature he would become, he looked into the staff his lord had gifted them before they left Baal. It clicked, and he understood what he had to do. With the last part of him human, Andros polarized the ritual, drawing upon it as a vessel, taking his lord's place and his life with it. Racerless, with nearly every blood angel with him, either wounded or dead, looked to the smoking shell that was Mephiston. The lord of death had returned and he stared back. His armor was smoking and burnt, but he was whole. The mountains outside had vanished, and Sabasis was at peace. Returning back to Baal, Mephison and Raceless sat in Lucius Antros's personal chambers, remembering their friend. With his Primaris form, Mephison had not just been restored, he had been elevated, just like when Calisterius had been elevated to Mephiston. His power was incredible, great enough to see the taint residing in Antros's heart, the taint of the sleepless mile. It feels like watching a fire from a distance. I see the light, the silhouettes that dance around it. I thought it would always be a part of me, but now I squint as the flames seem more distant, further and further from my reach. This is the price for the burden I bear, the price of power. The somber Raceless asked if Mephiston could have saved Antros. Why had he let himself be stabbed by Zadkael? If Antros had needed to die in the polarizing of the ritual, Mephiston told him that he had saved him. A flash of anger rose in Raceless and then faded. The Lord of Death was so powerful, and with that elevation came an even greater distance from his friends, from his student, 
from his humanity. He watched them like silhouettes around a flame, distant, now far away from their warmth. Did he even mourn Antros, or was he even capable of it? Could the avatar of the Black Angel, the symbol Mephiston, care for one being? The centuries-old librarian sat in peace. He had endured so much. He let his mind drift as he sketched. He looked down at his work, seeing, like Astria, a sketch of the Emperor. Those powerful, determined, hope-filled eyes staring back. Is this how he felt? How Sanguinius felt? A protector of humanity, but destined to be on the sidelines, its observer, never quite feeling its warmth again. The Lord of Death, Kali, Calisterius, Mephiston, the Black Angel, stood up, striding out, ready to fight the enemies of the Imperium until he could no more. His destiny was doomed to become the embodiment of the Black Angel. But until that day, he would rage, rage against the dying of the light. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end know dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learn too late they grieved it on its way, do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men, near death, who see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there, on the sad height, hurts. Bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light.